Section 1 of the Heroines of History. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Section 1. Publisher's Note and Dedicatory Epistle. Publisher's Note. Mr. Jenkins, whose name remains on the title page of this volume, was prevented from finishing the work for a long time by sickness, and finally by death. The first chapter is from his pen, and the rest has been written according to his instructions by one whom he selected, and who has had access to works rare in this country, such as Monstrelet's Chronicles, Tooke's Life of Catherine the Second, Madame Roland's Appeal, etc. Acknowledgement is due to P. J. Forbes, Esquire, of the New York Society Library for much polite aid in ascertaining the sources of information. Dedicatory Epistle To S. Sheldon Norton, Esquire My dear Norton, I do not inscribe this volume to you merely because of the long and uninterrupted personal friendship existing between us, though I would fain have you regard it as a memorial of the intimacy which that friendship has sweetened and hallowed. I find other motives to influence me in our mutual admiration of female heroism, and in the interest with which, in common with myself, you have traced out the varied fortunes and studied the characters of the heroines of history, whose lives I have attempted to sketch in the following pages. They were not perfect women, and where did such ever exist, unless in the dreamy conceptions, half poetic, half philosophic, of the pure and simple-minded, though almost too unworldly, Bard of Ridelmont. I have not considered them as examples of female excellence, without spot or blemish, nor have I represented them in that light. They were famous women, and so lifted above mortality, and as such I have endeavored to portray them. The title is suggestive of the character of the book. It has not been my aim to give detailed biographies of the several personages introduced so much as to present pictures of them, in the shading and coloring of which, while I may have gone beyond the letter of history, I have not done violence to its spirit, nor disregarded its facts. You will readily discover that the characters have not been selected in pursuance of any particular plan. Some have been taken from, quote, the classic days, those mothers of romance, that roused a nation for a woman's glance, unquote and others from a period full of interest indeed, and abounding in great names and great deeds, but separated from our own times by a very narrow interval. Believing that you will be interested in the perusal of these pages, and hoping that the public may find nothing in them worthy of censure, I am their servant, and most truly your friend, the author, Auburn, New York, August, 1851. End of section one. Recording by David Lawrence in Brampton, Ontario, July 2010. Section two of The Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine H. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Section 2. Cleopatra. Part 1. Pur Cleopatra o Egipto ful bensido. Mascarenas. Whatever might have been the character of the person occupying the throne of the Ptolemies during the time of the Caesars and the Triumvirate, it may well be doubted whether the independence of Egypt, under any other circumstances than those which attended the complete subjection of that kingdom to the Roman sway, could have been longer maintained, in opposition to the colossal power whose victorious standards were planted on the rocky shores of the Atlantic or fanned by the soft breezes of the Orient. And perhaps it was rather the misfortune than the fault of the fair but frail descendant of a long line of illustrious princes, that she was the last of her dynasty and race 
who ruled in the home of her ancestors. Nay, is it not certain that the charms which captivated Caesar and enthralled the heart of Antony, though powerless to save her country from the doom that awaited it, put far off the evil day of its undoing? The Egyptian kings had long been the mere allies of Rome, and such vassalage was almost sure to be the precursor of entire subjugation. Yet it is for the very reason offered by the Portuguese poet in her condemnation, that for, or on account of her, Egypt was vanquished, that the name of Cleopatra is so famous in history. The poet who has dwelt with delight on her charms and her follies, and the historian whose periods have grown eloquent as he depicted her graces, and lamented the weakness with which they were allied, have referred to them more as the causes which produced the downfall of the Egyptian monarchy than as the effects of that national degeneracy which preceded it. As the beauty and the shame of Helen are first in the thought of the traveler who pauses beside the yellow waters of the Scamander and looks around him but in vain for the memorials of ancient Ilium, so he who gazes on the humble promontory that breaks the waters of the Ionian Sea forgets that the crescent of the Moslem is reflected in the blue waters that sparkle beneath it. Time rolls back the events which she has numbered. The proud galleys of Egypt's queen and her doting lover pass in review before him, and he remembers only that here was lost a world for woman, lovely, harmless thing. But the story of the false bride of Menelaus is all a fable, and thus, too, may it be said, that historic truth does not warrant the conclusion that Egypt was overthrown for the sake of Cleopatra. It is enough that she presided, as it were, over the catastrophe which she could not avert, to invest it with the attractions of romance. The seeds of disillusion were not, in fact, planted by her hand. She but neglected to check their growth. Under her auspices, the last days of the monarchy were spent in the soft dalliance of love, in excess and voluptuousness, instead of the misery and confusion of a hopeless and protracted warfare. One after another of the Roman generals who designed to wrest from her the kingdom she had inherited was made captive by her beauty, and in her embraces forgot the high ambition which had before been his mistress. And it was only when that beauty had faded, and could no longer ensnare, that the Egypt whose glory and splendor had once been unrivaled was humbled in the dust. The beauty and the love of Cleopatra had preserved for a season, but they did not secure the independence of her country, and the same hour that witnessed the overthrow of the one beheld the failure of the other. Cleopatra was born about the year 68 B.C. Her father, Ptolemy Auletus, had ascended the throne of Egypt under the patronage of the Roman Senate, his predecessor, Alexander Ptolemy III, having bequeathed his kingdom to the Romans, although, as he had been banished by his subjects, it was a matter of some doubt whether he was capable of making such a disposition of his crown. Auletes was a shrewd and politic prince. With the sum of six thousand talents, he purchased the favor and friendship of Julius Caesar and Pompey, and through their influence secured the alliance of Rome. His people, indignant at his conduct, revolted from his authority and drove him into exile. But they were compelled again to receive and recognize him as their king by the presence of a Roman army. Subsequent to this re-establishment of his power, the peace of the realm was not disturbed, and until his death he continued in the uninterrupted possession of his kingdom. Auletes had two sons and three daughters, but two of his daughters survived him. The eldest, whose name was Berenice, was put to death by her father because she had worn the crown and assumed the royal authority during his exile. By his will, therefore, he left the government of Egypt to his eldest son and his second daughter, the latter being the renowned Cleopatra. He also directed, in accordance with the usage of the Alexandrian court, that they should marry together 
and reign jointly. As both were minors, they were placed under the guardianship of the Roman Senate, by whom Pompey was selected to fulfill the duties of the office. At the time of her father's death, Cleopatra had nearly reached her seventeenth year, that season of poetry and love. She stood just upon the threshold of womanhood, the faultless outlines of the girl wanting but the filling up to perfect a form unmatched among Egyptian maidens for symmetry and grace. She was tall of stature and queenly in gait and appearance. Her features were regular, and every limb finely molded, though yet lacking the round and voluptuous fullness of her ripened beauty. The warm sun of that southern clime had tinged her cheek with a hue of brown, but her complexion was clear and pure as the serene sky that smiled above her head, and distinctly traced beneath it were the delicate veins, filled with the rich blood that danced so wildly when inflamed with hate or heated with desire. Her eyes and hair were like jet, and glossy as the raven's plume. The former were large, and, as was characteristic of her race, apparently half shut and slightly turned up at the outer angles, thus adding a great deal to the naturally arch expression of her countenance. But they were full, too, of brilliancy and fire. Her silken ringlets fell in long flowing masses down the stately neck and over the snowy throat and the polished shoulders and the wavy bosom where love delighted to make his pillow. Both nose and chin were small, but fashioned as with all the nicety of the sculptor's art, and her pearly teeth nestled lovingly between the coral lips whose kisses were sweet as honey from the hives of Hybla. But her beauty was not all mere comeliness of form and feature. To the witchery of Venus she added something of the dignity of Juno. Beside the personal charms that might arouse the slumbering passions of an anchorite, she possessed the most exquisite mental gifts. Her countenance was expressive, and her dark sparkling eyes beamed with intelligence. With a fondness for philosophy, she united a love of letters as rare as it was attractive, and in the companionship of scholars and poets her mind expanded as she added to its priceless store of wealth. She was not only familiar with the heroic tales and traditions, with the poetic myths and chronicles, and the religious legends of ancient Chemia, but she was well versed, too, in the literature and science of Phoenicia and Chaldea, of Greece and Rome. Of both the Greek and the Latin tongue she was a complete mistress, and with the swarthy Ethiop and the fierce Bedouai of the desert, with the Jew and the Syrian, the Mede and the Persian, she could converse without an interpreter. Delighting, as she indeed did, in the love songs of Anacreon, she often turned with interest to the dark volumes of papyrus containing the historic fragments of Manetho and Eratosthenes. Much as she admired Homer and Pindar, they were not more her favorites than Euclid or Archimedes, than Anaxagoras or Aristotle, and Apollonius of Perga occupied as high a place in her regard as his namesake the Rhodian. She was skilled also in metallurgy and chemistry, and a proficient in astronomy, and the other sciences cultivated in the age in which she lived. In the lighter accomplishments she was not deficient. She possessed a fine taste, which had been highly cultivated. The female graces for which Miletus was so widely famed beautified and adorned her character. Her skill in music found none to equal it. Her voice itself was perfect melody, and when breathed through the soft tibia, fell upon the listening ear with a magic power and bathed the drooping spirits in delight beyond the bliss of dreams. Touched by her fingers, the cithron seemed instinct with life, and from its strings there rolled a gushing flood of glorious symphonies. She was eloquent and imaginative, witty and animated. Her conversation, therefore, was charming. And if she exhibited caprice, which she sometimes did, it was forgotten in the inimitable grace of her manner. Had she not been fond of pleasure, she would have constituted an exception to the times. Yet she was no Sybarite, but, like Asphasia, or to find her parallel in a later age, like Margaret of Valois, 
she loved to mingle the intellectual with the sensual. There had been a reaction in the social condition of the Egyptian people. The sacerdotal power was diminished. The influence of their strange religion was weakened. The prejudice of caste was not felt to the same extent as formerly. Refinement had taken the place of austerity, and licentiousness that of gloomy formalism. This change commenced with her father's reign, and her character was formed by the circumstances that surrounded her. Her vices were those of the age. Her virtues, few though they may have been, were cherished in spite of it. She was superstitious, but superstition was then religion. She was cruel, but cruelty was the besetting sin of nations and individuals. She was selfish. Why should she not have been selfish, with enemies plotting and conspiring against her at her father's court, and seeking in every way to compass her destruction? She was ambitious, but when were the sons or daughters of kings and princes without ambition? She possessed strong and ardent passions, which she rarely attempted to control, but they were the only feelings she was at liberty to gratify. She was formed to love and be loved in return, but both the law and her religion forbade the indulgence of an honest affection. Such was the youthful queen of Egypt when she ascended the throne of her father, not as sole mistress, but enjoying a divided empire, and coupled, too, with a condition, that of her marriage with her brother, who was still younger than herself, from which she revolted, not from principle, indeed, than for the reason that its fulfillment was abhorrent to her inclinations. A mutual dislike seems to have been early formed between them, and the flame was industriously fanned by the designing counsellors and favorites of young Ptolemy. Not less ambitious than his sister and wife, but her inferior in talents, in accomplishments, and in every attribute necessary to maintain the dignity appropriate to his position, he was but the tool and creature of abler and more designing men. The strong aversion conceived for each other by the royal pair was soon changed to the most rancorous hate. The Egyptian people were by no means favorable to the rule of a female sovereign, and this national prejudice contributed a great deal to strengthen the influence of the king's advisers. While the joint power remained in the hands of Cleopatra, they could do nothing. She was too intelligent to be a dupe, too ambitious to acknowledge a superior, and therefore it became their aim and object to deprive her of her share in the sovereignty. Their plans for the time were successful. Acting under the influence of Votinus, his tutor, of Achilles, the general of his army, and Theodotus, the rhetorician, Ptolemy refused to allow her to participate in the administration of his government. It was not in the nature of Cleopatra to submit to so great an indignity. She claimed her rights, with a boldness and spirit which, among any other people, would have aroused a general and irrepressible feeling of enthusiasm in her favor. But the prejudices of the populace were stimulated and aroused by the artful ministers, and they too joined in the cry against her. Too proud to compromise her dignity by a surrender of her authority, she was nevertheless forced to yield to the tide of popular fury. But the heroic heart that beat in her bosom was unsubdued. Obliged to fly from Egypt, she hastened to Palestine and Syria to collect an army that might enable her to recover the heritage of which she had been deprived. Just at this juncture, the fate of Rome and the world was decided on the plains of Pharsalia. Pompey fled to Egypt, but was treacherously murdered by the cruel Ptolemy and his ministers. The victorious Caesar followed close upon his track, with an army too small for conquest, but having in its leader a host. He was then at the zenith of his power, and brave men trembled when his name was uttered. The murder of his great enemy did not secure his friendship, as the counselors of Ptolemy had anticipated. He treated them with coldness, and demanded the prompt payment of a sum of money due to him from Auletus. Anarchy now reigned in Egypt. Altercations and disputes between the respective adherents of Cleopatra and her brother were of daily occurrence. Assassinations were frequent. Violence usurped the place of justice 
and crime went unpunished. While this state of things existed, Caesar could not expect that his claim would be satisfied, for the turbulent state of the country afforded abundant excuses or pretenses for postponing its consideration or evading it altogether. Accordingly, it was his policy to promote the early restoration of order and quiet, and to that end he proposed, as the representative of the Roman Senate and nation, to hear and determine the dispute between Cleopatra and her brother. In the meantime, the fair refugee had nearly completed her preparations and was about to return to Egypt to maintain her right to the throne by force of arms. Having received the summons of Caesar to appoint some person to plead her cause before him, she determined to obey it, but to be her own advocate. And fearing that the arbiter might be prejudiced against her by Ptolemy and his ministers, she resolved to seek a private interview with him without delay. Lest her approach should be suspected, and means be taken to prevent any communication with the Roman general, she sailed from Syria in a frail skiff, attended but by a single friend, Apollodorus, a Sicilian Greek. Caesar himself had not dared to venture out to sea, on account of the prevalence of the fierce Etesian winds. But nothing daunted her buoyant soul. It was a high stake in peril, her crown and kingdom, everything to her. Each moment was pregnant with danger, and the dark waters of the Mediterranean frowned gloomily upon her. Yet she knew not what it was to fear, for wind and wave seemed but to throb in unison with the wild, fierce passions that sustained her. Arrived off the harbor of Alexandria, she found that it would be impossible to effect a landing in safety, and to avoid the spies and elude the vigilance of Photinus and Achilles except by stratagem. Her woman's wit and cunning now served her well. Having procured some cloths and other fabrics, such as were brought for sale by foreign merchants, she spread them out and laid herself at full length upon them. Following her directions, her faithful attendant Apollodorus wound them about her person and then tied the bundle with a thong in the same manner as packages of goods were secured. Thus hidden from all stranger eyes, she was conveyed in the dusk of evening to the quarters of the Roman commander, her companion sustaining for the nonce the character of a merchant, and bearing the load of beauty on his shoulders as if it were but common merchandise. In answer to all inquiries, he said he bore a present for Caesar. That was true, though not in the sense in which he was understood, but the reply was sufficient, and he pursued his way unmolested through crowds of citizens and soldiers, and passed all the lines of guards, till he reached the presence of the illustrious Roman, and deposited the fair burden at his feet. Then he unloosed the package, and instead of Tyrian purples, of scarves from Sidon glistening with their splendid saffron dyes, or shawls of Babylon enriched with stripes of gold, or sprinkled with woven flowers, there sprang forth, like Venus from the waves of ocean, a woman robed in beauty such as poet never dreamed, nor sculptor's art could fashion. The matchless queen of Egypt stood before him, her disordered apparel but half concealing the matured charms of twenty summers, her unbound tresses floating to her feet, her short-sleeved tunic leaving the white arms uncovered which outshone the armalay of pearls that clasped them, her olive-brown cheek tinged with blushes, and her dark eyes beaming with anxiety and hope. She came, she saw, and conquered. Though always addicted to sensual indulgences, Caesar had now passed his fiftieth year, and the hot blood of youth no longer warmed his veins. Yet passion was not wholly dead within him. He was unprepared for so much loveliness, and it filled him with surprise. Her charming conversation— her sparkling vivacity and wit increased the fascinating influence whose spell was on him, and he yielded, without an effort of resistance, to its power. His Roman wife was forgotten, and in the arms of Cleopatra he promised that her will, in Egypt, should be second to his own. It was nothing strange that the attachment should be reciprocated by the Egyptian queen. 
not strange that, escaping from an incestuous connection, she should indulge an unlawful passion. Not strange that, flying from the imbecile husband provided for her, she should find a refuge in a hero's love. There was much in the character of the Roman statesman and warrior that was calculated to inspire her regard. His person was not displeasing to her, and his renown, his soldierly skill and daring, his intelligence, and his manly independence, all combined to attract her to him. She loved him, no doubt, sincerely, and manifested her affection by an intimacy which, though outraging decency and virtue, was but in keeping with the customs and manners of the time. She could not be his wife, and therefore became his mistress. On the day following this strange interview, Caesar sent for young Ptolemy, and advised him to become reconciled with Cleopatra, to take her as his wife, and share with her the regal power. The suspicions of the young monarch were at once aroused, and when he learned, as he soon did, that his sister was at that moment in the apartments of Caesar, his anger rose beyond control. Rushing from the palace into the open street, he tore the kingly diadem from off his head and trampled it beneath his feet. To the people who crowded around him, he said that he had been betrayed, and called upon them to avenge him. For his dishonor, if he knew it then, he cared but little, as he had before sought to compass the death of Cleopatra. But that she was under the protection and enjoyed the confidence of Caesar seemed ominous of ill. His story excited the sympathy of the populace, and placing himself at their head, he returned to the palace for the purpose of attacking Caesar. But his ungovernable rage only led him into further difficulty. He was seized by the Roman soldiers, and forced to acquiesce in the arrangement which Caesar had indicated. An assembly of the Egyptian people was held, by order of the Roman commander, at which he announced his decision, as guardian and arbiter, that Ptolemy and Cleopatra should reign together jointly in Egypt, according to the will of their father, and that Ptolemy, their younger brother, and Arsinoe, the younger sister, should exercise joint rule in Cyprus, then a Roman possession, but formerly one of the dependencies of Egypt, and now restored by Caesar. In this decree, both Ptolemy and Cleopatra, who were present when it was pronounced, concurred without hesitation, and their example was followed by all the principal dignitaries in the kingdom. But the peace thus concluded was a hollow one. The decision of Caesar was fatal to the ambitious design of Pothinus, and at his instigation Achilles refused to give his assent, and marched with the Egyptian army upon Alexandria. Ptolemy, too, only waited for an opportunity to manifest his disinclination to abide by an arrangement which had been forced upon him. While in the capital he was but the mere prisoner of Caesar, and he desired to be released from the unwelcome surveillance. Professing the sincerest attachment to the Roman general, he deceived him so far that he was permitted to go to the Egyptian camp, in order, as he said, to prevail upon his friends to submit to the decree. Once there, he threw off all disguise and prepared for hostilities. End of Section 2 Section 3 of The Heroines of History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine H. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Section 3. Cleopatra, Part 2. The Alexandrian War now succeeded. Various fortune attended the movements and operations of the rival parties. At one time, the little Roman army seemed doomed to be overwhelmed by the superior force of the Egyptians. But the good genius of Caesar did not desert him. He manfully supported the cause of Cleopatra, which he had espoused, and by repeated exposures of his own person to danger and peril for her sake, awakened in her bosom still more powerful feelings of affection and regard. 
At length, being seconded by the Roman troops from Syria and Cilicia, Caesar prosecuted the war with his accustomed vigor, and it finally ended in the complete overthrow and death of Ptolemy and the general recognition of the authority of Cleopatra. During the series of contests that took place in the vicinity of Alexandria, a large portion of the city was destroyed by fire, including its chiefest ornament, the noble library founded by the Ptolemies. At one time all seemed lost, but through the gathering gloom the star of Caesar shone with a luster as of old. Midst the ashes and ruins of the capital, his banners floated proudly in triumph or in defiance. From street to street the enemy were driven by his victorious arms until the beleaguered city was relieved. Indifferent to peril, he shared every risk, and each day the heart of Cleopatra warmed toward him as she beheld him fearlessly encountering danger for her sake. Before, she had but loved him. Now, gratitude turned her love into devotion. The war being ended, Cleopatra was proclaimed anew the Queen of Egypt, and in order to gratify the disaffected partisans of Ptolemy, and to allay the prejudices of the people, Caesar decreed that she should marry her younger brother, and that he should be associated with her in the government. This marriage, however, was one of mere form, as the younger Ptolemy was then but eleven years of age, and Cleopatra continued to share the counsels and the bed of Caesar. Having thus put down all opposition and restored peace and tranquility to the kingdom, Caesar and Cleopatra made a royal progress through the valley of the Nile, accompanied by his Roman guards, by a large retinue of friends, and by troops of servants and attendants. Slowly and leisurely they ascended the great river, whose banks were yellow with the ripening harvest, in barges with poops of burnished gold, the oars inlaid with silver, keeping time with the measured tones of sweetest music, and the carved prows cleaving the waters softly, like mermaids in their merry sports. Reclining beneath silken awnings spangled with stars and flowers, upon carpets that yielded to the slightest pressure, and in whose woof the velvet foliage of the amaranth was blended with eastern roses and the azure flowers of the sacred lotus, the Egyptian queen and her noble lover passed the day in slumber, lulled by the mellow strains of barbiton and pipe, and fanned by the scented gales of Araby the Blessed. At the fall of even the tents were pitched upon the shore, and summoned, as it were, by magic, Long files of slaves came forth, bearing the vessels of gold and silver for the feast. The board was spread with fish and sesame, with soup of alika, with olives, cakes, and sweetmeats, and the luscious fruits of Yemen. Wines made from the palm and grape, cooled in the vases of Koptos, or sparkled in the golden craters wrought by Argive artists with exquisite skill and lamps of perfumed oil and censers filled with burning incense scattered their rich odors through the groves of date palms and acacias. The night was spent in merriment and feasting, and when the morrow came it but renewed the scenes of yesterday. In revelry like this, in love's soft dalliance, the winged hours flew swiftly by. Though his presence was no longer needed, Caesar still lingered at the Alexandrian court. Cleopatra became the mother of a son, named, after his father, Caesarian. Thus there was another tie between them, and it was difficult to separate. At last the revolt of Pharnassus obliged him to break loose from the sweet thraldom which had detained him, and hastening forthwith to Syria, he defeated the rebel prince and drove him out of the kingdom of Pontus. Meanwhile his enemies at home not without cause, had brought discredit on his name, and even his warmest and most faithful friends did not withhold their censures, for that he had not resisted the blandishments of the Egyptian Circe. Leaving a sufficient number of his troops with Cleopatra to enable her to suppress any outbreak that might occur, he now returned to Rome, taking with him her sister, the young Arsinoe, 
who had fallen into his hands as a prisoner on the defeat of Ptolemy, to grace the triumph decreed him by the Roman Senate. From this time, and until the death of Caesar, the reign of Cleopatra was not disturbed by foreign war or internal commotions. Her power was firmly established, and no one disputed her authority. During the minority of her brother, she administered the government alone, with a skill and ability not unworthy of the race from which she sprung. Though too much devoted to pleasure and gaiety, she was not without ambition. She conciliated the favor of her subjects by her attention to their interests, by the encouragement of commerce and the arts, and by the restoration of the capital to its former splendor. Under the powerful protection of the first man in Rome, none dared to molest her. Kings and princes courted her alliance and stood in awe of her name. It was, perhaps, a frail tenure, the will of Caesar, by which she held the scepter, but it was also the sole alternative of absolute submission to the Roman rule. Egypt was already doomed. Nature had made her the granary of the world, and she was far too valuable a prize to be either overlooked or forgotten. It had been the original intention of Caesar to bring Cleopatra to Rome and there to marry her. For that purpose, he had solicited a friend to propose a law to the people, allowing a Roman citizen to marry as many wives as he thought fit. His friend acceded to the request, but nothing had been done when he returned to Rome. Opposition to his project being anticipated, no further steps were taken, though he continued as deeply enamored with her as ever, and many tender messages were wont to pass between them. Had he lived and attained the imperial power, it is not improbable that she would have become his wife, and certainly in one respect, as the two most conspicuous personages in the world, they would have been fitly mated. She, the bride of Caesar, Caesar, emperor of Rome. What might have been the fate of both? What the destiny of the Niobe of nations? Events now followed each other in rapid succession. Cleopatra did not soon forget her love for Caesar. She visited him at Rome, became an inmate of his palace, and usurped the place which his wife should have occupied. But her hopes of an alliance with him, in which he probably shared, were suddenly frustrated by his assassination. The Roman people did not regard her with favor, and she returned forthwith to Egypt. Disappointed in the darling object of her heart, she resolved to reign alone, and was not disposed to share her throne with a husband forced upon her acceptance. When her younger brother, therefore, having reached the age of fourteen years, claimed his share of the regal power, she removed him by poison, and was thenceforth sole mistress of the realm. Her court, like that of her father, was distinguished alike for its refinement and its voluptuousness. She was the patron both of learning and of love. The fame of her wit and beauty were noised abroad, and Alexandria became a favorite resort of travelers. To all she gave a cordial welcome, whether philosophers and men of letters, or gay gallants in quest of pleasure. It would seem that Cleopatra hesitated at first whether to ally herself with the triumvirate or with the party of Brutus and Cassius. Her sympathies were unquestionably with the friends of Caesar, but while it remained in doubt which was the stronger faction, the safety of her kingdom and herself appeared to require that she should not give offense to either. Her hesitation, however, was not of long continuance, foreseeing the ultimate triumph of the powerful party headed by Antony, Lepidus, and Octavius Caesar, she refused her aid to Cassius, which he had earnestly solicited, and shortly after sailed with a numerous fleet to join the forces of the triumvirate. In consequence of a violent storm, in which many of her ships were destroyed or disabled, she was obliged to return to Egypt, where she remained till the question was decided by the utter discomfiture and overthrow of the Republican faction in the Battle of Philippi. After the defeat of Brutus and Cassius, and the firm establishment in Greece of the authority of his colleagues and himself, 
Mark Antony crossed over into Asia to secure and strengthen their interests in that quarter of the world. The prestige of his name was all-powerful. His progress was one continued triumph, not such as best became a conqueror, but dishonored by the most shameful debauchery and excess. Kings bent before him in humble obeisance and laid their hoarded treasures at his feet. Queens, rejoicing in youth and beauty, sought his presence eagerly and yielded every favor that he asked. Never was the gross sensualism of his character more glaringly exhibited. The wealth of Croesus filled his coffers, but it was needed to furnish new pleasures for his jaded appetite. Syncophants and flatterers shared his gold, and partook with him in every vice and folly. Dancers and buffoons were his companions and attendants, the creatures of his bounty, and the ministers to his passions. Rumors of the sports and revelry, the rioting and feasting in which he delighted, went before him. Cities sent forth their entire population to greet his coming. His followers called him Bacchus, a name that pleased him and men and boys disguised as pans and satyrs, and women dressed as bacchanals in loose Asiatic robes, with vine wreaths about their heads and fawn skins on their shoulders, ran before him, swinging their thyrsi crowned with acanthus leaves and the foliage and berries of the ivy, beating their drums and cymbals and shouting, Eo bacche! Eo bacche! This was Antony, brave but effeminate, talented and eloquent, but coarse by nature, generous in disposition, but often cruel and unforgiving, sometimes abandoned, as it seemed, to the very lowest vices, and then, breaking loose from his degradation, exhibiting his character radiant with its old light. This was the Antony who, history tells us, was ruined by the arts of Cleopatra, as if he were an unwilling victim, and she were wrong, judged by the standard of her time, in adopting the only means that could save her country from impending ruin. Antony had cast a longing eye on Egypt, and he wanted but a pretext, whether reasonable or unreasonable, to occupy it with his troops, abolish its government and laws, and seat a Roman governor on the throne of Cleopatra. He had been informed that the governor of Phoenicia, then an Egyptian province, had aided Cassius, and he now summoned her before him to answer for the conduct of her subordinate. His lieutenant, Delius, was charged with his commands to her to meet him at Tarsus, the capital of Cilicia. To disobey this summons was to incur the displeasure of Antony, with Lepidus and Octavius, joint ruler of the world, and to arm the whole power of Rome against her feeble kingdom. She determined, therefore, to comply but that it might seem like condescension, rather than enforced submission, she did not hasten the preparations for her journey. From Delius she learned the weak points of Antony. She knew his character and felt assured that he would prove an easy conquest. He was fond of money, not so much for its own sake as for the pleasures and amusements it could purchase. So, from her affluence, she provided herself with the richest presents and an ample store of gold and silver. He was vain and relished display and pomp. So she caused a barge to be built whose magnificence had never yet been equaled, and its accompaniments and her own habits and ornaments were suited to her dignity and wealth and in keeping with the show and splendor with which she intended to dazzle the eyes of all beholders and to charm and captivate the Roman general. But more than all, he was the courteous Antony, whom ne'er the word of no woman heard speak. And so she brought herself. And Cleopatra was not now the young and inexperienced girl who gave her love to Caesar. She was in her twenty-sixth year, and every charm was perfected, every grace was finished. With both mind and person fully developed, winning in her address, fascinating in conversation, possessing a vivacity in whose presence melancholy was changed to mirthfulness, and skilled in every art of wantonness and coquetry, she was peerless and irresistible. None knew it better than herself, none felt it more than Antony. 
Though she received many pressing letters from Antony and his friends, urging her to expedite her movements, she affected to treat them with disdain, and lingered long at every place she visited upon the way. No thought of haste appeared to animate her, but she traveled slowly, as if intent on pleasure, or delighting to provoke the impatience of those who waited for her arrival. At last her fleet was moored within the entrance of the Silver Sidness, and then, in the splendid galley brought across the sea, followed by a long line of smaller barges, she ascended the river to Tarsus. It was a glorious pageant. The richest carvings adorned her barge, which fairly blazed with gold and splendor. Its sails of brightest purple swelled gracefully with the soft south wind that strained its silken cordage. Its oars, both blade and handle, tipped and bound with silver, moved in harmony with the voluptuous music of the flute, the pipe, and cithern. Above it floated the mystic ensign of the Egyptian monarchs, and from the burning censers on its prow, clouds of odorous perfume were wafted to the shore. Upon its deck was raised a lofty canopy of cloth of gold, beneath which, on a cushioned couch, with ivory and tortoise shell inlaid, reclined the dark-eyed queen of Egypt. She was robed like Venus, in a purple mantle, glittering with diamonds, and its border ornamented with threads of gold and silver intertwined. Roses and myrtles were wreathed about her brows. Her ears were pierced with rings of oricalcum. A necklace of precious stones encircled her swan-like throat. The golden cestus clasped her waist, and golden sandals encased her tiny feet. Beautiful boys, disguised as cupids, stood beside her and fanned her with their wings. Damsels, among the fairest at her court, whose houred beauty could not be surpassed, were habited as nereids and graces, in loose, transparent robes, and waited to do her bidding, or managed the helm and sails with great dexterity and skill. The tackling silk, the streamers waved with gold, the gentle winds were lodged in purple sails. Her nymphs, like nereids, round her couch were placed, where she, another sea-born Venus, lay. She lay and leaned her cheek upon her hand, and cast a look so languishingly sweet, as if, secure of all beholders' hearts, neglecting she could take them. Boys like cupids stood fanning with their painted wings the winds that played about her face. But if she smiled, a darting glory seemed to blaze abroad that man's desiring eyes were never wearied, but hung upon the object. To soft flutes the silver oars kept time, and while they played, the hearing gave new pleasures to the sight, and both to thought. T'was heaven or somewhat more, for she so charmed all hearts that gazing crowds stood panting on the shore and wanted breath to give their welcome voice. Dryden's All for Love, Act Three. The shore was lined with people who watched the barge laden with so much beauty with straining eyes. As it moved along, the cry was raised that Venus had come to feast with Bacchus. From mouth to mouth it passed until it reached the marketplace in Tarsus. All hastened forth to witness her approach, all save Antony, who, deserted by suitors and attendants, remained alone on the tribunal where he was seated. Immediately upon her landing, he sent an officer to her with his greeting, coupled with the request that she should come and sup with him. "'Go, tell your master,' was her reply, "'that it is more fitting that he should come and sup with me.' This assumption of social superiority put an end at once to all the dignity which Antony proposed to assume. He accepted the invitation of Cleopatra, and thus— at the very outset, exhibited a deference toward her by which she did not fail to profit. For luxurious magnificence and costly and profuse extravagance, the entertainment provided by Cleopatra had never yet been equaled. Her tents and pavilions, hung with cloth of gold or silken tapestry from the looms of Tyre and Sidon, were pitched beside the sparkling water of the Sidness, 
in a noble grove of spreading plane trees and stately laurels. Lamps of bronze and gold, suspended by gilt chains or supported by lofty candelabra, arranged in squares and circles, and raised or depressed at pleasure, shed their perfumed light around. Blazing censers filled with choicest spices loaded the air with fragrance. There were long rows of marble tables and silver tripods, covered with tureens and urns and vases of gold and silver, fashioned with elegance and taste. Large silver lances or chargers, splendidly embossed, contained the juicy meats, the fish, the hares, the pheasants. The bread and fruited cake were brought in silver baskets. Bronze dishes, with ornaments inlaid, were filled with eggs and rows of fishes, with oysters from the Hellespont, with fresh and pickled olives, with frumenty and radishes, with dried dates and raisins, mulberries newly gathered, and almonds and confections. Banqueting cups of most exquisite workmanship were wreathed with garlands and poured brimming full with the rich juice of Chios or the produce of the Egyptian soil. Not the mild wines of Thebes and Coptos, but the light, fragrant Mariodicum and the oily and aromatic Teniodicum. Upon the ornamented seats and couches reclined the guests, with chaplets of violets and roses, myrtle, ivy, and philera bound about their temples. Their ears were charmed with the soft strains of music, and buffoons amused them with their droll tricks and pleasantries. Attending servants cooled them with fans of peacock feathers, while they listened to the mythological love stories which the pantomimes related, or watched the dancing girls, who, clad in the gossamer robes of Koa, with golden bangles upon their feet, and emerald brooches upon their arms and shoulders, moved with airy steps before them. The sparkling eyes and flashing ornaments, the white arms and the raven hair, the braids and bracelets, swan-like bosoms, the thin robes floating like light. High above them all was Cleopatra, and Antony reclining near her. Upon her head the diadem of Egypt, with the asp, the symbol of divinity upon it, flashed with rarest gems. Her tunic glittered with all the colors of the east and was overspread with rich embroidery. A Babylonian shawl of finest tissue was thrown around her shoulders, and at her side there gleamed a Persian dagger whose hilt was pearls and diamonds. Cushions of crimson damask rose invitingly about her swelling limbs. Her full lips parted but to utter honeyed words. The glow of satisfaction was on her cheek, and in her eye the light of triumph. Joy and merriment everywhere prevailed. The guests pledged each other in wine cups brimming full. Honey and spices were brought and mingled in the wine, and with the fragrant compound they drank the health of Cleopatra. The Roman guards without the tent were also served with sumptuous fare, and instead of Pascha, filled their rytons with the barley wine of Egypt. End of Section 3 Section 4 of The Heroines of History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine H. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins Section 4 Cleopatra, Part 3 Anthony was in raptures with everything he saw and heard. His expectations were far exceeded. His wildest imaginings had not dwelt upon such splendor and magnificence. The following day he returned the compliment, but his entertainment was so mean compared with hers that he was obliged to acknowledge himself outdone. He had boasted that Cleopatra should pay him tribute or resign her kingdom, but now he yielded all to her, and even caused her sister, Arsinoe, who had taken refuge in Diana's temple at Miletus, to be put to death, at her request, that there should be no rival to contest her throne. 
she encouraged all his follies, humored every caprice, and laughed at every whim. His coarseness she returned with interest and with infinite wit and grace. He sought her love with warmest protestations, but she yielded with coy submission. Nay, swear that you love me, she said. Swear by the holy Osiris. I swear, he said. Thenceforth she called herself the wife of Antony, though no rite nor ceremony had sanctioned their illicit love. Day after day was given to feasting, each entertainment surpassing in elegance that which preceded it. Antony was astonished at the wealth so lavishly displayed by Cleopatra. She only sneered at what she called his parsimony. At a banquet given by her, he expressed his wonder at the great number of golden cups, enriched with jewels and beautifully wrought, that adorned the tables. She said they were but trifles, and gave them to him. The next day she provided a still more costly entertainment. Antony, as was his custom, brought with him all his officers of rank, and when the feast was ended, she bestowed on each guest the vessels of gold and silver he had used. At another of her banquets, she wore in her earrings two pearls of immense value, and having made a wager with Antony that she could spend more than ten thousand sestertia upon a single entertainment, the value of the different dishes was estimated, but falling short of that sum, she declared that she could lay out so much upon herself, and calling for a cup of vinegar, dissolved in it one of the pearls, and then drank off the costly draught. She was about to do the same with the other pearl, but the umpire stopped her, and decided the wager in her favor. Forgetful alike of public duties and private ties and obligations, Antony lingered away the time at Tarsus in revelry and dalliance. Affairs in Syria demanded his attention, in consequence of the warlike demonstrations of Parthia, yet they were neglected. At Rome, his individual interests were suffering by reason of his continued absence, but his spirited and ambitious wife, Fulvia, in vain besought him to hasten his return. A spell was thrown around him which he had not the desire, if he possessed the power, to break. The tighter his chains were drawn, the closer he hugged them, the more he loved the beautiful tyrant whose willing slave he was. From Tarsus, Antony and Cleopatra proceeded to Tyre, at which place she was to embark for Alexandria. Here he designed to separate from her, in order to lead the Roman army against the Parthian forces, then preparing to enter Syria. But this was not her intention. She had lost Caesar, as she thought, mainly through her own neglect to render her influence over him secure. It was her ambition now to become the acknowledged wife of Antony. His prospects were as fair, if not prematurely blighted, as those of the younger Caesar, whose superior he was in age, in experience, and perhaps in popularity. As his wife, then, she would not only remain the queen of Egypt, but she might be empress of Rome and of the world. To suffer him to leave her, therefore, till the fulfillment of these hopes, which, once buried in the grave of Caesar, had now revived again, would be to ruin them for ever. Her arts and blandishments proved irresistible. Home, country, duty and ambition, all were forgotten by Antony. Instead of leading his soldiers to new victories and planting the Roman eagles in triumph on the banks of the Euphrates, he accompanied Cleopatra to Alexandria. In the Egyptian capital, the scenes at Tarsus were renewed. He gave himself up to all the wild, fierce passions of his nature, and reveled in debauchery and excess. She did not once make the attempt to restrain him, but gave encouragement to every folly, and rejoiced whenever she was able to provide some new pleasure for his entertainment. This was the secret of her power, and she did not hesitate to use it. She was with him day and night. They gamed and feasted and drank together. They fished and hunted in each other's company, 
and she attended him when he reviewed his troops. Disguised as slaves, they rambled through the city in the dusk of evening, making themselves merry with the faults and frailties of the inhabitants, jesting rudely with those they met, and playing tricks upon them, and often becoming involved in serious brawls and difficulties. They called their mode of life inimitable, and it was so, for it was characterized by unrestrained indulgence and extravagance unbounded. But, while she thus encouraged and ministered to his vices, she neglected no opportunity to impress him, and those who were about them, with the notion that she possessed superior tact and sagacity. She treated his opinions with levity, and exacted a large share of deference for her own. Even their amusements furnished occasions for triumph over him, which she failed not to improve. One day, when they were fishing, he was deeply chagrined at his ill success, and ordered one of the fishermen to dive under the water secretly, and fasten some of the larger fishes that had been taken upon his hook, so that the raillery of the queen might not be provoked. She discovered the trick at once, but affected not to perceive it, and on the following day invited a still more numerous company to witness similar sport. But she privately instructed an experienced diver in her service to procure a salted fish from the market, and when a favorable opportunity offered, to attach it to Antony's hook. This was done, and he drew up the fish amid the laughter and merriment of the whole party. "'Go, General,' she exclaimed, "'leave fishing to us, petty princes of Pharos and Canopus. Your game is cities, kingdoms, and provinces.' At length Antony was aroused from his folly and inaction by the intelligence that the Parthian army had been repeatedly victorious in Syria, and that his presence was absolutely necessary to prevent fresh disasters. The news from Rome, too, was far from pleasing to him. His wife and brother, more watchful of his interests than himself, had raised an army to check the ambitious designs of Octavius, but they had been overpowered and were forced to flee from Italy. He proceeded to Phoenicia, however, but the letters of Fulvia finally induced him to turn his course toward Rome. She died at Sician, on her way to meet him, and he was afterward reconciled to young Caesar and married his sister Octavia. Her gentle virtues did not fail to win upon his better nature, but the marriage had been based upon political considerations solely, and he soon began to tire of the restraints it imposed. Memory often dwelt upon the fascinating charms of the fair Egyptian, and he longed to return to her again, but durst not hazard a rupture with his brother-in-law and co-triumvir. Years passed by. The world had been divided between the triumvirs, and Antony had received for his portion the countries lying east of the Ionian Sea. Important matters of state, and the active duties of his life, diverted his mind from Cleopatra, yet she was not forgotten. The condition of affairs in Syria once more demanded his attention, and, leaving Octavia behind him at Rome, he revisited the scenes around which clustered so many pleasant but guilty recollections. There Cleopatra joined him again, upon his earnest solicitation, though she did not attempt to conceal her anger because he had deserted her and married Octavia. She was still ambitious, and still claimed the name and station of his wife. She loved him also, it may be, and was jealous of her Roman rival. To appease her, therefore, he gave her the provinces of Phoenicia, the lower Syria, the Isle of Cyprus, and a great part of Cilicia, with the balm-producing portion of Judea and a large and fertile tract of Arabia. Upon the twin children, Alexander and Cleopatra, which she had borne him, he bestowed the surnames of the sun and moon. After spending several months with him, Cleopatra returned to Egypt, and he proceeded against the Parthians with a powerful and well-appointed army. But the unwise delay was fatal to the expedition, which was wholly unsuccessful. And when he returned to Phoenicia, 
It was with the mere remnant of the proud array he had led across the sandy plains of Syria. The timely arrival of Cleopatra at Sidon, where he awaited her, with supplies of clothing and provisions, alone saved his army from utter destruction. Henceforth, the wiles of the charming queen were far more powerful with Antony than all other influences combined. Now that he was restored to her, she resolved not to lose sight of him again. Separated from him, she was but the sovereign of a petty kingdom. With him, a ruler of the world, she was not only the companion of his pleasures, but she governed and controlled him. Accordingly, all her arts were employed to retain him near her, and they were not employed in vain. Octavia came as far as Athens to meet her lord and husband, but he sent her back to Rome with bitter words. This was Cleopatra's triumph, but she rued it bitterly in the hour of her humiliation. She saved Egypt from the Romans' grasp, but sacrificed herself. Antony became her veriest slave. For her sake he heaped indignities upon his lawful wife, and added to them the last and foulest one of all, repudiation. She conquered but unmanned him. The pride and daring of the soldier were not, indeed, altogether subdued in the effeminacy of the lover and the weakness of the debauchee. After spending another winter at the Egyptian capital, wearied and sated with pleasures, he took the field again the following spring. Armenia was conquered, and its captive monarch dragged through Alexandria, where he celebrated his triumph, at his chariot wheels, laden with chains of gold, and thus presented to the lovely siren who was the victor's victor. Again the banquet and the feast filled up the time, and sport and revelry and dalliance made Antony the wreck of what he was. But his return to Rome was thus prevented, and it was that she ardently desired. Her charms were fading now. In a few years their influence would be no longer felt, and it would seem that she hoped to retain her power by ministering to his coarser passions and desires. Once more he prepared to lead his soldiers against the Parthian. Cleopatra had promised to accompany him to the Euphrates, and she had pictured to herself bright scenes of future glory and conquest. But before they set out upon the expedition, the ceremony of the coronation of herself and children was performed. In the palace court, a throne of solid gold, with steps of silver, was ordered to be placed. Seated upon this, and clad in a robe of gorgeous purple, embroidered with gold and fastened with diamonds, was Antony himself, with a golden scepter in his hand, at his side a Persian scimitar, and on his head the diadem of the Persian kings. On his right hand was Cleopatra, in the robes of Isis made of costly asbeston, the lotus twined about the diadem upon her head, and in her hand the rattling sistrum. Beneath them sat Caesarion, the son of Julius Caesar, and Alexander and Ptolemy, the sons of Antony and Cleopatra. At Antony's command, the heralds proclaimed Cleopatra queen of Egypt, Cyprus, Libya, and lower Syria, and named her son Caesarion as her colleague. The other princes were then proclaimed kings of kings, and the kingdoms and provinces of the east were divided between them. Thus ended the pageant, and it was all but empty show. Cleopatra accompanied Antony in his expedition, for they were now inseparable. They proceeded as far as the Arasis, but alarming news from Rome recalled them. They then directed their course to Greece, at Ephesus, at Samos, and at Athens, spending weeks and months in revelry and feasting, which, profitably employed, would have made them masters of Rome, and thus realized the glorious dreams of her proud ambition. Never was woman so self-deceived. She anticipated an easy victory over the stripling Caesar when Antony declared war against him. Her jealous pride rose high with the thought that Octavia would be humbled, that Antony would be the world's great master, and she its mistress. The delusion was not a strange one, and from it she never woke, till, 
from her galley's deck at Actium, she saw that all was lost. Had Antony pushed on to Rome, he could scarcely have failed of victory. It was not his wish that Cleopatra should remain with him, but, fearing, with very good reason, that a reconciliation would take place between Octavius and Antony if she returned to Egypt, she bribed one of the counselors of the latter, in whom he placed great confidence, to advise that she should continue at his side. Antony lingered away most precious time, and when at last he ventured to risk an engagement, he listened to the advice of Cleopatra, instead of following his own better judgment, and offered battle at sea. The hostile fleets encountered each other before the promontory of Actium. Foreseeing certain defeat, on account of the imbecility and want of skill displayed by Antony, Cleopatra determined to secure her own personal safety, and left the scene of the engagement with her fifty galleys. Antony might still have made a noble stand, but his courageous spirit seemed to have forsaken him. He gave up everything, without a struggle worthy of his name and character, and followed the flying Cleopatra. Having been received into her galley, they hastened with all speed to Alexandria, not to make a noble stand in defense of what was left to them, but to forget their folly in the wildest excesses, or in the intervals of dissipation, to load each other with reproaches. It is as two jealous lovers, not bound together by the sacred tendrils of an honest affection, but united by an unholy passion, that Antony and Cleopatra are from this time to be regarded. They loved and hated one another by turns. They doubted and deceived each other. One day she spent in feasting with him as in former days, and on the next refused to see him. She feared, as had been the case before so often, that Antony would make his peace with Caesar, and so she resolved to provide for her own security by secretly dispatching friendly messages to the conqueror. Upon the arrival of Octavius with his army before the walls of Alexandria, the warrior heart of Antony aroused itself once more. He made a gallant sally and drove back the advancing legions. But the advantage he received was but temporary. And on the following day, the fleet of Cleopatra was surrendered by her command to Caesar. Antony sought the queen forthwith to charge her with her treachery. But she had now immured herself, with all her most valuable treasures, in a lofty tomb which she had caused to be erected beside the temple of Isis. In reply to the inquiries of Antony, from whose ungovernable rage the worst consequences were feared in case they saw each other then, it was told him that she had killed herself. His love for her at once returned, and shutting himself up in his apartment, he fell upon his sword. At this moment an officer came to inform him that Cleopatra was still alive, and at his request he was carried to the tomb, and there he died, folded in her arms, those arms whose fascinating embraces had brought him to this strait. By stratagem the officers of Octavius obtained admission into the tomb, whereupon she attempted to stab herself with a dagger, but her design was frustrated by their interference. Octavius himself now came to see her. She appeared before him clothed in a simple under-tunic, thinking, perhaps, the charms displayed so freely might move him, but he did not deign to notice them. The deadly sorrow charactered in her face had robbed her of her former beauty. She then urged him with tears to spare her children and herself and leave them undisturbed in Egypt. He promised fairly, but she doubted him, and she determined to die by her own hand rather than be led in triumph like the humblest slave before the car of the Roman conqueror. This degradation she had always feared. Her high soul revolted at the prospect which she saw before her and sooner than be young Caesar's captive, she resolved to perish nobly, although unqueened, yet like a queen. With the effect of different poisons she had made herself perfectly familiar, and either by this means, or, as was commonly believed, 
by the bite of an asp secretly introduced into the tomb, her life was ended. Such was the fate of Cleopatra. Faults and vices she exhibited which, revolting as they were, need not be excused in her, for they were characteristic of her age. Though her virtues were mental only, they deserve to be remembered. It should not be forgotten also that history, all partial to the Roman as it is, has scarcely done her justice. She loved Caesar, and to her it seemed not guilty. She was ambitious, too, not only desiring to save her throne and kingdom, but to reign in Rome. In her intercourse with Antony, she was prompted not by sensual motives only, but chiefly by policy and ambition. She was indeed mistaken as to the effect of the means and arts which she employed to win him to her. Judged by the times in which she lived, this was her error. End of Section 4 Section 5 of The Heroines of History this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine H. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Section 5. Isabella of Castile. She had all the royal makings of a queen. Shakespeare. Isabella of Spain, the Catholic, as she was called, stands before the world as a model of queenly and womanly excellence. In her, the energy of manhood, the wisdom of the statesman, the devout rectitude of a saint, and the tenderness and grace of woman, were more perfectly combined than in any female sovereign whose name adorns the pages of history. Far as the East is from the West, and distant as their several periods, is the character of this renowned Castilian from that of the passionate and cunning Cleopatra. The beautiful conscientiousness of the former, her firm adherence to conviction, her delicacy and mercy and sweet humility, are a proof of the moral superiority resulting from the prevalence of truth, however perverted or obscure it be, in the place of utter delusion, whatever of classic attraction it may have. Oblivion has veiled her faults, if any belong to her intrinsic being. She is left perfect to the eye of posterity, except it be in her almost inevitable failure to assert at all times her own manifest and better instincts over those influences in her life and time which go far to excuse the few blamable acts that may be charged upon her. And such a picture of character, fair as her own lovely countenance, is framed in the most picturesque era of modern history. The scenery and romantic associations of Spain, the conquest of the splendid Moorish kingdom of Granada, the gorgeous evening of the day of chivalry, and the morning of great discoveries heralded by Columbus, were the fit setting for the jewel of queens, or rather an appropriate scene for the display of her noble qualities. The disappointments she endured in the latter part of her life the cruelties of which she was the unwitting or unwilling a better, the bigotry that took advantage of her piety, and the despotism established by her husband, the artful Ferdinand, are the clouds that darken the narrative of a reign else bright and beautiful. Spain was originally divided into four kingdoms, Castile, Aragon, Navarre, and the Moorish possessions, the latter comprising the most luxuriant districts and the most important strongholds upon the coast. Castile and Aragon were nearly alike, both governments being monarchical, yet in spirit republican. The king had little power, separate from the assembly or parliament, consisting of the grandees, nobles of the second class, representatives of towns and cities, and deputies of the clergy. This was evident in the oath of allegiance, taken in this form. We, who are each of us as good as you, and altogether more powerful than you, promise obedience to your government, if you maintain our rights and liberties, but not otherwise. Many of the nobles were, in fact, petty kings, owning vast and populous territories, which yielded them richer revenues and larger armies than the monarch himself could command. 
The continual jealousies and feuds existing among them kept the kingdom in constant turmoil, and thus originated the confusion, revolts, and successive tragedies that darkened the chronicles of Castile and Aragon previous to the succession of Ferdinand and Isabella. While John the Second occupied the Castilian throne, his subjects laid aside for a time the ferocious and warlike spirit that had previously marked the national character. and imitated the refined taste of their sovereign, whose love of letters and utter disinclination for business induced him to neglect even the most important affairs of the kingdom, leaving all in the hands of favorites, and often signing documents at their option, without taking the trouble to examine the contents. The nobles finally became disgusted with their poetizing king, and jealous of the arrogant favorites, who, raised from an humble origin, assumed the dignity and magnificence of royalty, and presumed to direct the affairs of the kingdom. A revolt ensued, and Henry, the young son of the king, was placed at the head of the disaffected party. This storm was quelled at the accession of a new queen, a woman of strong and resolute character, who obtained such ascendancy over the ease-loving monarch as to cause the downfall and final execution of of the principal and most obnoxious favorite, Alvaro de Luna. John's regret for this step induced a melancholy that aggravated the disease which terminated his life soon after. He left, by his first wife, one child, Henry, whom he appointed his successor and guardian of the two younger children by his second wife, Alfonso, then an infant, and Isabella, afterwards Queen of Castile. who was born April 22, 1451, at Madrigal. She was but four years old at the time of her father's death, and was soon after removed, with her mother, to the little town of Aravello. Henry IV was welcomed to the throne amidst unfeigned expressions of joy from a people wearied with the long and glorious reign of his father. They hoped for a vigorous government, and the prosecution of the war against the Moors, which for years had been in contemplation. It required but a short time, however, to unfold the worthless character of the new king, who, without a corresponding taste for intellectual pursuits, inherited all his father's aversion to business. At once indolent, profligate, and imbecile, he gathered about him courtiers who, like himself, sought only frivolous or debasing amusements, till, without shame, they indulged in open vice, boldly boasting of their exploits. The low state of morals was not improved after the arrival of Joanna of Portugal, whom Henry espoused, having repudiated his first wife, Blanche of Aragon, after a union of twelve years. The new queen was accompanied by a brilliant suite, and her arrival was signalized by the festivities and pageant due to royalty in those days of chivalry. Being young, beautiful, and vivacious, she fascinated the Castilians, and by her wit and raillery overcame the punctilious etiquette observed at court. Her freedom of manner soon gave rise to gross suspicions. Beltran de la Cueva, one of the handsomest and most accomplished cavaliers of his time, was designated her favorite, and notwithstanding her undisguised preference, the king, so far from resenting it, continued to heap favors upon the man, who previously had gained such ascendancy over him as to guide the affairs of the kingdom to suit his own views and interests. To this polluted, licentious court, Isabella, in her sixteenth year, and her brother Alfonso, were brought after the birth of the ill-fated Princess Joanna. This was a matter of policy, as the king required the oath of allegiance to the infant Joanna as his successor, without regarding her supposed illegitimacy, and fearing the dissatisfied nobles would form a separate faction in favor of Isabella, he required her presence at the royal palace. All her early life had been spent in seclusion with her mother, who faithfully instructed her in those lessons of virtue and piety which shone out so vividly in after years. Her education received a finish seldom attained in that age. Her tastes were refined and elevated, her nature gentle and placid, and with these womanly qualities she united a maturity of judgment, energy, and firmness 
that fully fitted her for the commanding position she was soon to take. Her beauty, gentleness, and grace ensured her a warm welcome at court, but the satellites that invariably hastened to flutter about a new star and bask in its rays were soon overawed in her presence. The blameless purity of her conduct, her sincere, unostentatious piety, and natural dignity of demeanor repelled familiarity, while it won the truest affection and homage of those who surrounded her. She was one whose influence roused all the pure, noble, and true aspirations of the soul, and as such she stood alone in the royal family, and far above the contamination of its giddy train of followers. Being nearly related to the crown, her hand was sought from childhood by numerous applicants. While too young to have a voice in the decision, she was solicited for the same Ferdinand to whom she was destined to be finally united, and afterwards promised to his brother, Carlos, whose tragical end defeated the purpose. In her thirteenth year, Henry affianced her to Alfonso, king of Portugal. But after an interview with that monarch, neither entreaties nor threats could gain her consent to a union every way disagreeable to her. Knowing her refusal would avail her little, she replied with a discretion, rare at so early an age, that the Infantis of Castile could not be disposed of without the consent of the nobles of the realm. The chagrined monarch was obliged to withdraw his suit, and Isabella still continued free. Though Henry had not succeeded in disposing of her, he felt secure in having her under his surveillance, and in order to divert his discontented subjects, he announced a crusade against the Moors. He assumed the device of Granada, a pomegranate branch, in token of his intention to enroll it among his own provinces. And he assembled the chivalry of the nation, and with a splendid army set out for the Moorish dominions. This grand expedition ended only in an empty display beneath the walls of Granada, which were lined with jeering enemies, but with whom the timid king would not venture a battle flying even from the petty scenes of action carried on along the borders, unless detained personally by the indignant knights, who burned to retaliate the insults of the infidels. But from all their expostulations and reproaches, the cowardly king took shelter in the reply that he prized the life of one of his soldiers more than those of a thousand musclemen. Repeated attempts like these disgusted the gallant Castilians, and brought complaints from the southern provinces, which were laid waste in these continual affrays, and complained that the war was carried on against them instead of the infidels. Another cause of disquietude arose from the abuses of government, which occasioned almost a state of bankruptcy. The nobles, unable to obtain redress, converted their castles into fortresses, and with their retainers went out upon the highways, and robbing travelers and seizing upon their persons, sold them to the Moors, who retained them in slavery, except when redeemed by heavy ransoms. These occurrences received no check from the imbecile monarch. Such grievances, together with the jealousy of the nobility, in consequence of obscure persons being elevated above the old aristocracy of the kingdom, and some concessions made to Aragon which were thought to com compromise the honor of the nation, occasioned a general revolt. One of the prominent leaders of the insurgents was the Marquis of Elena, the most powerful noble in Castile, possessing a large and populous territory. He was a man of polished address and unfailing shrewdness, but turbulent, restless, and continually involving the nation in trouble. The other noted partisan was the Archbishop of Toledo, a stern warrior and churchman. A confederacy was organized which, among other things, demanded Alfonso to be recognized as Henry's successor, instead of Joanna. Too indolent to adopt severe measures to crush the rebellion in its beginning, he refused the advice of his adherents and yielded all that was demanded of him. He soon after retracted all his agreements, which so incensed and disgusted the Confederates that they determined to defy his authority and elect a king for themselves." An immense concourse assembled in an open plain near the city of Avila, where a scaffold was erected, and a crowned effigy of Henry the Fourth was placed upon a mock throne, arrayed in royal drapery, with a sword, scepter, and other insignia of royalty decorating it. A list of grievances was then read, 
after which the Marquis of Elena and other leaders despoiled the statue of its kingly trappings and threw it to the ground, where it was rolled and trampled in the dust by the excited multitude. Alfonso, then but eleven years of age, was seated in the chair of state, proclaimed king, and received the homage of the multitude amidst a loud flourish of trumpets. The news of this bold usurpation threw the whole kingdom into a frightful state of excitement, since every man was obliged to choose his party. Old feuds were revived, families divided one against another, and all the horrors of a civil war threatened to devastate the land. Henry was obliged to summon his forces, which were strong enough to have maintained his right to the throne, but they had no sooner assembled than he disbanded them and commenced negotiations with the cunning Marquis. A cessation of hostilities during six months was agreed upon, in order to make some amicable arrangement. But Henry's adherents were overwhelmed with indignation that he should have forsaken his own cause. Had a humane spirit dictated his course, he might have been honored. But the weakness and cowardice plainly evinced in all his movements made him despicable in the eyes of his subjects, and the jest of his enemies, in an age when the laws of chivalry demanded redress for the slightest affront. The two parties maintained their separate sovereigns with their respective courts, each enacting laws as if the other was not in existence. It was plainly seen that peace could not be long preserved while they were thus playing at cross-purposes. But the ready Marquis of Elena devised a scheme which should conciliate all parties and secure his own aggrandizement. He proposed the marriage of his brother, Don Pedro de Pacheco, Grand Master of Calatrava, a prominent member of the new party, with Isabella. To this the feeble king assented, though the project was strongly opposed by Isabella, who considered it not only degrading to her rank, but bore a personal dislike to Pacheco. He was many years her senior, of dissolute habits, was a fierce and noisy leader of faction, and in every respect unfitted to appreciate Isabella's lofty character. Her opposition availed her nothing, however, and not knowing whither to turn for escape from the hateful marriage, she shut herself in her own apartments, praying and fasting for a day and night. When weeping under the tyranny her heartless brother imposed, and bewailing her fate to a faithful, courageous friend, Beatrix de Bodadilla, the latter exclaimed, God will not permit it, neither will I. And drawing forth a gleaming dagger she wore concealed upon her person, passionately vowed to strike Don Pedro to the heart, if he dared to drag her to the altar. Magnificent preparations went on for the celebration of the nuptials. The master of Calatrava had obtained a dispensation from the Pope, releasing him from the vows of celibacy, and exultingly devised the most extravagant display for an occasion which was to bestow upon his fortunate self the hand of a beautiful and distinguished princess, nearly related to the crown. Already he saw himself a king. Elated with the prospect, and quite insensible to the unwillingness of the bride-elect, he set out from his residence with an imposing and showy retinue for Madrid, where the ceremony was to be performed. On his way thither, however, he was seized with a fatal illness, and died with frightful imprecations on his lips, because his life had not been spared till the goal of his ambition had been reached. His death was by some attributed to poison, though no one cast the slightest imputation on Isabella, whose well-known purity and uprightness placed her above suspicion. Don Pedro's death dissipated all the fine schemes for the reconciliation of the parties, and it was soon determined to decide the contest by a battle. The two armies met at Olmedo. The royal adherents greatly outnumbered the Confederates, but the latter made up in enthusiasm and spirit what they lacked in numbers. Alfonso's army was led by the Archbishop of Toledo, conspicuously arrayed in a scarlet mantle embroidered with a white cross, beneath which he wore a complete suit of armor. The prince, also clad in mail, rode at his side. Before the battle commenced, the archbishop sent a message to Beltran de la Cueva, advising him not to appear in the field, as a score of knights had vowed his death. He returned a defiant answer, minutely describing the dress he was to wear on the occasion, which cost him many a sharp struggle during the day. 
Henry took great care to avoid a dangerous proximity to the scene of blood and death, and upon the first announcement of the enemy's victory, which proved to be a false alarm, he fled in dismay with forty attendants to a near village for safety, leaving his friends to fight as best they might. The battle ceased only when darkness separated the combatants, nothing being gained on either side. The insurgents, however, occupied the city of Segovia, where Isabella repaired after the battle, and during the succeeding months of anarchy and bloodshed, remained under Alfonso's protection. The struggle ceased at the death of Alfonso, who, after a short and sudden illness, expired the 5th of July, 1468, at a little village near Avila, the scene of his proclaimed sovereignty two years before. His loss was deeply deplored, as he gave promise of unusual talent, and possessed a nobleness of sentiment that might have made him a just and great king. His death was ascribed by many to poison, and by others to the plague, which united its unsparing scythe to the chariot of war that wheeled right and left over fair Castile. Isabella immediately retired to a monastery at Avila, but the alarmed confederacy looked to her as its head, and unanimously delegated the Archbishop of Toledo to offer her the crown of Castile and Leon, promising her their support. Notwithstanding the primate's eloquent entreaties, she firmly refused the honor, replying magnanimously that, while her brother Henry lived, none other had a right to the crown, that the country had been divided long enough under the rule of two contending monarchs, and that the death of Alfonso might perhaps be interpreted into an indication from heaven of its disapprobation of their cause. The inhabitants of Seville and other cities proclaimed her their queen, and continued to send deputies to gain her consent to adopt their cause. But her immovable decision obliged the confederates to open negotiations with the ruling sovereign, which ended in, an, in a treaty, many of the articles whereof were degrading to him, as a man and as a king. He declared Joanna illegitimate and accepted Isabella as his heir and successor. An interview took place between Henry and Isabella at Toros de Guisando, each accompanied by a brilliant suite. When the king affectionately embraced his sister and publicly announced her as successor to the throne. This was followed by an oath of allegiance from the assembled grandees who, in token of their faithfulness, knelt and kissed the hand of the princess. Isabella took up her residence at Ocana, where she enjoyed comparative quiet in the peace and prosperity once more restored to the distracted kingdom. Suitors appeared with redoubled assiduity, now that her succession to the throne was established. Among them was a brother of Edward the Fourth of England, and the Duke of Guillaume, brother of the French king, and heir apparent to the throne. Isabella's choice hesitated between the latter and Ferdinand of Aragon, though her decision was influenced by a personal preference, as well as by the interests of the kingdom. France was distant from Castile, and the customs, language, and manners of the people widely differed, while Aragon was closely allied to Castile in every respect. Aside from this, Ferdinand greatly exceeded the duke in personal appearance and accomplishments, which enlisted Isabella's favor. In this decision she was fiercely opposed by a party who had retired in disgust at Henry's repudiation of Joanna, and headed by the malicious Marquis of Elena, formed a new faction in favor of the discarded heir. In Isabella's marriage with Ferdinand, the Marquis saw his own downfall and, with the hope of frustrating her intentions, regained his power over her guardian, the king, and it induced him to suggest to Alfonso of Portugal the renewal of his former addresses more publicly. End of Section 5 Section 6 of The Heroines of History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine H. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Section 6. Isabella of Castile, Part 2. 
The king of Portugal gladly acceded and sent a pompous and magnificent embassy to Isabella at Ocana. She peremptorily declined the honor, which so incensed Henry that, urged on by the cunning marquis, he threatened her with imprisonment in the royal fortress at Madrid if she did not see fit to acquiesce in the choice he had made for her. Such menaces did not intimidate her, as the inhabitants of Ocana were devotedly attached to her and approved of the Aragonese match, making known their approbation by singing ballads in the streets that derided Alfonso and compared his age and defects to Ferdinand's youth, beauty, and chivalry. She also had the promised support of the Archbishop of Toledo, who was warmly attached to her interests, offering to come in person at the head of a sufficient force to protect her if violent measures were resorted to. Notwithstanding a provision in the treaty which required her to consult Henry as to her marriage, she determined no longer to regard his wishes, since he had violated almost every article himself. Without farther hesitation, she took the opportunity of his absence in the southern provinces to quell an insurrection, to send an envoy to Aragon, accepting Ferdinand's suit. While awaiting the result, she repaired to Madrigal, remaining with her mother for greater security. This proved a disadvantage, as she found there the Bishop of Burgos, a nephew of the Marquis of Elena, who acted as a spy upon all her movements, corrupted her servants, ferreted out her designs, and faithfully reported the particulars to Henry and the Marquis. They became alarmed at her daring step, and at once made preparations to put their threat in execution. By an order from the king, the Archbishop of Seville was directed to proceed to Madrigal with a sufficient force to secure Isabella, and the inhabitants were warned not to attempt her defense. They entreated her to fly, and succeeded in informing the Archbishop of Toledo of her danger. He promptly placed himself at the head of a body of horse, proceeded to Madrigal with such speed as to arrive before her enemies, and gallantly carried her off in the very face of the Bishop of Burgos and his guard. She was thus escorted to the city of Valladolid, where the inhabitants greeted her with hearty enthusiasm. Soon after her arrival, a dispatch was sent to Ferdinand to expedite matters during the king's absence. John of Aragon had received the favorable answer to his son's suit with the greatest satisfaction, as it had long been his favorite scheme to consolidate the provinces of Spain under one head. The marriage articles had been signed, the most pleasing of which to the Castilians was that Ferdinand should reside in Castile, and the essential rights of sovereignty over that kingdom should be relinquished to his consort. But the arrival of the princess's messengers, with the information of the necessity of hasty measures, embarrassed the king of Aragon, whose treasury was exhausted by a war with the Catalans, leaving him without means to provide Ferdinand with a suitable escort or to support the expense attending a royal marriage. After much deliberation, it was decided that the prince should go, in the disguise of a servant, to a pretended company of merchants, while, to divert the attention of the Castilians, a showy embassy should proceed by another route. This stratagem succeeded. The distance to be traversed was short, but the country was patrolled by troops to intercept them, and the frontiers were guarded by strong fortified castles. They traveled at night, Ferdinand performing all the offices of a servant, till they reached the friendly castle of the Count of Trevino, from which a well-armed escort accompanied them to Duenas in Leon. Here he was welcomed by a throng of nobles, and the joyful intelligence of his safe arrival sent to Isabella. The following evening he went secretly to Valladolid, accompanied by a few persons. He was warmly received by the Archbishop of Toledo, who conducted him to the princess at the palace of John Ververa, where she, with her little court, resided. Ferdinand was at this time in his eighteenth year. His complexion was fair, though somewhat bronzed by constant exposure to the sun, his eyes quick and cheerful, his forehead ample and approaching to baldness, his muscular and well-proportioned frame was invigorated by the toils of war and by the chivalrous exercises in which he delighted. He was one of the best horsemen in his court and excelled in field sports of every kind. His voice was somewhat sharp, but he possessed a fluent eloquence, and when he had a point to carry, his address was courteous and insinuating. Isabella was a year older than he, 
She was well formed, of the middle size, with great dignity and gracefulness of deportment, a mingled gravity and sweetness of demeanor, confiding and affectionate. Her complexion was fair, her hair auburn, inclining to redness, her eyes of a clear blue, with a benign expression, and there was a singular modesty in her countenance, gracing as it did a wonderful firmness of purpose and earnestness of spirit. The interview lasted two hours, full of interest and mutual admiration, sealing the marriage contract with a love that rarely unites royal hearts, denied the free choice that blesses lower rank. Arrangements were made for the celebration of the nuptials, but both parties were so poor as to be obliged to borrow money to defray the expenses of the occasion. The ceremony took place on the morning of October 19, 1469, at the palace, and in the presence of a large assemblage of noblemen and dignitaries. A week of festive rejoicings followed, and, at its expiration, the newly married pair publicly attended Mass at one of the churches, as was the custom. Their first step had been to inform the king of their union and loyal submission. He coldly received their tardy seeking of his approbation, and replied that he should consult his ministers. The Marquis of Elena, who had now attained the dignity of Grand Master of St. James, chagrined at the failure of his schemes, quickly concocted new ones that put all Castile in ferment. He counseled Henry to again institute Joanna his successor, which advice was the more readily accepted since an embassy had just arrived from the King of France, proposing the Duke of Guienne, Isabella's disappointed suitor, for his daughter's hand. An interview took place between the Castilian monarch and the French ambassadors, during which a proclamation was read condemning Isabella's violation of the treaty by her unapproved marriage and reinstating Joanna in her former rights. The nobles took the oath of allegiance, and the young princess was formally affianced to the Duke of Guienne. Ferdinand and his consort, now almost forsaken by the same ones who a short time before had warmly espoused their cause, remained quietly at Duenas, surrounded by an unostentatious court, and so poor they could scarcely support the expenses of their frugal table. Henry's court, on the contrary, exhibited a frivolous and corrupt abandonment, himself the spectacle of a king completely under the guidance of rapacious and profligate counselors, and his dominion the scene of continued warfare and crime, carried on with impunity under the very eyes of Castile's incapable monarch. At this crisis, and when Ferdinand's presence was most needed to inspire the remaining adherents with courage, he was summoned to the assistance of his father, who, at war with France, was perilously besieged in the city of Perpignan. With Isabella's approbation, Ferdinand led a body of horse, furnished by the Archbishop of Toledo, into Aragon, where he received reinforcements from the nobility of that kingdom. With this army, he suddenly appeared before the surprised enemy, who abandoned the siege in dismay. John, with the remnant of his troops, went out to meet his son and deliverer, whom he embraced with affecting gratitude in the presence of the two armies. During this absence, several events favored Isabella's fortune. The Archbishop of Seville, a powerful man in position and character, observed the marked contrast between the courts of the king and princess, and won by the superior decorum of the latter, justly concluded Castile would attain a greater degree of prosperity under her firm administration than it could ever reach in the reign of her weak-minded rival, who, like her father, was entirely controlled by those around him. Influenced by such considerations, the archbishop revolutionized his interest and fortune in Isabella's favor. Another important accession to her party was one of the king's officers, Andres de Cabrera, who controlled the royal coffers. Partly influenced by hatred toward the Grand Master of St. James, and more by the urgent importunities of his wife, Beatrix de Bodedilla, Isabella's early friend, he opened a secret correspondence with the princess, advising her to have an interview with her brother. To assure her of his friendly motives, he sent his wife, who performed the journey in the disguise of a peasant, and thus unsuspected, reached Duenas, gained access to the apartments of her royal friend, and induced her to attempt a reconciliation with the king. With this certainty of protection from Cabrera and his friends, 
Isabella willingly set out for Saragossa, where Henry usually resided. An interview took place that resulted in a good understanding, and to give public proof of it, the king led her palfrey through the streets of the city. Grand fetes were given to express the universal joy at the event. While these rejoicings were in progress, Ferdinand returned to Castile and hastened to Saragossa, where he was warmly welcomed by his sovereign. This happy reconciliation did not suit the designs of the plotting favorite, who took the first occasion to crush these germs of peace. After a splendid entertainment given by Cabrera, Henry was taken violently ill. Ever ready to listen to his crafty minister's suggestions, he attributed to poison the result of his own excesses, and immediately issued secret orders for Isabella's arrest. The vigilance of her friends saved her, and she returned to Duenas in disgust. Ferdinand was again called to his father's succor. In the meantime, events thickened toward the consummation of his consort's power. The death of the Duke of Gouin in France dampened the hopes of the opposing party for Joanna, more especially since the alliance had been declined by several princes, owing to her alleged illegitimacy. Shortly after, Henry was deprived of his supporter and adviser by the death of the Grand Master of St. James. This was an occasion of more joy than grief to the Castilians, who were now delivered from the cause of nearly all the evils that for years had banished peace from the kingdom. To the monarch it was an irreparable loss, occasioning an anxiety and melancholy that hastened the progress of a disease which, for some time, had threatened his life. Undecided in matters of moment to the last, he died December 11, 1474, unlamented, without a will, and without naming his successor. The following morning Isabella, who was at Segovia, desired the inhabitants of that city to proclaim her sovereignty, resting her claims to the crown upon the fact that the Cortes had never revoked the act which appointed her Henry's successor, although twice summoned by him to give allegiance to Joanna. An assemblage of the chief grandees, nobles, and dignitaries, in robes of office, gathered at the castle, and, receiving Isabella under a canopy of rich brocade, conducted her to the public square. Two of the chief citizens led the Spanish Jeanette she rode, preceded by an officer on horseback, who upheld a naked sword, the symbol of sovereignty. A platform had been erected and a throne placed upon it, which Isabella occupied with graceful dignity, while a herald proclaimed, Castile, Castile, for the King Don Ferdinand and his consort Doña Isabella, Queen Proprietor of these Kingdoms. The royal standard was then unfurled, and the peal of bells and sound of cannon announced the recognizance of the new queen. The procession then moved to the principal cathedral, where, after the solemn chanting of the Te Deum, Isabella devoutly prostrated herself before the altar and invoked the protection and guidance of the Almighty. Immediately after the coronation, deputies from various cities tendered their allegiance and raised the new standard upon their walls. Ferdinand was still absent, but on his return he exhibited great dissatisfaction with the investment of supreme authority in his consort. With unyielding firmness and winning gentleness, she maintained her right, convincing and at the same time, with womanly tact, soothing her offended husband by mild, just reasoning, assuring him their interests were indivisible, that the division of power was but nominal, and that the interest of their only child, a daughter, demanded it, as she could not inherit the crown if females were excluded from the succession. This was one of his grounds of contention, since he himself was a distant heir of the Castilian crown. It was satisfactorily decided, however, that all appointments were to be made in the name of both, with the advice and consent of the queen. The commanders of fortified places were to render homage to her alone. Justice was to be administered by both conjointly when residing in the same place, and independently when separate. Proclamations and letters patent were to be subscribed with the signatures of both. Their images were to be stamped on the public coin and the united arms of Castile and Aragon emblazoned on a common seal. The succession was not yet peacefully established. Joanna's party still contended for the crown. Among her prominent supporters was the young Marquis of Valena, 
who inherited his father's titles and estates, but not his crafty, intriguing character. The Archbishop of Toledo, offended with the proclaimed queen because he was not solely consulted by her, and jealous of the rising importance of Cardinal Mendoza, suddenly withdrew from court. He shortly after openly espoused the cause of the unfortunate princess whom he had so long and successfully opposed. He would not be conciliated by any advances from Ferdinand and Isabella, who, as far as possible, without compromising their dignity, sought to regain his friendship. Propositions were now made by the rebellious party to Alfonso V of Portugal to espouse Joanna and assist in asserting her claims. To this he readily agreed. He assembled an army which comprised the flower of the Portuguese nobility, eager to engage in an expedition that promised them glory in the chivalrous defense of an injured princess. Advancing into Castile, they were met by the Duke of Aravello and the Marquis of Valena, who presented the king to his future bride. They were publicly affianced and proclaimed king and queen of Castile. A week of festivities followed, after which the army quietly awaited reinforcements from the Castilians. During this delay, Ferdinand and Isabella, who, on the first arrival of the invaders, possessed but a scanty army, put forth indefatigable exertions to strengthen their forces. Isabella frequently sat up the whole night dictating dispatches. She visited in person, on horseback, the several cities that had delayed allegiance, thus succeeding in rallying an army of 42,000 men well equipped. On one of her journeys, she sent a message to the archbishop, notifying him of an intended visit in hope of reconciliation, to which he impudently replied that, if the queen entered by one door, he would go out at the other. As soon as such preparations as could be rapidly made were completed, the army set out for the city of Toro, of which Alfonso had taken possession. Unable to engage the Portuguese in battle, Ferdinand laid siege to the city, but owing to a want of proper battering artillery and the cutting off of supplies by the enemy, who occupied the neighboring fortresses, he was obliged to withdraw his forces. An inglorious and confused retreat followed. The army was disbanded, scattering to their homes or strengthening the garrisons of friendly cities. The Archbishop of Toledo exulted at this ominous opening of the war on the part of the king, and no longer hesitated to join the enemy with all the forces under his command, haughtily boasting that he had raised Isabella from the distaff and would soon send her back to it again. Tidings from Portugal of an invasion caused the detachment of so large a portion of Alfonso's army as to cripple his operations, obliging him to remain in Toro without any aggressive movements. The king and queen, in the meantime, gathered a new army and proceeded to besiege Zamora. That being an important post to the enemy, Alfonso abandoned Toro and, with reinforcements from Portugal, headed by his son, Prince John, went to its relief. A battle ensued in which the Portuguese were completely routed and would have been nearly all put to the sword but for the friendly darkness that enabled many in extremity to give the Castilian war cry of St. James and St. Lazarus and thus escape their confused pursuers. Many of the troops were massacred in attempting to fly to the frontiers of their own country. This cruelty was rebuked by Ferdinand, who not only ordered their safe conduct but provided many of them with clothing who were brought prisoners in a state of destitution and suffering. He permitted them to return safely to their homes. Isabella, upon hearing of this decisive victory, commanded the people to go in procession to the Church of St. Paul, humbly walking barefoot herself to the cathedral, where thanksgiving was offered to God for the success he had vouchsafed them. Complete submission followed, except from the Marquis of Valena and the imperious Archbishop, who maintained their rebellious maneuvers till the demolition of their castles and the desertion of their retainers obliged them to yield. Alfonso retreated into Portugal with Joanna, but, mortified with his defeat, applied to the King of France to assist him in securing the crown of Castile for the Princess Joanna. He remained nearly a year in France for that purpose. Louis promised assistance when Alfonso's title was secured by a dispensation from the Pope for his marriage with Joanna. To his entire chagrin, he found that Louis was already negotiating with his rivals, 
and, overwhelmed with mortification at having been duped before all the world, he retired to an obscure village in Normandy, and wrote Prince John of his wish to resign his crown and enter a monastery. His retreat was discovered, and at last, persuaded by the urgent entreaties of his followers, he returned to Portugal, arriving just after his son's coronation. This caused him additional chagrin. John, however, immediately resigned his premature dignity on his father's reappearance. A treaty was soon after confirmed with Castile, which obliged Alfonso to resign all claims to the hand of Joanna, and imposed upon her the necessity of taking the veil or wedding Don Juan, the infant son of Ferdinand and Isabella, when he should arrive at a suitable age. Wearied and disgusted with worldly ambition, forsaken by her relatives, successively affianced to princes who, one after another, rejected her at every reverse of fortune, and at last offered a consort still in the cradle, with the alternative of becoming a nun, she chose the latter, as at least a means of releasing her from a position which made her the football of opposing parties. End of section 6 Section 7 of The Heroines of History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine H. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins Section 7 Isabella of Castile Part 3 Alfonso was so much disappointed at the loss of his bride that he determined to put his former threat of entering a monastery in execution. The one he fixed upon was situated in a lonely spot on the shores of the Atlantic, but the realization of this Quixotic fancy was prevented by his death shortly after Joanna took the veil. The same year, 1479, chronicled the death of John of Aragon, thus bequeathing an independent crown to Ferdinand. This event strengthened the security of Castile and cemented the various provinces into a whole that was soon to stand foremost among nations. When tranquility was at last restored to a people who for years had suffered the disasters of war, one would suppose they would willingly have been cradled in the arms of peace and prosperity. But the restless, turbulent spirit of the times required a channel for its resistless flood that would otherwise undermine the foundations of a throne slowly gaining steadiness and solidity after its long rocking. The ambition of the chivalry of Spain was enthusiastically directed towards the prosecution of the war against the Moors, while the zealous clergy were absorbed in the new project of establishing the Inquisition in these dominions, rapidly becoming more powerful. The Jews, who were a numerous, wealthy, and important class, had incurred the hatred of the Castilians both on account of their heretical belief and because of the almost irretrievable indebtedness of a large share of the nobility to these moneylenders. Since the avowed purpose of the Inquisition was the conversion or condemnation of this unfortunate people, both the Castilians and Aragonese submitted to its otherwise detested establishment, hoping thus to escape their extensive liabilities, not foreseeing that its unlimited power might finally initiate the whole nation in its mysterious horrors. The clergy were eager for the work, and the Pope willingly sanctioned measures which, by the confiscation of the estates of the accused, would pour immense wealth into his coffers. Isabella, whose tenderness of heart revolted at the barbarous design, withheld her consent till, blinded by the united representations of advisers in whom she reposed confidence, and actuated by a bigotry which owed its place in her otherwise perfect character to the early teachings of her confessor, Thomas de Torquemada, a proud, intolerant man of unrelenting cruelty, she at length permitted the appointment of two Dominican friars in September 1480, who were ordered to repair to Seville and commence operations immediately. This appointment was not made, however, till after Isabella had induced them to employ milder means that failed, of course, in the hands of fiery, overbearing monks. 
an edict was issued ordering the arrest of all persons suspected of heresy, some of the proofs of which were wearing cleaner linen on the Jewish Sabbath than on other days of the week, having no fire in the house the preceding evening, giving Hebrew names to children, a whimsical, cruel provision, since, by an enactment of Henry the Second, they were prohibited the use of Christian names under severe penalties. The cells of the convent of St. Paul, where the dreadful tribunal commenced its murderous deeds, were quickly filled, and the number of arrests multiplied so rapidly that they were obliged to remove its operations to the fortress of Triana, in the suburbs of Seville. Removed from the immediate supervision of the citizens, the infatuated, brutal monks carried on the revolting work, instituting mock trials, which gave the accused no opportunity of defense, but confronted him with witnesses concealed beneath black cowls and judges enveloped in dark robes. The scene was rendered more gloomy and depressing by the dimly lighted chambers where the sittings were held. The victim, with no hope of escape, however innocent, was often condemned through the machinations of some deadly but disguised enemy, hurried away and subjected to most excruciating tortures, in dungeons too deep for their cries of agony to reach any sympathizing ear. In the meantime, Isabella, who devoutly believed this to be a pious work, was occupied in preparations for the Moorish war, in accordance with the promise she made on ascending the throne, and with the same bigoted zeal that actuated her in the forced conversion of her own subjects. Ferdinand engaged in the project with commendable activity under the cloak of his most Catholic majesty, but with the secret gratification of adding to his dominions a wealthy and beautiful region acknowledged as the Eden of Spain. Its position, too, embracing the most important fortifications along the coast, caught the covetous eye of the king, and probably had an influence upon Isabella, though her prominent idea was the conversion of the infidels. The Moorish kingdoms, which had formerly extended over a large portion of Spain, had been reduced, by successive conquerors, to a narrow district of seventy miles in breadth, lying between the mountains and sea, and stretching along the coast one hundred and eighty miles. The inhabitants were still subject to their enemies, being obliged to pay an annual tribute which had ceased during the reign of Henry the Second and his successors. In this interval they had become prosperous, amassed great wealth, beautified their possessions with every known luxury, and cultivated the arts and sciences to a surprising degree. Ingenious and inventive, they originated much that has been universally adopted by mankind. To them we owe the first manufacture of paper, and from them came the equally world-appropriated invention of gunpowder. Astronomy, philosophy, and mathematics made rapid strides under their direction, though perverted to the uses of astrology, magic, and the untiring search after the elixir of life and the philosopher's stone. Literature and poetry were successfully cultivated, but overburdened with legends and fairy tales that have since been inwoven in the poetry of all nations. The renowned city of Granada was situated nearly in the center of the kingdom, upon two hills and an intervening valley, one of the hills being crowned by the fortress of Alcazaba, the other by the palace of Alhambra, magnificent and fanciful in its architecture, adorned within by richly tinted walls, musical fountains, perfumed gardens, and gay with gorgeously dressed attendants, now a pile of ruins whose history seems but the magical creation of an Arabian romance. Noble palaces and lofty houses, abounding in oriental colonnades and graceful porticos, crowded the city. It was famous for its gallant warriors, who proudly boasted an army of twenty thousand men within its walls. Around the city extended the Vega, or Plain of Granada, luxurious with vineyards, abundant in citron and orange groves that perpetually blossomed, and watered by the Senil that flowed in a thousand diverted channels through these enchanting gardens. Upon one side of the plain extended a long range of mountains whose snowy peaks rose like sentinels along the frontiers, 
while the dark Mediterranean dashed against the rocky battlements with which nature had provided its extreme southern boundary. Populous cities, towns, and impregnable fortresses were numerous in this fertile kingdom, which was regarded by the Moors with a passionate devotion revealed in the romantic ballads and legends that immortalized its beauty and glory. The king, Muli Abin Hassan, was an old man, yet one who retained the fiery spirit of his youth and the natural vigor of his mind. He still held the reins of government with a firm, unyielding hand, but was an undisputed tyrant in his domestic relations. To this haughty monarch, Ferdinand and Isabella sent an embassy as soon as their purpose was decided, demanding the payment of long arrears of tribute due to Castile. He received the embassy in the halls of the Alhambra, and proudly defied the demand. Tell your sovereigns, said he, that the kings of Granada, who used to pay tribute to the Castilian crown, are dead. Our mint at present coins nothing but blades of scimitars and heads of lances. The indignant ambassadors returned to Castile, while Abin Hassan, fully aware of the vast preparations making against him, determined to open hostilities himself. The fortress and town of Zahara, negligently guarded because of its impregnable situation upon craggy heights, was fixed upon for the first onset. An inconsiderable number of valiant Moors scaled the almost inaccessible walls of precipitous rock, and under cover of a raging tempest and the darkness of night, surprised the slumbering inhabitants, massacring such as resisted and carrying the rest into slavery. The news of this capture roused the wrath and revenge of all Spain, as though it had not intended to commit a like aggression. Ponce de Leon, the Marquis of Cadiz, noted for his personal prowess, was selected to conduct an army of five thousand foot and horse into the enemy's country, though with some especial design, his soldiers were kept in ignorance, they expecting some sally along the frontiers. They performed a fatiguing and perilous march over the mountains that separated them from the kingdom of Granada, the way being rendered more dangerous by moving only at night in order to conceal their approach. This feat accomplished, the Marquis announced to his astonished soldiers that they were within half a league of the fortress of Alama, in the very heart of the Moorish dominions. This fortress and town, of the same name, were, like Sahara, situated on a rocky eminence, washed at its base by a deep river on one side, and screened on the other side from any powerful attack by the mountains. Its apparent security of position lulled the vigilance of the sentinels, and enabled a detachment of the Spanish army to scale the walls unseen, put the garrison to the sword, and throw open the gates to the remaining troops. The town was captured after a brave resistance from the Moors, who fought desperately this first battle for their beautiful land, their homes, and those endeared ones who were threatened with death or hopeless slavery. The news of this daring exploit, almost within sight of Granada, struck terror into the hearts of the people, who deplored the evil the tyrant king was bringing upon them. The astrologers shook their heads, and said the stars denoted the downfall of the empire, while the poets mournfully sang, Woe is Alhama! And women and children rushed through the streets, tearing their hair, and wildly calling upon their king to stay the destruction which threatened to overwhelm them. But Abin Hassan, roused by this defiance of the Castilians thrown in his very teeth, and deaf to the lamentations and reproaches of his subjects, made hasty preparations to retake his captured city. A large army, fierce for vengeance, assembled under the walls of Alhama, and laid siege to the city. The conquerors held unflinchingly what they had so perilously grasped. Unintimidated by the fast exhausting means found in the city, or the long protracted, fierce attacks of the Moors, rapidly thinning their numbers. In this extremity, the Marquis succeeded in conveying intelligence to his wife, who, alarmed for the safety of her husband, quickly dispatched a message to the most powerful neighboring chief, 
the Duke of Sidonia, to fly to his relief. This nobleman was a deadly enemy of the Marquis, but with chivalrous honor obeyed the confiding frankness of the demand, and with his speedily gathered retainers, amounting to fifty-five thousand, set out for the Moorish dominions. The tidings of the victory and ensuing danger of the Spanish army at Alama reached Ferdinand and Isabella at Medina del Campo. After a public procession and thanksgiving in the cathedrals, Ferdinand dispatched orders to the duke, who had already begun his march, to await his presence. But he, unwilling to lose a moment, disobeyed the command and pushed on to the rescue of his countrymen. The first announcement of their approach to Alama was the sudden retreat of the Moors into Granada, a movement the besieged could not comprehend till, presently, they saw lances glittering and banners floating among the defiles of the mountains. With shouts of joy they went forth to meet the brilliant array, the Marquis and Duke embracing cordially, in presence of both armies, forever burying the animosity that had stained their family escutcheons with the blood of many generations. They triumphantly entered the city together. In accordance with Isabella's directions, the cross was reared where the crescent had hung for centuries. The mosques were converted into cathedrals, and the belongings and decorations of Catholic worship displaced the sacred utensils of Moorish rites. An exquisitely embroidered cloth, the work of the queen's own hands, was laid upon the newly erected altar in the principal mosque of Alama, thus consecrating to religion what had been gained by rapacious bloodshed. A stronghold now being secured in the very midst of the kingdom of Granada, Isabella determined to prosecute the war more vigorously than ever. With her sanction, Ferdinand summoned an army, which, it was found, lacked sufficient supplies of ordnance and ammunition, in consequence of want of means, to incur further expense. Not listening to the advice of more experienced men, and burning with a desire for military renown, he persisted in entering upon a campaign with this ill-equipped army. The soldiers caught the dispirited bearing of the leaders, and, full of evil forebodings, dejectedly followed the royal standard, carried before them to the Cathedral of Cordova, to receive a blessing, and thence on their long march and toil over the rugged mountains. Laxa, a thriving city on the banks of the Senil, so completely surrounded by inaccessible rocks as to be designated a flower among thorns, was the first point of attack. The army, fatigued with their rough march and with no ardor in the enterprise, poorly withstood the wily assaults of the Moors, who, practicing the Arabian and Indian tactics, concealed themselves in crevices or behind rocks, and suddenly sprang upon their astonished foes, darted fatal showers of poisoned arrows among their ranks, then fell upon them with never-failing scimitars and deadly knives. A complete rout ensued, and the remnant of Ferdinand's army returned to Cordova in a disconsolate plight. Isabella was mortified at such a signal defeat. She fully resolved to adopt measures proportioned to the importance of the undertaking, and not thus allow the fame of Castilian arms to be tarnished. The court removed to Madrid at the beginning of the year 1483, a year remarkable for the death of the Archbishop of Toledo, who, after his disgrace, retired to his own palace, where he pursued the study of alchemy with such infatuation as exhausted even his princely revenues. This year was also notable for the appointment of Thomas de Torquemada, Inquisitor General of Castile and Aragon, investing him with full powers to conduct the operations of the Holy Office, powers which he exercised with the utmost vigor and cruelty, enforcing every imaginable torture with horrible precision. Isabella permitted its continuance, notwithstanding the serious drains it produced upon the working classes as well as the nobility. No one was above a suspicion that, without warning, he might be snatched away from the fireside, from the busy loom or the plying hammer, with a suddenness and impenetrable secrecy that seemed the work of imps of Satan, 
carrying their victims to subterranean halls and placing them before malicious, cowled tribunals, which consigned them to a frightful, secret death in the depths of the fortresses and castles occupied by the inquisitors. Had Isabella been left to her own judgment, she would have used milder means to root out heresy from her kingdom. But actuated by her early teachers, who impressed her with the duty of thorough action, and influenced by her confessor Talavera, she countenanced the proceedings of the Inquisition. Talavera, though not possessing the cruelty of Torquemada, was equally austere and haughty. Upon his first attendance upon the queen as confessor, he remained seated while she knelt before him. It is usual for both parties to kneel, said she. No, replied he. This is God's tribunal. I act here as his minister, and it is fitting that I should keep my seat while your highness kneels before me. This is the confessor I wanted, she said afterwards in commenting upon it. What wonder that with such spiritual guides in whom she reposed the greatest confidence, her doubts should be overruled. Her resolution to execute the war of Granada on a larger scale was soon made manifest. In opposition to the wishes of Ferdinand and the chief leaders, she used energetic measures to raise a new army. Ashamed to be outdone by a woman, the old spirit of chivalry was roused again, and they now eagerly offered their services to the courageous queen. The treasury being exhausted by the various objects that drew largely upon it, the Pope was applied to, who permitted funds to be raised out of the ecclesiastical revenue, and also issued a Bull of Crusade, which granted indulgences to all who should take up arms against the infidel. Magnificent preparations were made with expectations of a certain success that seemed to be warranted by the scenes of civil faction which Granada presented. The Sultana Aixa was jealous of a beautiful Greek slave of whom the old king was undisguisedly fond, and fearing lest the succession of her own son, Boabdil, should be superseded by other heirs, she represented her wrongs to the people, already rebellious under the tyrannical government. These intrigues were discovered, for which Aben Hassan caused her to be imprisoned in the highest tower of the Alhambra. With the aid of her attendants, she effected the escape of herself and son by tying scarves and shawls together, upon which doubtful support they descended to the ground unharmed, and were welcomed by a large share of the quickly assembled inhabitants. A contest soon commenced, which stained the halls of the Alhambra with blood, and drove from it the tyrant king, who took shelter in Malaga, a city that remained loyal to him, leaving Boabdil to occupy the throne. While the kingdom of Granada was thus weakened by domestic feuds, and unable to rally unitedly, the Castilians decided to strike a blow at Malaga. The gallant army passed out of the gates of Antiquera, exultant and eager for the victory of which they were confident. The following day they arrived at the torturous defiles of the Axarquia, dragging heavy artillery and baggage through the rocky windings with great difficulty. During the slow ascent, the inhabitants of the villages among the mountains had time to escape with their effects and spread the alarm through the lower country. End of Section 7 Section 8 of The Heroines of History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine H. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Section 8. Isabella of Castile. Part 4. Aben Hassan made immediate preparations, and with a strong force sallied from the city of Malaga to meet the enemy while entangled in the passes. The Castilians were under several leaders, neither of whom had the supreme command. Not finding the booty they anticipated, they began to separate in various detachments, that of the Grand Master of St. James alone proceeding in military order. 
upon that division the first attack of the Moors fell, and as soon as the sound of the alarm was given, the Marquis of Cadiz hastened to his relief. The spirit and agility of the Moors gave them success. The Castilians were scattered, and, laden with spoils gathered in the various forages for which they had separated, and unable to manage the cavalry amid the defiles, were driven back after a desperate struggle. In order to facilitate their escape, they were obliged to leave the artillery, baggage, and dearly earned booty to their pursuers. Their retreat was further embarrassed by missiles showered upon them from the heights above by the numerous peasantry and villagers. Heavy rocks and stones rolled down upon their close ranks, making fearful inroads on the already diminished numbers, causing confusion, alarm, and a struggle for life that lessened the chances of escape and often sent them rolling into deep chasms, clutching each other with a death-grasp. The Marquis of Cadiz succeeded in extricating his detachment and escaped to Andalusia, but the rest were not so fortunate. Some lost their way, wandering back into Granada. Others died from exhaustion and terror. Many were taken prisoners. And those who still kept together mistook the route and came to a stand in a deep, dark glen, hemmed in by insurmountable rocks. Darkness was fast enveloping them, increasing their danger, and magnifying the horrors of their situation. Watchfires were kindled by the enemy along the ridges of the mountains, and the fierce moors flitted hither and thither in the red light, like a multitude of evil spirits securing the captivity of their victims. Well-aimed arrows were darted among the unresisting soldiery, who, thinking now only of personal safety, desperately sought to retrace their steps. After struggling through almost impenetrable thickets, scaling fearful precipices, and leaping dark chasms, a moiety of that brilliant army reached their own frontiers, almost dead with fatigue and terror. They left three of their most illustrious commanders, and two brothers of the Marquis of Cadiz, slain among the defiles, to be mutilated by the revengeful Moors, or to be prey for the eagle's airy, and one was taken a prisoner, with no hope of ransom. After these disasters, the war would have ceased for a time, but for a rash expedition undertaken by Boabdil, the young king of Granada, who was jealous of the renown which his father's knights had gained, and determined to perform some exploit himself which should secure the loyalty of his adherents. Accordingly, he summoned a large army which embraced the flower of Moslem chivalry. Disregarding the ill-omened accident of breaking his lance against an arch as he passed through a gateway of the city at the head of his army, he persisted in executing his purpose. Perhaps the more desperately, from the repeated and mysterious warnings he received from the astrologers, and because of an old prophecy which foretold that he would be the last king of Granada. The Castilians, having been informed of his design of investing Lucena on the Spanish frontiers, provided that city with a strong garrison. The Count de Cabra raised a small army, and came in sight of Lucena, just as the Moors were marching towards it on the opposite side. The approach of the Spanish army was partially concealed by the rolling hills among which they passed, affording the Moors only an occasional glimpse of troops thus multiplied infinitely to their alarmed vision. The echoes of the loud clarions and trumpets that filled their ears impressed them with the approach of an immense army. At the same time, troops poured forth from the gates of the city. Imagining themselves already overpowered, a portion of the Moors fled, leaving the brunt of the battle to the cavalry, who soon obliged the rest to give way and retreat towards the Zanil, closely followed by their pursuers. The panic and struggle for life were so great that numbers were precipitated into the waters, grappling one another till they sank in a common grave. The proudest blood of Granada flowed from the banks and mingled with the rolling river that day, a day immortalized in the mournful lamentations and ballads of a race who fought to perpetuate a nation that was doomed to be struck out from the kingdoms of the earth. 
Boabdil was often seen in the thickest of the melee, conspicuous from being mounted upon a richly caparisoned white steed and wearing golden armor and a magnificent turban blazing with jewels. His royal guard fell one after another around him. Unable to sustain himself longer or to hope for escape across the river, he dismounted and concealed himself in a thicket. A Castilian soldier discovered his retreat and would have dispatched him after calling assistance had not the king revealed his rank. This was the crowning feature of the day. He was triumphantly led to the Spanish camp and conducted to Count Cabra, who received him with all the honor and respect due to the royal captive. He was then escorted to the Count's castle and entertained with munificent hospitality, the most punctilious care being taken to make the golden-plumaged bird forget that he was caged. Isabella received the tidings with tears as well as joy, and sent him a message full of kindness and courtesy. All her generous womanly sympathies were awakened for the unfortunate prince. When a council convened to determine what was to be done with their captive, they talked of delivering him to the vengeance of his father for a heavy ransom. But Isabella indignantly rejected the proposal, deciding that he should be liberated and sent back to his country, on condition of allegiance to the Castilian sovereigns, the promise of supplies to their troops, and permission to pass unmolested through that portion of the country under his sway, together with the payment of a large sum of money annually, and the delivery of his son and several children of the nobility as hostages. He was released, and, after a cordial interview with the king and queen, was conducted by a brilliant escort to his own dominions. In the loftiest towers of the Alhambra, his mother and beautiful young wife, Morema, had watched daily for the coming of Boabdil, straining their eyes in vain beyond the vine-covered vega to catch a glimpse of the triumphant return of the gaily-equipped cavaliers who had gone forth with buoyant hopes to win glory. While still gazing far among the blue mountains for a sight of the Muslim banners heralding the approach of the victors, their keen eyes perceived a little band of horsemen skimming swiftly across the plain. With beating hearts they returned to the state chamber to await tidings that were soon conveyed to them, more loudly than words could have done, in the blood-stained, dusty habiliments that remained to the exhausted cavaliers, who rushed with evil news to the presence of the Queen Regent. The announcement of the capture of Boabdil overwhelmed his wife and mother with grief and filled the city with lamentations. Old men and women wandered through the streets, tearing their hair and throwing ashes upon their heads. The wise were struck dumb with the unheard-of calamity, and even the children united in the wailing cry that rose yet more mournfully than the sad cadence that prophesied the recoil of the first blow, beginning with the words, Ay de mi alama. The high-spirited Sultana Ayexa, unwilling to indulge a useless grief, made an effort for Boabdil's liberty, offering an immense ransom and terms which, for the most part, were those the conquerors granted. But the glory of Granada had departed, for no sooner had the degraded king returned to his dominions than Aben Hassan renewed his former animosity through Abdallah el Zagel, a vigorous and fiery warrior, who was appointed to succeed the old monarch, now blind and infirm. The new opposing king carried on a determined warfare with the fated Boabdil's party, till the palace of the Alhambra and the streets of Granada were streaming with the blood of the bravest Moors, who should have reserved their strength for the common defense of the kingdom. Ferdinand and Isabella continued to take advantage of these destructive feuds, pushing their conquests from town to town, capturing the most important posts and strongest fortresses along the frontiers. No memorable campaign occurred, however, till 1485, a year distinguished for the siege and capture of Ronda. Isabella, with all her household, accompanied the army, animating the soldiers with fresh courage, 
and prompting the gallant knights and cavaliers to valiant deeds, to deserve the smiles and commendation of their beautiful queen, for whom it was glory to peril their lives. Her presence softened the horrors and sufferings of war, as she always advised the most lenient and magnanimous conduct toward the vanquished, and held back the murderous sword that almost universally follows in the track of victory. She frequently reviewed the troops on horseback, wearing light armor, and addressed the soldiers with a perfect grace and strength, united with unassumed modesty, that won the admiration of the whole army. Any one of those thousands would probably have laid down his life in the defense of a queen, regarded, by all her subjects, with the passionate devotion of a lover, as well as with the awe which, not only royalty, but the purity and beauty of her character inspired. To her the honor is due of first establishing the inestimable services of a hospital in the army. She paid, from her own revenues, the skillful military surgeons and the expenses of six spacious tents, provided with beds and everything necessary for the comfort of the sick and wounded. It was denominated the Queen's Hospital. She was always accompanied by the Infanta Isabella, whom she loved with more than ordinary tenderness. The sweetest and most confidential intercourse existed between them, endearing them to each other with such strength of affection as nearly proved fatal when a final separation became necessary. The campaign of 1486 opened under brilliant auspices. Vast preparations were made and once more the valiant warriors of Spain, emboldened by the presence of Ferdinand, filed out from the gates of Cordova amidst floating banners, the flourish of trumpets, and the music of clarions, and buoyed by the hopes of victory whereof they were more rationally certain from being thoroughly supplied with every provision necessary to a well-equipped army. While they proceeded to the siege of Laxa, Isabella remained at Cordova, assuming the sole administration of government, and attending to civil and military business with surprising precision and skill. The derangement of internal affairs, increased during the prolonged absence of the sovereigns, added to the thousand separate demands upon her time, caused many an applicant to be unavoidably unheard. Among the throng who eagerly sought her presence was one who, in lowly garb, passed unnoticed through the streets of Cordova, abstracted and absorbed in the great dreams that daily pictured the glorious panorama of the Western world, and living a life of noble aspirations and intense longing to grasp the reality beyond the ocean that his keen vision had already spanned, a life of hopes and aims exalting him far above the motley, scornful multitude, which, to his unmindful sight, passed dimly forth and back, as seen in dreams. Impatient with the cold and reiterated refusals of an audience, Columbus succeeded in laying his gigantic plans before Talavera, the queen's confessor, through whom he hoped to reach Isabella's ear. He had previously applied to John II of Portugal, who rejected the chimerical ideas with disdain. Now he had a worse obstacle to encounter, in the learned prelate's unconquerable aversion to any departure from the long-established theories. Too much occupied to bestow thought upon Columbus's scheme, Isabella refused him admission, with an indefinite promise of giving attention to the subject at some future day. Columbus, impatient at the delay, could only plunge into the scenes of warfare that now seemed to engulf every other interest. After the capture of Laxa, Ferdinand requested Isabella's presence in the army, to which she promptly responded. With the Princess Isabella, the ladies of her court, and a numerous and brilliant train of attendants, she set out for the camp. The Marquis of Cadiz, with a detachment of nobles and cavaliers, met her on the frontiers, and conducted her to the encampment in the vicinity of Moaline. The queen rode a chestnut mule, seated on a saddle-chair, embossed with gold and silver. The housings were of a crimson color, and the bridle was of satin, curiously wrought with letters of gold. 
the Infanta wore a skirt of fine velvet over others of brocade, a scarlet mantilla of the Moorish fashion, and a black hat trimmed with gold embroidery. The king rode forward at the head of his nobles to receive her. He was dressed in a crimson doublet with breeches of yellow satin. Over his shoulders was thrown a mantle of rich brocade, and a supravest of the same materials covered his cuirass. By his side, close girt, he wore a Moorish scimitar, and beneath his bonnet his hair was confined by a cap of the finest stuff. He was mounted on a noble war horse of a bright chestnut color. As they approached each other, they bowed thrice, uncovering their heads, and saluted one another affectionately, though with the stately ceremonies which accompanied every movement of their majesties. The presence of Isabella and her court in the camp spread universal joy, gave new life to the soldiery, and added to the brilliancy of the scene. Royal pavilions were reared in the midst of the encampment, embellished with all the luxuries pertaining to a court, and gay with the presence of the beautiful and distinguished. There was the heroic Marchioness of Cadiz, and the Marchioness of Moya, better known as Beatrix de Bodidia, together with the dignified presence of the Grand Cardinal Mendoza, a man reverenced for his learning and reliable qualities, the gallant Earl of Rivers of England, with his brave followers, Gonzalvo de Cordova, the notable captain of the Royal Guards, and his famous brother Don Alonso, the Marquis of Cadiz, styled the Mirror of Andalusian Chivalry, the Count de Cabra, the capturer of Boabdil, and a host of renowned knights, with their numberless followers, made up as famed and gorgeous an array as ever entered the battlefield. And among this throng of haughty, powerful nobles, who burned to gain laurels to lay at the feet of the worshipped queen, moved Columbus, still unnoticed, still overshadowed by the bold and great, whose emblazoned names in future years would pale before the radiance of the genius now despised by their prejudices. The din of war drowned his pleadings, and the poor but noble Genoese could only raise his arm beside the common soldier to strike a common foe. Moline was captured, its dungeons thrown open, from whence poured forth Christian captives whose fate had long been a mystery to their mourning relatives. Its mosques were converted into cathedrals, colleges founded for the instruction of the Moors in the Catholic faith, and arrangements made for the government of the conquered cities. Isabella universally exerted herself to alleviate the horrors of war, showing such leniency and kindness toward her Muslim subjects as secured a devotion almost equal to that of her own nation. And when severe or cruel measures were applied, it was because her remonstrances were overruled by Ferdinand and the Spanish leaders. At the close of the campaign, the sovereigns returned to Spain, making Salamanca their place of royal residence. Here Columbus succeeded, through the influence of the Marquis of Cadiz and Cardinal Mendoza, both men of enlightened minds, in obtaining the appointment of a council to decide his claims. Talavera was designated to select the most learned and scientific men in the kingdom for this purpose. Many of them were equally pugnacious to innovations upon established theories, and caused discussions which were likely to foil the long-protracted hopes of Columbus by their interminable length, if not in their decision. The spring of 1487 came, and the council, without having effected anything, was broken up by the preparations demanded for a new campaign. Ferdinand placed himself at the head of an army of 12,000 horse and 40,000 foot, and once more advanced toward the dominions of the Moors. A toilsome march over the mountains, a rapid descent among the defiles, and the army swept like a cloud of devouring locusts over the fair fields, vineyards, and gardens of Granada, leaving a scene of desolation behind it, and at length settling in a broad valley, at the extremity of which lay the city of Malaga, second only in importance to Granada. The approach to it, however, was rendered perilous by two well-guarded eminences, commanding the valley both on the sea-coast and the opposite side, 
where the wild Sierra receded into mountainous heights that overshadowed the city. After a desperate defense by the Moors, the Marquis of Cadiz took possession of the position considered most dangerous from its exposure to attacks of bands concealed in the neighboring thickets. The other most important point was secured by La Vega. The following morning, the remainder of the army swept through the pass and defiled into a wide plain which surrounded the city upon three sides. A fourth was washed by the waves of the ocean. A Spanish fleet rode in the harbor, effectually cutting off supplies in that quarter. Thus, the doomed city was completely encircled by a foe daily tightening its coils till the victim was crushed in the fearful embrace. Malaga was bravely defended by a noble Moor named Hamet el Zegri, renowned since the siege of Ronda, and appointed to this responsible post by el Zagel, who still disputed the crown with Boabdil. But for this weak prince, Malaga might have been rescued by the Moors, inasmuch as a valiant band of troops set out from Granada to their assistance, but were intercepted by Boabdil and engaged in a bloody affray which disabled them. After several weeks spent in the unsuccessful bombardment of the city, the Christians, wearied with its determined resistance, became discontented. A rumor had reached the besieged that the Spaniards were about to break up their camp. This gave them fresh courage to prolong the struggle. To undeceive them, Ferdinand immediately sent for Isabella to join the army, knowing her presence would dispel the dissatisfaction among the troops, and would assure the infidels of their intentions to persevere. Isabella's arrival was greeted with every manifestation of joy. The plain of Malaga presented a scene like that of Moline. It was brilliant with gorgeously attired horsemen and glancing weapons, gay with pavilions from which floated the royal standard, and the interior of which was richly hung with silken draperies and otherwise luxuriously fitted for the presence of beautiful women of noble birth, the wives or sisters of those in the camp. The army was purified from the vices which usually accompany war. Gambling was prohibited under severe penalties, blasphemy punished, and prostitutes banished a state of things due to Isabella's pious and virtuous regulations. End of Section 8 Section 9 of The Heroines of History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine H. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Section 9. Isabella of Castile. Part 5. Immediately upon her arrival, she showed the humanity and mildness of her character by requesting the cessation of hostile operations and caused terms of capitulation to be offered the inhabitants of Malaga. They would gladly have accepted these, but for the fierce chieftain El Zegri, who returned only a defiant answer. The siege was, therefore, prosecuted with redoubled vigor. An event occurred shortly after the queen's arrival, which occasioned great alarm for her safety. A wild moor named Agarby allowed himself to be taken prisoner, and, promising to reveal important information to the Spanish sovereigns, was conducted to the royal tent. The king being asleep, the queen refused to confer with the prisoner till he should awaken and be present at the audience. The moor was, therefore, led to an adjoining pavilion, where the Marchioness of Moya and Don Alvaro were playing a game of chess. Their magnificent apparel and distinguished bearing deceived Agarby, who, thinking himself in the presence of royalty, suddenly drew forth a dagger from the folds of his Moorish mantle and plunged it into the side of the unsuspecting Don Alvaro, then turned quick as lightning upon the marchioness, who escaped injury by the weapon becoming entangled in the heavy embroidery of her robes in its descent. 
the attendants fell upon the assassin, dispatching him with numberless blows. The noise of the affray soon spread the alarm, and in revenge for the daring attempt, his body was thrown from an engine into the besieged city. Spanish historians denominate him a fanatic. His own countrymen might have immortalized him as a hero who, in the face of certain death, made one last effort to arrest the departing glory of the kings of Granada by sending into the captivity of death the crowned instigators of their downfall. The vigilance of sentinels was redoubled, and an additional guard placed upon the royal quarters. Though Isabella was disturbed and alarmed at her danger, she still enforced her wishes to spare the destruction of Malaga and its inhabitants. Capitulation was again offered, but rejected with disdain, notwithstanding the famine which had reduced the besieged to the necessity of eating the flesh of horses, cats, dogs, and boiled leaves. To this distress, a pestilence was added, arising from the use of such unwholesome food. Reduced to uttermost extremity, their numbers rapidly diminishing, and their places of defense giving way under the increasing fire and battering engines of the Spaniards, El Zegre at length sent an embassy to Ferdinand, accepting the offered terms, to which the king replied that it was too late, as they must now abide by such terms as their conquerors chose to offer. After remonstrances, threats, and defiance on the part of the Moorish general, he was at length obliged to surrender Malaga unconditionally, having bravely maintained its defense for three months. Ferdinand and Isabella entered the city at the head of a triumphant procession and went in state to the Cathedral of St. Mary, where Mass was performed, and thanks given to the God of Armies for enabling them to establish the Catholic faith in the land of the infidels. The Te Deum was solemnly chanted, followed by all the usual demonstrations of victory. In the meantime, the inhabitants of Malaga awaited the decision of their fate with the additional terror of suspense. The dungeons were opened, and the Christian captives, who had been chained there for years, were led before Isabella in the presence of the assembled multitude. Sons, brothers, husbands, long mourned as dead, were recognized among the dejected, cadaverous beings, with cries of joy at the reunion and tears at the sight of their suffering. Isabella wept with them, had them carefully provided for, and enabled them to return to their families. Strange inconsistency that could release captives in a foreign land with tears, while, in her own dominions, thousands innocently suffered a more horrible captivity in the dungeons of the Inquisition. And strange infatuation that should lead her, immediately after the release of Spanish prisoners, for whom her tears had flowed, to enslave a host of the most beautiful Moorish maidens for herself and friends, tearing them from homes and loved ones no less dear because the crescent was an emblem of their faith, though this was sufficient to make them unfeeling in the eyes of the Spaniards. The terrified inhabitants were ordered to appear in the spacious courtyard of the al Kazaba to hear their doom pronounced. Wasted by famine and exhausted with fearful watching, they clung in despairing silence to one another, pale and trembling. They were anxious as to their impending fate, yet hoping for the generous treatment shown towards other conquered cities. Here and there a sullen moor stood apart with folded arms and rebellious spirit, haughtily awaiting the sentence he knew full well would be no light one from the exasperated conquerors. Breathlessly the multitude listened till the dreaded decree of hopeless slavery was passed upon them, then sent up a long mournful cry that might have touched a heart of stone. O oh, Malaga, renowned and beautiful, what shall become of thy old men and thy matrons, thy sons and thy maidens, when they shall feel the galling yoke of bondage, cried they in tones of agonized grief. 
Daughters clung to mothers. Children in vain supplicated the protection of their fathers. The family ties were broken. Some were destined to the burning coasts of Africa. Some were distributed in the beautiful plains of Italy, while the noblest and fairest were selected to embellish the palaces of Spain in subjection to those whom they hated as infidels as well as oppressors. Ferdinand would have put them all to the sword, but for the remonstrances of his more humane consort, though their policy had always been marked by a magnanimity that won them a worldwide fame in those days of savage warfare. The rapacious Ferdinand, fearing that the inhabitants would conceal their wealth, secured it by offering freedom to them at a ransom so enormous that, despite all the gold, precious stones, and merchandise the duped victims could lay at his feet, it availed them nothing. These traits, that gradually became more prominent in his character, repulsed the upright purity and tenderness of Isabella's more refined, exalted nature, and chilled the love that had at first united their interests and aims. But whatever Isabella's disappointment was upon a clearer perception of the soul that years made more transparent to her insight, she never compromised the dignity of either by revealing it to those who surrounded them. The year succeeding the capture of Malaga was more remarkable for its reverses than successes. After a short campaign, Ferdinand withdrew his forces. Isabella's residence during the ensuing winter was at Valladolid and Saragossa, where she was entirely engrossed in domestic affairs and the education of her children. The Princess Isabella was her constant companion and confidant, relieving her mother's sorrows by her gentle, sweet sympathy. Her eldest and promising son, Don Juan, often diverted her from oppressive troubles. But all her motherly anxieties were awakened for her second daughter, Joanna, who, having always been subject to fits, was threatened with idiocy or insanity. The infant Catherine, destined to a sad fate, and known as Catherine of Aragon, was at this time affianced to Prince Arthur, son of Henry the Seventh of England, an event which sealed a long unbroken peace between the two nations. The brilliant campaign of 1489 decided the fate of Granada. An army was raised of 15,000 horse and 80,000 foot, embracing the most distinguished leaders and hardy knights of Spain, together with troops furnished by allies. Ferdinand led his legions once more over the mountainous barriers, determined to summon all their strength for a final victory that should terminate this long, disastrous war. The siege of Bassa was determined upon, as it was the capital of El Zegel's dominions and the most important post to be obtained. A long and fierce resistance, however, dampened the ardor of the Spaniards, and after suffering several reverses in skirmishes and attacks upon the town, and dreading the severity of the fast approaching winter, they were so entirely disheartened as to unitedly desire the king to return to Castile and await the following spring, for the furtherance of designs which would detain and expose them to certain death by the hardships of the cold season, and the cutting off of supplies by the breaking up of the roads over the mountains. Even the most heroic leaders advised Ferdinand to abandon the siege, and scarcely one in the whole army opposed it but the sagacious commander of Leon. Uncertain what course to take, and unwilling to disband his army without a single conquest, Ferdinand sent his embassy to Isabella, who resided at Hyene, a place nearest the scene of action and most convenient for communication. Her reply, full of hope, courage, and energy, promising the faithful discharge of her engagement to furnish supplies to the army without intermission, at whatever cost or labor, reassured the dispirited army. With fresh vigor they made preparations for the approaching winter, and the astounded moors of Bassa suddenly beheld a city of houses and streets rise, as if by magic, where only light tents had sheltered the besiegers. Walls of mud, thatched with timber, 
constituted the houses of the nobility. Palisades joined at the top, and intertwined with boughs, protected the common soldiers. Shortly after the completion of these huts, a severe storm swept them all to the earth. Torrents rolled down from the mountains, swelling the streams to an impassable depth and rapidity. The mountain roads were blocked up by fallen rocks and trees, and deep fissures were cut by the descending floods. Alarm was depicted on every continent now that supplies and intercourse with their own country were completely cut off. Two or three days of painful suspense ensued when a messenger arrived from Isabella exhorting them to hold their position, for the roads should be quickly repaired. With incredible alacrity and skillful management, she succeeded in the reconstruction of the roads. Her workmen made new ones, bridged the swollen rivers, and established a line of fourteen thousand mules, which constantly conveyed supplies of every description to the army. The immense expense incurred she defrayed by pawning the crown jewels, plate, and personal ornaments, by large sums borrowed of wealthy individuals who, for their reimbursement, trusted to the word of the queen, a sufficient guarantee for any risk, so faithful was she in performing her promises, and by the treasures of the convents and monasteries thrown open to her. Thus, to the indefatigable efforts of this high-spirited, admirable woman, who wonderfully united feminine qualities with masculine wisdom, energy, and skill, was owing the brilliant and decisive conquests that succeeded. Bassa was still defended with determined valor and strength, drawn from the dependence of the fate of Granada upon the loss or retention of this royal stronghold. The Spaniards again lost patience with the prolonged defense, looked to the queen for new inspiration, and believing her presence would hasten the termination of the siege, entreated her to join them. Accompanied by the Princess Isabella, the Marchioness of Moya, and other ladies of her court, she arrived at the camp in November, the sixth month of the siege. When the Moors beheld her gay cavalcade streaming from among the mountains, knowing what a talisman of success lay in her presence, they beat their breasts in dismay and despair, exclaiming, Now is the fate of Bassa decided. From the moment of her appearance, says the historian, a change came over the scene. No more of the cruel skirmishes which before had occurred every day. No report of artillery or clashing of arms or any of the rude sounds of war were to be heard, but all seemed disposed to reconciliation and peace. Bassa almost immediately surrendered, and the triumphant Christians entered the city amid the firing of artillery, waving of banners, and the ringing of bells, hateful sights and sounds to the vanquished. The Alcaide, who had bravely sustained the defense, was loaded with civilities and presents. Overcome by the same kindness and sweet sympathy which gave Isabella such power over her own subjects, he knelt before her in admiration and offered his services in her cause thenceforth. She replied graciously and created him one of her knights. The monarch El Zagel, then in a neighboring fortress, knowing how fruitless resistance would be, resigned himself to a fate he could no longer avert. What Allah wills he brings to pass in his own way. Had he not decreed the fall of Granada, this good sword might have saved it. But his will be done, exclaimed the fallen king, with the solemn gravity and unchanging features characteristic of the Moors. Ferdinand appointed him king of Andres, subject to the crown of Castile. This shadow of royalty could not divert him from his melancholy downfall. In a short time he resigned the despised crown, and left a scene that continually reminded him of the departed glory of Granada. He took refuge among the Africans, who seized upon the riches he carried with him, and left him to end his days in extreme poverty and obscurity. Boabdil was now called upon to yield up his capital and acknowledge the supreme sovereignty of Castile and Aragon. The inhabitants of Granada refused the demand, 
and sent a message of defiance to the conquerors. Unwilling to open another siege so late in the season, they returned to the city of Seville to recruit, perfectly at ease in the knowledge that Granada was theirs except in name. In the following spring, the nuptials of the Princess Isabella and young Alfonso of Portugal were celebrated in a succession of balls, fetes, and tournaments, which were gladly welcomed after the toils and hardships of war. But the queen mingled in these rejoicings with a heavy heart, dreading separation from a daughter who had enlisted her strongest affections, and who regarded her own departure with equal and foreboding sadness. Columbus again appeared at court in the interval of peace to present his claims. He was referred to the Council of Salamanca, which, after a three years' consideration of the matter, had decided that the scheme proposed was vain and impossible, that it did not become such great princes to engage in an enterprise of the kind on such weak grounds as had been advanced. This was the decision of Spain's most learned and scientific men. Yet there was a minority in the council of more enlightened views who would fain have encouraged the great discoverer and so far prevailed on the sovereigns as to induce them to hold out promises of future and more explicit attention to the subject when the war of Granada had ceased. In April 1491, the king assembled an army of 50,000 to strike a final blow that would set his seal upon the entire kingdom of Granada. Accompanied by Don Juan, now created a knight, and the commanders who had gained numberless honors during the long wars, the unfailing Marquis of Cadiz, the valiant Count Cabra, Don Alonso de Aguilar, and his brother Gonzalvo de Cordova, of brilliant renown in the after-Italian campaigns. With such supporters, King Ferdinand once more encamped upon the banks of the Senil, facing the royal city of the Muslims, the last of all the strongholds of the kingdom that remained free and independent. The Vega stretched away from its frowning battlements, covered with a wild, entangled growth of vines, groves, and gardens, whose beauty had been desolated in the long struggle, but had sprung up again in untrained luxuriance, in a soil enriched with the blood poured freely upon it. The river had gradually withdrawn from its artificial channels, rolling through the plain as musically as if a crimson tide never mingled with the pure waters, ever fed by the rills which, like ribbons of silver, unwound from the hills. The grand, solid mountains rising beyond alone remained unshaken and unchanged, a chain of unavailing bulwarks towards which the eyes of every Moslem had often turned, watching in dread and hatred the coming of the myriads yearly poured forth from those rugged defiles. This last defiant approach to the very walls of their beloved and last remaining city filled the Moorish knights with uncontrollable vengeance and indignation. Thousands of the bravest and choicest of Moslem chivalry were shut within its walls, determined to sacrifice their heart's blood before they would yield their royal palaces or see Christian monarchs seated upon their throne. Undaunted by the encircling foe, and caring less for the horrors of a famine than submission to a foreign yoke, they daily sent forth the best warriors to challenge the Spanish knights to combat upon the Vega, which became the strange scene of innumerable single-handed battles and daring exploits that seemed more the picturings of romance than the terrible reality of war, prompted on one side by bigotry and on the other by a desperate defense of home, liberty, and kingdom. The Spanish army met with a disaster which proved, in the end, the speedier termination of the siege. Isabella, who was present in the camp, occupied a magnificent pavilion, belonging to the Marquis of Cadiz, which, with his usual gallantry, he had resigned to her use. One night, when all were wrapped in secure slumber, the cry of fire, proceeding from the royal quarters, roused the whole camp to arms, supposing the enemy were upon them. 
the flames which had caught in the hangings of the queen's tent from a carelessly placed taper spread with rapidity and were not extinguished till after the loss of a large quantity of plate jewels and brocade and the costly decorations of the pavilions occupied by the nobility isabella herself narrowly escaped injury as a memorial of her gratitude to god for the preservation and in token of her determination never to abandon the vega till granada had surrendered she caused a city of substantial houses to be erected in the place where the encampment stood immediately the soldiers became artisans and instead of the shock the shout the groan of war the din of industry went up to the ears of the amazed moors who beheld in the rising city a token of inflexible determination that it was useless and fatal to combat in less than three months la santa fe was completed and was long after the boast of the spaniards for its freedom from the pollution of heresy boabdil would have yielded at once but dared not oppose the undiminished courage of the inhabitants who were still resolved to die in defense of their last possessions although fully aware of the impossibility of retaining their position eventually secret negotiations were carried on however with the king's vizier sometimes within the sacred precincts of the alhambra and sometimes at midnight in the little village of churiana which ended in boabdil's betrayal of granada into the hands of the christians end of section 9「Section 10 of the Heroines of History」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine H. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins Section 10 Isabella of Castile Part 6 In the meantime, Columbus had retired from the Spanish court in disgust and prepared to visit the King of France, who had written him in an encouraging tone. While on his way, he was detained at the convent of La Rabida by his friend, the guardian Juan Perez, formerly confessor to the Queen. Comprehending the greatness of Columbus' designs, and anxious that his sovereigns should lose neither the golden opportunity of extending their dominions to an incalculable extent, nor the glory of perfecting the gigantic schemes, in defiance of the world's brand of fanaticism, he offered to seek an interview with Isabella and make one more effort in behalf of one with whom a continent had been unknowingly rejected. The good monk arrived at Santa Fe, and having obtained an audience, eloquently expostulated with Isabella. She became warmly interested in his representations, and, urged by two eminent men and the intelligent marchioness of Moya, consented to receive Columbus, sending him substantial evidence of her favor in the presentation of a well-filled purse, a mule, and habiliments necessary to his appearance at court. Overjoyed at the near prospect of the consummation of his hopes, he hastened to Santa Fe, arriving in time to witness the surrender of Granada. Elated with success, the sovereigns and court were ready to listen approvingly to new plans. Columbus appeared before them, adding the power of his inspired presence, lofty demeanor, and the eloquence of his beaming, benignant face to persuasions in which he pictured in glowing description the realms he should add to their dominions and the converts that should be made among the heathen who peopled these imaginary regions in barbarous magnificence. Warriors and courtiers, knights and fair women graced the interview, some listening with admiration and enthusiasm, others scoffing at the eloquent pleader, for presuming to reveal his wild dreams in presence of the majestic pair, more imposingly royal than ever, now that they were thrice crowned. Isabella listened approvingly. 
the thought of converting the benighted heathen in the supposed continent was a strong motive of acceptance. But the cautious Ferdinand had no idea of complying with terms in which Columbus demanded for himself and heirs the title and authority of admiral and viceroy over all lands discovered by him with one tenth of the profits. Terms which Talavera, already appointed Archbishop of Granada, haughtily assured the king, savored of the highest degree of arrogance, and should be unbecoming in their highnesses to grant to a needy foreign adventurer. Although Columbus saw the means of accomplishing his great schemes almost within his grasp, he proudly spurned every offer which did not secure to him the titles and emoluments due to his achievements. Refusing farther conference, he indignantly left the court, and mounting his mule, turned his back upon the scene of conquest that to him seemed child's play, in comparison with the magnificent world to whose shores he would have winged even a single vessel, had such a prize been within his reach, in defiance of the superstition which kept the people aloof from his project, and in scorn at the foolhardiness of the learned." while he angrily hastened across the vega towards the mountain roads. His friends were eagerly expostulating with the queen, assuring her that he would well deserve the reward he asked, if he succeeded, and if he failed, nothing would be required. Yielding at last to her own generous impulses, she determined not to regard Ferdinand's opposition or the advice of over-cautious counsellors. I will assume the undertaking for my own crown of Castile, said she, and am ready to pawn my jewels to defray the expenses of it if the funds of the treasury shall be found inadequate. A messenger was quickly dispatched for Columbus, who was overtaken a few leagues on his route. Assured that the orders came from the queen herself, he gladly returned to Santa Fe, where he met a gracious reception and at last received from her own lips the acceptance of his terms, definitely concluded April 17, 1492. With accustomed promptness, Isabella immediately gave orders for the equipment of two vessels, the third being provided by Juan Perez of La Rabida and the Pinzones, distinguished mariners of Palos. The fleet was manned with great difficulty, but at length preparations were completed, and on the 30th of April, after partaking of the sacrament and confessing themselves, Columbus and his motley crew spread their sails and floated away to unknown regions from which they were never expected to return. Granada had surrendered, and at the triumphant entrance of the Spanish monarchs, the unfortunate Boabdil met them, and would have dismounted to do them homage, but was hastily prevented and kindly embraced by Ferdinand and received with cordial regard by Isabella, who delivered to him his son, detained at the Spanish court as a hostage during the last years of the war. Boabdil then delivered up the keys of the Alhambra. They are thine, O king, since Allah so decreed it. Use thy success with clemency and moderation, said he mournfully, turning away and passing through one of the gates of Granada, which he requested might immediately be walled up, that no other should pass after him. He began the tedious route to the Alpujarras, arriving at the last eminence from which he could behold the royal city. He stopped and turned to look upon its rich palaces and the beloved sacred Alhambra, now desecrated with the blazing cross and waving banners of the conquerors gazed upon the wide vega with its fragrant vines and orange groves, followed the windings of the Senil, looked afar upon the minarets and towers that shot up from the cities clustered in the luxurious plain, and then at the blue heights of the rocky barriers he had thought a safeguard to his kingdom, rudely wrenched from his weak grasp. The scene and its associations were too much for the banished prince. He covered his face in his Moorish mantle, and burst into tears. "'You do well to weep like a woman for what you could not defend like a man,' exclaimed his haughty, unfeeling mother, adding the sting of reproach to his sorrow. "'Alas, 
when were woes ever equal to mine? returned the unhappy prince, pursuing his desolate journey to the barren regions assigned to him in lieu of his splendid possessions. The rock where he stood and mourned his fate is still known by the poetical appellation El Ultimo Suspiro del Moro, the last sigh of the Moor. His final career was like that of his uncle El Zagel. Disgusted with his petty dominions, he sold them for an insignificant sum and passed into Fez, where he fell in battle in the service of an African prince, losing his life in another's cause, though he dared not die in his own. The kingdom of Granada was now wholly in possession of the Christians, after a struggle through 741 years, during which the Arabian Empire had lessened in every succeeding generation, and finally absorbed in the Spanish nation after an unceasing war of ten years. The event was commemorated by processions and demonstrations of triumph, not only in Rome and many of the cities of the continent, but also in London, to say nothing of the joy manifested throughout Spain. Immediately after the close of the war, the death of one of its most brilliant supporters caused general mourning. The Marquis of Cadiz, who had been present during every campaign, from the surprise of Zahara to the fall of Granada, expired the 28th of August, 1492. The king and queen, with the court, wore deep mourning for the cavalier who was esteemed, like the Cid, both by friend and foe. But a far greater calamity fell upon Spain at the same time, and a louder lamentation went up from palace and hovel. After Ferdinand and Isabella had entered Granada, they issued an edict for the expulsion of the Jews from their dominions. The inquisitors represented the impossibility of their conversion, and recommended banishment as the only method of purging the land of such heinous offenders. To send from Spain a class of people comprising the most industrious and skillful of her artisans, and the wealthiest portion of her subjects, in many cases intermarried with the nobility, seemed to Isabella an impolitic measure, as well as inhuman, in tearing from their homes those who claimed a long line of ancestry in renowned Spain, where their interests and affections were entirely centered. She would have rejected a proposition so repellent to her kindly, generous nature, but, while negotiating with a representative Jew, who came to offer 30,000 ducats toward defraying the expenses of the Moorish war, thinking thus to gain favor for his people, Torquemada, the inquisitor general, rushed into the apartment and, holding up a crucifix, exclaimed, Judas Iscariot sold his master for 30 pieces of silver. Your highnesses would sell him anew for 30,000. Here he is. Take him. Barter him away and throwing the crucifix down before the astonished sovereigns, fled from their presence. Instead of resenting his unasked interference, they were overawed by his denunciations. Without farther hesitation, Isabella affixed her name to the decree, thus again silencing the promptings of her own better judgment, and, in the name of a religion whose teachers had possessed themselves of her conscience, inflicted another scourge upon the subjects who adored her, and whose cries of suffering, if they reached her ear, could not swerve her from her stern sense of duty. She might have wept when she saw them streaming forth in little bands after selling their property at immense sacrifice, not knowing where to turn from persecution, since all the world spurned them. She might have been touched with compassion for the sick and helpless, dragging over the painful route, or pitied the young maidens educated in luxurious abodes and sent forth homeless, or, when the exiles reached the frontiers, fainting with hunger and fatigue, or scattered through Portugal, Italy, Africa, and even Turkey, their numbers dwindled away in consequence of murders, exhaustion, or the plague, which strewed their pathway with the dead and dying. If she could have witnessed all this torture, tears might have welled abundantly from the depths of her sensitive heart. 
but they would have flowed without prompting a revocation of the fiat, any more than the lamentations of the Moors would have stayed her determination to make theirs a Christian land. Spain must be cleansed from heresy, was the continued teaching of the stern Torquemada in her childhood. Spain must be cleansed from heresy, was his warning admonition in her girlhood. Spain must and shall be cleansed from heresy, he boldly demanded when she ascended the throne. When we know with what unquestioning confidence the Catholics to this day commit their consciences to the keeping of confessors, we need not wonder at the religious errors that darkened Isabella's character, or why she should have yielded to the advice of grim and cruel monks, instead of regarding the dictates of her own truer soul. In the following year, 1493, the court, still residing at Barcelona, was struck with unutterable surprise by the reception of letters from Columbus, announcing his return to Spain and the success of his voyage. Everyone was on tiptoe to see and do honor to the illustrious man who, a year before, they had brushed past with curling lip. Isabella was impatient for an interview, and commanded his attendance at court, whither he quickly repaired, accompanied by a few Indians he had brought with him, and bearing samples of the various produce of the islands he had discovered, together with strange animals and birds of gaudy plumage. It was the proudest moment of his life when, seated in the presence of the monarchs, who received him with unheard of distinction, and in the hearing of the same learned scholars who formerly had looked upon him as a visionary, denouncing his theories as silly vagaries, he gave a glowing description of his discoveries in the exploration of an ocean never before traversed. He had torn aside the mystery that for ages had veiled the western horizon, and now that he held up a new world to their view, they clothed it with the golden tissue of their imagination, and exalted the bold voyager as extravagantly as they had before denounced him. Crowds followed him wherever he went, and he was everywhere received with the honors usually reserved for those of noble birth. The poor Genoese who, in his younger years, had sighed in vain for a sail to wing his material self, where his spirit daily wandered, at last had realized his visions, and sat before kings, the greatest conqueror of the age. He had fought with poverty, contempt, ridicule, and the derision of the whole world. He had gone amidst the mingled jeers and pity of old experienced navigators to combat waves which, he was assured, would bear him to purgatory, to the outskirts of the earth, or to desolate regions where diabolic imps would forever enchain him with spells. He had fought the prejudices of his mutinous crew and commanded them into submission. He had waged one long battle from early youth to late manhood, in which he had gained a continent to lay at the feet of his sovereigns. Well might he bear his honors with noble dignity. But no adulation or acknowledgments were so grateful to him as the testimonial of regard for his services given by Isabella. She caused a fleet of seventeen vessels to be fitted out to promote his discoveries. At his departure, she provided, among other stipulations, for the interests of the heathen, forbidding them being seized as slaves. She enjoined Columbus to treat them well and lovingly, and to chastise in the most exemplary manner all who should offer the natives the slightest molestation. These arrangements Isabella assumed herself, since her worthy prelates could not decide if it would be Christian or not to enslave them. Thus she invinced the justice of her character when exercising her own judgment. News reached her during his third voyage in 1498 of the violation of these especial charges, added to other delinquencies, all of which were grossly misrepresented by his enemies. She showed her deep displeasure at this by ordering all the Indians who had been shipped to Spain to be returned to their own land and such as had been sent to any market to be restored immediately. A person called Boabdil 
was also sent with full powers to make arrests in Hispaniola of those who had disobeyed her commands. Making the most of his commission, he ordered the admiral before him, and putting fetters upon him, conveyed him to Spain. Columbus bore these sad reverses with the same lofty spirit in which he had received distinction. But he was quickly released on arriving in Spain, where everyone was indignant at this outrage upon the man to whom so much was due. The court was residing at Granada when the king and queen, mortified and grieved at this excess of their orders, and willing to repair the indignity, sent a large sum of money and rich habiliments to the discoverer with a request to appear at court. Hastening to Granada, he sought the presence of the benevolent queen. At the sight of him, and at the remembrance of the unkind requitals from her own hand, as it were, towards one who had rendered her such glorious services, she could not restrain her tears. Reaching forth her hand, she offered consolatory words to heal his wounded spirit. Overcome with this unexpected reception, he threw himself at her feet and wept aloud. Both the king and queen exempted him from the blame which had been attached to him by enemies, restored him to his honors, and, in 1502, sent him on a fourth voyage of discovery. Isabella was destined never to see his return home, as accumulated afflictions were rapidly undermining her constitution. The Princess Isabella had, some time before, been deprived of her youthful husband, Alfonso of Portugal, after a union of but five months, his death being occasioned by a fall from his horse. She returned to her mother, depressed with grief from which nothing could divert her, and the melancholy indulgence of which preyed upon her naturally delicate constitution. While Isabella watched her daughter with anxious and foreboding care, she was called to the deathbed of the Queen Dowager, her mother, to whom she had devoted herself with dutiful attention, notwithstanding the many cares that demanded her time. A few years after the death of Alfonso, the Princess Isabella was prevailed upon to accept the suit of Emmanuel, King of Portugal, who became a passionate admirer of the sweet and gentle princess during her residence at Lisbon. She would not give her acceptance till he promised to expel every Jew from his dominions, a stipulation that made him hesitate for a time but he was too fond of her to allow such a barrier. And accordingly, the despised and hated Jews, who had taken refuge there from Spain, were again sent forth in exile. Ferdinand was too much occupied in affairs with the French and Italians to give much heed to domestic arrangements. It was important, however, to his politic schemes to secure the friendship of Austria and England, and accordingly family alliances were arranged to cement the good feeling existing. In 1496, a marriage was concluded between Prince Juan, their only son, and Margaret of Austria, and between the Infanta Joanna and Philip, Archduke of Austria, son and heir of the Emperor Maximilian, while the youngest, Infanta Catherine, was affianced to Arthur, Prince of Wales, both too young to admit of an immediate marriage. At the close of the summer, a gallant and beautiful armada was fitted out, ready to convey the young Princess Joanna to foreign shores. Isabella, whose affectionate heart clung tenaciously to her children, accompanied her daughter to the place of embarkation, deferring their separation to the last moment before the fleet sailed. After bidding farewell to her beloved child, she returned in her boat to the shore, but the tide had risen so rapidly that no dry footing could be found for her on the beach. The sailors were preparing to drag the boat farther upon the strand when Gonzalvo de Cordova, but lately returned from an Italian campaign and covered with honors, being present, attired in a rich and elegant court dress, gallantly waded into the water and, lifting the queen in his arms, bore her safely to the shore, amid shouts of applause from the delighted spectators. End of Section 10 
Section 11 of The Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Section 11. Isabella of Castile, Part 7. After Joanna had embarked, the weather became tempestuous, and the long absence of the fleet without tidings alarmed Isabella, already overburdened with anxieties. She consulted the most experienced navigators as to the safety of the fleet, suffering distressful fears, till the welcome news came of the safe arrival of the princess in Flanders. Though not without the loss of several ships and many of her attendants, her marriage with Philip was celebrated with great pomp in the city of Lille. The same fleet that bore her to the Austrian prince was to convey Marguerite to Spain. After the refitment of the vessels, she embarked, and arrived early in March 1497, having experienced a severe tempest. She was cordially received by the Spanish monarchs and Prince Juan, who eagerly hastened to meet her. The marriage was celebrated in April with magnificence. The ceremony was performed by the Archbishop of Toledo in the presence of the nobility of Castile and Aragon. The event was followed by a continued round of splendid festivities in which Marguerite and her Flemish attendants participated with an easy gaiety that caused surprise and remark among the stately and formal Spaniards. Soon after this, Ferdinand and Isabella attended the nuptials of their unusually loved daughter Isabella, celebrated without parade in a little town on the frontiers. While thus happily engaged, the king and queen received an alarming summons to Salamanca, where Prince Juan had become suddenly and dangerously ill. Before their arrival, he failed so rapidly that no hopes were entertained for his recovery. He expired in October 1497, in the twentieth year of his age. Thus, at a stroke, the Spanish sovereigns were deprived of an heir whose character and education Isabella had carefully superintended in order to prepare him for the important station he was expected to fill. His talents and admirable qualities endeared him to the nation, which hoped much under the administration of so wise, temperate, and benignant a prince. All Spain was in mourning, but the affliction fell upon none so heavily as the doting mother, who could find no consolation in the vain splendor of royalty. Her deep piety alone prepared her to meet adversity, as it had borne her through prosperity without arrogance. She received the mournful tidings in the touching language of resignation. The Lord hath given, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be his name. The succession now devolved upon the Queen of Portugal, but before the formal recognition of her right had been instituted, death claimed her also. This occurrence, though not so great a national calamity as the loss of Prince Juan, was a fatal stroke to Isabella, from which she never fully recovered. The young infant that cost its mother's life was happily a son, named Miguel, in honor of the saint's day on which he was born. The delicate, helpless child, unconscious of its magnificent destiny, was born in state through the kingdoms of its inheritance, to receive the allegiance of the grandees, and amidst solemn and pompous ceremonies was proclaimed successor to Ferdinand and Isabella and to Emmanuel of Portugal. Thus, above the head of the little sleeper, almost hidden in the satins and costly lace of royal babyhood, were suspended a multiplicity of crowns that, when encircling the brow of the young prince, would make him king of Portugal, Castile, Aragon, Navarre, Granada, Naples, and Sicily. Too brilliant a destiny for a cradled infant who, as if already pierced with the thorns that thickly line a golden crown, pined away and died, before it reached its second year. 
These successive calamities were overpowering to the sensitive queen. Still, after her recovery from a severe illness, induced by her excessive grief, she continued to exert herself for the welfare of her subjects and the furtherance of every project for the advancement of the nation and the interests of religion. On the death of Cardinal Mendoza, Archbishop of Seville, in 1495, she appointed Jimenez his successor, who, a short time previous, had been induced to accept the office of confessor to Her Majesty. Knowing nothing of his new dignities, he was called to the royal presence to open dispatches from the Pope. After humbly kissing the missive, he broke the seal and was overwhelmed to find the contents addressed to himself with the title of Archbishop of Toledo. Without waiting to examine it farther and exclaiming, This cannot be for me, he dropped it in consternation and fled from the apartment. Messengers were sent to command his return, but he was not to be found till a courier overtook him on his way to the monastery at Ocaña, whither he was traveling on foot in the blazing sun at his best speed. He was with difficulty prevailed on to return, but no entreaties of the monarchs could induce him to accept so high an office for which he declared himself totally unfitted and which would deprive him of his unobtrusive holy life in the cloisters. He had been the jest and the fear of the gay courtiers, when now and then his pale spectral face and thin but muscular form came among them, clothed in coarse garments, girdled with a rope, and all the more humble from its contrast with their own gay trappings. For six months he steadily refused the appointment, till a command of obedience arrived from the Pope, compelling him to occupy the chair of primacy. He still continued to appear on foot in humble garb, till, assured by Isabella that his excessive austerity and plainness would degrade the office in the eyes of the people, he assumed the state and magnificence that characterized his predecessors. But beneath his silken robes, he kept his coarse Franciscan dress abstained from the luxuries that daily loaded his table, and slept upon a hard mattress so arranged as to be concealed in the downy couch that was apparently his resting place. Stern, inflexible, bigoted, nothing could deter him from executing plans once formed. He began a thorough reformation in the monasteries and convents, into which deplorable vices and abuses had crept. Isabella countenanced his efforts, notwithstanding the general opposition to Jimenez's severity, often visiting the convents, taking with her a distaff or embroidery, setting an example of industry and endeavoring to purify the frivolous character of the inmates by her pious instructions. Jimenez disregarded the express provisions of the treaty between Granada and Castile and undertook the bold measure of converting the Moors. Taking up his residence for a short time in Granada, he began by collecting all the volumes of Moslem literature that he could lay hands upon, reserving only a few medical works for his own shelves, and consigned the rest to the flames in a public square in the city. His daring infringement of the people's rights and inquisitorial enforcement of a hated religion occasioned a revolt which threatened his life but he refused to fly for safety, boldly confronting the mob and declaring his willingness to endure martyrdom. By the adroit interference of the Archbishop of Granada, who was greatly beloved by the inhabitants, the disturbance was quelled, and in the end Jimenez triumphed. Isabella was greatly incensed at his high-handed measures and wrote him a severe letter, to which he replied by his presence ascribing his conduct to a worthy zeal for the conversion of the infidels. He recommended that the sovereigns should condemn the delinquents for treason and offer them pardon on condition of renouncing their faith. Isabella did not accept this advice, yet imprisoned the leaders of the revolt. 
many from fear emigrated, and the panic led nearly all the remaining inhabitants to accept the Catholic belief. All Christendom was astonished at this miracle, the more wonderful from the well-known hatred its subjects entertained for the religion they had assented to. Jimenez was henceforth venerated as a saint, his admirers asserting that he had achieved greater triumphs than even Ferdinand and Isabella, since they had conquered only the soil, while he had gained the souls of Granada. In 1500, the birth of a son, the celebrated Charles V, to Philip and Joanna, gave universal joy. And as on the death of the Queen of Portugal and her heirs, the succession would devolve on the young infant through Joanna, the Spanish monarchs requested the presence of the child's parents in Spain, that their rights might be recognized. Philip did not comply with the invitation till the following year, being too much occupied in the pursuit of pleasure to secure his interests. The tour was finally made, accompanied by brilliant fetes and rejoicings throughout the nation. Arrived at Toledo, where the court then was, Philip so betrayed his aversion to business and his dislike to the stateliness of Castilian ceremonies as to alarm the sovereigns concerning his capability to occupy the Spanish throne. Isabella was more deeply grieved in noting his open neglect of her daughter, whom she again clasped in her arms after a long separation, listening with painful solicitude to a weeping account of his infidelity and his repulsion of a heart that clung to him with tenacious affection, and was unappreciated by him because encased in so plain a setting. As soon as Joanna was duly recognized heir to the Spanish crown by the courts of Castile and Aragon, Philip, impatient at the restraint upon his free habits, and despising the formalities of the court, intimated his intention to set out immediately for France. This was warmly opposed by Ferdinand and Isabella, who represented to him the importance of remaining long enough to become familiar with the usages and interests of their kingdom, and to secure the goodwill of his future subjects. Besides, Joanna's delicate health required repose, and the open war with France might expose him to an uncivil reception. He persisted in his determination, leaving Joanna, who was unable to accompany him, inconsolable. From the moment of the departure of her idolized husband, she fell into a deep melancholy, from which nothing could arouse her. The birth of a son, named Ferdinand in honor of the king, did not dispel her strange mood, but each day gave more decisive proof of mental derangement. This was an additional grief to Isabella, whose health was rapidly failing under her accumulated sorrows and cares, aggravated by the exposures and fatigue to which she was subject in being frequently called to Joanna, who resided at Medina del Campo. She was summoned on one occasion when no one could prevail upon the unfortunate princess to return to her apartments after mounting the battlements of the castle in a fit of insanity. She consented to take shelter in a miserable kitchen in the neighborhood, but at daylight returned to the castle walls, where she stood, immovable as a statue, till Isabella arrived and exerted her authority in removing her. In a few months she returned to Flanders, notwithstanding her mother's unwillingness to trust her to the journey during the inclement season, and while the country was agitated with warlike preparations, to further the conquests of Gonzalvo de Cordova in Italy. Still inconsolable for the loss of her most cherished daughter, the amiable and beautiful Queen of Portugal, missing, with a mother's yearning tenderness, those who had been destined to a foreign land, and daily probed to the utmost depths of her tried heart with painful accounts of slander and disgraceful scenes enacted by the unhappy Joanna at the Flemish court, Together with anxiety for the issue of the impending war, and letters from the New World exciting her active sympathies for the welfare of the poor Indians, all this drew too heavily upon her already exhausted constitution, and prostrated her in a bed of sickness from which she was never to rise. 
her life was slowly consumed by a fever, not lessened by her solicitude for Ferdinand, who was seriously ill at the same time. She still, with surprising energy, attended to business, receiving all who sought an interview as she had been accustomed to do when in health, but particularly attending to affairs relating to the welfare of her subjects when she should no longer be with them. Among her last words were earnest injunctions to enforce kindness and justice towards the Indians, whose condition had greatly excited her interest and pity. The continued violation of her early commands was concealed from her, and the suspicion of this induced her to make them the subject of a codicil to her will, two days before her death. Owing to the incapacity of Joanna to occupy the throne, she appointed Ferdinand, regent of Castile, until the majority of her grandson, Charles V, influenced in so doing by her declared confidence in Ferdinand's wise and beneficent rule. She also touchingly expressed her affection for him in the words which bequeathed to him some of her personal property. I beseech the king, my lord, that he will accept all my jewels, or such as he shall select, so that, seeing them, he may be reminded of the singular love I always bore him while living, and that I am now waiting for him in a better world, by which remembrance he may be encouraged to live more justly and holy in this. The same jewels, perhaps, not long after, served to adorn a young, beautiful bride, the Princess Germaine de Foix of France, whom the unfaithful and politic Ferdinand led to the altar in the same duenas where, in his youth, he had given his fresh vows to the devoted Isabella. Having addressed a few words of consolation to the weeping friends about her, some of whom had been the companions of her youth, she received the sacrament and soon after expired, November 26, 1504, it being the fifty-fourth year of her age and the thirtieth of her reign. Her remains were conveyed to Granada, as she had requested, but during the journey a severe and long-continued tempest made the roads nearly impassable, rendering the way desolate, and depressing with still deeper gloom those who bore her beloved form to its plain tomb in the Alhambra. To that unfathomed boundless sea, the silent grave, thither all earthly pomp and boast roll, to be swallowed up and lost in one dark wave. The people vied with each other in extolling the triumphant glories of her reign and the wisdom and purity of her character, one that scarcely deserves the charge of bigotry, since the two great errors of her administration were measures which she abhorred and would never have allowed to be executed, had not her judgment been overruled by those upon whom she relied for spiritual guidance. Uniting the noblest masculine qualities with the finest and most lovable characteristics of woman, she secured the love and devotion of a nation still proud of that incomparable queen, upon whom was justly bestowed, then as now, the simple but eloquent designation, Isabella de la Paz y Bondad, Isabella of Peace and Goodness. End of Section 11、Section、of History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aubrey Kirkham. Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Joan of Arc, Part One. Monarch of France. Send thou the tidings over all the realm, great tidings of deliverance and of joy. The maid is come, the missioned maid, whose hand shall in the consecrated walls of Reims crown thee, anointed king. Southies, Joan of Arc. In this age of intelligence and refinement, of the arts, 
of commerce, political science, and Christianity, it is difficult to believe that so few years, comparatively, have elapsed since superstition threw her dark pall over all that is now bright and attractive. The period is not very remote when the most trivial events were presumed to be of an unearthly or supernatural character, when it was rare, indeed, that any man, however much in advance of his age and knowledge, had the boldness to attribute an unforeseen and extraordinary occurrence, though susceptible of the fullest explanation, to its proper and legitimate cause. Among the polytheists of Greece and Rome, to doubt the interposition of these numerous divinities in the commonest concerns of life was the worst grade of treason to the state. They believed, as they were taught by the religion in which they placed their trust, and by its priests whom they reverenced, that every waterfall had its nymph, every grove its dryad, that there was a deity to smile upon every folly, to encourage every unholy passion, or to strengthen every virtuous hope and noble aspiration. In the dim religious light of a later era, popular credulity clung with less tenacity to the forms and ceremonies than to the substance of superstition. Astrology was mistaken for astronomy. Philosophy and magic were synonymous terms. Palmistry and necromancy were ranked among the sciences. The belief in ghosts and witches was general. Ancient wood and castle were peopled with spirits and hobgoblins. Bright-eyed elves beset the path of the lonely wayfarer, and light-footed fairies danced the live-long night upon the green. The French historian, speaking of this period, says, Henceforward, Diablerie had little to learn, but was soon erected into a science. Demonology brought forth witchcraft. It was not sufficient to be able to distinguish and classify legions of devils, to know their names, professions, and dispositions. It was necessary to learn how to make them subservient to the uses of man. Hitherto the subject studied had been the means of driving them away. From this time the means of making them appear was the end desired. Witches, sorcerers, demonologists started up beyond all number. Each clan in Scotland, each great family in France and Germany, almost each individual, had one of these tempters, who heard all the secret wishes one feared to address to God, and the thoughts which shunned the ear. They were everywhere. Their flight of bats almost darkened God's own light and day. They had been sent to carry off in open day a man who had just received the communion, and who was watched by a circle of friends with lighted tapers. Such was the character of the age, made up of credulity and superstition, prone to believe and trust in the strange and the marvelous, ready to grasp supernatural aid when human efforts failed. Such was France when, at the death of her maniac king, Charles the Sixth. A bloody struggle for the crown commenced between the various competitors and their adherents, a struggle prolonged from a want of skillful military leaders, and the superstitious belief of all parties in omens preceding a conflict which depressed them with cowardly fear, or elated them with reckless courage, according to the import of the signs. Chance decided the victory. The rival houses of Orleans and Burgundy were the instigators of the civil war that desolated France, enlisting the aid of foreigners who threatened to subjugate the nation to British power. Charles the Dauphin, sixth son of the deceased monarch and claimant of the crown, strengthened the Orleans party by marrying a daughter of Count Armagnac, a Gascon nobleman of influence in his rude land, warlike, fierce, and not unfitted to lead a party in those days of open strife. On the other hand, the young Duke of Burgundy, in revenge for the murder of his father, in which Charles had participated, offered the crown of France to Henry V of England, already upon their shores with a well-disciplined army, in answer to the call of the old duke. In accepting the tendered throne, he espoused Catherine, the daughter of Charles the Sixth. but before his young head bore the weight of a double crown, he died, leaving an infant son, Henry the Sixth, with the Duke of Bedford at Paris, to rival the claims of the little king of Bourges, as Charles was called in derision by his enemies. 
and indeed this raillery was not amiss, for the Dauphin surely straightened in his resources, being scarcely able to furnish his table. He was naturally amiable and weak in character, yet adversity lent him courage and prudence that served him in time of need, but relaxed into effeminate ease when his foes granted him tranquillity. His army was made up of the sturdy Scotch retainers of the Earl of Bouchon, soldiers from Italy and Spain, the fierce, cruel Armagnacs, and such of the friends as supported his claims, though he placed little dependence on the unskilled troops of his own nation. France was thus overrun with a foreign soldiery, who made up for their lack of enthusiasm in the cause which they supported by the hearty eagerness with which they pillaged the towns, cities, and hamlets that fell into their hands. There was scarce a river in France but had rolled a crimson tide through its channel, or borne the mangled corpse of friend and foe to low, quiet valleys, terrifying the simple inhabitants and warning them that strife and bloodshed were near. Neither age nor sex were spared the inhuman butchery. Scarce an humble cottage but had wrongs to revenge, and not a palace or castle had escaped the mournful loss of some of the noblest blood of France, as often spent in petty vengeance as on the field of battle. The English, supported by the Burgundian party, succeeded in capturing every town north of the Seine, driving Charles and his adherents beyond the Loire. Had the English now unitedly pushed their conquests, France would have been completely subjugated. Their strength was destroyed, however, by private feuds and jealousies which finally obliged the Duke of Bedford to return to England, leaving Charles the Seventh in a comparative state of tranquillity. Orleans was the last stronghold left him, and in that city and in the surrounding region his remaining followers stationed themselves. The king, so far from making defensive preparations and accumulating forces in the two years' interval of peace, spent the time in distant chateaux, luxuriating in ease and pleasure, utterly regardless of the petty intrigues and struggles for power that daily weakened his party. But all these years of turmoil and war and superstition were schooling a daring spirit to uphold the victorious batterers of France, not a noble youth learning the tactics of war at the side of a chieftain father, not a young tell gathering vigor in the strong mountain air and practicing eye and hand to unerring archery, nor a bold genius whose military talent was to place him at the head of the armies of France, but a simple, gentle, peasant girl, instigated by imaginary saints and angels. Jeanne of Arc, or Jeanne d'Arc, la Pousseur d'Orléans, according to the old chroniclers, was born in the department of Vosges, in northern France, in the year 1411 or 1412. Her family name is said to have been written Dark. She was the third daughter of an honest and worthy husbandman, bearing the name of Jacques Dark, who, though a native of Montier-Udir at the time of her birth, dwelt in the pretty little village of Domremy, which lies in one of the most beautiful valleys of the winding Meuse, between the towns of Nochefetio and Vacoyers, and on the borders of Lorraine and Champagne. In this lovely and fruitful region she first saw the light. Her quiet and pleasant home, the rich pasture lands that girt it as with a belt of emeralds, the neighboring groves of beech and chestnut where fairy forms were seen to flit and fairy voices whispered, the balloon-shaped hills of the Vosges, which stretched far away to the land of the vine and the olive, and the dark forests of oak and fir that crowned their summits, shaking and bowing their stately tops in the fragrant breezes from the purple vineyards and the smiling slopes of Burgundy. These were all the world to her, through the quiet and peculiarly meditative years of her childhood. The sweet-toned bells in the chapel of Our Lady of Belmont lulled her infant slumbers with their musical chimes, and, as she grew older, her young mind expanded in an atmosphere of legends and myths, of saints and fairies, that gave a wild and boundless range to a naturally vivid imagination. Her mother, in whom a superstitious piety was strongly implanted, kept the little ones quiet while she plied the humming distaff by telling them tales of valiant knights and fair ladies, carried off by demons, or visited by angels and attended by a troop of fairies, all which the young listeners most devoutly believed. 
the young Joan never lost a word of the wonderful legends, storing them in her memory till her brain became peopled with imaginary beings, who accompanied all her lonely rambles, whose voices whispered to her in the stirring leaves of the forests, whose forms were wreathed in the mists of waterfalls, and whose tones were as audible to her sensitive ear in the gushing music of winding streams as they had been in the sweet tones of her mother's voice when united with the dreary hum of the spinning wheel she never danced and sung like the other maidens in the hamlet nor joined in their merry sports but preferred to steal away by herself and tell over beads to kneel in a shaded aisle of the chapel and to breathe her baptismal vows at the shakered shrine or at the hour of vespers devoutly repeat the compline before a favorite picture of the virgin but if she did not mingle with gay playmates at the sound of the viol she could boast of a neat and nimble use of the needle and could ply the distaff with speed equal to her mother's reading and writing were unsolved riddles to her for these were accomplishments known only to the clergy to those of gentle birth or to such as depended on them for a livelihood and there were many a peerless dame and gallant knight who deemed these performances as unbecoming labor and kept servants in the household to do such menial offices it is asserted by some that joan was a servant in a roadside inn and tended the horses and the guests in the capacity of an hostler and that she rode them to the watering places thus acquiring great skill in horsemanship these facts are not well authenticated however and they certainly are not in keeping with the gentleness, modesty, and delicacy of her character. It is related by others that she tended her father's flocks and herds while they grazed on the mountainside, a not improbable occupation and a very common one in the Valley of the Muse. Here upon the slopes, gorse flower glowing as the sun illumined their golden glory, she rested the livelong day, watching grazing herds and, and looking down upon the picturesque valley, bordered with a vast forest, its green meadows, luxuriant vineyards, the river with its wooded banks, and her own loved hamlet in the midst, invoking good spirits to guard it against the ravages of war, nor let the clash and din of weapons echo among the blue hills that shut in the peaceful valley. But the occasional traveller brought tidings of unjust and murderous deeds, and, as Joad's spirit began to break away from the enfoldings of childhood, her lonely day watches were occupied with burning thoughts of her country's wrongs. She longed to pass beyond the hills where she was born and mingle in the mortal strife. Her pale cheek crimsoned when she heard the story of helpless women falling beneath the battle axe and children driven forth to suffer the horrors of famine that their cries might intimidate the stout hearts of their fathers and make them yield their strongholds. And when at last a troop of fierce soldiers came with victorious shouts along the Meuse to the very heart of the sacred valley, and Joan and the humble household had to flee for safety, then the martial spirit pervaded her being and was henceforth inseparable from the religious fervor that actuated her in freeing France from her enemies. The fugitives returned to the unobtrusive village and found the beloved chapel in ruins. This wanton destruction of her favorite and holy resort awakened a new feeling of heroism in Joan, which, with unfixed purpose, only awaited events which should direct her. In the vicinity of Domremy was a large old tree whose immense, thick foliage branches overspread a wide green sward. It had stood through many generations, and legend upon legend hollowed its remembrances. To the young people it was known as the Tree of the Ladies and Beauty of May, and tradition said the fairies used to meet and converse with brave knights, who, in later times, had become so wicked that the sprites refused to appear to any but the good and virtuous. At early dawn the maidens of Domremy tripped the footprints of the fairies where they had danced all night beneath the giant tree, and they hung garlands upon the branches, wishing they might get a glimpse of the forms that Joan assured them she had seen and whose voices whispered mysterious things to her. Nearby was also a fountain, called the Fountain of the Fairies, and here the young girl lingered for hours till she saw the misty waters take shape, and beheld the holy features of St. Margaret or St. Catherine beaming kindly upon her, and she heard them in a low, soft voice call her the Restorer of France, and felt them affectionately embracing her. This she related to her parents and the village maidens, 
but it only excited their derision, since none of them were equally fortunate. She solemnly chided them for their unbelief, for she evidently had faith in these visions, the result of a morbid imagination dwelling constantly upon one theme. After the intelligence of the marvelous success of the English, and the retreat of Charles the Seventh beyond the Loire, she had startled the quiet laborers in the valley, and become the theme at every cottage door or fireside. Joan's visions became more vivid, and in her daily visits to the fountain she discovered the mission which the angels had devolved upon her. St. Michael, the archangel of battles and of judgments, appeared in the midst of a dazzling light, saying, Jeanne, go to the succor of the king of france and thou shalt restore his kingdom to him saint marguerite and saint catherine will be thy aids a host of angels in white wearing crowns and speaking in soft voices followed the appearance of saint michael and when they had all disappeared the timid girl wept abundantly wishing they had taken her with them several years had passed in this way confirming joan's belief in these messages and commands from god as she denominated them she obeyed the voices, which directed her to attend church faithfully and perform all her duties. She was known to all the villagers in her pious and charitable acts, and her youthful friend, Homet, assured her companions that Joan was a good, simple girl, and always talked of God and the angels. She entered maidenhood, pure and beautiful, the impress of her unsullied thoughts stamped upon her pale, calm face, full of childish innocence, yes, adorning a mind of rare sense and shrewdness. Both her mother and father reproved her firm belief in the mission that had been given her, and with alarm found her already practicing military exercises, mounted upon a horse and tilting her lance against trees, as if in knightly combat. Her father declared that, rather than see his daughter among men-at-arms, he would drown her with his own hands. Hoping to divert her from her wild, unwomanly schemes, her parents used their authority to secure her marriage. A young man declared she had promised him her hand in childhood, and to enforce his claims, cited her before the ecclesiastical judge of Toul. This they thought would frighten her into acceptance, since, with her timidity and modesty that suffused her face with blushes at a word from a stranger, she could never summon courage to defend herself. To her surprise, she appeared in court and declared the falsity of the charge. A visit from an uncle at length secured an opportunity for her to execute her purpose. He was convinced of her divine mission, and promised to take her to Robert de Baudricourt, captain of Vaucouillers, to whom St. Michael had directed her for aid. Bidding farewell to her beloved home, her cherished mother, and dear companion Omet, she journeyed with her uncle to Vaucouillers, in her simple peasant's costume, a coarse red dress and little close white cap. They traveled nearly four leagues among the banks of the Meuse, and traversed the valley spread with verdant meadows, enameled with flowers from which the town derived its name, and at the extremity of which it lay in the form of an amphitheater. They arrived in the busy streets, where all was new, stirring life to the young girl who had never before wandered beyond the hills that encircled her home. They sought the dwelling of an hospitable wheelwright, whose wife was captivated with the gentleness and beauty of the strangely commissioned maiden. Joan's uncle had previously obtained an interview with Baudricourt, giving an account of her and asking the aid she desired, to which the blunt soldier replied, Give her a good whipping and take her back to her father. Nothing daunted by this scorn of her pretensions, she succeeded in obtaining admittance to the castle, and soon stood in the presence of the hardy captain. Speaking in a firm tone, she told him she came from her lord to succor the king, and that she would raise the siege of Orleans and bring Charles to Reims to be crowned. The captain, struck with her appearance and astonished at her words, believed her possessed with a devil, and sent immediately for the curé. Upon entering her presence, the frightened priest exhibited his stole or scarf, and commanded the evil spirits to depart if they guided her. She simply smiled upon him, and conversed with so much honesty and unaffected simplicity that the curé himself was bewildered. The news that the prophecy concerning a pucelle of the marches of Lorraine, who was to save the realm, was about to be accomplished, and that the maid had actually appeared, threw all vocalières in a commotion. Crowds hastened to see her and hear her words, and all were equally vehement in their admiration and confident of her saintly commission. 
several of the nobility were won over to her cause and promised to conduct her to the king for she assured them that no one in the world nor kings nor dukes nor daughter of the king of scotland could recover france but herself and that it was her lord's will she should do it urging them to hasten for she must be at orleans before mid-lent baudricourt sent messages to the king to obtain his consent to an interview with joan orleans being closely besieged the inhabitants not able to defend it much longer and charles crown being dependent on the preservation of this last stronghold he was willing to grasp any aid however supernatural if it would but serve his purpose receiving his orders for her advance she set out from vaucouleurs equipped in man's attire mounted upon a fiery black charger the gift of the admiring inhabitants and armed with a sword bestowed by baudricourt at her departure a message of entreaty threats and commands came from her parents who were frantic with the thought of trusting their youngest and delicate daughter to all the horrors and exposures of war but joan still firm in her resolves begged their forgiveness and continued her journey with an escort of three knights the district that lay between vaucouleurs and chinon where charles held his court was overrun with men of arms at both parties making the journey extremely perilous but joan fearlessly traversed it cheering her companions who regretted the undertaking and began to fear that their charge was a witch or sorceress she continued to face danger with the utmost tranquillity and insisted upon sojourning at every little town to hear mass or to repeat her prayers in the churches at fierbois she remained a long time kneeling before the altar in st catherine's cathedral in spite of the entreaties of her impatient escort after escaping an ambuscade that had been laid for her they arrived safely at chinon here in a strong castle the ruins of which still ornamented the town charles and his courtiers were assembled a rich suite of apartments was occupied by his queen mary of anjou and her ladies of honor among whom was agnes sorrel known by the appellation of fairest of the fair and lady of beauty and celebrated as much for her gaiety of temper entertaining conversation and grace of manner as for her beauty the gentle submissive queen had consented to live amicably with this beautiful woman who shared the affection of the king and had a powerful influence over him seeing the hopeless condition of orleans he would have fled to the remote province of dauphigny and abandoned his crown but for the spirited agnes and the prudent sensible queen both of whom warned him that his followers would forsake him if he betrayed his despair by, of success by flight. End of section 12 Recording by Aubrey Kirkham Section 13 of the Heroines of History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amanda John Quinn. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Section 13, Part 2. The news of the coming of Joan excited hope, fear, and curiosity in the occupants of the castle. Uncertain whether to receive her, and fearing lest he should place himself in the power of an evil spirit, Charles called a council of warriors, priests, and bishops to consider the dangers or advantages of accepting one who might be a sorceress for their leader. As for trusting the events of war to a woman, such an objection was not raised, since it was a common occurrence for the fair sex to engage in battle, and in those very years the Bohemian women fought like men in the wars of the Hussites. The council, however, debated for two days the expediency of even admitting her to the king's presence, but it was finally decided that, if she could prove the divinity of her mission, by selecting the king from among his courtiers, she should receive the equipment she desired and accompany such forces as could be raised to Orléans. In the meantime, Joan was conducted to the queen's apartments, where the two friendly rivals received her with equal interest and curiosity. The rustic peasant girl exhibited no wonder as she entered the luxurious abode of the queen, where, in the soft shade of purple hangings, richly worked with golden fleur-de-lis, sat the attendants, industriously engaged with their embroidery frames, while the queen with fur-bordered robes occupied a slightly raised platform covered with tapestry. 
Her face was expressive and gentle, with a shade of subdued sadness resting upon it, and in her eyes beamed a soft winning radiance that reassured the timid girl, who modestly approached, though not overawed by the royal presence. She answered the questions relating to her childhood and the voices with the same simplicity and sweetness as when among her companions. The beautiful Agnes, whose vanity always found her a position and light that best displayed her faultless form, and a complexion clear as the coloring of Correggio, half reclined in a rich costume, her sandaled foot resting upon a velvet cushion. With a keen, penetrating gaze, she bent her full dark eye upon Joan, so cross-questioning her as might easily have bewildered an intentional deceiver. The result of this interview was the unreserved approval of the two who most influenced the king thus preparing him to place greater confidence in Joan's account when she appeared before him. When the hour for presentation arrived, Joan was conducted to a magnificent hall arched and ornamented with dark fretwork, upon which was thrown the brilliant and waving light of fifty torches. A crowd of nobles and more than three hundred knights in emblazoned court dresses added to the splendor of the scene. The king, in no way distinguished by his attire, mingled with the courtiers. To the surprise of the assemblage, upon Joan's entrance they beheld, instead of a woman of masculine form and courageous front, only a slender, delicate girl, a poor little shepherdess, who with a face pale and, chaste as the icicle that's curdled by the frost of purest snow and hangs on Diane's temple, advanced with composed air, and with as modest a countenance as if she had been bred up in court all her life, being led to a knight of distinguished bearing, she said he was not the king, and immediately selected the true Charles from among the brilliant throng, fell at his feet, and, embracing his knees, exclaimed, Gentle Dauphin, the king of heaven sends you word by me that you shall be consecrated and crowned in the city of Rheims. The king raised her, and, still unconvinced, led her aside, when she told him of a circumstance he had supposed known to himself alone, namely, that he had prayed in his oratory that God would restore his kingdom or allow him to escape safely to Spain or Scotland, Charles paled at this revelation of his secret prayer, and no longer doubted that the maid was the appointed rescuer of his crown. It did not occur to him, nor to those present, that she had been in the Queen's apartments and might have heard of it there as well as have seen or listened to some outline of his personal appearance which enabled her to distinguish him. She was certainly a girl of good sense, and shrewdness, but in her honesty and simplicity might have been but vaguely conscious of what occurred in the royal apartments, and mingled her impressions with the revelations of the voices. Still there were many who were not willing to rely upon the mysterious pretensions of the maid, and it was resolved to refer the matter to the doctors of theology. They were equally puzzled for a decision, either because of their superstition, or because they were careful not to take sides in a matter which divided the court, shirking their responsibility, by referring an examination to the University of Poitiers. By a proclamation from the Archbishop of Rheims, also President of the Royal Council, which held its sittings in Poitiers, a great number of doctors and professors of theology, including priests and monks, besides members of Parliament, assembled at the capital of the department to determine the case of this little peasant girl. Joan, always attired in the dress of a man, was conducted to Poitiers, but without trepidation or concern for the result of the trial, looked with admiring eyes upon the varied scenery while journeying, sure to dismount at every little church to repeat an Ave Maria before its altar, whether its spire upheld the cross in the midst of a town through which she passed, or whether humbly nestled in a hermit-like retreat among the hills and valleys that lay between Chinon and the parliamentary city. Poitiers was easily descried in the distance, for it crowned and girdled a hill at the junction of two rivers. A thick wall, flanked by strong towers, guarded the city, which boasted the remains of an old Roman castle and amphitheater, besides its splendid cathedrals and imposing palaces. Joan approached the city, that had so much interest for her, passed through the gates without fear, and guided through the narrow, crooked streets, was conducted to the house of an advocate of the Parliament and left in the care of his wife. The following day, the pompous prelates having assembled, the maid was conducted to the vast hall where they sat. 
Upon being questioned, she related all that she had seen and heard in a sweet, heart-touching voice, and with a simplicity and innocence that already won the grim judges before whom she meekly stood. After she asserted that she obeyed the directions of God and his angels, a Dominican friar said, Joan, thou sayest that God wishes to deliver the people of France. If such be his will, he has no need of men at arms. To this she readily replied, Ah, the men at arms will fight, and God will give the victory. A professor of theology in the university demanded a sign from her by which they might believe in the holiness of her mission. To this she quickly retorted, I have not come to Poitiers to work signs or miracles. My sign will be the raising of the siege of Orléans. Give me men-at-arms, few or many, and I will go. With all their cross-questioning, they could find nothing to condemn in her, and therefore countenanced the granting of the forces she asked. The people of Poitiers went in crowds to see her, wept at her winning childish purity, and declared, The maid was of God. Messengers from Dunois, the celebrated bastard of Orléans, who with his forces was in the besieged city, urged hasty measures to be adopted. In reply to his impatient demands, Joan was fully equipped and provided with a suitable escort. She wore a complete suit of white armor, a small axe, and at her side a sword upon which was engraved the royal insignia of three fleur-de-lis. This sword she had demanded from the learned assembly, telling them that they would find it behind the altar of St. Catherine's Cathedral at Fierbois. This information proving correct, the odd monks bore the miraculous sword to the girl, whom they seriously began to fear, forgetting that she had prayed at St. Catherine's altar for hours, when she might have heard the whisperings of priests, or have spied the sword herself, yet undoubtedly she believed it had been placed there by her favorite saint. She bore a white standard in her hand, embroidered with fleur-de-lis, and upon which was represented a shield and sword surmounted by a crown, and a beautifully painted image of the Savior. Thus equipped and mounted upon her black charger, accompanied by one of her own brothers, a page, a maître d'hôtel, an old knight, his valets, and a confessor of the order of St. Augustine. She set out for Bois, where a large body of troops were rallying to follow her charmed standard. The impatient army waited on the banks of the Bois, with a large convoy of provisions for the relief of the beleaguered city. Joan was received by them with enthusiastic shouts, young, beautiful, modest, and courageous, with the attributes of a saint, the soldiers looked upon her with mingled admiration, worship, and fear. She found herself surrounded by the cavaliers of Italy and Aragon, the valiant Scots, the Gascon nobles, the fierce fire-eaters of the gallant Count Dunois, and the cruel but brave Armagnacs, a band of ferocious brigands with captains at their head who had long been the terror of France. One of them, Gilles de Retz, was not only the robber hero of his own times, but as the original of Bluebeard has been immortalized as the bugbear of nursery tales through every succeeding generation. With such a promiscuous and fearful host, the brave girl unfurled her sainted banner and turned her face toward Orléans. It was springtime, the hills were blossoming with the yellow ferts, the meadows were carpeted with velvety green, the vast forests had put off their somber dress and sported fresh fragrant leaves. The deep arches of the wilderness halls echoed the notes of the nightingale, the bluebird winged from grove to perfumed vineyards, while the oriole, drifting like a flake of fire, whirled to the loftiest treetops and joined its sweet notes in the universal concert. The air, clear and invigorating in its freshness, inspired the army with buoyant hopes and a good will that made them readily obedient to the commands of their gentle leader. She banished from the camp all profligacy, endeavoring to elevate the debased character of her followers. During the first day's journey, she caused an altar to be erected on the banks of the Loire in the open air. She also partook of the communion and required the same of the soldiers. Hearing one of the robber captains, La Hire, swearing violently, she mildly rebuked him, fierce as he was. He received it with humility, promising in future to swear only by his baton. Joan's purity, gentleness, and religious zeal gained her a strong power over those Armagnac brigands, who would have devotedly followed her wherever she chose to lead, even on a crusade to the Holy Sepulchre. The remainder of the army were scarcely less infatuated. Their enthusiasm increased daily as they saw her sharing their hardships, sleeping unpillowed upon the damp earth, encased in her protecting armor. 
They marched rapidly along the southern banks of the Loire, where the heights were covered with orchards, vineyards, castles, and villages. Passing Chambord and the clustered turrets and towers of an imposing castle that marked its boundaries in the midst of a neighboring wood, they approached within a few leagues of Orléans. Joan was impatient to cross the river and enter the city on the northern side, where the English encampment lay. This the chiefs would not hear to, and their council was supported by the Count Dunois, who came from Orléans with an escort to meet them, and induced Joan to adopt a less perilous entrance by water. Orléans stood at the extremity of an elevated plain which terminates near the banks of the Loire. The broad, rapid river washing its southern walls prevented the English from investing it completely. In the beginning of the siege, the French had burned the entire suburbs, which were extensive as a city, and contained a countless number of churches, convents, and monasteries that would have served as so many strongholds for the English, besides many finely built houses, the resorts of the burghers of Orléans. The inhabitants had retired within the embattled walls that encircled the city, flanked by square towers at short intervals, and thickly planted with cannon which, by the destruction of the suburbs, could play freely among advancing ranks of the besiegers. The English were protected by fifty or more bastilles and forts, erected and strongly garrisoned by men-at-arms, whose commanders were selected from the flower of the English army. The commander-in-chief, Salisbury, and the distinguished Talbot, occupied the nearest bastille, while the one next to the Loire was entrusted to Sir William Gladsdale, as being a post of danger. Moving towers and battering engines added to the formidable and firm appearance of their position. The English soldiers were nearly as superstitious as their foes, and their army was partly composed of French troops of the Burgundian party. They were filled with dread and fear at the thought of fighting against a maid, commissioned by heaven, or as some thought, a sorceress, or a saint who had the power of striking them to the earth by a word. Her fame had arrived before her, but her entrance into Orléans escaped the vigilance of the English, since it was covered by the darkness of a midnight tempest, as is asserted by some. Others record her arrival at, quote, eight o'clock of the evening, April twenty-ninth, when so great and so eager was the crowd, striving to touch her horse at least, that her progress through the streets was exceedingly slow. They gazed at her as if they were beholding an angel. She rode along, speaking kindly to the people, and after offering up prayers in the church, repaired to the house of the Duke of Orléans treasurer, an honorable man, whose wife and daughter gladly welcomed her. End quote. The succeeding day she rode gaily around the walls of the city to reconnoitre the English Bastilles, followed by a crowd who afterward repaired with her to the church of St. Croix to attend Vespers, and with French readiness to laugh or shed tears, so occasion may direct, feasted and smiled upon each other at the prospect of a near deliverance from their enemies. The armor were raised above all fear, drunk with religion and war, and furious with a fanaticism equal to their previous despair. The first attack which she led was directed against one of the northern Bastilles, strongly defended by men-at-arms. Talbot came to their assistance with a formidable detachment, but a fresh outpouring from the gates of Orléans and the approach of the maid in her white armor and emblazoned surcoat so filled them with fear that wherever her magic standard appeared, the soldiers threw down their arms and fled in consternation. The Bastille was taken, raised to the ground, and its defenders either put to the sword or carried prisoners into Orléans. Joan, at this first scene of carnage, wept to see so many perish unconfessed, and commanded the following day to be observed by fasting, prayer, and confession. The next morning she addressed her troops, and assured the commanders that victory was certain. They sallied out in the early sun, the knights with glittering helmets and polished shields, and coats of mail over which were thrown elegantly embroidered surcoats of silk or satin whereon were curiously beaten the arms of their house in gold, the men-at-arms bristling with murderous weapons, the scalers and the archers, filed out of the city and throwing themselves in boats crossed the Loire, and attacked the Tournelle, erected on the opposite bank and defended by Glasdale. Joan, in the beginning of the onset, was wounded by an arrow and fell, but was rescued, borne away from the scene of conflict, and laid upon the grass. 
Upon unloosing her armor and examining the wound, she found the arrow had pierced her through, and terrified wept with womanly weakness. This was but for a moment, for her voices came again. She rallied her strength and courage, dressed the wound with oil, and remained till nightfall in communion with her protecting saints, who appeared to her excited vision surrounded by a halo of light. Her standard was borne by a Basque soldier in the thickest of the affray, and never failed to disperse the enemy. While victory was still wavering between the two parties, the citizens of Orléans became impatient to decide the contest, rushed forth in a body, and assailed the French forces, who were urged on by shouts from the maid, exclaiming, Enter, all is yours! At a bound they gained the redoubt, and the English, terrified at the rush, and believing they saw the patron saint of the city or the archangel Michael protecting the French, fled in dismay to a bastille connected with the redoubt by a small bridge. A cannonball shivered the bridge while they were crowded upon it, precipitating them into the river and placing them at the mercy of their foes. Glasdale, who had heaped epithets of shame upon the head of the maid, was drowned before her eyes. Ah, oh, how I pity thy soul, she exclaimed, as she saw him borne down in useless struggles by the weight of his armor, to rise no more. These and other decisive defeats completely disheartened the English commanders, who saw their own troops paralyzed in the presence of the reputed sorceress, fall down in terror before her standard, and at the same time beheld the Orleanist possessed of a ferocious courage and fanatical confidence of success that made them irresistible. Unwilling to risk another battle, Talbot and Suffolk ordered a retreat, leaving on the plain their artillery, the Bastilles, the sick, wounded, and such prisoners as they had taken. While they were marching away, Joan had an altar erected on the plain, and mass sung in the hearing of the retreating enemy, tingling their ears with a sound of triumph and thanksgiving as they went out of sight. There was no longer a doubt entertained of the divine mission of the peasant girl, henceforth called the Maid of Orléans, and admitted to the councils of war. Messengers were now sent to Charles the Seventh, still indolently whiling away his time in the castle at Chinon, to come speedily with whatever forces he could collect and follow up their success before the English should be strengthened by detachments sent by the Duke of Bedford at Paris, under the command of Sir John Falstaff. As soon as the king arrived, the French were eager to see the accomplishment of the remainder of Joan's promises, and hastened to take possession of Sarjo and Beaugency before these places could be relieved by the English. The armies of Talbot and Sir John Falstaff had meanwhile effected a junction and being in a section overgrown with thickets and brambles, the Orleanists, in pursuit of them, could not discover their position. Joan now rode at the head of a rapidly increasing army. Recruits poured in from all quarters, wrought to the highest pitch of enthusiasm at the reported miracles Joan had performed, and elated at the late successes. The English are uniting, said she, but in God's name advance boldly against them, and assuredly they shall be conquered. But where shall we find them? asked some. Ride boldly forward, and you will be conducted to them, she replied. A band of sixty horsemen were sent in advance to reconnoiter. Unable to discover the English, they started a stag, which rushed into the enemy's ranks. A loud shout of surprise from them betrayed their position, while the French men-at-arms galloped up to the disordered army, gave them no time to rally, and rushed upon them. The soldiers, from fear of the maid, had been deserting in great numbers, and now, as she rode fearlessly at the head of a force multiplied into a host in the bewildered vision of the enemy, the English leaders could do nothing with the dismayed troops. Sir John Falstaff, though he had won honors for his courageous conduct in other battles, seemed overwhelmed with fear and confusion, and catching the superstitious spirit that infatuated his troops, turned and fled from the battlefield without striking a blow, for which cowardice the enraged Duke of Bedford deprived him of the Order of the Garter. Talbot was unwilling again to show his back to the royalists. He fought bravely, but was deserted by his followers and taken prisoner, while the rest were pursued and put to the sword. At the sight of the awful carnage, the maiden later wept. She obeyed the impulse of her tender sympathy. She dismounted and held the head of one who had been cut down before her, praying for his soul while she attempted to soothe his dying agonies. After the signal victory of this battle of Pate, the French, eager to see the king crowned at Rheims, went triumphantly from town to town, carrying everything before them. Quote, 
the indolent young monarch himself was hurried away by this popular tide which swelled and rolled northward king courtiers politicians enthusiasts fools and wise were off together either voluntarily or compulsorily at starting they were twelve thousand but the mass gathered bulk as it rolled along end quote. upon approaching troyes it was found so well garrisoned that the army large as it was despaired of forcing it without artillery a council was assembled after taking their position under the walls in which the leaders unanimously advised the abandonment of their march to rheims since it would be poor policy to leave such a stronghold in their rear and impossible to besiege the city since they lacked both provision and artillery one armagnac captain disputed the retreat while they were warmly debating joan herself knocked at the door and assured them they should be in troyes in three days we would willingly wait six said the chancellor were we certain you spoke sooth six you shall enter to-morrow exclaimed the heroic girl seizing her standard and calling upon the troops to follow her end of section thirteen Section 14 of the Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Rees. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Joan of Arc, Part 3. A portion of the ditch or fosse that surrounded the city was quickly filled in by her direction, and, while they prepared to cross and make the attack, the English offered to capitulate, reserving the privilege of marching away with their effects without molestation. As they passed from the gates, Joan perceived a number of French prisoners manacled and driven before them. She refused to let them pass, and the king was obliged to ransom them. The way was now open for their progress to Reims. Upon approaching that city, a deputation of the citizens went out to meet the king, presenting him the keys of the city and acknowledging him their sovereign. Joan led the way with her white banner always unfurled and floating like a beckoning spirit before the impetuous and worshipping army who followed wherever it conducted them. Her face beamed the triumph and joy she felt. Passing through the massive gateway, they went with a conqueror's step along the thronged streets and then to the cathedral to offer prayers and thanksgiving. This cathedral stood in a square, from which the six principal streets of Reims diverged. It was here that, two days after, the promised coronation took place. The holy oil of Clovis, secretly kept in the old church of St. Remy's, was brought with great ceremony by priests who were met at the entrance of the cathedral by the archbishop. He received it, and, approaching the king, who bowed reverently before it, consecrated him with all the state and pomp that the mysterious aid by which the event had been attained could suggest. The dark, massive walls, from which graceful arches sprang and fell, resting upon tall clustered columns, the curious and elaborate carvings everywhere visible, the vast interior crowded with ferocious soldiers, bearing their battle-axes and crossbows, knights with plumed helmets and gold-embroidered surcoats, the glittering mail of the men-at-arms, the fair and noble ladies of Reims in their enormous and lofty headdresses, the nobles in rich coronation robes, grouped about their monarch, who stood prominent in the stateliest array of royalty, the pompous archbishop, and above all, the maid with helmed head, like a war goddess, fair and terrible. Standing near the king, her sacred sword sheathed, and her banner dropping in folds upon her white armor, together formed a scene that filled the superstitious throng with a feeling of awe and wonder, and hushed them all to silence. When the crown, a golden bauble to gain which such rivers of blood had flowed, was placed upon the monarch's head, Joan burst into tears and prostrated herself at his feet, beseeching him, now that her promises were fulfilled, to permit her to return to her own valley, and with her sisters watch the flocks upon the hills, and be happy and peaceful again, were their grieved parents. All who listened wept with her, but Charles, unwilling to lose one upon whom his battles depended, would not consent to her departure till the English were driven from France. As a mark of his gratitude, he ennobled her family, giving them the title of Dulice, 
in allusion to the lilies on her banner, and presented her with a handsome estate. The movements of the army were now like so many triumphal processions. City after city surrendered without resistance, till it arrived at St. Denis. Joan refused to proceed further, warned by her voices, or presentiments, that she could not advance with safety. Regardless of her advice, the commanders, elated with past success, pushed forward to Paris. The Duke of Bedford was alarmed at the rapid progress of the Orleanists. He sent to the Duke of Burgundy for assistance, and afterwards to the powerful Cardinal Winchester, who hastily raised forces in England, and came to Paris with the young Henry the Sixth in order to crown him there. Thus strengthened, and in possession of the Seine both above and below the city, it was impossible for Charles the Seventh to besiege it with his army, ill provided with the necessary provisions and equipments. In the very face of impossibilities, he advanced towards the strong and well-prepared city, depending on the mysterious power of the maid and the enthusiasm of his followers. They carried one of the outposts, and the brave and fearless Joan cleared the first fosse with a bound, firmly maintaining her seat, and in another spring was beyond the mound that separated it from the second, where but few dared to follow her. Her conspicuous dress was a fair mark for the showers of arrows falling thickly around her. Regardless of her danger, she sounded the depth of the fosse with her lance, but, while urging the troops to follow, an arrow darted through the links of her armor and pierced deeply, causing such a flow of blood as obliged her to seek shelter. The French were repulsed with severe losses. The headlong impetuosity that had served them before would not calmly brook reserves, and they were ready to heap reproaches and harsh epithets upon the brave girl who had warned them not to make the rash attempt upon Paris. Disheartened and weak with pain and loss of blood, she could not be prevailed upon to return to the camp till after nightfall. The French now abandoned the hope of securing Paris, and occupied the winter in laying siege to two towns, one of which was successfully carried by the exertions of Joan, the other abandoned in a panic. In the meantime, the Duke of Burgundy assembled a formidable army, and with the English troops in the spring of 1430 laid siege to Compiègne, where the French were concentrated. The maid threw herself into the city, and on the second day headed a sally against the besiegers. In the beginning of the struggle, her party was successful, but the English rallied and drove back the assailants. Joan remained in the rear, to cover the retreat of her followers, reached the bridge too late to enter the gates which suddenly closed, and, betrayed by the governor of the city, she was left among the crowd upon the bridge. Conspicuous by her dress, a purple surcoat brilliantly embroidered with gold, thrown over her armor, she was immediately seized by a Picard archer, and dragged from her horse. She surrendered to the bastard of Vendôme, a distinguished knight, who conducted her to the English camp and placed her under a secure guard. The soldiers crowded about and gazed upon her, and the English nobles and Burgundians could not restrain their exclamations of surprise at finding the witch, the sorceress, the great object of terror, to be only a simple, delicate, and fair young girl. They were more delighted at her capture than if they had taken a host of French prisoners, and assembling, in showy array, in the plain before Compiègne, sent up shouts of victory. Joan was sold to John of Luxembourg, who sent her under a strong guard to the castle in Beaulieu, in Picardy, where she was confined in the highest tower. But soon after, from political motives, he had her removed to his own castle of Beaurevoir. Here she could only gaze from the narrow windows of the loftiest tower upon the meadows, the streams, and the blue hills, beyond which she could fancy see her peaceful home, her mourning parents, and her young and loved Homette with whom she would have given worlds to breathe the free air again. A close prisoner, and in despair for France, fearful too for her own fate, she passed the weary days in prayer and weeping. She was filled with forebodings of evil. She had endeavored to effect her escape from the castle of Beaulieu, and even now from the high towers of Beaurevoir the intrepid girl attempted a descent. She fell and was taken up half-dead by the ladies of Luxembourg, who bestowed the most tender care upon her. They were won by her gentleness, and doubly attracted by sympathy for her grief, that she could no longer aid France, and her tears and anxiety for the king for whom she suffered, but who made no effort for her deliverance. She knew that her present captor had sold her to the Duke of Burgundy, and suffered herself to be led away from her new-found friends, 
who in vain pled with tears at the feet of John of Luxembourg, entreating him not to deliver her into the hands of the English, thirsting as they did for the blood of one who had cost them so dearly. She was conveyed to Arras, and from thence to the dungeon-keep of Crotoy, where she could look out upon the sea and watch the ships gliding to and fro, or driving along on the waves of a tempest. A clear day revealed the distant coast of England. It reminded her of the Duke of Orléans, who, like herself, a close prisoner, wore his life away in chains on a foreign shore. All her fire and spirit was roused, for it had been one of her treasured hopes to secure his release, when the French arms had triumphed. Joan was consoled and strengthened by a priest who, likewise a captive, said mass daily in her presence. In this she heartily joined, her old enthusiasm returning and her courage revived by the voices which assured her that she should be delivered when she had seen the king of the English. Nearly a year had passed since her first imprisonment, when she was claimed by the bishop of the diocese in which she was taken, at the instigation of Cardinal Winchester, whose plan was to crown Henry the Sixth, and at the same time disgrace the pretensions of Charles the Seventh by burning the girl who had secured his coronation as a witch or sorceress. By order of the vicar of the Inquisition, Joan was taken to Rouen in February 1431. Released from her long confinement, she exulted in the pure fresh air of freedom, and rode cheerfully along with her keepers, though still manacled with chains. Approaching Rouen, the inhabitants thronged the entrance to catch a glimpse of the wonderful being who was represented, at one moment, a beautiful woman, an angel, and at the next, described as a demon who possessed a terrible power over her enemies. They hardly knew whether to shrink from her gaze, or touch and kiss her garments. All were filled with amazement at beholding so fair and harmless a girl. The women of Rouen, in their tall muslin caps, red petticoats, and clattering cabots, followed her through the streets, and with motherly protection would have shielded her from the denunciations about to descend upon her, could they have rescued her from the grim monks who closely guarded her. Joan felt her spirit depressed as they traced the narrow winding streets of Rouen, lined with peak-roofed houses, decorated with curious carvings and innumerable balconies. Towers and spires with rich-cut ornaments loomed up along the narrow way which was crowded and confused with passing donkeys, laden with well-filled panniers and driven by quaintly dressed women and children, while men in silken jackets and long-peaked shoes added their sonorous cries to the babel of voices. Joan, weary and bewildered, was soon led before the impatient assemblage, eager for their victim. Bishops, monks, doctors of theology and of the canon law, enveloped in stately robes, sat ready to pronounce judgment upon a girl whom they were bribed to condemn by some means, if she were guilty or not. Alone in the midst of this subtle court, without the sympathy of a friend or the aid of a counsel, Joan sat with intrepid bearing, her spirit free, though her limbs were chained. Upon being required to swear to speak the truth, she consented, but refused to reveal anything connected with her visions. She was ordered to repeat the pater and the ave, her judges thinking that she would not dare to if possessed with an evil spirit. To their surprise she readily assented if the presiding bishop would hear her confess. This touching and confiding demand overcame the bishop, who adjourned the sitting, and afterwards deputed one of his assessors to question the accused. As it was found impossible to convict her on the ground of sorcery, she was charged with heresy, since she refused to acknowledge the authority of the church militant. She told them she held her belief in God alone. The long-continued trial, and her efforts to sustain herself, induced an illness, from which she had not recovered when she was again summoned to the hall of the castle where the court sat. Threats of torture were given to intimidate her, but she adhered firmly to her account of the voices and would still acknowledge none but the one God. They insisted upon her discarding the man's dress she wore, but to this she would not consent, it being her only protection, and the dress which her saints directed her to wear. Led back to the tower, where every movement was watched by keepers stationed near her, she became more severely ill. In this situation her tormentors visited her, hoping to make her yield her belief while too weak to maintain courage in her assertions. The angel Gabriel, said she, has appeared to strengthen me. They were obliged to leave her, 
firm and unyielding as she had ever been. In order to terrify her into submission, a scaffold was erected in the cemetery of St. Juan, behind the church of the same name. Joan was placed upon it in the midst of hussiers and torturers, a preacher and an executioner in his cart below her. Opposite, on another scaffolding, sat Cardinal Winchester and the bishops, with their assessors and scribes. The preacher, who was to exhort and urge her to submission, overdid the matter by exclaiming violently against Charles the Seventh, calling him a heretic and accepting Joan for a leader. This roused the indignation of the brave girl, who, in spite of threatened terrors, had the nobleness to defend the king who had deserted her. On my faith, sir, I undertake to tell you and to swear on pain of my life that he is the noblest Christian of all Christians, the sincerest lover of the faith of the church, and not what you call him, exclaimed she boldly. Silence her, cried out the bishop, who began to read the sentence of condemnation. Abjure or be burnt, reached her ears. Those about and below her entreated her to save herself by acknowledging the power of the Pope. We pity you, Joan, urged the people who crowded about the scaffold. Overcome at last with fear and entreaties, she consented to abjure, on condition she should be delivered from the power of the English and be placed in the hands of the Church. What is to be done next? respectfully asked Carichon, the bishop, turning to Cardinal Winchester. Admit her to do penance, answered the wily Englishman, which penance was to pass the rest of her days in imprisonment, on the bread of grief and the water of anguish. Take her back whence you brought her, continued the bishop, while Joan, dumb with surprise and despair, could scarcely move. The poor girl had thought at least she was to be spared chains and the hateful dungeon. Even at this respite the English were so enraged that they pelted the bishop with stones, and the priests and doctors could escape only by promising they should soon have her again. She was led away to her prison house and chained to a beam. But this did not satisfy the English, who attributed the continued success of the French arms to her sorcery, exerted even within the walls of a prison. The guards were ordered to hang her armor within reach, hoping she would be tempted to resume the dress and thus break the conditions she had signed. The result was what they wished, and, as soon as the news reached the cardinal, he gladly exclaimed, She is caught! The inquisitor and others were deputed to visit and question her. She bravely faced them, and told them she had resumed the dress, because it was fitter for her, as long as she was guarded by men. Put me in a seemly prison, and I will be good and do whatever the church shall wish, said she. The next day it was told her she must die. She wept pitifully, tearing her hair and mourning that she was to endure the frightful torture of being burned. After the first burst of grief, she confessed and asked to receive the sacrament, which was granted her, with the inconsistency of condemning her as a heretic and at the same time granting her all the ordinances of the church. The following morning she was dressed in female attire, placed on a cart, accompanied by priests, and surrounded by a guard of eight hundred Englishmen, armed with sword and lance, who conveyed her to the old marketplace. She wept as they went along, crying out, O oh, Rouen, Rouen, must I then die here? Three scaffolds were erected, one upon which a throne was placed for the Cardinal Winchester and the prelates, and the third, built high and filled underneath with faggots, was for the harmless victim. The ceremony began with a sermon preached by one of the doctors of the University of Paris. This was followed by exhortations from the bishops to recant all she had said concerning her angels. But, though she was bitterly disappointed that none had come to rescue her, and her confidence in the voices thus sorely tried, because they failed to deliver her, still she affirmed the truth of her assertions, and persisted in rejecting the Pope and his minions. Though you should tear off my limbs and pluck my soul from my body, I would say nothing else, she cried. She knelt upon the platform, invoked God, the Virgin, St. Michael, and St. Catherine, then turned to those who had accused her, forgave them their injuries, and besought their pardon, asking them to pray for her. She entreated the priests each to say a mass for her soul. Her manner, voice, and look were so full of grief, and her appeals so touching that, with contagious sympathy, every beholder wept, 
even the cruel cardinal. Vexed at betraying such weakness, the judges dried their eyes, and crushing the momentary feeling of kindness for the lovely and friendless girl, proceeded to read her condemnation in a stern voice. The faggots were kindled, and as they crackled and burned beneath the platform, she cried out for a crucifix. An Englishman gave her one he had hastily carved out of a stick, but she entreated them to bring one from the neighboring church, which, after some hesitation, was obtained and held up before her. At last, overcome with terror and suffocated with the smoke and flames that curled about her delicate form, she expired with prayers on her lips. The multitude wept at her sufferings and silently dispersed, full of consternation at the deed. Even the executioner hastened to relieve his terror and remorse by confession. Thus perished a fair and innocent girl who had committed no crime but that of seeking to rescue her nation from the grasp of a hated enemy. Pure, gentle, and heroic, imbued with the superstition of the times, gifted with a vivid, intense imagination that had become morbid through her early habits of lonely communion, it was not wonderful that she should imagine she conversed with spirits in an age when every one consulted unseen spirits and fairies to some extent. She was educated from the cradle in the belief of visions of saints and angels, assurances of which fell daily upon her ear in tales and legends from her mother's lips. The French believed and accepted her as a celestial deliverer, investing her with a supernatural power which she did not claim. On one occasion at Bourges, when the women prayed her to touch crosses and chaplets, she laughed merrily and said, Touch them yourselves. They will be just as good. Her success was simply that of a warrior who inspires his troops with his own courage and confidence of victory and rushes to battle with an impetuosity that sometimes supplies a lack of skill. She took advantage of the superstition of those she led, as well as those she opposed. She embodied their ideal of an angel in mortal form, by the purity of her beauty, manner, and words, which was manifested even in her equipments. And thus they followed her with a unity and enthusiasm that gave strength to a party that previously owed its weakness to an indolent and despairing prince, and to the divisions and feuds among the leading nobility. Through all the deference and honors paid her, she never lost the childlike sweetness and simplicity that were singularly united in her character with good sense, shrewdness, and woman's subtlety. Charles the Seventh, who owed his crown and kingdom to her heroic exertions, acknowledged the debt by causing a monument to be erected to her memory in Paris, so soon as his power was established. The inhabitants of Rouen testified their admiration of her and their disapprobation of the unjust sentence by erecting a statue that still stands in the marketplace of the old city. The house in which she was born was afterwards repaired on the original plan by the king's orders, and still remains in Dom Remy. It stands near the church and is easily discovered by a Gothic door that supports three scutcheons adorned with the fleur-de-lis, and a statue in which she is represented in full armor. It became national property during the reign of Louis the Eighteenth, who granted the village 12,000 francs to build a monument to the memory of Joan. 8,000 for the education of young girls in Dom Remy and the neighboring hamlets, and another 8,000 as a support for a sister of charity to teach the school. A fine painting, The Gift of the King, decorates the principal room of the house. In the marketplace, which is surrounded by poplar trees and watered by a fountain, is placed a statue of the maid. On the monument is the simple inscription, To the Memory of Joan of Arc. End of section 14. Recording by Matthew Reese, Davenport, Iowa. Section 15 of The Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Abai in September 2010. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins Section 15 Maria Theresa Part 1 We will not from the helm to sit and weep, but keep our course, though the rough wind say, No. Shakespeare
Austria is a name that suggests the ideas of despotism, cruelty and bigotry. In these respects it is a land that has no rival, except Russia. Every humane and free heart must burn with indignation at the mere mention of those empires. But Austria, however repulsive as a bloodthirsty power, has much attractive interest in its several provinces and noted places and in portions of its history. Bohemia, Moravia and Hungary have associations that are dear to art, to religion and to liberty. Austerlitz is a word of potent influence, and Vienna is full of picturesque imagery, for it is the name of a capital than which there is none more gay, magnificent, and enriched with curiosities. Not in any other town, with statelier progress to and fro, the double tides of chariots flow, by park and suburb, on the brown of lustier leaves, no more content or pleasure lives in any crowd, when all is gay with lamps and loud with sport and song in booth and tent, imperial halls or open plain, and wheels the circle dance and breaks the rocket molten into flakes of crimson or an emerald rain. And as for the history of Austria, it would have enough charm if it only bore the noble name of Maria Theresa. In her we behold indeed some of the worst peculiarities of her royal line, but softened by her womanly nature and receiving from that nature many a balancing virtue. If her censorship of the press and espionage of private life were worthy of her detestable successors, her great and successful enterprises, military, educational and industrial, and her reforms in church and state were worthy of her beauty, talent and exalted character. Vienna was her birthplace, and her birthday the 13th of May, 1717. As usual, the royal child received a baptismal name proportioned in length to her imperial ancestry and superfluous as her fortune. It was Maria Teresa Valperga Amelia Cristina, a grand name, like a carriage of state with six horses. Nothing short of a family that, like Maria Theresa's, the House of Habsburg, had reigned four hundred years and had absorbed so many states and races into its vast empire, should justify such a parade of pray no means. Her father, the Emperor Charles the Sixth, was a man of dull perceptions and extraordinary gravity, very punctilious in all matters of form and of a benevolent disposition. He labored to improve the condition of his dominions, rebuilt roads, encouraged commerce, manufactures and art, revised the laws of Hungary, and established museums and libraries. He was fond of athletic sports, such as hunting and shooting at a mark, but his ruling passion was music. He composed an opera, and himself led the orchestra, while his daughters acted as ballet dancers. The costume and scenery of one of these exhibitions cost him over a hundred and thirty thousand dollars. From Italy he attracted to his court Metastasio, who composed some of his best operas at Vienna and was Italian preceptor to the young princesses. But, in consequence of the imbecility of Charles and his advisers, his reign nearly ruined his empire. His best general, Prince Eugene, died, and his enemies made encroachments on every side. The English ambassador wrote home that, quote, Everything in this court is running into the last confusion and ruin, where there are as visible signs of folly and madness as ever were inflicted on a people whom heaven is determined to destroy, no less by domestic divisions than by the more public calamities of repeated defeats, defenselessness, poverty, plague, and famine. End quote. The loss of Belgrade, surrendered by a treaty to the Turks, and the menacing conduct of the French, preyed on his spirits, undermined his health, and inflamed his ailments of gout and indigestion. With reckless imprudence, he insisted on taking a hunting excursion, and eat immoderately of mushrooms stewed in oil. This prostrated him beyond recovery. He took an affectionate leave of his family, and died in 1740, when Maria Theresa was twenty-three years of age. 
His wife was Elizabeth Christina, daughter of Louis Rodolphe, Duke of Brunswick. By her, he was the father of a son who died in infancy, and three daughters, one of whom died in childhood. The others were Maria Theresa, the eldest, and Maria Amelia. They married brothers, Francis, Duke of Lorraine, and Prince Charles of Lorraine. The latter, Maria Amelia's husband, was distinguished in the wars of Theresa's accession to the throne. The mother, like the daughters, was famed for beauty, elegant manners, and kind disposition. The sisters, who bore the title of archduchesses, were very unlike in their style of person, mind, and character. Equally fascinating, Maria Amelia had less intellect and confidence and brilliancy of feature. Maria Theresa was full of life and dignity. She seemed every way constituted for a queen. Her form was tall and well-proportioned, her face regular, her eyes a bright grey, her complexion clear, her voice musical, and her bearing at once majestic and graceful. In her youth, her temper was sufficiently gentle and yielding, her heart overflowing with tenderness. It was not until she assumed the scepter and found herself threatened on every side by hostile invasions that the unrelenting determination of her character was drawn forth, and indeed a degree of resoluteness was demanded that hardly differed from the obstinacy peculiar to her family blood. She was educated, after the manner of the age, more in feminine accomplishments than in the solid acquirements that would best fit her for a station of great authority. From her father she inherited a passion for music, which was carefully developed under her distinguished instructors, among whom was Metastasio. He took much pride in her proficiency, especially in the Italian language, and could not praise too highly her talent and gentleness. Happily, the family pride so assiduously nourished by the house of Habsburg induced in her a studious acquaintance with the history and condition of her expected empire, so that a foundation was laid for her able administration. At the same time, the seeds of her after bigotry were sown and cultivated by the thousand Romanish observances to which a great part of her time was set apart. It fostered, however, a strong religious inclination that might have made her a saint in the annals of a more enlightened creed than that of Rome. At the age of fourteen she was required, as a matter of custom for the heir apparent to the crown, to be present at the meetings of the royal council. She had no share, of course, in the debates, but however long and tedious the sessions were, she always showed the liveliest interest in everything said, whether intelligible to her or not. The need of being well versed in affairs of state was apparently anticipated by her shrewd apprehension. The only part she was permitted to take in the proceedings was the offering of petitions entrusted to her care. Her immature years and ready goodwill made her frequently subject to such applications, and when her father rebuked her with the words, You seem to think a sovereign has nothing to do but to grant favors, she replied with a precocious wisdom, I see nothing else that can make a crown supportable. At so early a period of life, she saw that her father's miseries were not outweighed by the empty shows of imperial grandeur. The young Francis, Duke of Lorraine, whose mother was a first cousin of the Emperor, had been brought up at the court of Vienna as the destined husband of Maria Theresa. From infancy they had associated together, and now, in youth, became more romantically devoted to each other. He had every quality to captivate her heart. Though not powerful or brilliant in mind, he was intelligent and kind, and he was brave, manly, accomplished, and remarkably handsome. When the Archduchess had reached the age of eighteen, her father's government was so much endangered by the triumphs of foes and the indifference of pledged friends that he was urged to break up the proposed union with Francis and give his daughter to Don Carlos of Spain as a last resort to uphold his own power. The Spanish minister at his court recommended that both daughters be married to princes of Spain. But Maria Theresa, already betrothed, remonstrated so warmly that the emperor knew not what to do. In the words of the English minister, quote, She is a princess of the highest spirit. Her father's losses are her own. 
She reasons already, she enters into affairs, she admires his virtues, but condemns his mismanagement, and is of a temper so formed for rule and ambition as to look upon him as little more than her administrator. Notwithstanding this lofty humour by day, she sighs and pines all night for her Duke of Lorraine. If she sleeps, it is only to dream of him. If she wakes, it is but to talk of him to the lady-in-waiting, so that there is no more probability of her forgetting the very individual government and the very individual husband which she thinks herself born to, than of her forgiving the authors of losing either. End quote. The Empress joined her own to the entreaties of her daughter, the German ministers interfered in behalf of the Duke, and the Emperor, driven to sleepless distraction, finally yielded to the wish of his family, and strengthened his power by a treaty with his old enemy France, giving the Duchy of Bar and France's inheritance of Lorraine in exchange for Tuscany. Francis and Maria Theresa, thus saved from separation by her constancy and resolution, were married at Vienna in February 1736. Two sweet children crowned this year's happiness. Blessed in these and in their own youth, beauty, love, and splendid position and prospects, nothing could exceed the brightness of their union. But the common lot of trouble was in store for them. The Duke was appointed to the command of an army set against the Turks in the first year of his marriage. He was courageous and often risked his life, but he was not a great and successful commander, and he was, moreover, fettered by the instructions of the court and by the lack of needed means. Victorious at first, the army suffered sad reverses and was weakened by pestilence. Francis returned to Vienna to meet the complaints of the emperor, the cold welcome of the powerful, the unjust contempt of the people, but to be greeted also by the warm sympathy of his wife, whose fear for his exposures was now changed to indignation at his treatment. Her father found it advisable to send her and the duke to Tuscany, ostensibly to visit their new estates, and he talked of changing the heirship of the crown to his youngest daughter and betrothing her to the elector of Bavaria. All this was probably done to appease the popular feeling. At Florence, the young wife was very discontented, the climate was disagreeable to her more northern associations. She saw little to admire in the people or the city and scenery. She was in continual distress about the misguided state of affairs at home, whereby her vast inheritance was rapidly dwindling. And Charles himself did not long manage to dispense with his daughter's clearer mind and firmer character. Four years passed since her nuptials, when she was called to the throne by the death of her father, whose end was hastened by his repeated misfortunes. She was twenty-three when she thus began to enjoy the various titles of Queen of Hungary and Bohemia, Archduchess of Austria, Sovereign of the Netherlands, Duchess of Milan, of Parma and Placentia, and Grand Duchess of Tuscany, all of which honours are summed up in the one name of Empress of Austria. She swayed the scepter over various nations, with diverse languages and laws, and only held together by submission to one sovereign. It was the richest empire of Europe, but its treasury was drained, its armies scattered, its provinces disaffected, and on every side were greedy governments to whom her accession was the signal to fall upon her dominions and divide them among themselves. The famous pragmatic sanction was to be broken by all. This was a treaty which it had been the labor of Charles' life to establish. By it, the European powers had guaranteed to support the claims of Maria Theresa to the imperial crown, instead of the daughters of Emperor Joseph, the predecessor and brother of Charles, and to whose family the succession should have reverted, according to Charles' own solemn promise. These daughters had married, the eldest, the elector of Bavaria, the youngest, the elector of Saxony. France, jealous of the ascendancy of Austria, with various false excuses, deferred to acknowledge Maria Theresa, and prepared to assist the pretensions of the Bavarian elector, who claimed Austria, Hungary, and Bohemia. The king of Spain made the same pretension, and set on foot an expedition against the Italian dependencies of the empire. The Sardinian king had his eye on Milan, and the king of Prussia, Frederick II, 
marched for Silesia before his designs were known at Vienna and took possession of it. He proved to be the almost lifelong and very dangerous enemy of the Empress, although he entertained high personal respect for her character. His father, without engaging much in war, had made it his empty pride to discipline a vast standing army, amass money, and drill his son in military science. Frederick had resisted this stern schooling and devoted himself passionately to literature and art. But, so soon as, about this time, he mounted the throne of his father, he suddenly revealed extraordinary ambition and skill as a politician and commander. Thus was the young and beautiful Maria Theresa, at the instant the diadem was placed on her head, called to take arms against the sea of troubles. Her own strong understanding and strong will were all that she could rely upon. Her husband was brave and tender, but with no talents nor disposition to assume the guidance of affairs, he was devoted to pleasure, and seems to have trusted more to his wife's intelligence and decision than to his own. The members of the state council were weak men, who were confounded by the difficulties that beset them. Bartenstein, who was their chief and had been under Charles, was a man of facile pen and tongue, faithful to his trust, but too shallow for his responsible position. England alone, although afterwards tardy in many of her engagements, was enthusiastic in favour of the Empress. The English ladies, indeed, subscribed some $450,000 in her aid. But she did not find it consistent to accept it, and, for the present, was virtually without allies, armies, counsellors, and money. Never was a sky darker than hers. All who were around her expressed only despair in their countenances. The army that had been hastily raised to oppose the aggressions of Frederick was defeated by his troops in Silesia. The French, appealed to in remembrance of the pragmatic sanction by which they were bound, gave evasive answers, until they marched their forces across the Rhine, joined the elector of Bavaria, subdued Bohemia, and approached the gates of Vienna itself. Still was Maria Theresa undaunted, although the crisis of her fate grew desperate even to sublimity. The birth of a son, whose destiny was involved in that of the empire like her own, was perhaps opportune at this dark hour, for it roused all the lioness within her. The mother will dare for her offspring that which she would shrink from for her own sake. The bold and wise resolution of the empress was taken. By it she at once saved herself and her magnificent realm. History and romance have no more inspiring and memorable story to relate. It is glorious as a dream. The Hungarians, whose struggles in this century have excited universal sympathy, had been relieved from political evils by Maria Theresa, who restored to them their privileges. For this they were deeply grateful to her. She was their queen, in virtue of a previous union of Austria and Hungary by the marriage of their respective sovereigns. In the great emergency of their dominions, therefore, she went to Pressburg to be crowned, it being the custom to repeat the act of coronation in each of the several kingdoms acknowledging one head. The ceremony took place on the 13th of June, 1741. According to the ancient usage, the iron crown of St. Stephen was placed on her, having been lined with cushions to make it fit her womanly head. His ragged and venerated robe covered her jeweled dress, and his scimitar was girded at her side. An eyewitness of the scene writes that, quote, The antiquated crown received new graces from her head, and the old tattered robe of St. Stephen became her as well as her own habit, if diamonds, pearls, and all sorts of precious stones can be called clothes. End quote. She rode gallantly to the top of the Royal Mount, a hill near Pressburg, and went gracefully through the ceremony of waving the drawn sabre and defying the four corners of the world. Then she returned and dined in public. The heat and fatigue had heightened the color of her transparent complexion, the crown was removed, and her rich masses of hair fell in curls over her shoulders and breast. Her appearance, her recent liberal concessions, and her defenseless situation aroused the warmest enthusiasm of the brave and chivalric Hungarians. 
she knew that she could trust herself and fortunes to their generosity and invincible prowess and having summoned the representatives of all orders of the state to meet in diet at the great hall of the castle she appeared clad in mourning and the hungarian costume and still wearing the crown and scimitar which were regarded by the nation with such religious respect with slow stately steps she walked through the apartment and ascended the tribune from which it was customary for sovereigns to address the states after an impressive silence the chancellor stated her distresses and requested speedy assistance then she herself made a short speech in latin a language in common use among the hungarians she appealed to the deputies declaring that her only resource was in their faithfulness arms and tried valor she called on them to deliberate as to the best means of rescuing her from danger and promised always to seek their happiness her words and her loveliness set on fire all the admiration and martial spirit of the assembly they half drew their swords and flung them back in their brazen scabbards with a loud ringing sound and shouted we will consecrate our lives and arms we will die for our king maria teresa it was a law that no queen could reign over them and hence they called her king she was overcome by this outburst of zeal and wept for joy and gratitude such an evidence of sensibility kindled their enthusiasm almost to madness they shed tears of sympathy and wildly gesticulating their resolution retired and voted abundant supplies of men and money end of section 15section 16 of the heroines of history this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by avai in september 2010 the heroines of history by john s jenkins section 16 maria teresa part 2 a similar scene occurred when the duke of lorraine appeared to take oath as co-regent of the kingdom at the conclusion of the act he waved his hand and said my blood and life for the queen and kingdom at the same moment she held up her infant son an exulting cry again arose then the deputies repeated their vow we will die for our king and her family we will die for maria teresa Fair Austria spreads her mournful charms, the queen, the beauty, sees the world in arms. From hill to hill the beacon's towering blaze spreads wide the hope of plunder and of praise. The fierce Croatian and the wild hussar, with all the sons of ravage, crowd the war. The coup d'etat of the empress soon changed the whole face of affairs numerous half-savage tribes from the far-off banks of the save the Theiss, the drave and the danube sent their wild warriors to rally around her standard croats pandors sclavonians varastinians and tolpaches as they are called astonished the eyes of civilized europe by their ferocious looks and their strange dress arms and mode of warfare the students of Vienna, whose modern representatives were bravely active in the revolution of 1848, mingled their delicate young faces with the shaggy beards of the Croats and Pandors. All classes pressed into the army, while the enemies of Maria Theresa became jealous of each other and divided in their councils. Frederick sought peace in view of this turning of the tide of success, yet he was too proud to yield his claim to silesia the empress having long and heroically resisted this claim at length ceded to him a part of that province well knowing that she was not with all her new supplies a match for so many powerful enemies on the right hand and the left the elector of bavaria aided by france had already seized bohemia was crowned king of prague and soon after crowned emperor of germany at frankfurt this was a great offence to maria theresa who wished her husband to be elected to the imperial diadem and she was speedily avenged 
the austrian army headed by the duke of lorraine entered the capital of bavaria as conquerors the very day that the elector was crowned at frankfort the austrians supported by england and holland achieved one victory after another the english king george the second was himself present at hazardous battles the semi-civilized croatians swam rivers each with his sabre in his mouth and mounting on each other's shoulders scaled castle walls the provinces in italy were fortified and the spanish and french invasions repulsed in that direction cardinal fleury for seventeen years the animating soul of the court of france died and left his nation without a pilot the french besieged at prague were weakened by disease and famine and at last fled to the Rhine, leaving twelve hundred men, destroyed by cold and hunger, to mark their track. Through the whole campaign, Maria Theresa issued her orders with great determination and wisdom. Her will seemed to have grown relentless and imperious by the difficulties she had met and overcome. She was vexed exceedingly at the escape of the perfidious French, for whom she had no mercy, she celebrated the evacuation of prague with public chariot races in imitation of the greeks and herself and her sister habited in appropriate costume took the reins among others and drove adventurously around the course with flushed faces erect forms and streaming robes to the admiration of all beholders after the victory of dettingen the empress queen returning from a boating excursion was cheered by the viennese who came forth to meet her and crowded the banks of the danube for nine miles she celebrated the event by a te deum in the cathedral and joyous festivities elated by unexpected success her ambition and her animosity to the powers that had conspired to crush her at length knew no bounds she rejected the compromises offered and meditated nothing less than the complete dismemberment of the french and prussian territories but discussion began to prevail among her allies frederick who was always wide awake guessed her designs captured prague and threatened her capital itself bavaria also was again seized by her foes and maria theresa was forced to apply once more to her sympathetic hungarians she went to Pressburg and appealed to their loyalty with still greater effect. Count Palfi, the aged Palatine, erected the great red banner of the kingdom, a signal for a general insurrection, as a general levy of troops was called. Forty-four thousand men took up their march, and thirty thousand others were collected in readiness. Quote, this amazing anonymity, end quote, writes a man of that day, quote, of a people so divided amongst themselves, especially in point of religion, could only be effected by the address of Maria Theresa, who seemed to possess one part of the character of Elizabeth of England, that of making every man about her a hero. End quote. An ecstasy of zeal prevailed from the highest to the lowest rank of society. The Empress sent a horse, a sword, and a ring to the Palatine, the horse was her own and richly caparisoned, and the sabre was studded with diamonds. The tide of war turned again. Bohemia and Bavaria were reconquered, and Charles the Seventh, who had been from the first a puppet emperor in the hands of France, died from chagrin and indigestion like Charles the Sixth. He enjoined on his son to make no pretensions to the crown, the advice was complied with, and Austria seized the occasion to secure the election of the husband of the Empress, Francis, Duke of Lorraine. He was crowned at Frankfurt, October 4, 1745. Maria Theresa witnessed the ceremony from a balcony and cried, Long live the Emperor Francis I! A general acclamation echoed her words. After this, she visited the army at Heidelberg, numbering 60,000. She met the new emperor at the head of his troops, rode along the lines, saluting each rank with charming grace and majesty, dined under a pavilion, and gave largesse to each soldier. Her husband being thus regularly invested with the imperial dignity, she was henceforth known as the Empress Queen. 
Germany being the empire, and Hungary and Bohemia the queendoms. But though she had fairly, according to the code of force, won these high titles, she was compelled, out of regard to the elector of Saxony, who was a constant sufferer in her cause, to resign Silesia to Prussia by a final treaty. This humiliation she had resisted for years, and with an immense expenditure of gold and blood. It was her pride to preserve entire the whole empire. Frederick had been her first assailant. She could not forgive him for opening the general war against her, and she had declared that she would sell her last shift before she would yield one inch of Silesia. But in Italy and Holland her foes were triumphing. Marshal Saxe was retrieving the glory of French arms. England was tired of furnishing money to Austria at the rate of a million pounds in one year, and had, moreover, a rebellion at home to attend to, and thus she was forced to consult prudence. In 1748, a general peace was ratified by the celebrated Treaty of Aix la chapelle at which the plenipotentiaries of all the leading powers met. Even then and there, Count Kaunitz, acting under the instructions of the indomitable Empress Queen, endeavoured to break up the conference, so unwilling was she to lose any territory while a florin was left in her coffers, or a soldier under her command. As it was, she gave up Silesia, Parma, Placentia, and Guastilla. She now turned her attention to the internal administration of the realm, to be well prepared for any new wars, she adopted a better discipline of the army, founded a military academy at the capital, and inspected the camps and garrisons. The discerning Frederick acknowledged that her power over the hearts of her soldiers was magical, and that the Austrian army, never before so well trained, had been made to achieve successes worthy of a great man. In civil affairs, her energy was no less conspicuous than in military. Among many other beneficial measures, she revised the courts of justice, abolished the custom of torture, and carried out a new plan of taxation, by which, after eight years of war and the surrender of four states, the revenues still exceeded those of any former reign by six millions of florins. She undertook to civilize the gypsies, who abound more in Hungary and Bohemia than elsewhere, but neither rewards nor punishments could induce that strange race to mingle with others and adopt a stationary and laborious life. The glory of her family and the good of her people seemed to be the animating motives of Maria Theresa in all these reforms and enterprises. She sought advice or information from all quarters, yet would not be dictated to in her plans. Her vigilance and activity were commendable, but were carried to an extreme injurious to her own health and comfort. She rose at five, breakfasted on a cup of milk coffee, and then attended mass. Quote, the floor of her room was so contrived that it opened by a sliding parquet, and mass was celebrated in the chapel beneath. Thus she assisted at the ceremony without being seen, and with as little trouble and loss of time as possible. She then proceeded to business. Every Tuesday she received the ministers of the different apartments. Other days were set apart for giving audience to foreigners and strangers, who, according to the etiquette of the imperial court, were always presented singly and received in the private apartments. There were stated days on which the poorest and meanest of her subjects were admitted, almost indiscriminately, and so entire was her confidence in their attachment and her own popularity, that they might whisper to her, or see her alone if they required it. At other times she read memorials, or dictated letters and dispatches, signed papers, etc., at noon her dinner was brought in, consisting of a few dishes, served with simplicity. After the death of her husband, she usually dined alone, like Napoleon, to economize time. After dinner she was engaged in public business until six. After that hour, her daughters were admitted to join her in evening prayer. If they absented themselves, she sent to know if they were indisposed. If not, they were certain of meeting with a reprimand on the following day. At half-past eight or nine she retired to rest. 
When she held a drawing room or an evening circle, she remained till ten or eleven, and sometimes played at cards. Before the death of her husband, she was often present at the masked balls or idotas, which were given at court during the carnival. Afterwards, these entertainments and the number of fetes or gala days were gradually diminished in number. On the first day of the year, and on her birthday, she held a public court, at which all the nobility and civil and military officers, who did not obtain access at other times, crowded to kiss her hand. She continued this custom as long as she could support herself in a chair. Great part of the summer and autumn were spent at Schönbrunn or at Luxembourg. In the gardens of the former palace there was a little shaded alley communicating with her apartments. Here, in the summer days, she was accustomed to walk up and down or sit for hours together. A box was buckled round her waist, filled with papers and memorials, which she read carefully, noting with her pencil the necessary answers or observations to each. It was the fault, or rather the mistake, of Maria Theresa to give up too much time to the petty details of business. In her government, as in her religion, she sometimes mistook the form for the spirit, and her personal superintendence became more like the vigilance of an inspector general than the enlightened jurisdiction of a sovereign. End quote. Her nature, in short, was one of those endowed with an inborn perpetual motion and uninterrupted industry. What she lacked in genius was made up by carefulness and persistence. Francis does not appear to have participated much in his wife's enterprises. He might have felt a humble consciousness of his inferiority to her in governmental capacity, but, more likely, the long delay in his receiving the imperial crown and his taste for quiet pursuits and pleasures had confirmed him in habits averse to public business. The love, also, which he and Maria Theresa had entertained for each other from infancy, had made it a second nature for each to yield to the other, without so much as thinking which used the greater authority or influence in their united decisions, without knowing whether, in domestic matters, one or both or neither ruled. With a mutually respectful and cordial affection, such a question never arises, and is impossible. A oneness of choice is always realized without dispute. A tender love is the harmonizer of opposite natures and wishes, the solvent of difficulties. If carefully fed with the oil of kindness and guarded against all the winds of passion, it is a clear flame that fuses the most stubborn and diverse characters into a flowing union that runs smoothly and is at length cast in one mould. The instance of Maria Theresa and her husband is remarkable. Never were there more or greater proofs of a happy companionship than theirs, notwithstanding her superior position in affairs of state and his infidelity to marriage vows, which was well known to her. Their long and deep-rooted regard apparently led a spirited, intelligent emperor to surrender all political power to his wife, while the virtuous, resolute empress calmly allowed her husband to indulge his licentious propensities as he pleased, provided his purer devotion was still hers. There could be no more extreme and hazardous tests of their mutual sympathy. It affected such a strange compromise of choice and exchange of privilege as almost to disprove its own existence on the part of both these persons, especially on the part of Francis. Indeed, this solution of the wonder would be inadmissible, were it not that those who wear crowns seem to regard the most iniquitous liberties as innocent in themselves. The emperor had some share in public acts, and might have taken the direction of affairs from one who exhibited undying constancy to him, he was associated with the skilful Kevenhüller in leading several of the Austrian campaigns, but for the most part he kept himself in the background. At a grand levé, when the Empress Queen was receiving a crowd that came to pay respect, he slipped away from her presence to a remote corner of the room. Two ladies rose in reverence as he approached, but he said, 
Do not mind me. I shall stay here till the court is gone, and then amuse myself with looking at the crowd. One of the ladies replied, As long as your imperial majesty is present, the court will be here. You mistake, replied he. The empress and my children are the court. I am here but as a simple individual. In the latter part of his life, he had an intrigue with the princess of Auersberg and squandered a great amount of money and jewels on this fascinating woman, but the empress treated the princess with careful politeness and never manifested to anyone her knowledge of the commonly reported affair of Francis. Much of his time was given to masks, balls, festivities, and the opera. Through his influence, Vienna became a city of great gaiety and splendor. Much of his attention was shared by his family. To his children he was kind and generous, and they regarded him with enthusiastic affection. He found time also, amidst all his duties and recreations, to cultivate a love for the fine arts, for natural history and chemistry in particular. This branch of science then included the wild belief in alchemy. Francis spent no little time and money in the pursuit of the philosopher's stone and in attempts to fuse many small diamonds into a larger one, not knowing that this jewel is combustible, and any persons devoted to these schemes were provided with materials at public expense. But the spendthrift disposition of the emperor was also turned to good account. His charities were on as liberal a scale as his luxuries and scientific attempts. While her thoughtless and handsome husband was busy with his flirtation, music, and alchemy, Maria Theresa was engaged in carrying on, or preparing for, wars of defense and conquest. After eight years of compulsory peace, subsequent to the Treaty of Aix la chapelle which had terminated eight years of war, she took a step which resulted in the Seven Years' War, wherein France, Russia, Sweden, Denmark, and Spain were united with her against her old enemy, Frederick of Prussia, who was saved from annihilation only by the great aid of England and his own great genius. Before the campaigns of Napoleon, this war was the wonderful one of modern history, in view of its display of skill and courage, its dreadful waste of blood, and its surprising victories. Maria Theresa's long-cherished enmity to the Prussian king was the cause of it, Though worshipped by her people, abundantly blessed in all the relations of life, and naturally of a humane mind, she could not forget the loss of Silesia, the guilt of Frederick as her first foe, and the bitter jests he had more recently uttered concerning herself and her husband's character. His insulting language, which came to her ears, kindled to a flame the suppressed fires of her former mortification, to which every thought of her lost province— Everything that reminded her of it had added fresh fuel for eight years. There was no way to gratify this revenge, except by an alliance with France, and thus an ungrateful rupture with England, her old and valuable friend. Three hundred years of implacable hatred between Austria and France were forgotten. The faithless deception and fierce efforts of France towards herself were overlooked, the danger of alienating all her allies by the junction of two great powers was risked. There was no other way to crush Frederick but by clasping hands with perfidious France. And there was no way to do this, except by stooping to flatter Madame de Pompadour, the influential but low-born and shameless mistress of Louis XV. Kaunitz, the now confidential and able adviser of the Empress, apologized for suggesting this expedient, but she, the daughter of a hundred kings, virtuous, devout, and proud, at once wrote to Pompadour, calling her, My dear friend and cousin. The artifice succeeded. France was soon hand in glove with Austria. End of section 16「Section seventeen of the Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in September two thousand ten.
The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins Section 17 Maria Theresa Part 3 The Emperor, as soon as the treaty was made known to him in the council at Vienna, struck the table with his hand, declared he would never consent to it, and walked away. His eldest daughter, Marianne, and his eldest son, Joseph, also protested with vehemence. But Maria Theresa soon won over her family to her schemes, and when England, astonished at the incredible news, remonstrated, she stained her pure name with a falsehood, declaring that the treaty had not yet been signed. Little did she foresee, when she thus abused the long-tried friendship of England, resorted to degrading artfulness and let loose the hounds of a general protracted and bloody war, little did she foresee the retribution that followed, especially the deplorable end of her own fair daughter, Marie Antoinette, who, in consequence of this same alliance, afterwards became a queen of France. The leaders of the Austrian armies were Marshal Daun, a Bohemian, Marshal Luden, a Scot, and Marshal Lacy, of Irish descent. Francis was intrepid even to rashness. This fact, together with his moderate talents and her fear of the confusion that might follow his death, may have induced the Empress to dissuade him from taking any command in the ensuing contests, in the course of which Silesia was regained and once more lost, and the vicissitudes of success so great that at one time Vienna was nearly overwhelmed, at another the Prussian sovereign driven from his capital. One of the chief victories on the Austrian side was that of Kolin, June 18th, 1757, by which the empire was saved from alarming danger. In gratitude for this deliverance, and in celebration of this triumph, the soldiers were generously rewarded, medals were struck, te deums chanted, and the Order of Maria Theresa founded, as a mark of honor to the officers who had distinguished themselves. Nor was the Empress less magnanimous to bravery when unaccompanied by success. At Tuagau, the same Marshal Daun, conqueror at Kolin, was defeated in a critical battle after heroically sustaining it, and the Empress showed him unprecedented regard by going forth to meet him on his return to Vienna and addressing him in words of kind encouragement. Though many thousands fell in many battles, to appease her ambition or resentment, she was still a noble and sympathizing woman whenever adversity appealed to her better feelings. And in this she was unlike the insensible Frederick, who refused to ransom or exchange one of his princely subjects when taken prisoner, or even to notice his letters. Maria Theresa, however, liberated him without ransom when he tried to redeem himself. After seven years' war, Frederick, contending almost single-handed against the three greatest powers of the continent and many of the smaller ones, was nearly exhausted and overthrown. Such was his despair that he carried poison with him, determined to die rather than be taken prisoner. He, who had despised all women and abused his wife and sisters, was almost crushed at last by the retaliation of two women, the sovereign of Austria and Elizabeth, Empress of Russia. Against the latter, as against the former, he had spoken sarcastically, though too justly. She retorted with an army of fifty thousand men. The two empresses were his mightiest foes, and were just at the point of final triumph, when Peter III, an enthusiastic admirer of Frederick, succeeded to the Russian scepter by the death of Elizabeth, and took the part of Prussia. This event put the contest on a more equal footing again. But all concerned were tired of so protracted bloodshed, and of melting even jewels and church plate into money. An Austrian prisoner assured Frederick that his queen would consent to terms. The king seized a half-sheet of paper, wrote ten lines of proposed treaty, and dispatched it to Vienna, requiring an immediate reply. Maria Theresa accepted it at once. By this treaty, all things were to be as at the commencement of the war. Five hundred thousand men had been slain, Bohemia and Saxony laid waste, Prussia left with hardly a man, and all Europe kept in seven years' alarm, 
in order that two or three crowned heads might settle their personal grievances. Nor were the devastations of the sword and torch confined to Europe. England and France carried their part of the quarrel wherever the possessions of each came into contact. France lost the most of her ground in America and the East and West Indies, together with the best part of her armies, commerce, and treasure, and all these disasters hastened the reign of terror, wherein Marie Antoinette lost her head. The Treaty of General Peace was signed in 1763. Two years afterward, the imperial court journeyed to Innsbruck to attend the marriage of Maria Theresa's second son, the Archduke Leopold, with the Infanta of Spain. Leopold succeeded to his father's Duchy of Tuscany, and, being a man of strong mind and good heart, contributed greatly to the reform and prosperity of his state. While at Innsbruck, his father, the Emperor Francis, died. Already ill and with some premonition of his danger, he took leave of his children who remained at Vienna. Marie Antoinette, then ten years old, was his favorite child, and he kissed and pressed her to his heart a second time. At Innsbruck, his wife was alarmed at his symptoms and urged him to be bled. But he replied in sad jest, Do you wish to kill me with bleeding? He was again entreated on Sunday, August 18th, to try the remedy and said, I must go to the opera, and I am engaged afterward to sup with Joseph, though it is affirmed that he was really to sup with his paramour, the princess of Auersberg. But, as he left the opera, he fell dead with apoplexy. Maria Theresa was inconsolable, and the more so, doubtless, on account of her conviction that he was unprepared to die. She wrote the next day to her family in these words, quote, Alas, my dear daughters, I am unable to comfort you. Our calamity is at its height. You have lost a most incomparable father, and I, a consort, a friend, my heart's joy for forty-two years past. Having been brought up together, our hearts and our sentiments were united in the same views. All the misfortunes I have suffered during the last twenty-five years were softened by his support. I am suffering such deep affliction that nothing but true piety, and you, my dear children, can make me tolerate a life which, during its continuance, shall be spent in acts of devotion." End quote. She could not bear the scene of her affliction and sailed immediately for her capital, accompanied only by her son, an officer, and a lady attendant. Francis was buried at Vienna in a family vault constructed under the Capuchin Church by the order of Maria when she was but twenty-six years of age. At every anniversary of her husband's death during the fifteen years that she survived him, she visited his tomb and engaged in devotions. Through all those years, also, she wore mourning, inhabited plainly furnished rooms, draped with black cloth, and, shunning scenes of gaiety, confined herself to state business and religious observances. At the next court occasion, after the emperor's death, she directed all the ladies to appear in mourning. This order was complied with, except by the princess of Auersberg, who appeared in a rich dress and highly rouged. The empress drew back her hand in surprise and contempt when the princess offered to kiss it. But, though the frivolous woman never appeared in the royal presence again, Maria Theresa treated her interests with the same scrupulous regard that she had shown when she insisted on the payment of 200,000 florins to the princess, according to an order on the public treasury, written by Francis the day before his death. She did not take the course of conduct prompted by virtuous indignation, but, from first to last, she acted with a lofty magnanimity. In this world of petty jealousies and small resentments, too much admiration cannot be rendered to a high-minded independence. Maria Theresa's retaliations were on a great scale, were either grandly national or nothing. It is wonderful how much she managed to accomplish. She was the mainspring of every enterprise, and attended to everything personally. She necessarily gave much time to the thousand forms and ceremonies of her station. She never forgot her many devotional tasks, 
and she was the mother of sixteen children in the course of twenty years. These children were brought up to simple habits, benevolent acts, a proficiency in music and Italian, an empty knowledge of the lives of Romish saints, and an overweening family pride. The incongruous results of such an education were seen in their afterlives. Many great or good deeds were mingled with their bigotry and their excessive and sometimes fatal devotion to family interests. Nearly all her sons and daughters who grew to maturity occupied positions of importance. The eldest son, Joseph, succeeded to the German Empire and displayed great talents, though timid and taciturn in childhood. A younger son, Charles, died at the age of sixteen. He was bold and brilliant, and his parents treated him with partiality, mistakenly regretting that the government would not fall to him. Joseph first married the Princess of Parma, a dark-eyed Italian of remarkable beauty. She was very melancholy and cold to all persons from the hour of her marriage. It was supposed that her heart had been given away previously, and this belief has been embodied in a story. She died soon, and Joseph married the Princess of Bavaria, who was as homely as her predecessor was charming, and was treated with cruel neglect by all her husband's family, except the Emperor Francis, at whose death she exclaimed with tears, Ah, miserable, I have lost my only supporter. Leopold, the next surviving son, has already been mentioned. Ferdinand, the third son, was gentle and beneficent, married the daughter of the Duke of Modena, and inherited that duchy. Maximilian, the youngest son, was elector of Cologne. The daughters were all gifted and all beautiful, like their mother, excepting the eldest, Mariana, who was deformed. She and Elizabeth were never married, and lived at home in seclusion, engaged in study, prayer, or deeds of benevolence. Christiana was much like the Empress, who was very partial to her. Her talents were greater, and her determined attachment to her chosen lover, equal to her mother's many years before, it is said to have hastened the peace of Hubertsberg. With her husband, Prince Albert of Saxony, she governed Hungary, afterwards the Netherlands, and exercised great influence with her sisters, the queens of France and Naples. Amelia was surpassingly bright in mind and person, and excelled in amateur dramatic performances. She married the Duke of Parma, and occasioned some trouble by her frivolity. Joanna, affianced to the king of Naples, died of the smallpox. The next sister, Josepha, who was to take her place, died of the same disease. The circumstances were very affecting. She was fifteen, lovely and tall, with a clear face and long light hair. She was publicly betrothed and treated as a queen already, but she dreaded her destiny. In this state of extreme sensitiveness, she was directed by her mother to visit her father's tomb and pay her last respect to his memory. With many tears she consented, but, while in the vault, was seized with chills and faintness, and the next day was attacked with the smallpox, from which she died, to the great grief of the empress, who too late lamented her imperious treatment. The next daughter, Caroline, equally intelligent and lovely, finally married the Neapolitan king, whose dullness and amiability easily brought him under the entire control of his cunning wife, and her more cunning and famous coadjutor, Lady Hamilton. Marie Antoinette, the youngest daughter, was the wife and fellow victim of Louis the Sixteenth of France. The many family afflictions of Maria Theresa, calmly borne during all her arduous reign, enhance her heroic merits. Her habits of devout meditation and worship, no less than her strong character, enabled her to do and suffer so much. Hers was a most exacting, unnatural, and puerile round of religious ceremonies. She spent the entire month of August in penance and prayer for her husband's departed soul. She gave five hours every day to the same monastic occupations, but the spirit of piety may live under any forms, however cumbrous, and, if she acted according to her best knowledge, her zeal should provoke respect and admiration. Certainly, if faith is to be judged by its fruits, hers had much that was praiseworthy. She was eminently beneficent and deeply affected by all forms of woe. 
Meeting some half-famished persons in Vienna, she said, What have I done that providence should afflict my eyes with such a sight as this? Her charities amounted to more than 80,000 a year, says an English writer. Her virtue, however, at length took one shape that was more odious than injurious, from no love of gossip, apparently, but with the idea that her vigilant superintendence and reformatory power should be almost omniscient and omnipotent in her kingdom, she exercised through a multitude of spies a despotic surveillance of the private affairs of families, and any lady of any rank who overstepped the chaste decorum was banished to the limits of the realm. Throughout her dominions, she instituted or improved academies, schools, observatories, systems of prizes, regulations for the encouragement of agriculture. She founded a hospital for smallpox and promoted inoculation, for the want of which she herself suffered great disfigurement of her beauty, which was finally obliterated by her obesity and by an accident which mangled her face. She suppressed the Inquisition and the Society of Jesuits, interdicted many of the useless saints' days, and opened the royal parks to common use as a public promenade, now known as the Prater, a magnificent feature of Vienna. But her censorship of the press and prohibition of French and English literature was, to a great extent, very begotted and oppressive. A book was condemned if, in it, quote, a doubt was thrown upon the sanctity of some hermit or monk of the Middle Ages, or if it attacked superstition in the slightest degree. End quote. The partition of Poland in 1772 is the greatest blot that rests on the reign of Maria Theresa, but her own share in it has many mitigating considerations. The dismemberment was first resolved upon by the Prussian and Russian governments, and Maria Theresa was persuaded by her son Joseph, already clothed with powers equal to hers, and by her chief counsellor Kaunitz, to join in the iniquitous measure, in order to check the ambition of her old rival Frederick. Her consent shows how a spirit of policy may extinguish the liveliest impulses of the heart, for she acted towards Poland, as other governments, to her everlasting indignation, had designed to act towards her in the beginning of her reign. Her grandfather and his dominions had been saved from the Turks by the bravery of the Poles a century before, and the portraits of that ancestor and his Polish deliverer were the only ones that graced the room she daily occupied. So inconsistent and ungrateful was that ambition which further persuaded her to consent to another war with Prussia, occasioned by a revival of the Austrian claim to Bohemia. Yet she remonstrated against this step with tears, sent five hundred ducats to those who suffered by the ravages of her army, and herself wrote a frank letter to Frederick that terminated the conflict. The two aged enemies now exchanged messages of kindness, and the question was settled by the intervention of Russia at Maria Theresa's earnest solicitation. She wept for joy at this and said, quote, I am overpowered with joy. I do not love Frederick, but I must do him the justice to confess that he has acted nobly and honorably. I am inexpressibly happy to spare the effusion of so much blood. End quote. These were among the last acts of her life. She had knelt in prayer that God would avert that war, while her armies, led by her son, were passing forth before her windows with music and flying banners. Now she publicly returned thanks in the church of the Capuchins for the success of her prayers. It was a fit prelude for her approaching and serene, though painful, death. She is described at this period, quote, as an old lady, immensely corpulent, habited in the deepest weeds, with her grey hair slightly powdered, and turned back under a cap of black crepe. Notwithstanding her many infirmities, her deportment was still dignified, her manner graceful as well as gracious, and her countenance benign. The disorder from which she suffered was a dropsy, accompanied by an induration of the lungs, which brought on fits of suffocation, and at length terminated her existence. End quote. Such in her last days was the woman who, in the flush of beauty and vigor of youth, 
had roused the wild admiration of the Hungarians, and so played upon the strings of those noble hearts that the music of a thousand sabres rattling in their scabbards rang through the royal halls of Pressburg. The distresses of her sickness were intolerable, yet she endured them with fortitude and patience. Once she said, God grant that these sufferings may soon terminate, for otherwise I know not if I can much longer endure them. She entreated her son not to weep in her presence, lest sympathy for him would take away her firmness. To his care she affectionately bequeathed her children, as all of hers that did not already of right belong to him, her successor. Until the evening before her death she was busy signing papers and giving him parting advice. When he exhorted her to take repose, she replied, In a few hours I shall appear before the judgment seat of God, and would you have me sleep? Remembering her plans of charity, her words were, If I could wish for immortality on earth, it would only be for the power of relieving the distressed. Just before her last breath, someone whispered, The Empress sleeps. She opened her eyes and said, I do not sleep. I wish to meet my death awake. Heroic and memorable words. Her whole people, as well as family, were plunged into sorrow by her death, and for many years her subjects often spoke of their mother as they affectionately termed one who had tenderly cared for their comfort up to the day of her death, November twenty ninth, 1780. She lived to the age of sixty-three years, six months, and reigned forty years. Her career has but one rival in splendor in the history of crowned women. Its glory is dimmed only by the bloodthirst and intolerance of her period, and of her family indeed, down to this hour. Never was more accomplished by the life of any female, whether for good or evil. In a private sphere she would have left an example worthy of imitation in all respects. As a queen in a freer and enlightened land, not a breath would have sullied the glorious mirror of her character. End of section 17、section、eighteen of the Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Marsitich, July 2010. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Section 18. Josephine, Part 1. A truer, nobler, trustier heart, more loving or more loyal, never beat within a human breast. Baron. The island of Martinique claims the distinction of being the birthplace of Josephine, who was born the twenty fourth day of June, seventeen sixty eight. Her father, Monsieur de Tascher, was a man of influence and moderate wealth, possessing a large plantation and an ample retinue of slaves. He was a man of ambition and unyielding sternness, and to this, in a great measure, Was owing the misfortunes which embittered Josephine's early life and threw her into the whirl of events that bore her on to greatness and suffering. Her childhood was spent in lively sports and amusements, attended by young negresses who were permitted to indulge her every whim and accustomed to obey instantly the most childish requirements, till, by unlimited indulgence, Her naturally sweet disposition was in danger of being spoiled. Fortunately, Madame de Tascher was wise enough to see this, and brought Josephine more within her maternal influence, allowing her a larger share of the affection which had been almost exclusively bestowed upon the elder, more beautiful, and only sister, Maria. The latter, like her mother, Was of sedentary habits and a mild, unimpassioned temperament. Thus, they had more sympathies in common, while Josephine was all vivacity and enthusiasm. She was a favorite with her father, and from him came all the instruction she received, till, 
on reaching her twelfth year she was placed under the superintendence of maria's teacher who gave her lessons in the form of amusements her sociability and excessive fondness for dancing led madame de tascher often to give fetes at which the young creoles of the island were assembled but the sombre maria rarely participated in these festivities much preferring to pursue her studies or to ramble alone she was busily occupied in cultivating such talents as she possessed and acquiring those accomplishments deemed necessary to a woman of the world in anticipation of a future home in france where an aunt in influential circumstances had offered to provide her with an establishment and designed her hand for the son of the marquis de beauharnois josephine on the contrary looked upon the island of martinique as her continued home when she gazed over the ocean that separated her from the rest of the world it created no longings to mingle in the dissipation and reckless folly that her mother described to her as pervading la belle france but the sight inspired in her a strong love of grandeur and sublimity and increased her already lively imagination but there was a spell that bound her heart to martinique which gave her contentment in its quiet retreats or otherwise her active restless spirit must have sought a wider world through all her childhood josephine had shared her amusements with william de k the son of english parents who had sought refuge in martinique after the fall of the house of stuart whose cause they espoused and therefore suffered prosecution the two children had grown up together in happy companionship and formed an attachment that was never effaced when josephine reached her twelfth year she had made so little progress in her studies though an apt scholar that madame de tascher decided to send her to france and place her in a convent till the completion of her education but this was a terrible stroke to the young lovers to whom separation would have been the greatest grief by the most earnest assurances from josephine of her future application she was permitted to remain on trial during the following six months she made such rapid progress as persuaded her mother to recall her threat of sending her from martinique and she not only allowed her to continue her studies with william de k under the same master but through the interposition of his mother josephine's hand was promised him conditionally thus they happily and lovingly remained together studying or rambling for shells along the seashore carving their united names upon the trees or gathering the beautiful blossoms of the amaryllis gigantea a plant which she so admired for its associations as well as its beauty that she afterwards planted to the garden of malmaison where it still grows luxuriantly not long after m de k was called to england and was accompanied by his son with the avowed purpose of pursuing his studies at oxford but unknown to himself or josephine the real object of the voyage was to assert heirship to an estate which m de k was to inherit on condition his son should marry the niece of the testator the months of silence that ensued were so full of anxiety on josephine's part that her health was evidently suffering from it no letter nor message came from the young creole who had seemingly forgotten her in the new interests of the great world yet she would not believe the representations of her friends that he had ceased to love her to console and divert her madame de tascher gathered young companions in their pleasant home and endeavored to occupy her mind by an interest in the study of languages and accomplishing herself upon the harp 
She possessed a sweet, plaintive voice, and that kind of talent which readily acquires anything placed within its reach with little application. She chiefly enjoyed quiet walks with Mademoiselle de K when they would lounge together under the shade of romantic cedars, talking for hours of William or throw stones at tree marks to ascertain by the stroke if her lover was faithless. But this friendship was of short duration, for Mademoiselle de K deceived her. Josephine's true, transparent nature had affinity only with candor and simplicity, and she could no longer endure her artful friend. While the Pagery mansion was gay with the young Creole girls, gathered to amuse Josephine, a new excitement one day aroused them from a languid siesta, and inspired them with all the vivacity which so especially belongs to the French, the fortune-telling fame of an old Irish woman, or, as some have it, a negress, called Euphemia, who lived in a sequestered and wild retreat called the Three Islets, reached their ready ear. Curious to lift the veil of futurity, they one and all decided to consult the oracle. Josephine accompanied her companions more for their pleasure than her own, not wanting to believe what might be predicted, but with a secret thought of William, she followed the gay party, who, with laughter and harmless sallies at each other's expense, hastened to the dark, rocky glen, where the fortune-teller's hut was half-hidden among a wild growth of large-leaved plants and tall trees. Their courage began to fail, however, as they approached the dwelling, but, after some whispering hesitation as to who should dare to enter first, they summoned boldness enough to make their errand known. The old woman sat upon a cane mat in the center of the cabin, and, perceiving the shrinking girls, called on them to come nearer. Each successively submitted her hand for inspection, and to all were predicted extraordinary adventures and misfortunes. Josephine presented hers last, though she would have gone away unenlightened, but for the persuasions of her companions. The lines of her hand being attentively examined, she was told, You will soon be married, but not to the one you love. The union will not be happy. Your husband will perish tragically. You will then marry a man who will astonish the world, and you will become an eminent woman as a superior dignity. The young girls returned to Madame de Tascher, half frightened, half unbelieving at the strange destinies predicted. But Josephine made light of the whole affair, entirely unwilling to have faith in a prophecy which, if fulfilled, must separate her from William de K. Not long after, the sudden death of Maria, who was in the midst of preparations for a voyage to France, cast a deep gloom over the family, which had hitherto known only joy and gaiety. The mother could not be consoled at the loss of her favorite daughter and companion. Touched by her mother's grief, Josephine determined to imitate her sister so closely as in a manner to fill the sad vacancy, which, with her sensibility, she felt most poignantly herself. At once the child became a woman. Her amusements, her reckless rambles, her gay companions were all rejected, and she remained at her mother's side or employed her hours in the most studious application to pursuits hitherto neglected. Her efforts and rapid progress surprised and attracted Madame de Tascher, and henceforth the amiable Josephine felt herself fully repaid for her exertions in receiving the unlimited affection and approbation of both her parents. At this time, the arrival of a package from France, and the proposals it contained, afflicted her with a new and serious anxiety. The wishes of her aunt, 
to receive her in Maria's place, and also to bestow her hand where her sisters had been promised, were quickly made known to her by her father. "'You promised me to William de K replied she in surprise at her father's tone of assent to the arrangement, but he assured her that was no barrier, as William was obliged to marry a joint heir of the estate fallen to him, or forfeit the bequeathment, which his father would not permit. Besides, said he, William has forgotten you. You should cease to think of one who has so neglected you. Knowing nothing of the affectionate and overflowing letters which her parents retained from her, she was persuaded to consent to what her father would allow no refusal of, and after many tears, regrets, and useless entreaties, she separated from her family, her quiet home with all its happy associations, and left the wild and romantic island of Martinique, for a home in a land where she was to reach a position and acquire a fame, exceeding the wildest dreams of ambition her father could have entertained for her. As the ship, which was to convey her to France, left port, a singular phenomenon attracted the attention of all on board, as well as those assembled on shore. A phosphoric flame, known to mariners as St. Elmo's Fire, attached itself to the masthead of the vessel, throwing out jets of light and encircling the ship with crown-like rays. Those who had heard the prediction in respect to Josephine looked upon it with superstitious awe, but she was too much overcome with grief to regard it in any light and remained unconsoled during the whole voyage. To a young girl, scarcely fifteen, it was a severe trial to be separated, perhaps forever, from her family, and more especially from the affectionate sympathy of an amiable, cultivated, judicious mother. She was kindly received at Marseilles by her aunt, Madame Renaudine, with whom she repaired directly to Fontainebleau. During the ensuing month, Josephine could not overcome the depression of spirits, fast infringing upon her health, and not lessened by her knowledge of the presence of William de K. in Paris, his frequent attempts to see her, and the discovery of his unchanged affections. To see him would but add to their distress, since he was betrothed to another, and the negotiations for her own marriage were in progress, while, on the other hand, the young Viscount Beauharnois was extremely repugnant to the match. Though he had admired the picture of Maria, he was extremely disappointed in Josephine, and at the same time was entirely devoted to a Madame de V, who possessed his affections. Josephine, bewildered and ill, but still dutiful to the commands of her parents, permitted her aunt and the Marquis de Beauharnois to use their influence with the Viscount, but she entreated permission to retire to a convent on the plea of her ill health. The Abbey de Panthemont was selected by Madame Renaudine. Josephine remained there nearly a year, and, at the expiration of that time, became the wife of Alexandre de Beauharnois. He is described as an amiable, accomplished man, of noble and dignified bearing, and a favorite at court, where he obtained the sobriquet of the Beau Dancer from his graceful participation in the festivities of Versailles. He highly esteemed Josephine, but his unabated attachment for Madame de V, together with the scandal continually poured into the ears of his wife, gave rise to such jealousy on her part as to destroy their domestic peace. The birth of her son, Eugene, for a time diverted her, but, through the maliciousness of her rival, Beauharnois, in his turn, became jealous of her early love, 
annoyed by her tears and reproaches, he left her, on the plea of business, to remain several months at Versailles. Josephine then withdrew entirely from the gaiety in which her new possession had thrown her. Though her debut at court had been a flattering one, and the favors shown her by Marie Antoinette were sufficient to give eclat to her present, yet she gladly escaped from the vortex of pleasure in which the giddy French were continually involved, and retired to a quiet retreat at Croce, where she resumed her long-neglected studies, successfully cultivating the talents that, now fully awakened, gave a more decided tone to her character. She was grieved at the neglect of her husband, but she was greatly consoled in her trials by the birth of Hortense, the more welcome since she was deprived of the society and care of her idolized son, whom his father had placed at a private boarding-house. Hearing from Madame Renaudin of Beauharnois' intentions to obtain a divorce, she retired to the convent which had before received her, determined to remain till the suit was decided. Confident of her own innocence, and sincerely attached to the man, who was strangely blinded to her faithful affection through the misrepresentations of spies upon her movements, and overwhelmed with grief at the turmoil in which her sensitive heart was continually plunged, she shut herself within the gloomy walls of the Abbe de Pontemont, submissively enduring and performing the innumerable penances imposed upon her by the abbess. Hortense was her companion in this grim, somber prison-house, lessening the tediousness of the long melancholy hours. Two weary years dragged away thus, serving at least to obliterate every trace of frivolity that might have remained from her light-hearted girlhood, and giving that dignity and composure to her manner which are the impress of long-continued grief. It also enabled her to cultivate, though unconsciously, a fortitude of character valuable in her after-trials, and so chastened her spirit as to inspire her with ready sympathy in the afflictions of others, a trait that endeared her to the French nation when she wielded the power of an empress and one which she could not have possessed to so keen a degree but for her own early trials. As soon as the Parliament at Paris had decided the suit of divorce in her favor, she determined to return to Martinique, but, unable to prevail upon Beauharnois to allow Eugene to accompany her, she was obliged to embark alone with Hortense, Two years of quiet home life in her native island somewhat restored the natural cheerfulness of her temper. Yet the remembrance of her husband and son, widely separated from her, often disturbed the otherwise complete rest under her father's roof. Another interview with Euphemia, the fortune-teller, confirmed the superstitious belief she entertained in the destiny that awaited her. It was with both fear and joy, therefore, that she again left Martinique for the scenes which henceforth tended towards the accomplishment of her elevation. The news of Beauharnois' acknowledgment of his wife's innocence and the readiness to receive her again reawakened all her affection and had induced her to seek the shores of France and reunite the divided family they met at Paris. Hortense, who already gave promise of much beauty, was presented to her father in the free, graceful dress of a young Creole. He was surprised to find himself possessed of so lovely a daughter, while Josephine rejoiced equally in meeting with Eugene, from whom she had so long been separated. Several months of peaceful reconciliation succeeded, and Josephine was at last happy. 
Beauharnot had at this time attained the rank of major of a regiment of infantry. He was also a representative in the National Assembly, and, in the following year, 1791, was appointed president of that body. Josephine listened with deep interest to the political discussions now carried on in her saloons, which were the resort of the most prominent members of the assembly, but she could not conceal her anxiety as to the future of France, and the fate of those who, she foresaw, were to take the lead in the rapidly approaching struggle. Beauharnot preserved a mild, firm bearing throughout the storm that soon burst with frightful havoc upon the nation, remaining loyal to his king, whom he venerated and loved, while he saw and urged the necessity of the monarch's compliance with the demands of the people. At the flight of the king, he displayed a firmness and calmness that challenged even the admiration of his enemies. He loudly declaimed against the execution of the monarch. In 1793, he was appointed general-in-chief of the Army of the Rhine. He was accompanied during that short campaign by Eugene, then scarcely twelve years old, and who had already exhibited military capacity of a high order. In consequence of political difficulties and the withdrawal of the most efficient men from the army, General Beauharnot sent in his resignation and, on his return to France, was ordered to retire twenty leagues from the frontiers. He remained in quiet seclusion during a short period until he fell under suspicion, was arrested, brought to Paris, and, like the host who already crowded the prisons, awaited in chains a speedy death. End of section 18 Section 19 of The Heroines of History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Marzatich, July 2010. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Section 19. Josephine Part 2. Madame Beauharnot was filled with terror at the news of the long-dreaded catastrophe. She exerted all her influence and eloquence to save him. She, too, was imprisoned in the gloomy walls of a monastery belonging to the Carmelite priests, the other prisons being already crowded. Hortense was kindly cared for by a friend of Josephine, and Eugene was adopted by a poor artisan, with whom he labored, employing his leisure hours in study and military exercises. Madame Beauharnot was not alone in her imprisonment. Her room and the adjoining ones were occupied by ladies of rank, who, like herself, suffered innocently and waited in hourly expectation of being led forth to execution. In the midst of all this terror and grief, Madame Beauharnot, preserved a calm, fearless aspect, in part supported by her belief in the prediction of her strange future. To inspire her terrified companions with courage, she assured them it had been foretold she was to be Queen of France, and if the prophecy was to be fulfilled, they should surely escape death. Thus she consoled and amused her trembling companions, while, at every entrance of the harsh, unfeeling jailer, they were nearly paralyzed with fear, lest their turn had come to be conducted to the guillotine. To their own perilous condition was added a distressing anxiety for the fate of relatives. They managed to obtain journals, in which were lists of the executed, but no one had courage to glance over those pages of crime or could read with unfaltering voice the names of friends numbered among the victims of the bloody Rospierre. One morning, as Josephine read the list, 
she came to the name of her own husband, a cry of agony announced to the pale group about her what her lips could not articulate, and she fell senseless to the floor. Surrounded by companions to whom her kindness and gentleness had endeared her, she received every attention in their power to bestow, yet was restored with great difficulty. Repeated fainting fits succeeded the shock, and the ensuing illness delayed her execution. A few days afterwards, a friend found means to allay the intense anxiety of the remaining prisoners by adroitly thrusting a slip of paper through the grating of the window. It contained the cheering words, Ruse Perry and his accomplices are marked for accusation. Be quiet. You are saved. What a relief to the long-continued fears of the exhausted prisoners. And when, on the following day, the great iron doors were thrown back for their free egress, with what joy they left behind the grating locks, the barred windows, the cheerless cells, and breathed a pure, free air again. Then came the thought of beloved and dear faces they were to see no more, the remembrance of the family circle broken, scattered, and bleeding under the iron tread of a mad tyranny. They could not seek even the fireside, doubly dear for the sake of the lost. Without home or shelter, they could only depend upon the bounty of those who had escaped such an accumulation of calamities. With nothing left of all her estates, her relations equally deprived of their wealth and unable to assist her, Josephine was nearly reduced to a state of indigence, and depended upon her own exertions, and those of her young son Eugene, for support. To him she read and re-read, the treasured letter Beauharnot had penned just before his execution, full of touching affection, regret for the doubts he had ever entertained of his wife's love, anxiety for her and the fate of their children, and overflowing with tenderness towards them all. This last gift, these words of remembrance, were dwelt upon with tears by mother and son, while they fired Eugene with the wrongs of France, and made him impatient for the arm and voice of manhood. Straightened in their means, Josephine applied to Tallien, and succeeded, after a time, in obtaining a small indemnity from the public property, which enabled them to live comfortably with economy. She educated her children by the exercise of her own abundant talents, the only amusement in which she indulged was a daily visit to the saloons of her friend, Madame Fontenoy, where were assembled those who, like herself, suffered from the events of the Revolution, and had not even their titles remaining. Thus Madame Beauharnot passed a long time in seclusion till, through Tallien's exertions, a compensation for her sequestered estates were given her, by which means she perfected Eugene's education, he being placed under the discipline of General Hoche, with whom he acquired the military skill for which he was afterwards distinguished. Napoleon Bonaparte was now the rising star of France. He was received in society as a distinguished guest, notwithstanding his lack of noble blood. He commanded notice by his unquestionable talent, energy, and ambition, as well as by his exciting wit and his eccentricities. He had heard much of Madame Beauharnot through a friend, entitled in her secret memoirs, Madame Chat, Wren, whose soirées he frequented. He was also interested in her as the mother of Eugene, who attracted his particular commendation by the bold, manly freedom with which he had presented himself and demanded the privilege of wearing his father's sword. Josephine and Napoleon met one day, just after the daring Corsican's feats, 
with the Parisian division of troops, newly placed under his command. The meeting was at the house of their mutual friend, and of this occasion she says, While sitting by a window, I was looking at some violets of which my friend took the greatest care, when suddenly the famous Bonaparte was announced. Why, I was unable to tell, but that name made me tremble. A violent shudder seized me on seeing him approach. I dared, however, to catch the attention of the man who had achieved so easy a victory over the Parisians. The rest of the company looked at him in silence. I was the first to speak to him. It seems to me, citizen general, said I, that it is only with great regret that you have spread consternation through the capital. Should you reflect a moment upon the frightful service you have performed, you would shudder at its consequences. Tis quite possible, madame, said he, the military are but automata, they know nothing but to obey. The most of my guns were charged only with powder. I only aimed to give the Parisians a small lesson. Tis, besides, my seal that I have set upon France. The calm tone, the imperturbable sang-froid, with which Bonaparte recounted the massacre of so many of the unhappy citizens of Paris, roused my indignation. These light skirmishes, said he, are but the first corsications of my glory. Ah, said I, if you are to acquire glory at such a price, I would much rather count you among the victims. Madame Beauharnois conceived the greatest dislike for Napoleon at this interview, which was not lessened during succeeding visits. She considered him a vain, ambitious boaster, nor was she at all attracted by his personal appearance. Pale, slender, and short, she donned him the title of Little Bonaparte, and made sport of his eccentricities to his friends. Her dislike for him increased so much that she finally discontinued her visits to Madame Chat Renz to avoid him. But, as she expresses it, the more she sought to avoid him, the more he multiplied himself in her way. Barras, one of the directors, strongly urged her to accept Napoleon, predicting his future greatness and informing her of his intended appointment by the directory as general-in-chief of the army to Italy. It was some time, however, before she could give her consent to the proposals, or become interested in the singular man who professed the strongest attachment for her. When she finally promised her hand, she concealed the fact from all her friends, dreading their reproaches. Upon her marriage, which occurred March ninth. 1796, two days before Bonaparte set out upon his campaign to Italy, all Paris was in commotion at the unexpected event, and more especially her friends, from whom she had kept the secret. Josephine is described in this, her twenty-eighth year, as by no means beautiful, but her manners and deportment were particularly graceful. There was a peculiar charm in her smile and sweetness, in her tones. She also dressed with an infinite degree of taste. She remained in Paris, at Bonaparte's luxurious hotel in Rue Chanterine, where she was constantly surrounded by the most distinguished persons of Paris, assembled to do homage to the interesting wife of the general, who was creating such a lively sensation throughout France. During the three following months, nothing was talked of among the Parisians but the brilliant victories of the young general, who was striking terror in all Europe by his skillful strokes and unheard-of success. He had already penetrated into the very heart of Italy. Couriers were daily dispatched to Josephine, keeping her fully informed of all his movements. 
the victory of milan achieved the austrians were conquered and the italians paid homage to the daring commander he won their admiration while he subdued them nothing was needed to complete his satisfaction but the presence of his wife to share his honors in his frequent letters he entreated her to come readily obeying his slightest wish she left hortense in charge of madame campan to complete her education and proceeded by rapid stages to italy the land of sapphire skies towering mountains and hills luxuriant with fragrant vineyards and rich in palaces and cathedrals abounding in magnificent cities and enlivened with a population in gay and picturesque costumes these scenes enchanted josephine who was animated with a glowing appreciation of the beautiful and sublime napoleon gave her a cordial and enthusiastic reception the milanese were full of curiosity and eagerness to behold the wife of the wonderful warrior to their excited imaginations he seemed the god of war personified or at least possessed of some wonderful talisman by which armies were made to vanish at his pleasure all the distinguished and the elite of milan paid court to madame bonaparte who captivated them at once by her irresistible sweetness and affability if they had honored napoleon before their ardor and worship was redoubled at the additional charm with which the musical and love name of Josephine invested him. Balls, fetes, and concerts succeeded one another in the bewildering profusion of magnificence, and the princess of Italian states were outdone in the display and state of Madame Bonaparte's court. The expense occasioned by this outlay together with her generous gifts, caused some reproof from Napoleon, but he was silenced by her adroit reasoning. In some sort, said she, your wife ought to eclipse the courts of the sovereigns who are at war with the French Republic. Napoleon continued his conquests, forcing his way even to the midst of Rome, and humbling the Pope in his own high and hitherto invulnerable place, while Josephine remained at Milan, conquering the hearts of the people, and keeping them in complete submission by her prompt and efficient measures, munificent gifts, conciliating kindness, and flowing sympathy. It was here in Italy that Napoleon learned the rare traits of his wife. He plainly saw she was to be henceforth indispensable to his advancement, security, and glory. Here she first acquired the strong influence over him that ceased only in her death. With the satisfaction of rendering her position safe, by keeping him informed of the secret jealousies and intentions of the directory in France, by a clear, unerring judgment, gaining a clear voice in his diplomatic measures as well as martial movements, by her address, securing an unbounded influence over the admiring Italians, with nothing to fear and everything to hope. Josephine was seeing her happiest days. She was sipping from the golden cup of fame and splendor, but like all the rest who partake of its enticing draughts, she found bitter dregs underneath the sparkle and foam. After the campaign signalized by Wormser's decisive defeat, Napoleon returned to triumph to Milan, where Madame Bonaparte had remained, and celebrated there the anniversary of the Republic with the utmost pomp and costly luxury. The round of pleasure quickly wearied the hero, who delighted most in the sounds and excitement of the battlefield, to which he eagerly returned. The constant display and stately ceremony that Josephine was obliged to keep up during his absence was fatiguing and distasteful to her. But, once freed from this restraint, 
she breathed with intense delight the perfumed air of the enchanting country around Milan. Upon one occasion, she visited with Napoleon the singular and beautiful islands of Lake Maggiore, from which rose luxurious villas, surrounded by terraced gardens, where the citron, myrtle, and fragrant orange trees perpetually blossomed and hung heavy with tempting fruit. These lay in the midst of the lake, and clear, glassy waters rippled here and there before the swift prows of winged boats, plying to and from the Switzer's shores. Beyond, toward the Alps, the eye falling first upon vine-covered slopes, wandered farther over wooded heights, then above and beyond, to where white and gray rocks, boldly outlined, shot up in snowy peaks, lost in a veil of blue mist that shaded into crimson when the rays of the evening sun had left the valley to linger in warmest colors upon the unclimbed heights. The beautiful city of Venice, too, called forth her enthusiastic ecomiums, its massive palaces, costly churches, and wondrous bridges everywhere spanning the streets of water, through which only noiseless gondolas continually plied, its delicious gardens decorated with innumerable statues, vases, fountains, and the gay, musical people, in endless varieties of dress, everywhere lending a lively aspect, together gave an air of storied romance that threw the French women of Josephine sweet in ecstasies of delight. The Venetians, greeted the wife of the victor with flattering honors, while she, with her characteristic generosity, lavished gifts and kindnesses upon them that riveted their extravagant adoration. By her thoughtful intervention, the rigors and devastation of war were in a measure checked. Cities were spared pillage, the vanquished treated magnanimously and the helpless protected, acts which exalted and endeared her to the Italians far more than her gifts, and secured the devotion of her husband, half jealous by her evident power. I conquer provinces, Josephine conquers hearts, was his playful comment. Suspicions of the directory and knowing their wish and intention to dispose, in some way, of a man whose growing power and ambition they had reason to fear, Napoleon suddenly and promptly returned to Paris, leaving Josephine at Milan. She was not suffered to remain long. Even the most virtuously great do not escape malice and calumny. Knowing this, Josephine could hardly have expected to have been spared the groundless scandal which was cunningly whispered into the ears of the impetuous, exacting, and jealous hero. Napoleon commanded her immediate return, which she obeyed without delay. He received her with unkindness, and, for a time, their domestic harmony was interrupted by the interposition of a friend, a reconciliation was effected. The hotel in Rue Chancerine was now too humble for the famed and laurel-crowned victor. In order to maintain a household more in keeping with his position, Josephine purchased Malmaison, an elegant country seat in Virons of Paris. Napoleon's restless ambition would not allow him luxurious repose, neither did the timid directory wish the presence of so dangerous a man. The French regarded him as their deliverer, and were already fascinated with the name around which clusters so much glory and so much odium. Fearful of the results, the directory gladly acquiesced to the proposed expedition to Egypt, which they hoped might give some pretext in the end for aspersions and dishonor if he did not fall in the contest. This he wisely foresaw 
and left Josephine to guard his interests at home and use her unlimited influence to keep his star in the ascendancy. Malmaison was her home during the year of the Syrian campaign. Without ostentation, she remained in this beautiful retreat, adorning it with every possible attraction. The gardens and greenhouses were filled with the rarest flowers and exotics, of which she was passionately fond. Rich Etruscan vases and graceful statuary, chiseled by the best masters, ornamented the grounds and imparted an air of taste and expensive refinement that attracted amateurs from every quarter. Josephine's income was large, but she greatly exceeded it in gratifying the love of art and the lavish gifts she bestowed upon every applicant from the founder of expensive but valuable institutions down to the poor, threadbare writing master who claimed the honor of first guiding Napoleon's pen. Her generosity never consulted the length of her purse. End of section 19「ニトリ He prized her letters, hastily, tearing them open and reading them with the greatest avidity, even in the midst of battle. During the last months of his absence, however, he neglected to write with his usual punctuality and affection, since he had become violently jealous of his wife through the misrepresentations of those who watched her with envy and malice. Reports of his defeat and even death reached France, but while the truth of it was being discussed, he suddenly appeared on the shores of France. With his characteristic and startling rapidity of movement. Josephine was at a magnificent levee given by Goyer, the president of the directory. When the news of Napoleon's arrival was announced, it was received with a thrill of surprise and joy by the guests who crowded the saloon, while Josephine was almost overcome at the suddenness of the event to which she had impatiently looked forward. Immediately resolving to be among the first to meet him on his way to Paris, and thus remove his unjust suspicions, she left the gay circle, and accompanied by Hortense, set out with the utmost speed. Unfortunately, they passed each other by different routes, which mistake Josephine sought to repair in returning to Paris by the fleetest posts, but too late to meet the arbitrary man whose tyranny she began to feel. He would not receive her when she reached their city residence, since her absence confirmed his suspicions, nor did he abate his resentment till, by the tearful entreaties of Hortense and Eugene, and the reproaches of her friends, who reminded him of all he might have lost but for her faithful and untiring devotion to his interests in his absence, his temper was finally appeased, and he again welcomed the wife who suffered the most poignant grief from this rude repulse of her tenderest affection. They retired to Malmaison, which at once became the scene of pleasure, of political debates and ambitious schemes. In fine, it was here where Bonaparte perfected his designs upon France. Upon his return he found the government weakened by opposing factions, and Italy, which he had so triumphantly wrested from the Austrians, retaken, with but little resistance from the irresolute directory. Irritated by this, his determination was the more confirmed to be the master of his own destiny and the arbitrator of the French nation, if not of the whole of Europe. Through Josephine's foresight and alertness in discovering the designs of all the parties, he was enabled to foil the directory at the moment his real aims were discovered, striking the final blow the very day on which his arrest was to have been made. He had with skilful address secured the enthusiastic services of the military, and when he appeared before the Council of Five, their cries of outlaw him down with the dictator were hushed by the appearance of the soldiery, who rushed to his rescue and scattered the representatives in utter confusion at the bayonet's point. Napoleon was immediately proclaimed First Consul. 
This anticipated event had been looked to by Josephine with great interest and anxiety, not from ambitious or selfish motives, but because she seriously judged it to be for the glory and good of France, which, since the downfall of royalty, had known nothing but turmoil, bloodshed, and innumerable conspiracies that threatened to enact again the horrible scenes of the revolution. The consul took up his residence at the Palace of Luxembourg, this soon proving too small in its dimensions, he decided to occupy the palace of the Tuileries. This was better suited to his aspirations, as having been the seat of royalty. Yet, to blind the lovers of republicanism and to secure the devotion of all, he styled it the governmental palace and had the pet word republic emblazoned in gold letters upon its front. He took possession of it with great pomp, distinguishing the occasion by military display, fireworks, and general rejoicings among the people. The first soiree given at the Tuileries was attended by all the distinguished and the beauty of Paris, as well as citizens of every class. The crowd was so great that even the private apartments were thrown open to the guests. The first consul entered to receive the congratulations and homage of the citizens, with little ceremony and in plain uniform, distinguished only by the tricolor sash, worn with good taste and with his usual policy. Curiosity and conjecture was at its height as to the style in which Josephine would appear as the wife of the hero of so many battles, the subduer of nations and the guardian of France. A curiosity greatly disappointed, when she entered, unannounced, leaning upon the arm of Talleyrand, then Minister of Foreign Affairs. She was dressed with the utmost simplicity in white, her hair negligently confined by the plain comb, and with no ornament but an unostentatious necklace of pearls. The unassuming dress was the more noticeable from the marked contrast it afforded to the splendidly attired ladies in showy brocades, flashing diamonds, and waving plumes that had been selected with the most fastidious care to grace the occasion. The first expression of surprise gave way to a murmur of admiration, as Josephine gracefully passed through the apartments, saluting her guests with fascinating affability and natural becoming dignity. She was at this time in her thirty-eighth year, but she retained those personal advantages which usually belong only to more youthful years. Her stature was exactly that perfection which is neither too tall for female delicacy nor so diminutive as to detract from dignity. Her person was faultlessly symmetrical, and the lightness and elasticity of its action gave an aerial character to her graceful carriage. Her features were small and finely modelled, of a Grecian cast. The habitual expression of her countenance was a placid sweetness. Her eyes were of a deep blue, clear and brilliant, usually lying half-concealed under their long, silky eyelashes. The winning tenderness of her mild, subdued glance had a power which could tranquilize Napoleon in his darkest moods. Her hair was glossy chestnut-brown, harmonizing delightfully with a clear complexion and a neck of almost dazzling whiteness. Her voice constituted one of the most pleasing attractions and rendered her conversation the most captivating that can easily be conceived. The occurrences which followed Napoleon's seizure of power contributed to his fame and increased the enthusiasm and admiration of the French. He was ready at all times to give redress to those who entered complaints, recalled men of letters and of science who had been obliged to fly, encouraged the arts, gave new impulse to manufactures, and employment to the industrious poor. Through Josephine's influence he abolished the sanguinary laws that oppressed the numerous exiles, brought back the immigrants, and restored their estates or indemnified their losses, till France became gay, happy, peaceful, and industrious, and forgot in this promising era the terrors and sufferings of the past. The consul accompanied Josephine to Malmaison to remain every Saturday and Sabbath, and on these occasions be indulged in amusements, in which he was joined by Louis Bonaparte, Duroc, Josephine, Hortense, and several young ladies of the old nobility, who had become impoverished orphans by the misfortunes of the Revolution, and whom Josephine had adopted, superintending their education and caring for their welfare with motherly kindness. From these unceremonious recreations they returned to the state and pomp of the Tuileries, often with visible of reluctance. Napoleon's tyranny over his household and in little things increased in proportion to his power. Especially towards Josephine and her suite, he exercised a wayward and annoying surveillance that would have been insupportable to any other than his devoted patient wife. 
Her influence over him was widely known, and in consequence she was thronged with applicants of every description. To some she made promises, to some she granted pensions, and for others she interceded with an eloquence that rarely failed. When Napoleon exhibited the selfish, domineering spirit of crushing every obstacle that intercepted the rays of his own glory, wresting from the generals who had faithfully served him dearly worn laurels to crown his own brow, Josephine unhesitatingly reproached him for want of gratitude and charged him with aiming at kingly power. These frequent altercations opened her eyes to his real designs and caused an occasional coldness between them. She trembled at the suggestion of his assuming a position some day that might plunge them in as frightful a vortex as that which engulfed the last reigning king with his throne and scepter. In May 1800, Napoleon, with a brilliant army, again set out for Italy. Josephine retired to Malmaison, where she remained during his absence, indulging in her predominant passion, the study of botany. She also made a collection of rare animals, many of which were sent to her from distant countries, in remembrance of some kindness she had bestowed. So general was the admiration of her character that orders were given by neighboring sovereigns to allow these gifts to pass unmolested even during the time of war. Napoleon was absent but two months. With incredible speed his army had crossed the Alps, in defiance of danger and death, descended upon the beautiful plains of Italy, and with a few brilliant strokes scattered the astounded Austrians, who believed him quietly reposing upon his laurels at the Tuileries. He returned in triumphal march, heavily laden with testimonials of gratitude from the Italians, and re-entered France. Advancing towards the capital amidst the shouts of gathering crowds, roused to the highest pitch of enthusiasm. His arrival at the Tuileries at midnight was first made known to Josephine by his noisy rapid strides through her apartments, when he came to arouse her with the account of his triumphant success. These sudden interruptions of her rest were not uncommon, for when at Malmaison she was frequently awakened from deep sleep to accompany him in long walks to the botanical gardens and little forest, or to listen to some new plans which had suddenly shot through his restless brain. Not long after his return from Italy, the marriage of Hortense de Beauharnois with Louis Bonaparte took place with great pomp. This union was not prompted by affection, since Hortense preferred General de Roc, an unaccountable attachment, as he was many years her senior, of few attainments, and lacked the qualities which usually attract the admiration and love of a woman. Louis Bonaparte was equally in love with a lady whose name is not transmitted to us. He was pale and slender, with a quiet, sombre air, not at all attractive. Yet he possessed many traits that won upon Josephine, and caused her to prefer him for Hortense rather than de Roc. One would suppose that the sufferings of her own early life would have prevented Josephine from influencing her daughter to a mariage de convenance, but her extreme dislike to de Roc and disapproval of his principles was her best excuse. She hoped that a union with the Bonaparte family would heal the difficulties and prevent the frequent jealousies and contentions arising between them. To these considerations Hortense was sacrificed. She stood in the midst of a gay assemblage, a jeweled flower-crowned bride, with a heart oppressed with an unendurable weight of sadness. As to her personal appearance, she was not exactly beautiful, for the conformation of her mouth and her teeth which rather projected took away from the regularity of a countenance otherwise very pleasing in all its sweetness and benignity of expression. Her eyes, like her mother's, were blue, her complexion clear, and her hair of a charming blonde. In stature she did not exceed the middle size, but her person was beautifully formed, and she inherited all her mother's grace of movement. At the close of this year the consulship was bestowed upon Napoleon for life but this additional evidence of confidence and admiration gave Josephine more anxiety than gratification, for with her keen foresight and knowledge of Napoleon's character, she perceived the final result, and knew full well that his ambitious strides would soon carry him beyond the shadow of republicanism that remained. His imitation of royalty in occupying a separate suite of apartments in their new residence, in the splendid palace of St. Cloud, gave her still greater cause for anxiety. It lent a seriousness to the vague hints of divorce from Napoleon, who longed to perpetuate his power and name through descendants. Josephine, however, was not of an unhappy temperament, and was willing to close her eyes to future ills. Her influence was still in the ascendant, and with this she consoled herself, though she sometimes failed in her generous attempts to rescue those who had fallen under the consul's displeasure. She was intensely interested in the fate of the Duc d'Anguien, 
whose life she pleaded for with unavailing tears and entreaties. The time arrived when Napoleon's crafty and unscrupulous measures enabled him to walk with powerful tread over the very bodies of his foiled enemies, to the throne which, from the first, had been the goal of his ambition. He seemed to throw a mysterious spell over the French people, managing them like a set of automaton toys, making them vow with a blind ardor before the very scepter that a short time before had been hurled from among them at such a frightful cost. Napoleon and Josephine were crowned emperor and empress at the Church of Notre Dame in the presence of an immense concourse of people. Napoleon appeared in a gorgeous state dress, attended by his marshals and all the dignitaries of France, while Josephine was magnificently attired and surrounded by the ladies of her suite. An elegantly decorated platform had been erected at the site of the spacious church. Here, after an imposing performance of mass, Napoleon received the crown from the Pope, placed it upon his head himself, and then rested in a moment upon the brow of Josephine, who knelt before him in tearful agitation. The notes of the Te Deum rolled grandly through the spacious area, then died away in subdued tones, leaving a breathless silence upon the vast multitude. The testament was then presented to the emperor, who pronounced the oath with his ungloved hand resting upon the sacred book. The ceremonies finished, the imperial assemblage retired amidst deafening shouts of Vive l'Empereur! Soon after the coronation, Josephine accompanied Napoleon to Italy to receive the iron crown of ancient Lombardy that had been offered him. This second coronation took place in the magnificent cathedral of Milan. Bonaparte immediately appointed Eugene de Beauharnois viceroy of Italy, and after a triumphant tour returned in state to Paris. Josephine now saw the predictions of her greatness fulfilled, but her happiness and peace decreased in proportion to the unprecedented rise of the man with whose destiny hers was linked. She seldom saw the emperor alone, he being almost always occupied in affairs of state or travelling by post to all parts of the kingdom. She sometimes accompanied him, but the addresses to which she was obliged to reply and the endless code of court ceremonials which Napoleon insisted upon being minutely observed were so innumerable that despite her diligence in studying them she could not retain a fourth part of them in her head, a great annoyance to her, notwithstanding she never for a moment lost her self-possession. Her impromptu replies rendered appropriate by her quick sense of fitness imparted a sweetness and sincerity to whatever she said or did, and not only saved her from censure or ridicule, but increased the admiration and respect of those about her. It is said, however, that on one occasion, when departing from Rheims, Josephine presented the mayoress with a medallion of malachite, set with diamonds, using the expression, it is the emblem of hope. Some days after, on seeing this absurdity in one of the journals, she could not believe that she had used it, and dispatched a courier instantly to Napoleon, fearing his displeasure above all things. This occasioned the famous order that no journalist should report any speech of the emperor or empress, unless the same previously appeared in the Moniteur. It is also amusingly related that when about to visit one of the Rhenish cities, the ladies who wished to be presented, being in doubt as to the ceremony used on the occasion, applied to one who had already been initiated. Among other instructions, she gave the following. You make three curtsies, one on entering the saloon, one in the middle, and a third a few paces farther on, en pirouette, whirling on the point of the toes. Immediately all the ladies of Cologne were practicing from morning till night, twirling away like so many spinning tops or dancing dervishes. Fortunately for themselves, as well as the dignity of the court, they learned from one of the empress's ladies of honor that a gentle inclination was all that was required, and thus were relieved from the misfortune of a misstep, and the empress and her suite were spared what must have excited irrepressible laughter and seriously disturbed the stateliness and equanimity of their imperial majesties. End of section 20section 21 of the heroines of history this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the heroines of history by john s jenkins section 21 josephine part 4 
During all these excursions, Josephine manifested the utmost kindness and benevolence to every one who applied to her with a tale of distress. Her sensitive nature never permitted her to turn a deaf ear to misfortune or suffering, nor refuse her generous sympathy to the poor. While partaking of a casual repast, by the way, she was sure to offer a portion of it to the passer-by, however beggarly, often adding bounteous alms. Blessings were invoked upon her head wherever she went, and with just reason, for Josephine was a friend to the friendless, a mother to the orphans, and a benefactress to the unfortunate. For some time after the coronation the emperor and empress remained at St. Cloud. While there, Josephine usually rose at nine o'clock, spent an hour in making a toilette, enjoyed a walk or some other recreation, and breakfasted at eleven o'clock, when she was occasionally joined by the emperor, though he never remained above ten minutes at table, considering it lost time. She afterwards received petitioners, to all of whom she gave ready assistance. Retiring to her own apartments, the remainder of the morning was spent with the ladies of her suite, all of whom were engaged in embroidering, while one of their number read aloud from some entertaining and instructive author. Works of fiction were never permitted to be circulated in the palace, as Napoleon was strictly and severely opposed to that class of literature. He sometimes suddenly appeared in their midst, talking gaily and freely with the ladies of honor, and occasionally joining in a game of cards, but his stay was always short. He was often present when the evening toilet of the empress was in preparation, overturning her boxes in his impatience, tossing about the most costly jewels as if of no value, and frightening her attendants by his irritable criticisms. He did not scruple to destroy an elegant dress if it happened not to strike his fancy, obliging her to assume another, a needless interference inasmuch as she was always apparelled with exquisite taste. He dined with her at six o'clock, in company with their invited guests, who learned to appease their appetite before being seated at the lavishly supplied table, from which they were obliged to rise before the tempting viands had been scarcely tasted. The emperor remained but a few moments, and the empress and guests necessarily followed him. Thus the utmost amiability was essential to Josephine, to endure these petty tyrannies with an unruffled mien. An important and happy event called her to Munich at the close of the year. The marriage of Eugene with the princess of Bavaria, was magnificently celebrated there. It gave both the emperor and empress the utmost satisfaction, not only for politic reasons, but because their mutual attachment gave promise of domestic peace. All that Josephine had desired was now accomplished. Her fears and anxiety as to the emperor's idea of divorce were forgotten after the birth of a son to Hortense, now Queen of Holland. As the young Napoleon advanced to years of interesting childhood, he so won upon his uncle's affections that Bonaparte determined to make him heir to his immense dominions. Josephine's future peace depended upon his life. As though to mock the hope centered in the young prince, death marked him an early victim. He died in 1807, while Napoleon was engaged in the brilliant campaign of Austerlitz. Upon hearing the tidings, he repeatedly exclaimed, "'To whom shall I leave all this?' The event afflicted Josephine with a double grief. She not only mourned the loss of a favorite, but trembled under the stroke that threatened her own happiness. She knew perfectly well that the powerful conqueror would not hesitate to sacrifice her if she impeded his limitless designs, though he loved her with all the devotion of which his selfish nature was capable. Nearly a year passed before Napoleon made known to her his unalterable decision, but that year was full of inexpressible torture to Josephine. A private passage determined by a small door connected their apartments. At this the emperor was accustomed to knock when he desired an interview. These occasions, when the subject of divorce was discussed, became so painful to Josephine that the usual summons caused violent palpitation of the heart, trembling, and faintness. She could scarcely support herself, while hesitating at the door to gather strength and courage for interviews that inflicted almost unendurable anguish. The final decision was made known to her May 30th by Napoleon himself, after ordering the attendants to withdraw. Of this, she says, I watched in the changing expression of his countenance that struggle which was in his soul. At length his features settled into a stern resolve. I saw that my hour was come. His whole frame trembled. He approached, and I felt a shuddering horror come over me. He took my hand, placed it upon his heart, gazed upon me for a moment, then pronounced these fearful words, Josephine, my excellent Josephine, thou knowest if I have loved thee, 
To thee, to thee alone, do I owe the only moments of happiness which I have enjoyed in this world. Josephine, my destiny overmasters my will. My dearest affections must be silent before the interests of France. Say no more, I had still the strength to reply. I was prepared for this, but the blow is not the less mortal. More I could not utter. I became unconscious of everything, and on returning to my senses found I had been carried to my chamber. From this time to the 16th of December she was obliged to appear at the fetes and public rejoicings, incident to the anniversary of the coronation, with a smiling countenance and cheerful demeanor, while beneath it all her heart was breaking. Her decision was not formally announced to the public till the 16th of December, when the Council of State was summoned to appear at the Tuileries. Napoleon's family, who secretly exulted at the event, were also gathered at the Grand Saloon. A chair, in front of which stood a table with writing apparatus of gold, was placed in the center of the apartment. At a little distance stood Eugene, with compressed lips and his arms folded over a heart swelling with resentment. Josephine entered with her usual grace, pale but calm, leaning on the arm of Hortense, who conducted her to the central chair and stationed herself behind it, weeping bitterly. The Empress sat composedly, with her head leaning on her hand, the tears coursing silently down her deathly pale cheek, listening to the reading of the act that was to separate her forever from the man for whom she would have laid down her life. Napoleon, in vain, endeavored to suppress the emotion that betrayed itself in the violent workings of his countenance. It was the wrenching of a strong affection from a soul that was else all chaos and darkness. It was the obliteration of a guiding star that had led him to the topmost pinnacle of greatness, and without whose steady radiance he must blindly overstep his narrow foothold and plunge from the dizzy height. A solemn stillness rested upon the assemblage when the reading of the act ceased. Even the Bonaparte family were touched with Josephine's uncomplaining sorrow. She pressed her handkerchief to her eyes for an instant, then rising, took the oath of acceptance in a tremulous voice, resumed her seat, and taking the pen, signed the document. The dreaded ceremony finished, she immediately retired, accompanied by Hortense and Eugene, who fell senseless as he reached the antechamber. The silent witnessing of his mother's suffering was too much for him to endure. For her sake, and in compliance with her entreaties, he had restrained his burning resentment. Josephine burst into an uncontrollable paroxysm of tears when she reached her private apartments, sobbing and groaning with an anguish heart-rending to behold. Carriages were in waiting to convey her to Malmaison. While preparations were making for her departure, Napoleon came to bid her a final farewell. As he approached, she threw herself in his arms, and clinging to him with a tenderness that conveyed more than words, the intensity and faithfulness of a love which nothing could tear from her heart. Overcome by her emotions, she fainted and was placed upon a couch, over which Napoleon hung with unconcealed anxiety and pain, tenderly stroking her cold face, and himself applying restoratives. Returning consciousness brought her more frantic grief when she perceived the Emperor was no longer near her for he had hastily left the apartment, fearing another scene. She seized the hand of an officer who still remained, and in accents of wild sorrow entreated him to tell the emperor not to forget her. No one could restrain tears of sympathy for the beloved empress, so unjustly thrust from the affections of an adored husband. She was accompanied to Malmaison by persons of distinction, who continued to pay court to her, knowing they thus best secured the royal favor, though many followed her from pure love and sympathy. She still retained the title of empress, and received an ample revenue to support the expenses and incident to her rank. Malmaison was elegantly furnished and embellished with many costly articles sent her by Napoleon's orders. She here held her court, which was frequented by the savants of Paris as well as the gay and beautiful. Thus Malmaison once more became the scene of fêtes, balls, and splendid entertainments. These gaieties could not divert Josephine from her one greatest sorrow. Every object in that lovely retreat, where their earliest days of happiness had been spent, reminded her of what she had in vain tried to forget. Her tears flowed afresh at the sight of the haunts they had frequented together. The flowers that had given her so much delight now only recalled painful associations. The rooms which had been exclusively Napoleon's she would permit no one but herself to enter, 
retaining every article precisely as he had left it. The maps he had studied, the books with leaves turned down, his apparel just where he had flung it in some impatient mood. Everything remained undisturbed and sacred to her own eyes, already inflamed and almost sightless with continual weeping. What agonizing remembrances of happiness she must have endured in this silent, deserted apartment! What abandonment to grief, where every object recalled the loved face and voice of one lost to her forever, and where no curious eyes checked her tears! It was well for her health and repose that she finally determined to forsake Malmaison, and retire to the Chateau of Navarre, a palace that had lain nearly in ruins since the devastation of the Revolution, but which was charmingly situated in the midst of the forest of Evreux. It had originally been celebrated for its spacious park, elegant gardens, lakes, fountains, and all that could render it an envied possession. The occupation of restoring its original beauty, of giving employment to the poor peasantry in the neighborhood, as well as escaping the heartless attentions of courtiers and the wearisome gaieties of court, was a beneficial, wise change. Josephine was accompanied thither by her most intimate, valuable friends, and a few young ladies whose guardian she became. She was never forsaken, however, by the world, who testified the sincerity of its admiration by visits to this out-of-the-way home of the loved empress. Her mornings were passed in company with the ladies of her suite, engaged in some useful work, and listening at the same time to one who read aloud. The afternoons were occupied in rides, walks, or visits to the poor, who were constant objects of charity. The evenings were passed in the saloons in lively conversation, occasional games at cards, or listening to the music of the harp and piano in adjoining apartments, where the young people engaged in dances or noisy games which, however they much disturbed the quiet of the saloons, Josephine would never allow to be checked, for she loved to see all around her cheerful and happy, even while her own heart was too sad for her face to brighten with a single smile. The news of the Emperor's marriage with the beautiful Maria Louise of Austria was a new pang to her already lacerated feelings. She could not conceal her grief on her first meeting with Napoleon after the event that deprived her of every claim upon his thoughts and affections. He often visited her, and evinced the lingering love and veneration he had entertained for her admirable character, by the entire confidence with which he unfolded all his plans to her. A correspondence sustained between them was her greatest pleasure. The birth of a son at St. Cloud was announced to Josephine, while attending a dinner given by the prefect at the city of Evreux. With no feeling of jealousy or envy, this noble woman added her congratulations and sincerely rejoiced with all of France at the accession of an heir to the throne. The only regret she expressed was that she had not first received the intelligence from Napoleon himself. When at length the letter arrived, communicating the tidings, she retired to read it and remained in seclusion an hour. When she returned to her guest, her face bore evident traces of tears. She longed to behold the young prince, a wish which Napoleon granted by himself placing the child in her arms, but which would have been refused by Maria Louise, who so disliked Josephine that she would ride miles out of her way rather than pass the resident of her rival in the Emperor's affections. Bonaparte continued to confide his most secret plans to Josephine. When he imparted to her his designs upon Russia, she used her utmost persuasion to induce him to abandon the wild project, in which she dimly foresaw his ruin. During that frightful campaign their correspondence was continued without interruption. His letters to her were more frequent and more affectionate than ever, while hers, written by every opportunity, were perused under all circumstances with a promptitude which clearly showed the pleasure or consolation that was expected. In fact, it was observed that letters from Malmaison or Navarre were always torn rather than broken open, and were instantly read whatever else might be retarded. The news of his disasters filled Josephine with fearful apprehensions, more especially as the French had lost the blind enthusiasm with which they formerly worshipped their hero and were as ready to heap anathemas upon his name as they had before been eager to find superlatives with which to praise him. He returned to France with the shattered remains of his brilliant army, unwilling to believe her people would dare to conspire against the bold conqueror who challenged all the world to battle. Neither his self-confidence nor his giant grasp could retain the crown, lost in his vain reachings for another. It was too late now to retrace his steps. In a short and painful interview with Josephine, he acknowledged that he might still have been Emperor of France, had he regarded her faithful entreaties. 
This was the last time she ever beheld him. The revolution that soon succeeded alarmed her for his fate. Could she have flown to him when deserted by Maria Louise, her grief would have been assuaged in imparting hope and consolation in his reverses, but she was obliged to wait in patient retirement widely separated from him, the issue of events that threatened his freedom, if not his life. Her own future was a secondary matter. She scarcely knew what to expect from the Allied sovereigns. They will respect her, who was the wife of Napoleon, said she, and with truth, though the honor and deference paid her was not because of her rank, nor because her fame had been closely associated with the fearful, hated, yet strangely glorious name of Napoleon Bonaparte. It was due alone to the world-wide admiration of her noble, generous, exalted character. A message from the Allied sovereigns expressed a desire to visit her at Malmaison, with which she immediately complied for the sake of her children, whose honors and titles had vanished with the Emperor's downfall. On arriving at her beloved home she was deeply affected to find a guard of honor had been stationed there to protect her property from the pillage and destruction involved in a revolution, like the devastation that marks the track of a whirlwind. Josephine was here visited by the Emperor Alexander, with whom she pled for Napoleon. It was greatly owing to her influence and eloquence, and a regard for her devoted attachment for Napoleon, that severe measures were not taken to crush or effectually pinion his ambitious spirit. Josephine was comparatively happy when it was at last announced to her that he was to possess in full sovereignty the principality of the island of Elba, an envied fate in contrast to the one she had feared. Upon his departure with the few who were still devoted to him, she wrote a most affectionate and touching letter, and would have followed him but for the delicacy of supplanting his rightful wife. Malmaison was again thronged with the great and gay, who came now not with empty flattery, but to assure the empress of the most profound esteem. The emperor Alexander, on meeting her, expressed his gratification thus. Madam, I burned with the desire to behold you. Since I entered France I have never heard your name pronounced but with benedictions. In the cottage and in the palace I have collected accounts of your goodness, and I do myself a pleasure in thus presenting to your majesty the universal homage of which I am the bearer. She was also visited by the King of Prussia. Louis, the occupant of the throne of France, conferred flattering distinctions upon Eugene, and would have made him Marshal of France, had his pride permitted him to accept the honor. Hortense was also received with marked favor. These monarchs, besides the most distinguished persons in Europe, frequently visited and dined at Malmaison, where Josephine gracefully did the honors. On the last occasion, May 19th, when a grand dinner was given to the Allied sovereigns, she became too ill to remain with her guests. She left her duties with Hortense to perform, obliged at length to yield to a disease that for some time she had endeavored to keep at bay. A malignant form of quinsy had fastened upon her, and despite the exertion of the most skillful physicians it made rapid and alarming progress. She articulated with much difficulty. She expressed affection for her children, who remained constantly at her bedside, by grateful and tender looks, often smiling upon them while enduring the severest pain, endeavoring to calm their agitation and lessen their anxiety. A few days, however, so changed the beloved countenance of their mother that no hopes were entertained for her recovery. She herself quickly recognized the hand of death. In her last moments her thoughts wandered far away to Elba, longing for the presence of one whom even the near approach of eternity could drive from her heart. A portrait of Napoleon hung near, which she motioned to be brought to her in place where she could gaze upon it, as if to number him who had forsaken her among the weeping ones gathered about her. Hortense and Eugene knelt at the bedside, overcome with grief, and sobbing painfully while they received her last blessing. At this moment the Emperor Alexander, who visited her daily, entered and was gratefully recognized by Josephine. She summoned all her remaining strength to say in a faint whisper, I shall die regretted. I have always desired the happiness of France. I did all in my power to contribute to it. I can say with truth that the first wife of Napoleon never caused a tear to flow. She died May 29, 1814, mourned, as she had said, not only by the French nation, but by all Europe. Princes testified their remembrance of her noble and eminent goodness by following her remains to the simple little church at Rouel, which was covered with black drapery on the occasion of her funeral. No ornament or inscription decorated the walls, but the tears of the proudest sovereigns of Europe 
mingled with those of the poor of France, to pronounce the funeral oration of the good Josephine. Her remains were afterwards placed in a beautiful tomb of white marble, upon which the empress is represented in a kneeling posture, as if praying for France. It gives no recital of her virtues, no enumeration of titles. The monument only bears the simple, touching inscription, Eugene and Hortense, to Josephine. Though crowned an empress, she never lost the sweetness and simplicity of character that belonged to her lively girlhood in the quiet at Martinique. Early disappointments and afflictions, so far from embittering her nature, served to chasten and fortify her spirit for the gentle endurance of sterner griefs. Great in prosperity, she was greater in adversity. She is an example of humane sympathy, of calm reason, of lofty magnanimity, thorough integrity, and unfaltering devotion to the objects of her affection. She was one of the countless instances of womanly tenderness repeatedly sacrificed to worldly schemes of the base and crafty, and she is an illustrious evidence of the higher policy of a frank and straightforward rectitude. Hers was that simple wisdom of a true heart which transcends the most dazzling genius of man, and as one of earth's true souls she will enlist the warm admiration of all who have an earnestness akin to hers so long as the world endures. End of section 21「Section 22 of the Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Elizabeth of England. Oh, she has an iron will. An axe like edge, unturnable, our head, the princess. Tennyson. Here vanity assumes her pert grimace. Goldsmith. Elizabeth of England is a heroine of history, not as a crowned and vain woman, but as one who, in early life, captivated all hearts by her youthful graces and acquirements, sustained many trials with fortitude, and escaped repeated dangers by her precocious sagacity and self-command. To her own wisdom, more than to any other mortal means, she owed her preservation, her popularity, and firm establishment on the throne of England. Her subsequent course presents little to be admired. Lord Bacon has been called the wisest, brightest, meanest of mankind. Elizabeth, in whose reign Bacon flourished, may be called the wisest, brightest, and meanest of women, if her reputation for extraordinary intellect is to be trusted as readily as the evidences of her odious character. That she was shrewd, learned, and energetic cannot be doubted, but it is hard to decide how far any ruler should be credited with measures in the suggesting or perfecting of which the wisest counsellors of a nation always participate. If the truth were fully known, many monarchs and presidents would lose the praise of glorious acts, and to some degree the blame of wrongs and follies into which they were entrapped. Elizabeth had the discernment to select able men as her advisers and agents, and the constancy to retain them in office during her long administration. She was fortunate in ascending the throne when the invention of printing, the discovery of America, and the Reformation had just aroused human intellect to new life, and produced great men in every department of literature and enterprise. Bacon, Shakespeare, Spencer, Raleigh, Sidney, and Drake, and other names of like luster, made the Elizabethan age glorious, not the selfish woman from whom the period borrows its title. Her favourites, not herself, were the patrons of genius. In her lifetime England entered on its present career of national grandeur, and achieved the peaceful and magnificent triumphs of art and commerce. But other motives actuated her than enlarged and generous ones. 
She established the Reformation and founded the English Church, but it was due to her resentment rather than to any enlightened and free spirit. Like the heroine of a novel, she gave her period a name and had the most prominent position in its scenes. The subordinate characters were the real heroes. She was an eagle, as one who most visibly hovered over the sunrise of modern intelligence, but in remorseless spirit, as in lean-necked ugliness, she was a vulture, and in absurd vanity, as in the full-sailed finery of her ludicrous dress, she was a peacock. She was born September the 7th, 1533, at Greenwich Palace, a little below London, on the Thames, now the site of the Greenwich Hospital for disabled or superannuated men of the British Navy. The royal birth occurred in a room called the Chamber of Virgins, and, as further coincidences, it is noticed by a superstitious writer of the time that she was born on the eve of the Virgin Mary's nativity, and died on the eve of her Annunciation. A solemn Te Deum celebrated her advent. Her mother was Anne Boleyn, second wife of Henry the Eighth, and famous for her beauty and cruel death. King Henry, the bluff King Harry, was, in some respects, the fit father of Elizabeth. He had six wives, four of whom were either divorced or beheaded to make way for their successors. He was a man of corpulent person, brave, frank, and susceptible of strong, transient attachments, but prodigal, capricious, rapacious, and overbearing in spirit. He once threatened a leading member of Parliament with the loss of his head if he did not secure the passage of a certain bill. His reign was a scene of bloodshed, and nearly all crimes are imputed to him. He divorced his first queen, Catherine of Aragon, mother of the one called Bloody Mary, to make room for Anne Boleyn, and when Elizabeth was in her third year, he brought Anne to the block, by an unsupported charge of secret amour, in order that he might marry Jane Seymour, mother of Edward the Sixth, and, like her predecessor, first a maid of honour in the royal household. The christening of Elizabeth on the fourth day of her life was very gorgeous. The Lord Mayor and civic authorities of London, together with a great array of nobility, were present at Greenwich to assist at the ceremonial which took place at the neighbouring church of Greyfriars, whereof no stone is now left. The procession marched from the palace in the inverse order of rank, citizens and esquires proceeding first. After them went the aldermen, and then lords and ladies, carrying gilt-covered basins, wax tapers, salt, and the jewelled chrism, a cloth to be laid on the child's face and finally the babe in the arms of her great-grandmother, beneath a canopy upheld by noblemen. The infant was robed in purple velvet, with an ermined train borne by earls and countesses. A crowd of bishops and abbots received the precious charge at the church door, and the celebrated Cranmer acted as godfather. After the baptism, a king-at-arms loudly invoked a blessing on the high and mighty Princess of England, Elizabeth. A flourish of trumpets followed, the child was confirmed, and the sponsors presented her with gifts of golden cups and bowls rich with gems. Thus was the royal babe initiated into the church of him who taught a gospel of lowliness and simplicity and thus was the symbol of purification applied with all pomp of pride. Elizabeth's state governess was the Duchess Dowager of Norfolk. Her governess in ordinary was Lady Margaret Bryan, who had sustained that office to the Princess Mary also, and the mansion and costly furniture, together with eleven attendants, were appointed for her infantile years. King Henry would not endure a child's presence at Greenwich. Therefore, when she was three months old, 
an order of council was issued, with all the solemn folly that attends royalty, to this effect. The King's Highness hath appointed that the Lady Princess Elizabeth shall be taken from hence towards Hatfield upon Wednesday next week, that on Wednesday night she is to lie and repose at the house of the Earl of Rutland at Enfield, and the next day to be conveyed to Hatfield, and there to remain with such household as the King's Highness hath established for the same. In a few weeks, Parliament acknowledged her heiress presumptive to the crown on certain conditions, and disowned her half-sister Mary. Then she was removed to the palace of the Bishop of Winchester at Chelsea. At a proper age, and after a profound deliberation of the great ministers of state on the subject, she was weaned. The official letter authorising this serious step states that the king's grace well considering the letter directed to you from my lady brian and other my lady princess officers his grace with the assent of the queen's grace hath fully determined the weaning of my lady princess to be done with all diligence the king built a palace at chelsea where until recently a nursery bathhouse and aged mulberry tree were known as elizabeth's According to the custom of bargaining away royal hearts and hands even from the cradle, it was now time to provide the infant with a future husband. A negotiation was commenced with Francis I of France for her marriage with his third son, the Duke of Angoulême, but the conditions proposed by the English court were so exacting that the affair was broken off and all further schemes respecting her were arrested by the execution of her mother, and the Act of Parliament by which she herself was declared illegitimate and incompetent ever to receive the crown. She was consequently so neglected by the court that not even the means for her comfortable support were furnished to her governess, who at last wrote a lengthy petition to my Lord Privy Seal, in which she says that Elizabeth hath neither gown nor kirtle nor petticoat nor no manner of linen nor forsmocks nor kerchiefs nor rails nor body stitchets nor handkerchiefs nor sleeves nor mufflers nor biggins she adds alluding to the child's slow teething i trust to god and her teeth were well graft to have her grace after another fashion than she is yet so as i trust the king's grace shall have great comfort in her grace for she is as toward a child, and as gentle of conditions, as ever I knew any in my life. This governess was judicious and faithful, and her commendable course, as well as the simple manner of life led by the young princess, doubtless contributed much to the strong qualities afterwards displayed by the latter. Her first appearance in scenes of court was at the christening of her half-brother Edward the Sixth. She was then four years old, and carried the chrism at the ceremony, marching with infant gravity in the procession, while the long train of her robe was borne by Lady Herbert, a sister of the woman who became the last wife of King Henry. As a great favour to her, she was made a companion of the young heir. The two became much attached to each other, and on his second birthday, when she was six years old, she gave him a cambric shirt worked by herself. Her precocious intelligence and propriety of demeanour won the good opinion of all visitors and associates, even that of her jealous sister Mary. Both Elizabeth and Edward were fond of study, so much so that, quote, as soon as it was light, they called for their books, end quote. Their first morning hours were devoted to the scriptures and religious exercises. After these came lessons in languages and science, and then, while her brother played in the open air, the princess resorted to her lute, viol, or needlework. When her father was married to Anne of Cleves, his fourth wife, Elizabeth desired to see the new queen, and wrote her a letter remarkable for its good sense 
and as being her first known attempt of the kind. Anne was delighted with her sprightly and fair stepdaughter, returned her young affection, and when herself divorced, requested that she might sometimes see the child, declaring that, quote, to have had that young princess for her daughter would have been greater happiness to her than being queen. End quote. Her successor, the lovely Catherine Howard, fifth wife of Henry and cousin of Anne Boleyn, was equally pleased with Elizabeth, placing her opposite at table and giving her a position nearest herself on great occasions. But it is noticeable that the flattering caresses of so beautiful a woman could not win away the child's preference for Anne of Cleves, so early developed was the characteristic constancy of disposition which was ever one of the few mitigating traits of the relentless maiden queen. Catherine Howard, however, deserved this invidious treatment. She proved to be anything but virtuous, and after her decapitation, the princess lived for the most part with Mary at Havering Bower. In her eleventh year, the king offered her to the son of Arran, a Scottish earl, in order to gain the earl's influence in favour of a contract of marriage between the infant Queen of Scots and young Edward of England. Arran did not improve the offer, nor, fortunately for Elizabeth, were any similar schemes successful. Instead of being sent to be educated in foreign courts, like Mary Stuart, in fulfilment of such contracts, she was happier in enjoying the care of her father's sixth queen, the worthy and cultivated Catherine Parr, who had always appreciated her mind and manners, and now gave her a room near her own in the palace of Whitehall. For a child of ten or twelve years old, she certainly had made wonderful advances in knowledge. With great ease, she had mastered the rudiments of all the sciences. She wrote and spoke French, Italian, Spanish, and Flemish, and was familiar with history, to which she set apart three hours every day, as if with a secret design already to prepare herself for public life. Her penmanship was very perfect. There was a volume in the Whitehall Library, written by her in French, on vellum, and in the British Museum is a small devotional volume of extracts from various languages selected by Catherine Parr, and translated and penned by Elizabeth when twelve years of age. The initials of the Queen and of the Saviour were by her hand worked in blue and silver thread on the cover. These acquirements and accomplishments, with her graceful behaviour, sparkling wit, and the kind of beauty that belongs to all childhood, gained her many admirers. Had her destiny been the private domestic circle, she might have been generally beloved through life, and perhaps have left a name in the annals of intellect. But as she grew older, her proud station changed her stability to wilfulness, her high spirit to violent temper, her ambition to vanity, and her maiden life made the, quote, vinous fermentation of youth turn to the acetus, end quote, vinegar of malign envy and jealousy. For a time before her father's death, Elizabeth lived at Hatfield House, in the town of that name, and the hedges of her garden there are still cut in the form of arches, as when she sported among them. There, too, her cradle is exhibited. From this place she was taken to Enfield, where, in her fourteenth year, the death of her father, Henry the Eighth was announced to her and her brother Edward, who both wept bitterly at their affliction. Never, in the charming words of an old writer, was sorrow more sweetly set forth, their faces seeming rather to beautify their sorrow than their sorrow to cloud the beauty of their faces. Edward was ten years old, and the splendour of his coronation could not divert his grief at losing the company of his sweetest sister, as he called her. 
according to her father's will, and by an act of Parliament rescinding a former one, Elizabeth was to succeed to the throne, if neither Edward nor Mary left heirs. Her income was the same as her sister's, over fifty thousand dollars a year, so that she was enabled to live in magnificence befitting the sister of the king. It was about this time that the Lord High Admiral Seymour made a bold attempt to engage for himself the affections and the hand of Elizabeth, of whom he had the charge in connection with his wife, who had been the last wife of King Henry. He was uncle to Edward, and was an immoral and unscrupulous man, though accomplished and handsome. He had married the widow of Henry with an unbecoming haste, and before his marriage had made some advances to Elizabeth which she firmly rejected. A year passed by. He still continued his very familiar attentions to her. His wife, the Queen Dowager, noticed it, and sent the young princess away. And soon after, Seymour was in mourning for his wife whom it was suspected he poisoned. Immediately he renewed his addresses to Elizabeth. He took care to find out the value of her estates, and he gained over to his interest Mrs. Ashley, her governess, and Parry, her treasurer. A girl of fifteen, it is not wonderful that she was pleased with a daring, agreeable man, who the year before had romped with her and caressed her. Now, though he was twenty years her senior, she gave him her first ready tender love, having no competent adviser in all her princely household of one hundred and twenty servants, and yielding to the persuasions of Mrs. Ashley and Parry, she met her wily lover at various times and places by stealth. Yet she seems to have acted with remarkable prudence at these imprudent meetings, as in all her communications with him. She assured him that she would marry him if he gained the consent of the royal council, over which Seymour's brother, the Duke of Somerset, ruled with kingly power as protector during Edward's minority. But rumours of the secret courtship were already afloat. The brothers Seymour and Somerset were both exceedingly ambitious and jealous of each other. Both aimed at royal authority, and the former had got himself appointed Lord Admiral in the absence of the latter, and had lately boasted of his concealed power. Seymour was soon arrested on the charge of high treason, and after the show of a trial was beheaded in the Tower of London. Parry and Mrs. Ashley had given evidence against him, but had exculpated Elizabeth. She herself was very strictly examined, but neither artful falsehoods nor terror could induce her to implicate any one. At so early an age, she was a match for the subtle persons who were sent to sound the depths of her heart. The tragical event made a powerful impression on her, and all things considered, it must have had an unfavourable effect on her character. The execution of her mother and her own first winning lover, the disgrace heaped upon their memories and herself, the neglects shown her through all her youth, her friendless condition, and the appointment of a new and strict governess, must altogether have exasperated her strong and princely will, and embittered her feelings. The child, the youth, if not the after-tyrannical woman, has many claims to admiring sympathy. The common reports concerning her at this time were of the most scandalous sort. That she gave some occasion for misrepresentation was probable at her period of life, and is rendered plausible by the fact that Mrs. Ashley is known to have deceived the servant of Sir Henry Parker, sent to inquire into the facts, and that she and Parry were promoted to high offices by Queen Elizabeth during all her reign, as if she would keep them silent on some points of the affair. At all events, 
the young princess displayed singular tact and talent in the whole course of it, and was schooled in such trials for the profound craftiness of her career. When Seymour's fate was announced to her, she betrayed no emotion to the spies who watched her features, and only said, This day died a man with much wit and very little judgment. End of section 22、section、23、of the Heroines of History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Elizabeth of England, Part Two. Her effort henceforth was to recover that popularity which was the object of her lifelong pursuit. She became very grave and studious, and devoted herself, among other things, to the theological questions which were then generally agitated. To the learned William Grindle succeeded the learned Roger Ascham as her tutor. He had before written to her governess in these curious words after the style of the time. Gentle Mrs. Ashley, would God my wit wist what words would express the thanks you have deserved of all true English hearts, for that noble imp, Elizabeth, by your labour and wisdom now flourishing in all goodly godliness. Now he undertook to perfect her in the classics. As to her personal decoration at this time, he writes in a Latin letter to a friend that quote, she greatly prefers a simple elegance to show and splendour, so despising the outward adorning of plaiting of the hair and wearing of gold, that in the whole manner of her life she rather resembles Hippolyta than Phaedra. Little did the good man imagine that at her death her wardrobe would contain three thousand costly dresses and eighty wigs of various colours. Her household expenses were already on a grand scale befitting the blood royal. Large sums were paid to musicians, theatrical companies, and for her servants' velvet liveries. And for her stock of choice wines, prize oxen for her table, and walnut furniture for her palace. But she affected extreme simplicity of dress, knowing that her youthful charms were best unadorned, and desiring to ingratiate herself with a triumphant Protestant party who opposed the claims of her sister Mary, a Catholic. On the sixth of July, fifteen fifty three, King Edward died of consumption, sixteen years of age, Elizabeth being twenty and Mary thirty six. Somerset had met the fate of his brother and had been superseded by Dudley, Duke of Northumberland, who had persecuted Mary on account of her faith. And when Edward's health failed and Mary was likely to assume the sceptre. Was alarmed at the ruin ready to fall on his head. He resolved both to save and further advance himself by a bold step. The Lady Jane Grey, sixteen years old and of marvellous learning, beauty, and loveliness of character, was like Mary, Queen of Scots, a granddaughter of a sister of Henry the Eighth, the father of Mary, Elizabeth, and Edward. By Henry's will, she was next heir to the crown after his own children. Dudley therefore effected a marriage between Jane Grey and a handsome, promising son of his own. Then, appealing to the religious convictions of the dying Edward, procured his legacy of the crown to her, and concealed his death for a while in order to get the sisters into his power. In this he failed, but forthwith prevailed on Jane Grey against her will to be crowned. 
She acted the part of queen but nine days. Dudley's forces did not rally in sufficient strength. The nation, apparently from a sturdy sense of honesty, flocked to the standard of Mary, who soon entered London in triumph. The duke, with many adherents of the quasi-queen, suffered under the axe, and three months afterward poor Lady Jane and her young husband met the same fate, in that Tower of London which still stands a mute and sullen witness to the heroic death of many noble victims. Elizabeth's conduct during these exciting events was marked by her rare caution and sagacity. When deceitfully summoned to Edward's bedside by Dudley, she remained at home, being warned by friends, perhaps, and even feigned illness, as it is asserted, that she might not be mixed up with Dudley's scheme, while, on the other hand, Mary was nearly entrapped. Before this sickness, she gave the conspirators a shrewd and brave excuse for not signing away her title to the throne, namely that she had none during the life of her elder sister. Her defenceless situation and the seeming success of Lady Jane's party evinced her courage in this. And when Mary victoriously advanced towards London, Elizabeth forgot her illness and hastened to meet and pay homage to her sister, with an armed retinue of two thousand horsemen, whose leaders were dressed in green, faced with velvet, satin, and taffeta. Learning that Mary had already dismissed her useless army, she next day met her with an unarmed cavalcade of a thousand persons, many of whom were ladies of rank. They were kindly received, and when the sisters entered the city they rode side by side on horseback, Mary's small, faded form and reserved demeanour poorly contrasting with the fresh youthfulness, tall, erect person, graceful airs and carefully shown delicate hands of Elizabeth, who then, as ever, craved applause and made the most of her attractions. Mary, though styled the bloody, was an unostentatious, sincere woman of excellent intentions. Her mixture of Spanish and Tudor blood gave her much latent pride and resolution, and she was embittered by her mother's and her own wrongs. But her heart was susceptible of the tenderest affection. She was generous to her sister under trying circumstances, and would have been humane in her administration, but for her intolerant creed, the sanguinary zeal of her advisers, the dangers of her position, and the spirit of the age. Unfortunately, differences soon sprang up between her and Elizabeth, and were fomented by the friends and ambition of each, or by the enemies of both. The younger sister was the hope and boast of the Protestant party, and for the sake of their plaudits as well as in consequence of her own education, she refused the Queen's summons to attend Romish Mass and resisted all her persuasions and threats, until, finding that she was endangering her safety and prospects, she sought an interview with Mary, threw herself at her feet, and expressed a willingness to be convinced of her errors, if they were such. In various ways she so pursued a double course that the Queen for a while gave her the place of highest honour on all occasions. In the grand pageant of the coronation, Elizabeth wore a French dress of white and silver tissue, and rode in a chariot drawn by six horses, trapped also with gold and silver, which followed immediately after the gold canopied litter in which the sovereign was born. But when Parliament passed an act which so affirmed the legitimacy of Mary as unavoidably to imply the contrary concerning herself, she resented it by an effort to withdraw from court. 
At this juncture the difficulties beset her which formed the third and greatest peril of her early career. Nothing but extraordinary care and good fortune saved her from the whirlpool of dangers into which she was now drawn. Her rash friends were her worst enemies. At the false instigation of her mortal foes, they formed a plot known as Wyatt's Rebellion, by which they hoped to enthrone Elizabeth, stop the Catholic schemes of Mary, and prevent her proposed marriage with Philip of Spain. Courtney, Earl of Devonshire, a prepossessing yet weak man, and kinsman of the sisters, had been rejected as suitor to Mary, and was now a leader in the plot, and resolved to gain Elizabeth. The King of France was busily seeking, by insincere offers of aid, to promote the conspiracy, and inflame both parties in England against each other, in order that he might set his daughter-in-law, Mary of Scotland, another claimant, on the English throne. The Emperor Charles V of Spain was a still more deadly enemy of Elizabeth, because her pretensions endangered the plans for his son Philip, and because her mother had supplanted Catherine of Aragon in the days of King Henry. Thus was the future Virgin Queen beset by various powerful foes, and by mistaken supporters who vainly tried every means to involve her in the plot. Rumours of it reached Mary, who was persuaded to require Elizabeth's acceptance of the Prince of Piedmont, that the mouths of the Protestants might thus be shut in regard to her own alliance with Philip. The undaunted girl steadily resisted this, even in the face of not improbable death by the axe, for she was already accused and suspected and her retirement from court to avoid indignities and vexations was construed against her loyalty. Letters from the rebels and the French to her were intercepted, and the odium of these unsought tamperings fell on her. The King of France offered her unlimited assistance, or, if she preferred, engaged to give her a refuge in his dominions a refuge which would have proved a virtual imprisonment for life. At last the whole plot was disclosed to the royal council. In four days after, Wyatt, a knight in the southeastern part of England, raised the banner of revolt and marched with four thousand men towards London. He was suffered to enter the city, and finding no expected aid, he was surrounded and yielded himself up in despair. The other leaders, in various parts of the kingdom, failed to support his movement, and were one after another arrested, among them Lady Jane Grey's father, who, in common with her and sixty of the conspirators, was speedily executed. It was a critical time for Elizabeth. The streets of London were hideous with heads of victims exposed to the populace, and the tower flowed with blood. She was summoned to the court to appear before avenging powers, and with the fate of her mother and many of her friends in vivid recollection. She delayed on the score of sickness, which, whether the result of agitation of mind or merely physical causes, was not feigned entirely, though doubtless she made the most of it in order to gain time. At length she was brought to the city. As she entered it, her lofty spirit rose superior to her bodily weakness and the terrific scenes around her. Gibbets were to be seen everywhere, and that morning, the Lady Jane's father had perished, following to the block his lately sacrificed and lovely daughter. But Elizabeth ordered her litter to be uncovered, and gazed with scornful dignity on the crowd that pitied but dared not rescue her. She was dressed in white, emblematic of her innocence, and a hundred gentlemen in velvet coats formed her guard of honour followed by a hundred others in the royal livery of fine red cloth, 
faced with black velvet. Thus was she escorted to the palace of Whitehall, and there closely guarded. For three weeks her fate was discussed in the council, while she remained in torturing doubt of the result. There was every cowardly temptation for the traitors to criminate her in order to shield themselves, or recommend themselves to mercy. Wyatt did so, but, finding it of no avail to mitigate his sentence, confessed on the scaffold the falsity of his charges. The other prisoners, for the most part, acted with more honour than could have been anticipated. No positive evidence could be found against her, and the Queen, against the urgent advice of her chief statesman, firmly opposed the immolation of her sister on insufficient proof. But Queen Mary was to attend a meeting of Parliament at Oxford. She had to dispose of Elizabeth in some safe way, and so she ordered her to the Tower. This command was received with natural dismay. Elizabeth wrote an admirable letter to the Queen, pleading against her supposed fate in strong, simple language, uttered with too much heartfelt anxiety to admit of her usual pedantic and finical amplification. She took care to occupy so much time in writing it that the tide of the Thames ebbed, and the barge that was to convey her could not pass the London Bridge. The next tide was at midnight, and it was not thought safe to attempt her removal at an hour when her friends might take advantage of the darkness to rescue her. On the morrow she was put aboard the boat. The tide not being fully up, she was nearly wrecked in the stream while passing the bridge. She reached the tower in a rainstorm, angrily dashed away an offered cloak, resisted the attempts to lead her through what was called the traitor's gate, and when she landed, exclaimed, Here lands as true a subject, being prisoner, as ever landed at these stairs. Before thee, O God, I speak it, having no other friend but thee alone. She seated herself on a stone in the pelting rain, and when urged not to endanger her health thus, she replied, Better sit here than in a worse place. She rebuked some of her attendants for weeping, and was conducted into her prison. The high-born captive remained two months in the tower. She and her servants were subjected to the severest examination by the council, one member of her household being even put to torture to extract some evidence against her. It would appear that she had held some cautious conference with accomplices of the rebellion, perhaps that she might ascertain the designs of Jane Grey's party, who were engaged in the affair, professedly to favour Elizabeth. But Mary was too conscientious and faithful to the tender ties of blood to permit her prisoner's murder without good proof of treasonable intent. Moreover, at one of the examinations, Lord Arundel, one of her most influential and furious opposers, was suddenly convinced of the injustice done her. He nobly and impulsively expressed his sympathy, and Elizabeth, with her usual cunning and something of her subsequent coquetry, began to flatter him in such a way that he warmly espoused her cause, and henceforth began to entertain hopes that he might win her hand for himself or for his son. Still she suffered much rigorous usage. English prayers and Protestant forms were forbidden to her and her ladies, two of whom were taken away on account of their resistance to this tyranny. Her place of close confinement is said to have been directly beneath the alarm bell of the castle, so that her keepers might ring it readily to arouse the city in case of any attempt to deliver the princess. The handsome Courtney, for whom it is still supposed she had some liking, was incarcerated near her, probably to tempt them to some communication which might be used against them. But her conduct is represented by her fellow prisoners as calm and brave. Whether it was to win favour or not, they spoke of her 
sweet words and sweeter deeds in consoling them. By degrees her privileges were increased. She bribed the chamberlain to remit his officious interference with the provisions of her table by giving him a bountiful portion of them. Her health began to fail, and she was allowed to walk through a splendid suit of apartments known as the Queen's Lodgings, the tower being sometimes used as a refuge for royalty as well as a prison. In these walks she was accompanied by a guard, and the windows were blinded that she might not look out. But her need of air procured her the liberty of a small garden within the walls. While pacing there, the captives were not permitted to gaze at her from their windows, lest some mutual understanding or plot might be contrived. Her constraint was relieved, however, by the winning acts of several children of the officers. These incidents are memorably beautiful. One infant girl brought her some little keys while she was in the garden, and told her that she need not stay there but might unlock the gates. Another child, a boy of four years, daily offered her flowers, and received trifling presents in return. This caused suspicion in the prying magnates of the place, who questioned the child, but could neither frighten nor coax him into any confession that he was employed to carry messages to and from the princess. He pitifully said to her through the keyhole of her door, Mistress, I can bring you no more flowers now. She was delighted with these little angels of consolation, and ever after seemed pleased with children for their sake. Among the many distinguished persons under arrest in the tower was Lord Robert Dudley, committed for aiding his father, Dudley, Duke of Northumberland, in the plot previous to the last mentioned one. He was born in the same hour with Elizabeth, had been a playfellow with her in her childhood, and was afterwards her chief favourite, and made by her the Earl of Leicester. He was on service abroad after leaving the tower, and until her accession to the throne, when he was immediately promoted and showered with favours. It is thought that he held a correspondence with her at the time of their imprisonment, by means of the boy who brought the flowers inasmuch as they had no other opportunity of intercourse for a long time. Some hypothesis is apparently needed to explain her sudden partiality to one who had long opposed her interests. But their early companionship, his qualities, and her policy or susceptibility may account for it all. End of section 23 Section 24 of The Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Elizabeth of England. Part 3. The climax of Elizabeth's danger soon came. It was a narrow escape from violent death, and illustrates the truth everywhere suggested by the pages of history, namely that the course of human events is daily changed or nearly changed by slight circumstances. The artful gardener, chief minister of state to Mary, had been gained over to the Spanish interest, and had persistently sought the princess's death. The queen was taken ill, alarmed probably at his own fate if Elizabeth mounted the throne. He sent a privy council order to the tower for her instant execution. The lieutenant of the tower observed that the queen's signature was not appended to the warrant, and had the good sense to send a messenger to her, inquiring her will. Had he been more swayed by the influence of Gardiner, he might have thought the sovereign too ill to sign a document approved by her and legally drawn. Elizabeth might have perished, leaving a sadly romantic fame only second to Lady Jane Grey's, 
and Mary, Queen of Scots, might have sat on the English throne, carried out the designs of the English Mary, and further established popery in a land where no strong Scottish relish for endless secessions would have hindered the still papistic tendencies of a nation too aristocratic to care for other than a formal state religion. The Queen was aroused by this attempt on her sister's life. She sent Sir Henry Bedingfield, an honest and fearless man, with a hundred men of the Royal Guard, to take command of the Tower, until she could transfer the Princess to a safer place, far from the intrigues of court. She had already given up the idea of prosecuting her any further, and had begun to speak of her again by the endearing title of sister. She had refused, too, a Spanish proposal to send her to some continental court, an event that would have led to Elizabeth's ruin. At length it was resolved to remove her in the custody of Bedingfield to Woodstock, a royal residence fifty miles west of London. Elizabeth, apprehending that any hour might seal her fate, had been suddenly frightened at the first coming of Bedingfield, with his hundred men in blue uniform. As they rode into the castle, she turned pale, and hastily asked her attendants whether Lady Jane's scaffold had been taken away. When she learned that she was to be conducted to Woodstock, her terror took a new form. She inquired whether the knight were a person who made conscience of murder. She knew too well that prisoners who could not be legally executed were sometimes exposed on the highways to a concerted attack. But her fears were allayed by the reputation of her staunch new keeper. She went by boat to Richmond, near London. There the Queen was sojourning with her court, and with her she had an interview which resulted in nothing but a renewal of the former effort to induce Elizabeth to marry Philibert, Prince of Piedmont, and most intimate friend of Philip of Spain. As often before, she asserted her determination to remain single, and to intimidate her into the measure, her servants were all taken from her. This deed again made her anxious for her life. This night I think I must die, she said. Her servants wept as they left her, as if they had looked upon her for the last time. But Lord Tame, one of her guards, assured her that he would protect her. When she was about to cross the Thames the next morning, her servants came to look another final farewell. Go to them, she said to a gentleman, and tell them from me, Tan quam ovis, like a sheep to the slaughter, for so am I led. No one except her keepers was allowed to have the least communication with her. No I, the detestable French ambassador, who had all along laboured to destroy her, sent to her a present of apples on her way, a plan to cast upon her more of the odium of French friendship. The people of England, who were mostly Protestant and admired her, made sincerer demonstrations of sympathy. Wherever she passed, they crowded near, and greeted her with prayers, acclamations, and tears, though rudely thrust back and denounced as rebels by the soldiers. In some of the villages a joyful peal of bells announced her arrival but Bedingfield, who was both her honest protector and suspicious master, silenced the bells and put the ringers in the stocks. The other guardian, Lord Tame, was bold enough to cheer her with a rich feast and invited company, while the party rested at his country seat. He said, Let what would befall, her grace should be merry in his house. So much chivalry and noble feeling existed even in those bloody days. At this entertainment she was not permitted to see the conclusion of a game of chess, lest some covert plan of delay were intended. 
and, while continuing the journey, she was, for the same reason, forbidden to take shelter from a severe storm in a house by the wayside. At the palace of Woodstock she was uncomfortably lodged in the gatehouse, and treated with much harshness. On her window she wrote these words with a diamond. Much suspected, of me nothing proved can be, quoth Elizabeth, prisoner. On a shutter with a bit of charcoal, it is said that she inscribed these pathetic lines composed by herself. O oh, fortune, how thy restless, wavering state hath fraught with cares my troubled wit! Witness this present prison, whither fate could bear me, and the joys I quit. Thou caused the guilty to be loosed from bands wherein our innocence enclosed, causing the guiltless to be straight reserved, and freeing those that death had well deserved. But by her envy can be nothing wrought, so God send to my foes all they have wrought. Quoth Elizabeth, prisoner. She composed elegant Latin verses to the same effect, and she wrote the following amusing yet excellent thoughts on the fly leaf of a copy of Paul's Epistles. Quote, August, I walk many times into the pleasant fields of the Holy Scriptures, where I pluck up the goodlysome herbs of sentences by pruning eat them by reading, chew them by musing, and lay them up at length in the high seat of memory by gathering them together, that so having tasted their sweetness, I may less perceive the bitterness of this miserable life. End quote. One day, it is related, she saw through her window a milkmaid in the park, singing as she milked. She exclaimed, that milkmaid's lot is better than mine, and her life is merrier. Sixty soldiers were on guard round her apartments all day and night, and well were they needed. The infamous gardener sent one Basset, with twenty-five ruffians in disguise, to assassinate her. But so strict were the regulations of those who had her in custody, Bassett could get no access to his intended victim. An incendiary also kindled a fire directly beneath her room, but it was discovered in time to extinguish it. The fears and hopes of wily politicians and the zeal of Catholic priests were arrayed against her. Her right to live was denounced from their pulpits. As a matter of policy, she outwardly conformed to the Romish rites. Yet, when questioned as to her belief in transubstantiation, the changing of bread and wine into the actual flesh and blood of Christ at the Catholic communion, she made a famous reply in extempore rhymes to which no person could object, of course. Christ was the word that spake it. He took the bread and brake it. And what his word did make it, that I believe, and take it. While she was thus inditing poetry at Woodstock, or suffering severe illness, or reading and meditating in resignation, weariness, or bitterness, as she paced her room and the adjacent garden, a change of feeling was taking place in regard to her. After a year of married life, Queen Mary was disappointed in her hope of an heir, and therefore looked still more kindly to her sister as her successor. And Mary's husband, Philip of Spain, fearing the claims of the Queen of Scots, hating France, desirous to gratify the English people, and perhaps with an eye to Elizabeth's hand himself, as he indeed sought it after the death of the Queen, who was now in declining health, with such motives, he urged his wife to invite the captive princess to pass Christmas at court in London. Arrived at Hampton Palace, she was still kept in close ward, and repeated attempts were made to induce her to confess some kind of guilt, 
in order that she might not seem to have been imprisoned without just cause. On this condition she was promised full liberty. But she heroically resisted this disgraceful proposal, saying, I had as lief be in prison with honesty as to be abroad, suspected of Her Majesty. That which I have said I will stand to. After a week's strict confinement, she was startled by a summons at ten o'clock at night to appear before the Queen. This was at least the fifth time in her captivity when immediate preparations seemed to be making for her death. She begged her attendants to, quote, pray for her, for she could not tell whether she would ever see them again, end quote, and was conducted by the light of torches to the Queen's apartment. Philip, ashamed to confront a woman at whose destruction he and his country had so long aimed, is said to have been concealed behind the tapestry of the room. A long conversation followed in English and Spanish, resulting in a fair understanding between the sisters. Elizabeth received a ring in pledge of amity, and soon after was honoured as next in station to the Queen at the showy festivities of the holidays. She sat at the Queen's table, and was served by her late enemy, Lord Paget. Her brave and amiable suitor, Philibert, Prince of Piedmont, was present, but she avoided his attentions, having perhaps too much preference for Courtney or Dudley, and influenced doubtless by the wishes of her party, as well as by her own ambition to wield an undivided sceptre. With Philibert, who afterwards married a French princess, Margaret of Valois, she would have passed a happier life, but the event would have been a great disaster to England by hindering the free principles of the Reformation. Many other distinguished guests from various courts of Europe were gathered at this time to attend a grand tournament, which was to have taken place the year before in honour of Mary's marriage, but for some reason was delayed. Elizabeth sat beneath the royal canopy to witness the jousting, in which two hundred lances were shivered, the knights of Spain and Flanders entering the lists in their national costumes. At the services in the royal chapel she was dressed in robe of rich white satin, parsimented all over with large pearls. Her appearance is described by the Venetian ambassador in this language, quote, Milady Elizabeth is a lady of great elegance, both of body and mind, though her face may be called pleasing rather than beautiful. She is tall and well-made, her complexion fine, though rather sallow. Her eyes, but above all her hands, which she takes care not to conceal, are of superior beauty. She is proud and dignified in manners. End quote. Great respect was shown her by the greatest dignitaries of the realm at this time. King and Cardinal, when they met her, sank on one knee and kissed her hand. She was very gracious to Philip, and afterwards boasted of him as one of her conquests. She returned to Woodstock. Her servants were allowed to accompany her, and she lived in comparative freedom. Some difficulty indeed arose concerning an astrologer, John Dee, whom she entertained on account of the strange interest which a woman of her education took in his occult science. Persons in her household were accused of practising by enchantment against the Queen's life. Elizabeth was brought back to Hampton Palace, but Philip so befriended her that she was finally suffered to return to her own chosen home, Hatfield House, where she was molested no further than by having one spy under her roof. This was Sir Thomas Pope, a learned and agreeable man, who was recommended by the Queen as a person who would look after her comfort, a pleasant way of installing him as her guardian. Quote, 
the fetters in which he held her were more like flowery wreaths thrown around her to attach her to a bower of royal pleasance than aught which might remind her of stern restraints End quote. and she was well satisfied with the arrangement sir thomas interested her in his plans concerning trinity college which he had just founded at oxford in return for her goodness he assisted in the amusements at Hatfield House. One of these scenes is thus described by a chronicler of the time. Quote, at Shrovetide, Sir Thomas Pope made for the Lady Elizabeth, all at his own cost, a grand and rich masking in the great hall at Hatfield, where the pageants were marvellously furnished. There were twelve minstrels antiquely disguised, with forty-six or more gentlemen or ladies, many knights, nobles, and ladies of honour, apparelled in crimson satin, embroidered with wreaths of gold, and garnished with borders of hanging pearl. There was the device of a castle of cloth of gold, set with pomegranates about the battlements, with shields of knights hanging therefrom, and six knights in rich harness tourneyed. At night the cupboard in the hall was of twelve stages, mainly furnished with garnish of gold and silver vessels, and a banquet of seventy dishes, and, after a void of spices and subtleties, with thirty spice-plates, all at the charge of Sir Thomas Pope, and the next day the play of Holofernes. But the Queen, per case, misliked these follies, and so these disguisings ceased. End quote. Another scene is recorded. Quote, she was escorted from Hatfield to Enfield Chase by a retinue of twelve ladies clothed in white satin on ambling palfreys, and twenty yeomen in green, all on horseback, that her grace might hunt the hart. At entering the chase or forest, she was met by fifty archers in scarlet boots and yellow caps, armed with gilded bows, one of whom presented her a silver-headed arrow, winged with peacock's feathers. Sir Thomas Pope had the devising of this show. At the close of the sport, her grace was gratified with the privilege of cutting the buck's throat. End quote. When the Queen visited her, quote, she adorned her great state chamber for Her Majesty's reception with a sumptuous suit of tapestry, representing the siege of Antioch. After supper, a play was performed by the choir boys of St. Paul's. When it was over, one of the children sang, and was accompanied on the virginals by no meaner musician than the Princess Elizabeth herself. End quote. Such were the merry-makings in the olden time. At Hatfield her grace enjoyed again the services of Mrs. Ashley and Parry, who were so convenient to her in her first love affair. Roger Ascombe, too, resumed his place as her instructor, though she was now twenty-three years old, and so versed in the classics that Ascombe confesses he could teach her nothing more but rather her, quote, modest and maidenly looks taught him, end quote. A modesty that her Italian master calls, quote, a marvellous meek stomach, end quote. Her meekness must have undergone a sudden and astonishing change before she became queen. The language of these men is merely the ordinary flattery of those promoted to places near princes, or it shows a finished artfulness in the future mistress of all deception. At this time, the Archduke of Austria was expected at London to propose for her hand. There was no end of the matches arranged for her from her infancy until long after her coronation. The great Gustavus Vasa of Sweden offered his son, but the union was declined. The subject of Philibert's addresses was repeatedly introduced, and always with resulting ill will. At last, quote, he was seen making love from his window to the fair Duchess of Lorraine, end quote, 
and this discovery by Elizabeth herself, as well as the final resolution of the Queen, terminated the vexatious suit. The urgent renewal of it immediately after the death of Courtney is thought to argue a private engagement between him and the princess. How far her heart was tried with disappointment, and how far this led to her maiden resolutions, can never be known. End of section 24、section、twenty five of the Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Elizabeth of England, Part Four. In various ways, her peace was constantly disturbed and her temper injured. In 1556, two insurrections broke out, headed by adventurous aspirants for her hand and a share in her expected sovereignty. The first was that of Sir Henry Dudley. Two of her officers were implicated in it. And she narrowly escaped suffering by their treason. The next revolt, a few weeks after, was raised by an impostor, and proclaimed Elizabeth Queen and himself King as her husband. From another danger, she escaped only through the honesty of the new French ambassador. Wearied out with court intrigues respecting her, she twice applied to him to secure her safe passage to France. At last, he plainly told her that if she ever hoped to ascend the throne, she must never leave England. But the queen was prostrate with mortal sickness in November fifteen fifty eight, and Elizabeth's anxieties for herself were soon to cease. Mary bequeathed her crown to her, and secured some kind of promise that she would maintain the Catholic religion. In fact, she observed the ceremonies of that church for a month after her sister's death, when she found that the Protestants were certainly in the majority. Mary sent her the crown jewels, and Philip added a precious casket. In gratitude for such favors, Elizabeth always retained his portrait in her bedchamber. As the Queen failed in strength. The courtiers, as usual at such times, forsook their late mistress and crowded around the expectant successor to the crown. Yet so cautious was Elizabeth that she would assume no airs of royalty until she was certified of the queen's death by private means. She engaged Sir Nicholas Throckmorton to procure Her Majesty's black enamelled ring. Which she always wore as a bridal one, so soon as she ceased to breathe, and ride with it to her at his utmost speed. This he commemorates in verse. She said, "Since naught exceedeth woman's fears, who still dread some baits of subtlety, Sir Nicholas, know a ring my sister wears, enamelled black, a pledge of loyalty." The which the King of Spain in spousals gave, if aught fall out amiss, tis that I crave. When the news came, she knelt and repeated in Latin the sacred words, "It is the Lord's doing; it is marvellous in our eyes." This was afterwards engraved on her gold plate, and another text, "I have chosen God for my helper." Was written likewise in Latin on her silver service. On the seventeenth day of November, fifteen fifty-eight, Mary expired, and Elizabeth was proclaimed queen. Great trouble was anticipated in consequence of the distracted state of religious parties and the late bloody persecutions by the papists, but it all passed off peaceably. The Catholic Lord Chancellor nobly secured the recognition of Elizabeth by Parliament. The people, worn out with tyranny, 
and terrified by a pestilence that swept the kingdom and strangely attacked many high ecclesiastics, hailed the new sovereign with joy. The bells were pealed, bonfires lighted, and the poor were publicly feasted by the rich. Queen Elizabeth appointed Cecil her secretary of state, and retained him so long as he lived, and his course proved the true policy of her choice. In a few days she took her journey to London, followed by a splendid procession of nobility and multitudes of the people, who had often before enthusiastically crowded to see and hail her. To the people she ascribed her quiet succession to the sceptre. On her way she met a company of bishops and offered her hand to be kissed by each, excepting Bonner, who had become notorious for his cruelty in persecuting nonconformists. As she approached the city she rode in a costly chariot, but entered the streets on horseback. Her dress was of purple velvet, with a scarf over her shoulders, and Lord Robert Dudley, her henceforth chief pet, rode next to her. Before her were borne the sceptre and sword of state. The walls of the city, then existing, were hung with tapestry, and music everywhere resounded, while the tower guns were continually discharged. At various points children were in waiting to welcome her with songs or set speeches. Nothing escaped her eye. She responded to everything, knowing well how far every attention goes in attaching the people to one in high station. It was always her rule to gain over all enemies and lose no friend. Reaching the tower, she went directly to the rooms where she had been imprisoned, fell on her knees, and thanked God, comparing herself to Daniel escaped from the lion's den. A few days after, she removed her court to Somerset Palace. Her first care was to ascertain by shrewd experiments how far she might restore the independent church and government of her father. After this, on the day preceding her coronation, she made a procession through the city. The Lord Mayor and his city companies, says a chronicler, met her on the Thames with their barges decked with banners of their crafts and mysteries. His own company, the Mercers, had a bachelor's barge and an attendant foist, with artillery shooting off lustily as they went, with great and pleasant melody of instruments, which played in a sweet and heavenly manner. Landing at the tower, she left it in a chariot covered with crimson velvet, and overshadowed with a canopy borne by knights. One who was in the procession records that, quote, The queen, as she entered the city, was received by the people with prayers, welcomings, cries, and tender words and all signs which argue an earnest love of subjects towards their sovereign. And the queen, by holding up her hands and glad countenance to such as stood afar off, and most tender language to those that stood nigh her grace, showed herself no less thankful to receive the people's goodwill than they to offer it. End quote. Frequently she stopped her chariot to receive gifts of flowers from poor women in the concourse. At the upper end of Gracechurch Street, beneath a splendid arch, had been erected a stage in three stories. On the lowest platform were effigies of the Queen's grandparents. Elizabeth of York, in the midst of a gigantic artificial white rose, at her side was Henry the Seventh peeping from a mammoth red rose, and holding his consort by the hand. From these roses a stem reached to the next higher stage, where the Queen's father was represented in the centre of a grand red and white rose, and holding Anne Boleyn by the hand. Another branch proceeded from this to the highest platform, where Elizabeth herself was counterfeited on a throne. Thus was her genealogy, embracing the houses of York and Lancaster, very ingeniously set forth. 
and thus was Anne Boleyn at length honoured. Many other devices, such as Father Time, the Beatitudes, Deborah, etc., were to be seen. Through all this remarkable display, the maiden queen acted her part with consummate address, according to the taste of the period. In later times it would have been regarded as ludicrously theatrical when she held up hands and eyes to heaven while certain speeches and songs were recited to her. At her coronation the next day she was duly attired with crimson velvet, ermine, and buttons, cords, and tassels of gold. The usual elaborate ceremonies were observed, much to the edification of all concerned, if we accept the anointing with oil which Her Majesty so much disliked that she retired to change her dress, remarking to her maids that the oil was grease and smelled ill. At the banquet in Westminster Hall, which concluded the drama, the customary champion rode into the room in complete armour, and offered to defend against all gainsayers the, quote, most high and mighty princess, our dread sovereign Lady Elizabeth, by the grace of God, Queen of England, France, Ireland, defender of the true, ancient, and Catholic faith, most worthy empress from the Orcade Isles to the mountains Pyrenees. End quote. Here ends the truly heroical period of Elizabeth's life. She was now twenty-five years of age, had bravely and discreetly held her course through a sea of early troubles, and was so firmly established on the throne that the occasional plots of malcontents could not seriously affect her safety. Her long career was one of eminent worldly wisdom, but a wisdom that was confined to her personal interests, and did not, like that of Maria Theresa, or Isabella of Spain, embrace the national welfare. The unprecedented prosperity of England during her reign was due to the peace which she selfishly maintained, and to other causes than her conduct. Her deceitful and cruel course towards Mary, Queen of Scots, belongs properly to the history of the latter. It was prompted by well-grounded fears, but carried to the pitch of despicable jealousy and unscrupulous malignity. This and the other leading events of Elizabeth's administration, unlike her youthful life, are too well known to require a detailed recital. As a rare picture of good Queen Bess in her thirty-first year, we have the account of a conference with her enjoyed by Melville, a Scottish ambassador. The morning after his arrival in London, he was admitted to an audience by Elizabeth, whom he found pacing an alley in her garden. The business upon which he came being arranged satisfactorily, Melville was favourably and familiarly treated by the English Queen. He remained at her court nearly a fortnight, and conversed with Her Majesty every day, sometimes thrice on the same day. Sir James, who was a shrewd observer, had thus an opportunity of remarking the many weaknesses and vanities which characterised Elizabeth. In allusion to her extreme love of power, he ventured to say to her, when she informed him she never intended to marry, Madam, you need not tell me that. I know your stately stomach. You think if you were married you would be but Queen of England, and now you are King and Queen both. You may not suffer a commander. Elizabeth was fortunately not offended at this freedom. She took Sir James upon one occasion into her bedchamber and opened a little case in which were several miniature pictures. The pretense was to show him a likeness of Mary, but her real object was that he should observe in her possession a miniature of her favourite, the Earl of Leicester, upon which she had written with her own hand, My Lord's Picture. When Melville made this discovery, Elizabeth affected a little amiable confusion. I held the candle, says Sir James, 
and pressed to see my lord's picture, albeit she was loath to let me see it, at length I by importunity obtained sight thereof, and asked the same to carry home to the queen, which she refused, alleging that she had but that one of his. At another time Elizabeth talked with Sir James of the different costumes of different countries. She told him she had dresses of many sorts, and she appeared in a new one every day during his continuance at court. Sometimes she was dressed after the English, sometimes after the French, and sometimes after the Italian fashion. She asked Sir James which he thought became her best. He said the Italian, quote, Wilk pleased her weal, for she delighted to show her golden-coloured hair, wearing a kell and bonnet as they do in Italy. Her hair was redder than yellow, and apparently of nature, end quote. Elizabeth herself seems to have been quite contented with its hue, for she very complacently asked Sir James whether she or Mary had the finer hair. Sir James, having replied as politely as possible, she proceeded to inquire which he considered the more beautiful. The ambassador quaintly answered that the beauty of either was not her worst fault. This evasion would not serve, though Melville, for many sufficient reasons, was unwilling to say anything more definite. He told her that she was the fairest queen in England, and Mary the fairest in Scotland. Still, this was not enough. Sir James ventured, therefore, one step further. They were both, he said, the fairest ladies of their courts, and that the Queen of England was whiter, but our Queen was very lussome. Elizabeth next asked which of them was of highest stature. Sir James told her the Queen of Scots. Then she said the Queen was over high, and that herself was neither over high nor over lay. Then she asked it what kind of exercises she used. I said that as I was dispatched out of Scotland, the Queen was but new come back from the Highland hunting, and that when she had leisure for the affairs of her country, she read upon good books the histories of divers countries, and sometimes would play upon the lute and virginals. She spirit gin she played wheel, I said, reasonably for a queen. End quote. This account of Mary's accomplishments piqued Elizabeth's vanity, and determined her to give Melville some display of her own. Accordingly, next day one of the lords in waiting took him to a quiet gallery, where, as if by chance, he might hear the Queen play upon the virginals. After listening a little, Melville perceived well enough that he might take the liberty of entering the chamber whence the music came. Elizabeth coquettishly left off as soon as she saw him, and coming forward, tapped him with her hand, and affected to feel ashamed of being caught, declaring that she never played before company, but only when alone, to keep off melancholy. Melville made her a flattering speech, protesting that the music he had heard was of so exquisite a kind that it had irresistibly drawn him into the room. Elizabeth, who does not seem to have thought, as people are usually supposed to do in polite society, that comparisons are odious, could not rest satisfied without putting, as usual, the question whether Mary or she played best. Melville gave the English Queen the palm. Being now in good humour, she resolved that Sir James should have a specimen of her learning, which it was well known degenerated too much into pedantry. She praised his French, asking if he could also speak Italian, which she said she herself spoke reasonably well. She spoke to him also in Dutch, but Sir James says it was not good. Afterward she insisted upon his seeing her dance, and when her performance was over, she put the old question whether she or Mary danced best. 
Melville answered, The queen danced it not so high and disposedly as she did. Melville returned to Scotland, quote, convinced in his judgment that in Elizabeth's conduct there was neither plain dealing nor upright meaning, but great dissimulation, emulation, and fear that Mary's princely qualities should too soon chase her out and displace her from the kingdom. End quote. Surely such exquisite vanity as this description reveals could hardly belong to a mind of such breadth and power, whatever cunning it may have possessed. The great events of Elizabeth's reign were the establishment of Protestantism and the war with Spain, signalized by the defeat of the Invincible Armada. The motives of her renunciation of the Pope's authority have been mentioned. She displayed the most admirable prudence in effecting a peaceable revolution of the national religion, and the beneficial consequences of it to the world cannot be overestimated. England and Scotland were for a long time the sole champions of religious reform among the nations, and nobly did they maintain their cause. Whatever were the faults and the springs of action of those who governed these two countries during this most critical period of the Church, a great debt of gratitude is for ever due to their firmness and intrepidity. End of section 25。section 26 of the heroines of history。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox.org。recording by ruth golding。the heroines of history by john s jenkins。Elizabeth of England, Part Five. The ecclesiastical position of England was the cause of the Spanish War. The great powers of the continent, temporal and spiritual, were leagued to crush everywhere the interests of truth and freedom, much in the way they are combined at this day. But the English aid rendered to Holland and Belgium against Philip and the piracies committed on Spanish commerce by English vessels were the occasions, if not the causes, of the war. The renowned Sir Francis Drake, the first circumnavigator of the world, had passed around Cape Horn, loaded his ships with gold and silver taken from the Spanish trading vessels, and finding his return intercepted, came home by way of India and the Cape of Good Hope. The Queen took possession of his plunder, on pretense that Philip might demand restitution. She disowned the expedition, but she welcomed the adventurer back, visited his ship, attended the festivities on board, and knighted the legalised buccaneer. When Philip, in 1587, was preparing his gigantic naval invasion of England, Drake, with a fleet of some thirty vessels, sailed for Spain, boldly forced his way into the harbour of Cadiz, and destroyed more than a hundred ships of the proposed expedition. Continuing his search, he burned or scuttled all the vessels he could find along the Spanish coast. This aroused the indomitable Philip to still greater exertions, and by the next year, he had prepared his armada of one hundred and thirty ships of unprecedented size, and carrying thirty thousand men, together with two thousand six hundred and thirty large pieces of brass cannon. Great was the terror of England at this vast armament, and great were the preparations made to resist it. Every rank of the people, high and low throughout the kingdom, contributed its share of men, money, and ships. For months it was all enthusiasm, fear, and busy work. Thirty-four thousand foot and two thousand horse, with a considerable fleet, were in waiting on the coast to meet the enemy, 
while twenty-two thousand foot and a thousand horse under the command of Leicester were stationed near the mouth of the Thames to protect the capital. The Queen was undaunted in courage and untiring in activity through all this season of dreadful suspense. She was the animating soul of the whole defensive movement, and so great was her excitement that she suddenly knighted a lady who exhibited great spirit in encouraging her warlike plans. Herself generalissimo of all the forces, she was determined to lead them in the contest, or seemed to be resolved so to do, and was with difficulty dissuaded from endangering her person. As it was, she reviewed the troops at Leicester's camp, mounted on a fine horse, and attended only by two earls, one of whom carried the sword of state, while a page followed bearing her helmet with a white plume. A bright steel corslet covered her breast. Immensely distended robes, as in her portraits, encumbered her person, and she held a marshal's truncheon in her hand. She was received with deafening applause, and made a spirited speech, in which she said, I am come among you, as you see at this time, not for recreation and disport, but being resolved in the midst of the heat of battle to live and die amongst you all, to lay down for my God and for my kingdoms and for my people, my honour and my blood even in the dust. I know I have the body of a weak, feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king, and of a king of England too, and think foul scorn that Palmer or Spain or any prince of Europe dare to invade the borders of my realm, to which, rather than any dishonour should grow by me, I myself will take up arms, I myself will be your general, judge, and rewarder of every one of your virtues in the field. Rapturous shouts and professions of fidelity followed this appeal. A storm scattered the armada for a while at the outset. This was reported as its entire loss, and Elizabeth ordered her larger vessels to be dismantled, so quickly did parsimony succeed her boastful self-denial. Her admiral ventured to retain all his force on the strength of his private purse, and thus saved England. On the 19th of July, 1588, the tall Spanish ships, with their lofty decks turreted like castles, were descried entering the channel, and extending seven miles to the right and left in the form of a half-moon. Night sank upon the dusky beach and on the purple sea. Such night in England ne'er had been, nor e'er again shall be. From Ediston to Berwick Bounds, from Lyme to Milford Bay, that time of slumber was as bright and busy as the day. For swift to east and swift to west, the warning radiance spread. High on St. Michael's Mount it shone, it shone on Beachy Head. Far on the deep the Spaniard saw along each southern shire, cape beyond cape, in endless range, those twinkling points of fire. The result is well known. The light English vessels hovered about the unwieldy ships of the Armada, crippling and sinking them. At night many were set on fire. All were thrown into confusion, and escaped towards the Orkney Isles, where a storm so overwhelmed them that not one half of the proud armament returned to Spain. The first half of Elizabeth's forty-five years' reign was much occupied with her flirtations. She had innumerable lovers who longed to share her power. Her position, next to that of the King of Spain, was the most splendid of any sovereign, and many princes, both at home and abroad, burned for the prize of her hand. She seems to have been too politic to hazard her popularity among her subjects, 
by wedding a foreign and therefore Catholic suitor, and too ambitious to accept of any subject of her own. But she had vanity enough to dally with all who numbered themselves among her admirers. And once or twice the advantages of married life betrayed her into actual preparations for the nuptial ceremony. She professed, however, a desire to remain single. When the House of Commons ventured to suggest the desirability of an heir to the throne, she replied that she would be content to have her tombstone declare that here lies one who lived and died a maiden queen. Philip proposed to her through his messenger immediately on the death of his wife. Two years afterwards she had the smallpox. The kingdom was alarmed at the prospect of her death and the confusion that might follow concerning her successor, and Parliament again recommended marriage to her on her recovery. There seemed to be some prospect now of her union with Robert Dudley, whom she had made Earl of Leicester and had chiefly favoured. He was suspected to have murdered his wife to make room for such an event, and Elizabeth had thrown out a remark that appeared to justify such an expectation. In her frequent and magnificent excursions he enjoyed her manifest partiality. Once she visited his seat, the castle of Kenilworth, which was a gift from her. The earl, we are told, made the most extensive and costly arrangements for the reception and entertainment of the queen and her retinue on this occasion. The moat of the castle had a floating island upon it, with a fictitious personage whom they called the Lady of the Lake upon the island, who sung a song in praise of Elizabeth as she passed the bridge. There was also an artificial dolphin swimming upon the water, with a band of musicians within it. As the Queen advanced across the park, men and women in strange disguises came out to meet her, and to offer her salutations and praises. One was dressed as a Sibyl, another like an American savage, and a third, who was concealed, represented an echo. This visit continued for nineteen days, and the stories of the splendid entertainments provided for the company, the plays, the bear-baitings, the fireworks, the huntings, the mock fights, the feastings and revelries, filled all Europe at the time, and have been celebrated by historians and storytellers ever since. But Leicester's flatteries were all in vain. In despair he married another. The Queen, as usual in such circumstances, was enraged, and sent him to prison, but afterwards released him. So unwilling is poor human nature to yield an inch of the territory it has acquired in other hearts, that many a person, though like Elizabeth a Minerva in wisdom, and, unlike her, an angel of goodness, will yet indignantly regard the one as faithless and fickle, who, doomed for an indefinite period to be fried on the coals of hopeless anxiety, at last turns to another and more heroic spirit to find sympathy. With the Virgin Queen it was a settled system to prevent all love-matches that seemed to promise happiness to those who meditated them, and also to separate and imprison for years or for life those who married without her knowledge or consent. Standing irresolute at the half-open door of matrimony, she would neither enter herself nor suffer others to go in thereat. The many outrageous instances of her envy and cruelty need not be repeated. A passage in the life of Sir Walter Raleigh illustrates the tyranny of Elizabeth in affairs of the heart, and also her extreme susceptibility to the gross flatteries which she constantly craved and received. She was mad with resentment at his marriage, and sent him to the tower. 
he straightway affected to be overcome with wretchedness at his separation not from his beautiful bride but from the queen herself as her majesty sailed by on the thames he counterfeited a crazy determination to leap from the window and swim out to the royal barge being only prevented by his keeper whose wig he tore off and whose heart he pretended he would strike through with his dagger in the struggle he then wrote to cecil knowing that the letter would be shown to the queen of her he thus spoke how can i live alone in prison while she is afar off i who was wont to behold her riding like alexander hunting like diana walking like venus the gentle wind blowing her fair hair about her pure cheeks like a nymph sometimes sitting in the shade like a goddess sometimes playing on the lute like orpheus but once a miss hath bereaved me of all all those times are past the loves the sighs the sorrows the desires can they not weigh down one frail misfortune elizabeth was so affected by this tender description of herself that she released him not long after her suitors gradually fell off as she approached an unfruitful age until in her forty-sixth year francis duke of anjou and brother of the french king was almost the only one that remained he was not half her equal in years and had never seen her he plied his courtship through an artful proxy and the ancient maiden so warmed towards him that he made a pompous visit to the english court the affair was fully arranged and at a banquet the queen publicly put a ring on his finger in token of the engagement the event created a great sensation on the fast anchored isle and throughout the continent where it was signalized with bells and bonfires but as the marriage approached elizabeth wavered she summoned francis to her presence and when he had left her apartment he dashed away the ring and cursed the caprice of woman she accompanied him with much parade to the coast and entreated him to return but he never showed his face again that side of the channel her last favourite was robert Devereux, earl of essex by which name he is generally known he was a son of leicester's second wife and was a fascinating fiery generous young man just of age when elizabeth nearly sixty transferred to him her partiality for leicester who had died soon after the defeat of the armada her regard for essex appeared to be a mixture of motherly fondness and maidenly romance she felt a torturing solicitude for his safety and was frequently agonized by his unannounced departure on cruising expeditions against the spaniards in which he leapt for joy at every encounter and plunged into the thickest fight he gained a high place in general admiration and with more discretion would have been the first man in the realm but he overstepped the queen's patience irritated by her refusal to grant a request of his he committed the egregious offence of turning his back on her as he left her presence she started up in a rage and boxed him on the ear and bade him go and be hanged he seized his sword-hilt in a threatening way and declared that he would not have taken that blow from king henry her father nor would he endure it from any one they were afterwards reconciled quarrelled again and again were reconciled but when the queen withdrew the monopoly of wines from him which was his chief support he entered into treasonable plots was condemned and was executed maintaining a brave spirit to the last the queen had formerly given him a ring with the promise that it should be a guerdon of her favour 
if he ever fell into extreme disgrace and danger. She delayed his death for a long time, hoping that he would avail himself of the promise. He did, in fact, but the one to whom he entrusted the ring withheld it from Elizabeth. Subsequently this person, the Countess of Nottingham, confessed on a sickbed her fault to the Queen, who shook the dying woman and fiercely told her that God might forgive her, but she never would. These events induced in her a melancholy that hastened her death, which occurred in the seventieth year of her age and the forty-fifth of her reign. She refused food and medicine, and lay prostrate on the floor at Richmond Palace, whither she had removed to be near a chapel that communicated with the royal apartments. For ten days and nights she lay in the anguish of remorse and bitterness, declaring that life was a burthen, and groaning at every breath. When urged to appoint a successor, she said angrily, I will have no rascal son in my seat, but one worthy to be a king, meaning thereby no one low in station, but the king of Scotland, the son of her hated rival, the queen of Scots. At length she sank into a profound sleep, from which she never awoke. When she breathed no longer, the preconcerted sign of the fact, a sapphire ring, was dropped from her window into the hands of a messenger, who started at full speed to convey it to James of Scotland. She was buried with magnificent ceremonies in Westminster Abbey. A wax figure of her, exhibited on the occasion, excited great lamentation, and is still preserved in a secret room of the abbey. It has her delicate features, broad forehead, and high cheekbones, and is dressed in her robes of crimson satin, profusely ornamented with pearls, rubies, emeralds, diamonds, fringe, and ample ruffs, with a purple velvet mantle, ermined and gold-laced. On the head is a light red frizzled wig, and on the small feet are high-heeled shoes a fit emblem of her character. She was a learned, acute, brave, and determined woman, but deceitful, jealous, vain, selfish, and malicious. Her life was a long progress from all that is promising and romantic to all that is pitiful and detestable and her last years were a notable comment on the emptiness of pomp and power. In her reign the great stars of literature shone, and England, from a second-rate kingdom, began the splendid career by which, at this hour, she boasts an eighth of the habitable globe, forty colonies, and a seventh of the world's population or one hundred and eighty million subjects. End of section 26 Section 27 of the Heroines of History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stacy Cologne. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Mary of Scotland, Part 1. Virtue may be assailed, but never hurt, surprised by unjust force, but not enthralled. Yet even that which mischief meant most harm shall in the happy trial prove most glory. Milton. The character of no woman whose name figures in the past has excited more discussion than that of Mary, Queen of Scots. From her day to this, countless volumes have been published in bitter accusation, or in defense of her, or with a professed attempt at impartiality. All the long-entailed disputes of royal families, the unforgiving pride of three great nations, and the endless conflict of religious parties have contributed to prolong the agitation of this question. 
whether she was guilty or not of the iniquities charged upon her. But the world has more generally taken a favorable view of her character in proportion as prejudices have worn away and the causes of controversy have been removed. To exculpate her now, it is enough to know that there is no positive evidence against her and that her enemies had every unworthy motive to misrepresent the facts and that her whole spirit to the last hour of her unfortunate life was evidently that of a pure and noble-hearted woman. Scotland, in common with Europe, was still emerging from the barbarism of the Middle Ages when Mary acted her part in the scene of human affairs. She was born in the palace of Linlithgow on the 7th of December, 1542, a remarkable year inasmuch as it was precisely a half-century after the discovery of America and just a quarter of a century after the first act of Luther's Reformation. It was also very nearly one hundred years subsequent to the invention of the art of printing with separate types. These three events smote the dead calm of man's intellect into increasing commotion, and set forward the world in a rapid tide of progress. At the period of Mary's birth, Scotland was in the fiercest struggle of that Protestantism which developed itself more sternly there than elsewhere and was likewise passing through the most sanguinary conflicts of the feudal barons and clans with each other, and with a centralizing royalty. In no other country were internal broils so severe and protracted. The advantage of mountain fastness, the small number of nobles, the lack of large towns, and the division of the nation into great kindreds or tribes were a few of the causes of the state of things. Besides, the kingdom was a bone of contention between the English crown, which labored to unite the Scottish with its own, and the French, who adroitly played off the latter in their wars with the former. Into such a furious sea of changes was Mary thrown, nor is her nature the less beautiful for the contrast of so fair a flower with the dark billows on which it was helplessly tossed. Her father was James V of Scotland, and her mother was Mary of Lorraine, daughter to the Duke of Guise of France. Both were strong and cultivated in mind and of energetic character. Commerce and agriculture had made little progress in this wild northern country. The wealthy and common with the poorest classes were without education. Edinburgh was not as now the Athens of the north, and traditionary songs and legends were almost the only literature of the people. King James was himself a poet, and encouraged learning and art in various ways directly, as well as indirectly, by the ingress of foreigners, consequent of his alliance with France that is now the center of refinement. In personal beauty, valor, and accomplishments, he was worthy of such a daughter as Mary, tall and muscular in figure, fair-haired of regular features, bright gray eyes, and sweet voice. His presence was both commanding and winning, and his death was brave and graceful like his life. Repulsed by the English army, and suspecting treachery in his own officers, he was yet cheerful in his last hour, before he expired, he smiled upon the assembled noblemen, and gave them his hand to kiss. Mary was only seven days old when her father died, and neither of them ever saw the other. The nation was immediately distracted with troubles connected with the choice of a regent to govern during her infancy. James Hamilton, Earl of Auden, of royal blood, was finally chosen. With him, Henry the Eighth of England, a Protestant, negotiated a marriage between his son Edward and the infant Mary. The treaty was soon broken up by her mother and Cardinal Baton, the leader of the Catholic party, who knew that if fulfilled, it would destroy the influence of their church and of the House of Guise, and tend to make Scotland an English province. The Cardinal in this affair made a tool of the Earl of Lennox, who, disappointed in his expected reward, the Regent's office, instigated King Henry to send an avenging army which, however, after plundering Edinburgh, retired home. The Earl was obliged by his part in this movement to escape into England, where in token of his services, Lady Margaret Douglas, niece of the King, was given him in marriage. To them was born Darnley, afterwards so conspicuous as the husband of our heroine and the father of James I of England. Thus, the failure of the Earl of Lennox led to indirect success and gave him the proud distinction of being an ancestor of the first sovereign and of many succeeding ones after the union of the crowns of Scotland and England. Soon after these events, the English king and his enemies, Cardinal Baton of Scotland and Francis I of France, were one after another numbered with the dead. 
but the rivalries of the three nations continued nonetheless. The English regent pursued the same policy of forcing the Scotch to comply with arbitrary demands, and defeated them in the Battle of Pinkie, slaying eight thousand of their men. The Scotch applied for aid to Henry the Second of France and bartered their young queen Mary to his infant son, the Dauphin Francis, agreeing to send her to the French court to be educated. The same fleet that brought six thousand Frenchmen to assist their country in its wars carried her away from her native shores. She was now six years of age, and hitherto had been the unconscious object of national homage and contention. When nine months old, she had been crowned in the presence of nobles and foreign ambassadors at a place famous for its beauty and associations, Stirling Castle. The English ambassador beheld her disrobed, that he might satisfy his king. Whose plans depended on her union with his son Edward, the officer reported her to be as goodly a child as he ever saw. She remained another year in the care of her nurse Janet Sinclair at her birthplace, the Palace of Linlithgow, situated on the margin of a small lake and now in ruins. Here she had the smallpox, which, however, left no marks to disfigure her beauty in after years. For safer keeping. She spent the next two years at Stirling Castle, and then, for the same reason, was removed to Ickmahome, a small island in the Lake of Monteith, one of the gems that are hidden in the once inaccessible highlands of Scotland. Linlithgow, Stirling, and Monteith all lie at about equal distance in a northwest direction from Edinburgh. Four children of rank, each bearing the name of Mary, were her playmates and fellow students in this wild island home. And afterwards, the same number of the same name were retained when one after another of the four Marys ceased to be a companion of the Queen. Attended by these and the Lords Erskine and Livingston and her three brothers, she sailed from Dumbarton on the west coast of the kingdom in July 1548. After a stormy voyage of two weeks, the precious child arrived safely in France, there to spend thirteen years of happiness as exquisite. As the misery that followed it, never was a life more singleized by transition from the height of honor and pleasure to the depth of humiliation and woe. By order of the king, Mary's reception and journey to the palace of Saint Germain were royally magnificent, and the prisons of every town she passed were thrown open, as if the liberation of the king's criminals were a favor for which the people should be grateful to the young queen in honor of whom the act was done. Arrived at the palace and duly complimented with festivities, she was soon sent with the king's daughters to a convent for education. Here she evinced great aptitude for learning, but even at her tender age, manifested such a growing fondness for cloister life that her royal friends and princely relatives, at the end of two years, took her away and introduced her to all the dazzling pomp of courtly life, fearing lest she might acquire an incurable love of religious solitude. Take the nun's veil and defeat their ambitious hopes. Such thus far and during all her years were the kind and amount of interest that centered in a playful, innocent child, no different from a multitude of others, except in the accident of birth. The eyes of Europe were fixed upon her, as if her sunny ringlets covered the wisdom of a Charlemagne, and in her dimpled arms slept the strength of a Charles Martel. Grave counselors made her the theme of deep study. Kings were sleepless in their anxiety. Nations were embattled, and blood flowed freely, all for the sake of a little helpless girl. Yet in the walls of Stirling, on the island of Ickmahome, beneath the roof of the convent, and in the regal gardens of Fontainebleau, she prattled and romped and slept as sweetly as if only a peasant's humble life awaited her. It was fortunate for Mary to pass her youth in France. The court and people were not then, as since, eminently licentious. The king and his favorites were outwardly correct. His sister, the Princess Margaret, exercised a highly moral influence, and the queen, Catherine de Medicis, a woman of great talents, had not yet developed her unenviable character. Everything tended to the cultivation of religious and delicate feeling in the young mind entrusted to their care. Nothing, indeed, would seem more mutually beneficial than the intercourse of the Scotch and French nations. The former, by nature, have a surplus of conscience, and the latter appear to have a native lack of that endowment. And at the period in view, 
something of the ignorance, religious severity, and iron inflexibility that characterize the one people, could be well exchanged for something of the refinement, elasticity, and joyous grace of the other. It was the era of fresh intellectual life in France. Its systems of education had just been grandly enlarged. All branches of science were gratuitously taught by professors who were supported by government, and many men of genius and celebrity adorned the various departments of authorship. The most noted of these were selected as instructors of Mary and her companions, in addition to the two teachers who had accompanied her from her native land. She became familiar with Latin and Italian, and could write and speak the French with elegance before she was ten years old. And poetry then, as ever, had for her a peculiar charm. In rhetoric, she was taught by Fauché. In history, by Pasquier. And in poetry, by Rosnard. All of them names well known in the annals of literature. In the accomplishments of ingenuity, she excelled, particularly in embroidery and the inventing of devices and mottoes, which were very fashionable at that day. Her loving remembrance of her convent home was testified to by the present of a richly worked altar cloth from her hands. Some of the devices which her fancy produced have been preserved. When her first husband died. She had a seal representing a branch of a licorice tree, of which the root only is sweet, and beneath the branch a motto in Latin signifying, "The earth covers my sweet." On her trapping, she embroidered a French sentence meaning, "My end is my beginning," a thought that all persons, the obscure no less than the great, and the suffering as well as the fortunate, would do well to keep in mind. By her orders, also, a medal was made, with the image of a wrecked ship and the words in Latin, "Nothing unless erect," teaching the value of uprightness. That physical development, without which mental activity is almost a curse, was not forgotten in the education of the Queen of Scots. Lively recreations and vigorous exercises gave her that flow of spirits which is the essence of health, and thus that health. Which is the life of life, rendering it something else than living death. Particularly did the exercises of dancing and riding exalt her naturally fine figure and movements to the height of graceful freedom. Her excellent performance of the stately minuet may be still recorded to her honor, and all the more so in view of the indecent waltz, polka, and Scottish of later times. The romantic but cruel amusement of stag hunting fascinated her with the joy of a bounding chase through the forest. And although thrown from her horse on one occasion, and nearly trampled down, she mounted and gaily sped forward again. Thus she nourished the royal power and beauty of the human frame, prepared herself for healthy thought and brave action in the duties of life. In 1550. Our heroine's mother, the Dowager Mary of Guise, came from Scotland to see her child, on whom two years since their separation and eight years of age had shed bloom and wisdom. Overcome at the sight of her daughter's expanding loveliness, she wept tears of joy. She persuaded the king to secure her the regency of Scotland and return thither, destined never to look upon her beautiful and ill-fated child again. At this period, too, came from Mary's native land the accomplished James Melville to act as her page of honor. He was a few years older than herself. He subsequently acted often as her ambassador and figured much in the events of the time. Surrounded by instructors, the young queen and the king's daughter spent several hours every day with Catherine de Medicis, and so devoted was Mary to this woman's brilliant society that excited jealousy rather than affection. She would not believe the child's assertion that she loved to gain wisdom from her and her distinguished visitors, nor would she respond to the trustful love of her future daughter-in-law. Jealous, doubtless of Mary's superiority over her own daughters, she even endeavored, in common with those in France who envied the elevation of the House of Guise, and those in Scotland who deprecated the reign of a French Catholic influence, to defeat the proposed marriage with her son Francis. Whether instigated by an interested party, or by his own mistaken zeal for his country, a Scotch archer in the king's guards attempted to poison the youthful queen. These circumstances only hastened a union, 
which was at least a providential solace of recollection to Mary during her after years of trouble. The machinations of even the powerful Montmorency and the family of Bourbon could not swerve the king from his purpose to strengthen his power in Scotland as speedily as possible, nor sever the two hearts that already clung to each other. Francis was slender in health and diffident, yet kind and affectionate in disposition, and Mary, though strong and spirited, had grown up in his companionship, always regarding him as her husband-elect, in a spirit of cheerful compliance with the arrangement made, and probably mingling compassion with her responsive tenderness. The marriage was solemnized on the 24th of April, 1558, at the Church of Notre Dame. The month previous, commissioners had arrived from Scotland, who negotiated the important conditions of the Union in view of every contingency, which provisions, however it is affirmed, Henry II was prepared to evade so as to unite the Scotch and French crowns at all events. The wedding party on the bridal morning were assembled at the palace of the archbishop, the bride being dressed in a jeweled white robe with a long train borne by girls after the humor of the time. There is endless evidence that her reputation for uncommon beauty was something more than flattery. Her form was full and tall, her hair a sunny brown, and falling in luxurious ringlets, her face clear and softly outlined, with a Grecian nose, lovely lips, and chestnut eyes, and her delicate hands as they waved in gesture, or glided over the strings of a lute when she sang sweetly, threw the court poets into spasms of admiration. From the bishop's palace the royal company marched through a temporary covered way, lined with gold-embroidered purple velvet, into the stupendous church, the Pope's Nuncio, proceeding with a gold cross, the bridegroom following, then the king and the bride. Passing through the church, they appeared on a platform at the door, in sight of an immense throng, seated in an amphitheater built for the occasion. Here the ring was given and a benediction pronounced when they returned to the choir of the cathedral where high mass was performed. After a feast and ball at the bishop's house, the party adjourned to the Tournelle Palace to enjoy such amusements as beholding artificial horses, richly comparisoned and bearing children of rank, moved by internal machinery through the halls, and superb barges pass on indoor lakes, and rowed by a single youth who thus carried off from the crowd his lady love. The celebration continued fifteen days and was closed by a grand tournament. During all these spectacles, Mary was as much a wonder of loveliness to all who saw her, as she was not long before, when bearing a torch in an evening procession, and looking unearthly radiant in the wild light shed down on her features, she was asked by a woman in the crowd if she were indeed an angel. In Scotland, the marriage was honored among other ways by bonfires, and by firing the famous gigantic gun called Munsmeg, which is still to be seen. The bride and groom retired into the country after the ceremonies to enjoy the quiet that was especially grateful to the shrinking nature of Francis. Here, Mary showed herself as eminent in the affectionate duties of a wife as she had been in the splendors of the court. But the freedom of rural life was not long the privilege of these two amiable beings. Cares and griefs were near at hand. The first interruption of their quietude was the death of the king, Henry the Second, at a tournament given in honor of his sister's and eldest daughter's marriages, he himself entered the lists in all the pride of his strength, courage, and regal array. But, by one of the accidents that sometimes happened in that warlike diversion, a lance pierced his helmet, inflicting a wound from which he died a few days after. Francis, ill at the time, sprang from his bed assumed the scepter, and was crowned at Reims, September 1559. Mary was now queen of both France and Scotland, and through the influence of her friends, unwisely paraded a title to the English crown also. The young Edward VI, to whom she was once engaged, and his sister Mary, known as the Bloody, had successively worn that crown and died, leaving it to the famous Elizabeth, who was first cousin to the father of Mary, Queen of Scots. 
The title of the latter to this, a third throne, was urged on the ground of Elizabeth's illegitimacy, which had been first decreed and afterwards denied by acts of Parliament, the question being whether the divorce of her mother, Anne Boleyn, rendered the daughter a rightful heir to royalty or not. The death of Elizabeth would, without dispute, have given Mary a triple scepter, and she was right in refusing, as she did, most firmly and ably for one so young, to relinquish such a rich reversion. As it was, her plate, banners, seals, furniture, all bore the united arms of Scotland, France, and England, and her chosen device was the crowns of the two first. With the words in Latin, another is delayed, or awaits me. Provoking as was this to the high temper of England's maiden sovereign, it fitly signified our heroine's peerless position before the eyes of a continent. She stood in the glory of youth and beauty, at the head of two of its greatest kingdoms, and claimed headship over another. The then as now most splendid empires of Europe were hers in possession or expectancy. But even in the first full blaze of her fortune she did not lose her sweet humility and magnanimity. In the coronation procession she yielded her own rightful precedence to her always ungracious and now discrowned and frowning mother-in-law. End of section 27. Recording by Stacy Cologne, Fort Worth, Texas. Section 28 of the Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stacy Cologne. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Mary of Scotland, Part 2. Francis, notwithstanding his feeble constitution and his title of the little to distinguish him invidiously from Francis the Great, entered on his duties with much energy, but his health declined, and after a reign of seventeen months he died, expressing to the last his love for Mary. She had already, the same year, mourned the death of her mother, the regent of Scotland, whose life was wearied out in vain attempts to crush the Reformation in that land, and now she was an orphan, and suddenly a widow, and a stranger in the beloved country of her adoption, her education, her short reign. Catherine triumphantly resumed her power as guardian of the new king, Francis's brother, and banished Mary's uncles from their influential stations at court. The Queen of Scots retired to a private country residence, and there relieved her sorrow for her lost husband, in tears or in sweet poetry composed to his memory. Monarch still of her native mountains and valleys, and only eighteen years of age, her hand was sought by princes and kings, but she would entertain none of their offers until she had decided her course of life. This was too apparent to be doubted. Her brother Lord James, on behalf of the Protestants, and John Leslie, in the interest of the Catholics, came from Scotland to secure her favor for their respective parties, and to hasten her return to the home of her infancy. To each of the delegates, she replied in a reserved and prudent manner, a characteristic that should have weight in judging her of her subsequent alleged intimacy with the notorious Earl of Bothwell, who it is noteworthy at this period came to France with other noblemen to greet their sovereign. Previous to embarking, Mary, as the custom was, sent word to Elizabeth of England, asking permission to pass through her dominions. Elizabeth replied through her ambassador that she would give a pass only on condition that Mary would no more refuse to sign the rejected article of a former treaty, which was a relinquishment of all claim to the English crown. Mary's refusal of this repeated demand, as well as her reply to other messages touching her religious position, are preserved at full length and are beautiful exhibitions of gentleness and candor, on the one hand firmness, dignity, and intelligence on the other. These answers added to the personal charms and Catholic predilections of the one who uttered them so incensed the homely, bitter, and ambitious spinster who wore the British diadem that she began anew to excite the Scots against their sovereign and her own cousin and sent out a fleet ostensibly to capture pirates but really to intercept and seize that sovereign and relative on her voyage home. In August 1561, she set sail from France, having lingered for months to wean her heart, if possible, 
from that sunny land and to overcome her very natural dread of the country of her parents' past and her own anticipated trials. The French court accompanied her to Calais, the port of departure. Catherine, forgetting her jealousies, took an affectionate leave of her sad daughter-in-law, and a few noblemen, connections, and literary men set sail with her, who had been the light of the palace, the pride of blood, and the theme of song. Two historians and a poet, Châtelot, afterwards a miserable actor in this narrative, were of the company. As Mary Ships weighed anchor, another in an attempt to make the port was wrecked before her weeping eyes, and declared by her to be an evil omen. To the last moment of twilight she sat on deck, gazing in steadfast despair, at the home of her childhood and the kingdom of her splendid nuptials. Tears fell unceasingly from her, and her lips constantly murmured, Farewell, France. Farewell, my beloved country. When the night hid the shore, she gave way to louder lamentation, exclaiming, The darkness now brooding over France is like that in my heart. And then refusing to enter the cabin, she slept on deck, awaiting the dawn's earliest light when her attendants had promised to wake her. A heavy fog delayed the vessels, and at morning she saw again the dear fading hills, and wept freshly, saying, Farewell, beloved France. I shall never, never see you more. On the voyage she composed a famous song, which is desecrated by any attempt to translate it into English verse, and is literally this, Adieu, pleasant land of France, O oh, my country, the most dear, which nourished my infancy, Adieu, France, Adieu, my happy days. The ship which sunders my friendships has only a part of me. One part remains with thee. That is thine. I trust it to thy affection, and for this do thou remember the other. The sweetness of the French words and rhymes, as in the Poule Ma Patrie, of the Marseille hymn, the very prepositions to an English ear, give the language a mournful effect. The young poet, Ellsworth, exquisitely conveys the spirit of the scene, without reference to the words of the original song in these lines. Wooed in the May day of my prime, and won by love to warmer earth, how can I seek in Scotia's clime, again alone a sullen hearth? But France is now for other eyes, and unto me are other skies. Oh, never shall a ship convey a sadder wanderer away. Behind the shore, distinct and bright, extends a farewell arm to me. Before me is the drooping light, the sunset and the misty sea. And thus in gloom and doubt decays to me the light of glorious days. When love to France with Francis flew, adieu, adieu, ami, adieu. The ships propelled by sails or oars according as the wind blew or not, and built with high prows and sterns like the ancient galleys, reached Scotland August twentieth, 1561. On the way, a heavy mist alone prevented a capture by the English cruisers, who, as it was, found and seized one of the vessels containing Mary's furniture. A dense fog, like that which shrouded the French coast, and likewise interpreted as an evil sign by the Queen, misled her mariners so that they were nearly wrecked on the rocks of the Scottish shore. The disheartened Mary declared that she had no wish to escape wreck, or the chains of English imprisonment, so cheerless seemed her future residence in the stern land of her father's. The voyage had been conducted with enough secrecy to surprise the Scots by the sudden arrival of their admired Queen. They were wholly unprepared to do fitting honor to the occasion, but were delighted with the return of their renowned ruler, especially with the fact that she so trusted them as to appear with no armed escort. Forthwith, the population of Edinburgh arrayed themselves according to their trades along the road to the port of Leith, and horses poor in breed and array compared with the superb ones Mary had been accustomed to see were brought to receive the royal party. Shouts of applause rent the air, bonfires and illuminations shone everywhere, and after the newcomers had been established in Holyrood Palace, all the musicians in the city made the whole night hideous with inharmonious sounds, among which a party of covenanters, too strict to play on profane instruments and too loyal to be silent, mingled their loud hymns. Knox, the great yet violent reformer, records that, so soon as ever her French Felix, fiddlers, and others of that kind got the house alone, there might be seen skipping not very comely for honest women. Her common talk was in secret, that she saw nothing in Scotland but gravity, which was altogether repugnant to her nature, for she was brought up in joyeux cité. 
The intolerance which the reformers in those times had learned from the papists themselves was singly illustrated the next Sunday after Mary's arrival. She had announced her intention to be present at High Mass in the chapel of Holyrood House. This ceremony the Protestants had forbidden throughout the realm, and now they assembled in great numbers and would have rushed into the assembly to expel the priests, had not Lord James himself, a Protestant, stood at the door and quieted the tumult. On the next Sunday, Knox thundered from his pulpit against the idolatries of Rome, but he himself had not become so enlightened as to inveigh also against the grand banquet given on the same holy day by the city to the queen at Edinburgh Castle, on her way to which she was grieved, as on many other occasions, by public exhibitions and ridicule of her religion. It speaks volumes in her praise that she manifested through all her life a liberality and moderation quite in contrast with the spirit of all religious parties in that age. She conceded so far indeed as to invite into her presence the great reformer, who had not concealed his opposition to her, and though in his mistaken conscientiousness, to use the most charitable word, he uttered disrespectful and indelicate language in her ears, she was no less calm and forbearing than shrewd and ready in her replies. This scene, as well as the mob at Holyrood Chapel, has been worthily painted by American artist Leutz and Rothermel. The Privy Council soon formed was made up of the great earls of both parties, and whose musical names, as handed down in their proud titles, are familiar to all readers of Scottish history and poetry. Lord James, who is now made Earl of Mar and afterwards Earl of Murray, a handsome, stern, sagacious man of thirty-one years, stood highest in the government, and exerted the most influence over the Queen on the one hand, and the new church on the other. He and others in power are accused of paying deference to the secret plottings of Elizabeth of England, who thus made trouble for Mary unceasingly, but could not turn that tide of popular admiration for her person, not her faith, which followed her everywhere. She journeyed about this time with her lords and ladies to the palace of Linlithgow and Stirling Castle. The scenes of her infancy and to other palaces among them Falkland, where her father had died, at Stirling she had a narrow escape from death, her bed having caught fire from a candle, and at Perth she fainted at the shocking means taken by the crowd to show that their enthusiastic loyalty did not imply any complacency toward her belief. The tour was made on horseback, there being but one wheeled vehicle in the realm, a chariot brought from England by Mary's grandmother, which would have been useless without better roads than there were than anywhere to be found. On her return to the capital, the young queen, still in her nineteenth year, was further provoked by a city proclamation, classing the papist clergy with outcasts of society and expelling them from the town, under pain of carting through the town, burning on the cheek, and perpetual banishment. The French nobles and courtiers who had accompanied Mary to Scotland were quite disgusted by all these savage proceedings as they deemed them, and one after another left the country. Many suitors now sent their envoys to propose a marriage with the royal widow. Among them were Don Carlos of Spain, Archduke Charles of Austria, the King of Sweden, the Duke of Ferreira, and the Prince of Conde. Two Scotsmen of rank added themselves to these, the Earl of Arran, the partly insane son of the regent of that name in Mary's infancy, and Sir John Gordon, a man of noble appearance, and the second son of Earl Huntley who was leader of the Romish army. There is no evidence that she favored the addresses of the latter. The former she certainly disliked, and all the more on account of a report that he had conspired to seize the queen and carry her to Dumbarton Castle, whereby great alarm was excited at Holyrood. It was a turbulent period, and no sooner had the sphere been allayed than a party of base noblemen led by Bothwell assaulted the horse of a merchant, whose daughter was supposed to be intimate with Arden. The offense was repeated notwithstanding the queen's rebuke. A great mob was occasioned, which was dispersed and Bothwell disgraced by the court. A more serious disturbance followed on the heels of this. The Earl of Arden, through timidity or remorse, disclosed a plot of himself, his father, together with Bothwell, Huntley, and his son Lord Gordon, to shoot Lord James while hunting with the queen. The motive was alleged to be a fear that the royal heirship of the Hamiltons, of which family was Auden, would be set aside. 
and a desire to give the Catholics greater influence in the government. Whether the story of the half-crazy Aden were wholly true or not, he and Bothwell were arrested. But inasmuch as so many of rank are implicated and so little proof could be found against them, the Queen was contented to take possession of Dumbarton and hold Bothwell in prison. From this he escaped and remained abroad two years. No man is either wholly an angel or a demon, and this plausible attempt at his very life may explain something of the young Lord James's subsequent wicked, merciless, and successful scheme to extinguish Huntley, a scheme strangely prefaced by the sumptuous festivities and humanizing joys of his own marriage with a daughter of the Earl of Marshall. This occurred in February 1562. In August, the iniquitous plan was executed. The Earl of Huntley was the most powerful baron in the north of Scotland. He had been a devoted and honored friend of Mary's father and mother, and to the last breath evinced himself a high-minded and faithful subject to herself. But Lord James, who had already affected the downfall of the Hamiltons and others who stood in the way of his unscrupulous ambition, was determined to ruin the Earl, and the Protestants generally, from less personal motives, had long wished such a result. Lord James was in reality king, and Mary his deceived instrument. From her he had secured the earldom of Mar, the benefits of which had hitherto accrued to Huntley, and now he privately obtained a grant of the revenues and title of the earldom of Murray, which were decreed for a term of years to the family of Huntley. The first step was sufficiently exasperating to the old northern baron, who did not suspect that such a second step had been taken. But an affray brought on by the question of this latter earldom happened between two members of the family in the streets of Edinburgh. This gave occasion to James to persecute one of the actors in the affray. Sir John Gordon, and thus offended his father, Earl Huntley, still more deeply. He next prevailed on the Queen to make a tour through her dominions, including the estates of the Earl, and there he sought both to alarm her with the falsely reported treason of Huntley, and to so beard the lion in his den, by slights and injuries for which Mary should seem responsible, that he would be driven to rebellion. The Earl and his heroic wife in various ways proved their loyalty, but he was at last forced to an unequal encounter with James's troops, and nobly refused to fly, was taken and fell dead from his horse, so great was his indignant grief at the manifest overthrow of himself and his ancient house. The faithful, brave heart of the old man was broken, and he was no more. Yet James, now openly Earl of Murray, pursued his unrelenting ambition and vengeance. He procured the death warrant of the son, John Gordon, who was beheaded before the queen's eyes. She wept and fainted as the axe descended on her former admired suitor, against whom history writes no blame. The other son she would not condemn to death, though he would have fallen a victim had not a forged death warrant prepared by James, Earl of Murray, been detected in season. He lived to recover the castles and estates of his father, which were now by all this triumphant course of villainy in the hands of Murray and his adherents. Mary is to be blamed only as a woman too honest to suspect so stupendous plots, and as one unfortunate in her period and position. Perhaps she failed to assert her better discernment and feelings. She had as much intelligence and tenderness as she had that manly courage which led her to scorn all supposed danger, and on the same infernal expedition to regret that she was not a man to know what life it was to lie all night in the fields, or to walk upon the causeway, with a jack and knapsack, a Glasgow buckler, and a broadsword. But she was deluded by the seeming austere integrity of her half-brother, this Lord James, Earl of Murray. Nor was it her only misfortune to blindly aid his aspiring designs. She was thus also exposing herself to the machinations of Queen Elizabeth, with whom Murray maintained a most detestable and traitorous understanding. Evidently, he would have stopped short of nothing between himself and his sister's crown, and possibly he made his reckless course a matter of piety for the same papacy which he opposed had taught him, as it has taught others in all times, the satanic doctrine that the end sanctifies the means. After these exciting scenes, two years of peace to Mary and her kingdom ensued. Her quiet was, however, invaded by the presumption of a French poet of fortune and family, Chatelain, who was one of her numerous escorts to Scotland, and who now went thither again to urge the suit of his patron, the Duke of Danville. He was pleasing, accomplished, 
and a grand-nephew of Chevalier Bayard. The queen, being fond of poetry, and not averse to the customary glowing compliments of courtiers, received his laudatory effusions with favor, and even replied to them in verse. In this she was no doubt culpable. She could have gratified and encouraged his poetic nature, and yet have kept him at a suitable distance, until the danger or safety of his temperament was fully apparent. Her whole life was a training to discretion, while his vocation was to give free flow to feeling and impulse. He introduced himself into her bedchamber, was discovered and ejected with a severe rebuke, but soon after repeated the offense, when Mary called Murray to her assistance, and Châtelain was seized, tried, and executed. On the scaffold, he looked toward her window and exclaimed, Farewell, loveliest and most cruel princess whom the world contains. Nothing but a blind zeal, or mere malignity, can accuse the queen of more than imprudence in this sad affair. Châtela merited his fate. During these two years of peace, Knox also continued to annoy Mary by his irritating personalities and preaching, his seditious opposition, and his bitter remarks when admitted to her presence. For the most part, he may have acted from a mistaken sense of duty, but he too often exhibited the strange mixture of artfulness with conscientiousness, peculiar to his nation, to be set down as a blundering zealot, much as to be pardoned to his times, yet, in the queen herself, he had an example of calm charity even in that day of persecution. Mary endeavored to conciliate him by gentle words. Nevertheless, after she had opened her first parliament with a befitting display of royalty, he and his brethren denounced in public the superfluity of clothes and vanity of their sovereign and her ladies. And Knox boldly attacked her governmental acts, because they were not in form, as well as substance, what he desired. Called to an interview with her, he threw her into excessive weeping by his blunt severity until she could abide his presence no longer. She saw him but once more, and then he was on trial for treason, a few weeks subsequently to the audience granted him. Two rioters, out of many who had been disturbing the services at Holyrood Chapel, were imprisoned and Knox, to save them, wrote letters to all the leaders of his party, in order to assemble a crowd that would terrify the magistrates into an acquittal of the rioters. This was a treasonable infraction of an express law recently passed, but the reformer was pronounced innocent by the Protestant majority of the royal council. Such were the winds that frequently ruffled the serenity of Mary's life during the two years of lull that preceded her stormier days. She spent this time in journeying through the western and southern parts of Scotland and making a second progress through the wilder north. Her ordinary life was varied by the duties of her office and every study and amusement that could adorn her gifts. Rising before light in the morning, her first hours were given to her privy council, before whose august members she sat, needlework in hand, giving and receiving advice. She was a great lover of history and the classics, in the reading of which, especially the works of Livy, she passed an hour or two each day after dinner. For the study of geography and astronomy, she had the advantage of the first globes ever introduced into Scotland. End of section 28. Recording by Stacy Cologne, Fort Worth, Texas. Section 29 of the Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stacy Cologne. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Mary of Scotland, Part 3. Gardens were her delight, and were attached to her six chief palaces of residence. Hollywood had two, but not satisfied with so limited exercise as these afforded, she often walked to Arthur's seat, or along the Salisbury crags which overlook Edinburgh. The indoor confinement varied only by short, slow walks abroad, which is the greatest curse of American women, never enfeebled Mary's strength, or paled her bright cheek. In the fresh air she practiced with the crossbow, or rode, hawked, and hunted, or walked miles together like her later countrywomen. At home she danced, sang, played on the lute and virginal, or assisted in the masks that were customary. One of these is described. At a feast during the first course, a cupid entered and sang Italian verses, accompanied by a chorus. During the second course, a young maiden sang Latin verses. 
at the third, a person in the character of Father Time appeared and offered his parting advice. The Queen had always at hand a company of musicians who sang or played the viol, lute, and organ. To her chapel music she added, strangely enough, a military band with bagpipes and drums. Elizabeth of England had an endless wardrobe, but Mary's, though rich, was not extravagant. We are told that her common wearing gowns, as long as she continued in mourning, which was till the day of her second marriage, were either made of camlet, or demise, or serge of Florence, bordered with black velvet. Her riding habits were mostly of serge of Florence, stiffened in the neck and body with buckram and trimmed with lace and ribbons. In the matter of shoes and stockings, she seems to have been remarkably well supplied. She had thirty-six pair of velvet shoes, laced with gold, silver, and silk, and three pair woven of worsted of Guernsey. Silk stockings were then a rarity. The first pair worn in England were sent as a present from France to Elizabeth. Six pair of gloves of worsted of Guernsey are also mentioned in the catalogue still existing of Mary's wardrobe. She was fond of tapestry and had the walls of her chambers hung with the richest specimens of it she could bring from France. She had not much plate, but she had a profusion of rare and valuable jewels. Her cloth of gold, her turkey carpets, her beds and coverlids, her tablecloths, her crystal, her chairs and footstools, covered with velvet and garnished with fringes, were all celebrated in the gossiping chronicles of the day. Indeed, Mary's reign was a new era of refinement and politeness in wild, rough Scotland. Her sweet manners and charming conversation and cultivated tastes soon elevated the tone of her court to that of any European capital. We know not how much the present culture and elegance of the land of Wilson and Macaulay are due to the influence of Mary, nor with all her expensive tastes did she forget the duties of charity. To all the poor she was a mother, herself directing the education of many poor children, and often personally watching the courts, where she maintained a lawyer to defend those who could not pay an advocate. Two priests also were employed by her to distribute alms constantly to all the needy. In the year 1565, Henry Stuart, Lord Darnley, went from England to Scotland, and with his advent commenced the great troubles of the Queen of Scots. Elizabeth had already begun her course of premeditated mischief in the matter of Mary's marriage, having insultingly proposed her own polluted favorite, Dudley, whom she had made Earl, as a husband for a pure-blooded and pure-minded sovereign, and knowing the offer would be rejected. Mary had declined many proposed alliances with the most powerful princes of the continent, in spirit of kind concession to England. She now turned her thoughts to her cousin Darnley, who next to her was heir presumptive to Elizabeth's crown, whenever it should be vacated by death. And the English queen, guessing the intention, not only permitted Darnley to go, but recommended him to Mary's favor, in order that she might interfere afterwards and break off the match by a civil war in Scotland. In this, she overshot her mark, as the event proved, though it would have been well for our heroine if the attempt to foil her purpose had succeeded. Darnley was four years younger than Mary, who was now a little more than twenty-two. Though so young, he was mature in his appearance, being uncommonly tall and well-proportioned. His features were regular, his movements graceful, his address winning, and his presence altogether full of fascination. In his childhood, he had displayed a precocious mind, as a letter still preserved and a story written of his, spoken of, may testify. His mother had always been ambitious to have this match take place. His father, the Earl of Lennox, as before mentioned, had been banished from Scotland and his estates confiscated. He was now reinstated in his forfeited honors, and his son Darnley, following him, reached Weems Castle near Edinburgh, on the north shore of the Frith of Forth, where Mary was then sojourning. She had every reason of policy for accepting him. She found him, as she remarked, the lustiest and best proportioned long man she had seen. He behaved well on first acquaintance, and he exhibited the accomplishments and professed the taste that might win her regard. Never was there a prospect of more fitting and happy union. He could not conceal entirely his boyish opinions and rash arrogancy, but these were naturally imputed to his youth. He courted the reform party. The nobles generally welcomed with gladness any one who would supplant Murray in authority, and Darnley's mother had taken care to send presents to the queen a ring with a fair diamond. 
one emerald to my lord of Murray, one or loge or montre, watch, set with diamonds and rubies to the secretary of Levington, a ring with a ruby to my brother Sir Robert, for she was still in good hope that her son, my lord Darnley, should come better speed than the Earl of Leicester, anent the marriage with the Queen. But more favorable to his suit than diamonds were the measles and ague that opportunely attacked this long man and demanded Mary's nursing care and excited in her that pity which is akin to love. When her mind was fully made up, she first intimated it to Darnley, who, unlike the modern Prince Albert, had not awaited a queen's proposal and, of course, was silenced until she offered herself. Next, she sought the concurrence of her good cousin Elizabeth, who forthwith refused it in peremptory terms. Mary replied that she had only made known her independent intention as an act of courtesy, and did not beg any consent. Elizabeth proceeded to excite the discontent of Mary's subjects, particularly Murray, and having imprisoned Darnley's mother, commanded himself and his father to return to England. Lennox made answer that the heir of England did not agree with his health, and his son more plainly sent word that he considered himself subject to Mary's word alone. But the trouble which Elizabeth had been brewing began to develop itself. The leading nobles of the Scottish court openly opposed the marriage, and Murray commenced in good earnest to set a rebellion on foot with the purpose of seizing his sovereign's person and himself assuming the government. She was in company with her intended husband to attend the baptism of a child of Lord Livingston. The conspiring lords were to waylay her on the road she was to travel, but she learned the plot in season, to provide a powerful escort, and to pass by the ambush so early that her enemies were unprepared to intercept her. Another attempt to provoke disturbance was made at Edinburgh, under the cloak of religion. It was frustrated, however, by the timely arrival and activity of the Queen. Next, on the 17th of July, Murray and his accessories boldly proclaimed civil war at Stirling Castle, and sent to England for money. Mary's wisdom, courage, and diligence now shone forth in her measures to meet this rebellion. Her nature was one that difficulties brought out in its strength instead of overpowering it. Her administration had been mild and acceptable. The majority of the people were attached to her, and many men of rank rallied around her in this emergency. But to anticipate any unforeseen calamity and to take away the excuse for treasonable acts, she hastened to consummate her union with Darnley. The marriage was solemnized on Sunday, July 29, 1565, in the Holyrood Chapel. According to the Catholic ceremony, John Sinclair, Bishop of Brecon, officiating. It was generally remarked, says Bell, that a handsomer couple had never been seen in Scotland. Mary was now 23, and at the very height of her beauty, and Darnley, though only 19, was of a more manly person and appearance than his age could have indicated. The festivities were certainly not such as had attended the Queen's first marriage, for the elegancies of life were not understood in Scotland as in France. And besides, it was a time of trouble when armed men were obliged to stand round the altar. Nevertheless, all due observances and rejoicings lent a dignity to the occasion. Mary, in a flowing robe of black, with a wide mourning hood, was led into the chapel by the earls of Lennox and Ethel who, having conducted her to the altar, retired to bring in the bridegroom. The bishop having united them in the presence of a great attendance of lords and ladies, three rings were put on the queen's finger, the middle one a rich diamond. They then knelt together, and many prayers were said over them. At the conclusion, Darnley kissed his bride, and as he did not himself profess the Catholic faith, left her till she should hear Mass. She was afterwards followed by most of the company to her own apartments, where she laid aside her sable garments to intimate that henceforth, as wife of another, she would forget the grief occasioned by the loss of her first husband. In observance of old custom, as many of the lords as could approach near enough were permitted to assist in unrobing her by taking out a pin. She was then committed to her ladies, who, having attired her with becoming splendor, brought her to the ballroom where there was great cheer and dancing till dinner time. At dinner, Darnley appeared in his royal robes, and after a great flourish of trumpets, largest was proclaimed among the multitude who surrounded the palace. The earls of Athol, Morton, and Crawford attended the queen as sewer, carver, and cupbearer, and the earls of Eglinton, Cassillis, and Glencairn performed the like offices for Darnley. 
When dinner was over, the dancing was renewed till supper time, soon after which the company retired for the night. Further messages were now exchanged between the neighboring queens, resulting only in further display of the envious hypocrisy of the one and the straightforward intelligence of the other. Mary's honeymoon was full of vexatious diplomacy and military preparations. The Earls Bothwell and Sutherland were of necessity recalled from banishment, and Lord Gordon recovered the titles and possessions wrested from his father by the grasping Murray. The Queen appointed a new provost at Edinburgh in place of the unreliable one, and summoning her subjects to arms, marched to Linlithgow, to Stirling, and to Glasgow, her forces accumulating at every step. Murray, with an army of twelve hundred, was at Paisley, five miles from Glasgow. But fearing an encounter, hastened to Edinburgh, there to find that his selfish motives were well known, and hardly one person ready to assist him. Thither, the royal army, now numbering five thousand, returned in pursuit, and Murray hurried at its approach back to the vicinity of Glasgow, whither the Queen again marched so immediately that Murray retired to the southern border, where through the English Earl of Bedford he received three thousand pounds and three hundred men from Elizabeth, with brazen deceit, had just assured Mary of her goodwill. The latter put forth a proclamation in which the real designs of Murray were set forth in plain words. Eighteen thousand soldiers soon gathered to her aid. The rebels fled from their approach and finally dispersed, leaving their leaders to take refuge in England. For a long time, Elizabeth did not permit Murray to come into her presence, and at last made him and the abbot of Kilwinning on their knees, and in the presence of the French and Spanish ambassadors, declare that she herself had taken no part in the Scottish rebellion. To such degradation were the traitors compelled, instead of reaping their expected reward. After this, they lived at Newcastle for some time in want and neglect. In this campaign, the Queen of Scots, by common consent, exhibited great executive talent and admirable spirit. She rode with her officers in a suit of light armor, carrying pistols at her saddle bow. And Knox himself confesses that her courage was manlike and always increasing. The revolt thus suppressed was but the prelude of Mary's henceforth uninterrupted misfortunes all of which flowed chiefly from her ill-starred marriage. Darnley soon manifested a nature too gross and defective to bear his sudden elevation to power. He gave loose to intemperate and libidinous inclinations, and to his willful temper. His manner towards his wife was often cruelly rude. His time was given to riotous companions, and the kingly title and equal power conferred on him by the generous love of the queen, together with many other favors, only fed his childish appetite for more, until he determined to usurp the supreme authority. The Earl of Morton, who affected allegiance to the Queen, was ready to seize on the passions of her husband as instruments for the execution of his own purposes, which must be considered selfish ones for the most part, inasmuch as Mary's whole course and all historical documents events no design in her to join the Continental League of Princes for the suppression of Protestantism by fire and sword. But she was resolved at a Parliament soon to meet, to secure the final expatriation of that Murray who, in the face of her offers of pardon, had persisted in rebellion, and had long shown himself a faithless and ungrateful dissembler. This resolution stirred up the disaffected to immediate action. Morton and others at once conspired with Darnley and the absent Murray, in a way that seemed to favor the separate interests of all concerned. The king was to be clothed with the right over the queen. Murray was to be restored, and the reform party to have full sway. Thus was Darnley made a poor dupe, and bound by written agreement to go to any extreme, even, as the language of the compact evidently implied, to the wresting of liberty or life from his devoted wife and munificent queen. The first step in this treason was the infamous murder of Rizzio, the confidential secretary and faithful adviser of Mary. There is some proof that this was perpetrated not merely through jealousy of Rizzio's long influence with the Queen, but more immediately in revenge of his disclosure of this same plot, which it is affirmed he had accidentally overheard as one that purposed her imprisonment until the rebels secured their objects. Rizzio was a native of Piedmont and came to Scotland in 1561 as an attaché of the Savoyan embassy. He was retained by Mary on account of his musical talent, and three years after rose to be her French secretary. Advanced in years and repulsive in features, he was accomplished in mind and manners, and in various ways serviceable to his mistress. 
She could trust no man, not even her husband, and though two of her four Marys yet remained unmarried with her, it is not wonderful that she admitted the trusty Rizzio to a familiar companionship, which has given some false color to the indubitably false insinuations of her enemies. Besides these, it was reported that the Italian was a paid agent of the Pope, a report that would make his assassination a popular scene in the drama of iniquity to be acted by the traitors. Saturday, the 9th of March, 1566, was fixed upon for the deed of blood. Morton introduced into Holyrood Palace 500 armed men as a safeguard. Lord Ruthven, a fierce man, and encased in a coat of mail beneath his robe, led a chosen few to Darnley's room, directly beneath a small private room where Mary was at supper, in company with a brother, a countess, and the secretary. By a secret stairway that led to this room from the lower one, Darnley, at eight o'clock, entered and sat down at the supper table next to the queen. His not returning after a certain interval was a preconcerted sign that his accomplices could do their work. Accordingly, as many as could crowd into the small chamber suddenly appeared, one after another, their savage leader clanking his armor as he sat down without a word of salutation. Mary demanded an explanation. Ruthven declared that no evil was meant except to the villain near her, and fixed his ghastly eyes on the secretary, who was conspicuous in his dress of satin, velvet, damask, fur, and jewels. Mary heard the reply with calm courage, and called on Darnley to maintain her rights. Then seeing him move not, she commanded the intruders to leave, saying that Parliament should investigate any charges against Rizzio. Ruthven now assailed the latter with a storm of invective, until, frightened from his senses, he rushed into the recess of a window behind the person of the queen, and cried repeatedly in Italian, Justice! Justice! In the confusion that followed, the table was overturned, all the lights but one extinguished, and swords and pistols flourished at random. At last, George Douglas grasped Darnley's dirk, and leaning over the queen struck Rizzio, who was dragged out into the presence chamber, dispatched with fifty-six stabs, and afterwards thrown down the great stairway, with the king's weapon still in his side. Several noblemen then in the palace were to have been captured, but they managed to escape by ropes from the windows and arouse the provost of the city. The alarm bell was sounded. Hundreds of citizens ran to the palace and called for the queen to show herself and convince them of her welfare. She was forcibly kept back, and Darnley dismissed the crowd. To her presence, Ruthven returned, and there drank a glass of wine, and to her rebuke for his conduct replied in abusive words. All night she was held captive, suffering the while from illness brought on by terror and her condition as almost a mother. Next day, Parliament was prorogued in Darnley's name, and in the evening, Murray and the exiled noblemen arrived at the palace. The affair had succeeded— but how the queen should be disposed of was a perplexing question. To set her at liberty or put her to death were equally dangerous, and to imprison her almost as much so. Darnley began to entertain misgivings, and at his entreaty the party agreed that Mary should be released, provided she would pardon all concerned. Alone with him, her strong mind and heart soon overpowered his feelings, and he consented to escape with her at midnight and fly to Dunbar Castle for their common safety against the lawless nobles who befriended in order to ruin him. There her still loyal earls rallied around her, and at her return with a sudden collected army they fled for their lives. She now found it advisable to pardon Murray and the leaders of the former rebellion, and to confine her indignation to the recent evildoers. Her whole reign, it has been said, was a series of plottings and pardons. She became very melancholy, as well she might be for various reasons. Her conjugal love had been betrayed. None of her associates were to be relied on. And Elizabeth still pursued her malevent schemes, one of which was the sending of a man to Mary's court, who passed himself off as a Romish priest, deputed by English Catholics, to offer her the crown of their country. He proved to be an emissary of Elizabeth herself, who had the face to demand his capture. His real character had already been discovered, and he was arrested in a way his mistress dreamed not of. End of section 29. Recording by Stacy Colon, Fort Worth, Texas. Section 30 of the Heroines of History. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stacy Cologne. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Mary of Scotland, Part 4. In June of this year, 1566, the Queen gave birth to a son, who afterwards became James I of England, being the first sovereign who united the scepters of that country and Scotland. In him were Mary's double title, and many hopes realized, though not until after her death, and alas, after that tender infant over whom she now watched, when grown a young man, had repudiated in stinging words his own mother in her sad captivity. The birth was a great matter of public rejoicing. The celebration continued long, the people, both high and low degree, assembling in solemn thanksgiving. The infant had an earl for governor, and his lady for governess, and was kept at Stirling Castle. Six months after, the child, remarkable for health and strength, was there baptized with extraordinary pomp. Ambassadors from all the chief courts of Europe came to attend the ceremony. Sixty thousand dollars were levied to defray the cost of their entertainment and of the occasion. Queen Elizabeth sent a font of gold worth five thousand dollars, and the baptism was duly performed after the Catholic ritual. The christened name was Charles James, James Charles, Prince and Steward of Scotland, Duke of Rothesey, Earl of Carrick, Lord of the Isles, and Baron of Renfrew. Among many other provisions made for the royal babe, five ladies of rank were appointed rockers of his cradle. And though he as yet could taste milk only, he had a master cook, a foreman, and three other servitors, and one for his pantry, one for his wine, and two for his ale cellar. As a specimen of the presents given by Mary in honor of the event, may be mentioned a chain of diamonds worth $3,000 given to the Duke of Bedford, Elizabeth's ambassador. The most exciting scenes in the life of Mary had already begun to rapidly unfold themselves. All that occurred so far is but the first breath of a tempest. After the affair of Rizzio, Darnley found himself more than ever despised and slighted by the nobility. Nor had he the cunning or the care to hide his resentment from them. He shunned the society of almost every one, accompanying the queen only a part of the time on her journeys after her confinement, and, for the rest, wandering restlessly from one place to another. Through all these months, his wife maintained the same kind manner to him, and paid him, indeed, all the more attention as a rebuke to the contemptuous lords, and he had the nobleness to recognize this in a marked way, and by declaring always that he had no complaint to make against her. He formed, or pretended, a plan to leave Scotland for the continent. This may have been done to extort some concessions of power from her, when she was so sick with fever and convulsions, two months before the christening that all hope of her recovery was given up, he was by her side, having flown to her at the first news of her serious illness. And when, immediately on her recovery, the proposal to divorce Darnley was made, at the instigation of Bothwell, by her counsel, she instantly rejected the idea from personal choice as well as for reasons of state. This proposal was the first step in the bold and terrible part which Bothwell played, it led to the scenes of horror that which history has few greater. That Earl was now in his thirty-sixth year, and but nine months before had married Lady Jane Gordon, sister of the Earl of Huntley. The plan to effect a divorce between the Queen and the King was the first sign of the purpose he had evidently formed to wear a crown himself as the husband of Mary. Never was a design more daring in itself or in its execution. He so addressed himself to the selfish interests of the barons that he secured their active or tacit support to any extremity or procedure against Darnley, still keeping his own ulterior purpose disguised. The king's death was resolved upon, or assented to, by all the chiefs. At this crisis, Darnley was taken ill at Glasgow with the smallpox. It has been asserted, with much improbability, that it was poison rather than disease. The queen, full of sympathy and alarm, went immediately to take care of him, she found him recovering, and returned with him in a vehicle to Edinburgh. From the nature of his infectious disease, or from his aversion to the presence of the lords, he was lodged in a house adjoining the southern wall of the city, and called Kirk in the Field. It had four rooms, of which an upper one was occupied by Darnley, 
and the one immediately beneath it by Mary, who spent much of her time and often slept there. She sat for hours by her husband's bed, and occasionally entertained him with the songs and instrumental music of her band. Little did the Queen or Darnley dream of the volcano preparing beneath their feet during the ten days they passed together in that house. We may imagine him subdued by sickness, to calm thought and gentle feeling, and her renewing the ardor of first love to her handsome and wayward lover in commiseration for his calamities. And well may he be an object of pity to all men. He was but a boy of nineteen when wedded to a queen and raised to a kingly power that half maddened his naturally strong will. Now he was aged twenty years only, and his heroic wife was but twenty-four. Men of age and wisdom had in every way endeavored to estrange the hearts of these two fair young beings, and were now busily plotting the destruction of one or both. Bothwell lost no time. On Sunday night, the ninth of February, 1567, the Queen was to attend the marriage of two of her favorite servants at Holyrood, and thus would not be at the Kirk in the Field. Duplicate keys of the house had been obtained. Eight men were enlisted to do the deed. As the best plan to avoid recognition and detection, powder had been brought from Dunbar Castle two days before. With this, the house was to be blown up. There was of so great quantity that the men went twice with horses to transport it. The queen and three earls were in Darnley's room while it was carried into her room beneath, and Bothwell himself, after overseeing the inhuman work, joined the party in the sick man's chamber, so self-possessed and fearless was he. In the conversation there, it is said that Mary remarked, It was just about that time last year David Rizzio was killed, a chance word that might well have made the bold earl visibly shrink. At eleven o'clock, she affectionately kissed her youthful husband, unconscious that she would never hear his voice again, then left with the others to attend the wedding. As she entered Holyrood House, she detected the smell of gunpowder in a passing servant of Bothwell and asked what it meant. An evasive answer was given, and she said no more. Bothwell joined the dancing and masking party, then went to his own house and exchanged his silver-embroidered doublet of black satin for coarse dress and cloak. With his accomplices, he hurried to the scene of action, affixed a piece of lint to the powder, which lay in a heap on the floor, and lighting the train, hastened to a garden close at hand to await the catastrophe. For fifteen minutes all was silent, and Bothwell was with difficulty restrained from going to examine the lighted match. But his patience was needed no longer. Suddenly, the city echoed as with many thunders in one, and shook as with an earthquake. The doomed building was shivered to pieces. Stones, ten feet in length and four in breadth, it is affirmed, were found blown from the house a far way. Bothwell made all speed through by-streets for his lodgings and retired to bed. In half an hour the news came to him that the king was killed. He donned the same dress he had worn in the presence of the queen a few hours before and assuming great anger, went with the others to break the news to Mary, who was already distressed to know certainly of the rumor that had reached her. At daybreak the guilty lords went to the scene, where they found a crowd gathered. One servant was rescued alive from the ruins. Three others were killed, one of whom, together with Darnley, was found at a great distance, both dead, but with hardly a wound. Thus perished Henry Stuart, who bore the titles of Lord Darnley, Duke of Albany, and King of Scotland, after a reign, if it may be called such, of eighteen months. Young, imprudent, willful, and vicious, yet fascinating and accomplished, his union with Mary and his shocking death have attached to his name a lasting interest. The unhappy queen shut herself up and refused to see anyone. Her account of the event in a letter to her ambassador at Paris is on record and is full of unaffected grief and horror. Believing that violence was intended to herself also, she removed to Edinburgh Castle for greater safety. Great rewards were offered for the detection of the murderers. Suspicion soon centered on Bothwell. At night, a placard was posted, charging the deed on him together with others, not accepting the queen as one who connived at the crime. The whole country was agitated with mystery. Mary used every exertion to penetrate it, but she knew not whom to arrest, and was so worn out with trouble that she was prevailed on to journey for her health. According to the entreaty of Lennox, Darnley's father, 
she finally ordered a trial of Bothwell in April. At this, Bothwell was acquitted, having taken care to make it unsafe for Lennox to appear and support the charge, even if he could have found evidence to sustain it. Bothwell's next achievement was the procuring of a written bond signed by nearly all the nobility of every party and creed, pledging their lives and goods to aid his claims to Mary's hand. This was accomplished at a supper to which he invited them on the 20th of April. It must have required much preliminary electioneering and as proof of very bold and subtle finesse, or perhaps the lords readily assented in order to better ruin Mary. The bond was secured for its effects on the Queen at a future day, and for the present was kept from her knowledge. When questioned as to the report of her intended marriage with the Earl, she said there was no such thing in her mind, and when Bothwell soon after hinted his desire to her, she discouraged it altogether. The time had come, therefore, for another high-handed act. The Queen had been spending a few days at Stirling and was to return on the 24th of April. Bothwell gathered a band of cavalry, numbering between 500 and 1,000 men, as if to suppress disturbances on the southern border over which he ruled. But changing his course after proceeding a short distance, he intercepted Mary and her slender escort at Linlithgow, took the bride of her horse, and hastened to Dunbar Castle. An abduction at all, under the circumstances— together with the unnecessary number of troopers employed and the spirit of Mary's whole life and testimony, are some of the evidences that this affair was not with her knowledge or consent as has been maintained. Able writers have not only laboriously accused her of this, but have argued that she had already a criminal intimacy with Bothwell, and that too before the murder of her husband. All that we know of her on undisputed record and a great variety of circumstances that any reader of history may gather utterly disprove the foul insinuations and assaults of partisan or blind writers. At Dunbar Castle on the rocky seashore, Mary was held ten days in a solitude to which none but Bothwell was admitted, not even her own servants. She saw no signs of an attempt by her subjects to deliver her. She found the nobles were pledged on the earl's side. He both supplicated her love and tender appeals, and declared that he would compel her to marry him against her will if necessary. Darnley, though only three months in his grave, had been one of the murderers of her faithful servant and secretary, and had before forfeited her love, so that she must have felt his death a relief, though a great shock to her sensibilities. There was not a man of influence except her captor on whom she could rely. Her kingdom was full of trouble and violence. Bothwell was a man of shrewd mind, unflinching courage, and great energy. He had been acquitted at his trial, and had the written consent of all the peers to his marriage with her. He was that sort of fierce lover which her whole temperament would lead her to admire and yield to. She was not a shrinking maiden, and above all, she was wholly in his power with no prospect of escape. What wonder she at last consented to be his bride, or that, having once consented and received his fond attentions, she afterwards, under less apparent necessity, adhered to her promise but there is reason to believe that he went to the most guilty extremities of compulsion, so that her course subsequently became one of mere necessity. Meantime, he and his injured wife both sued for a divorce, which was hurriedly granted by the courts. Taken under guard to Edinburgh Castle, which was in Bothwell's control, Mary was not permitted to appear in public until the bans of marriage had been twice proclaimed. The ceremony took place in a very quiet way, and according to the Protestant form, to which the Queen seems to have been reconciled only by a despairing state of mind, so unfaltering was her steadfastness and her peculiar faith through a whole life. A sermon was preached on the occasion, and after it at supper Bothwell gave loose to his coarse hilarity elated by his entire success. But his success so far was no less complete than was the conscious ruin of the Queen of Scots. So hopeless was she, it is declared, that she threatened to commit suicide. Though she was reinstated in Holyrood Palace, she was continually guarded by two hundred harquebusiers in the pay of her ravisher. His conduct to her was full of suspicion and rudeness. His other wife, formerly divorced, remained in his former residence, and, as it was believed, had an understanding with him. And to these sources of Mary's misery were added the now apparently confirmed and triumphant accusations of many of her subjects, and a loss of the respect of other nations and royal courts. Villainy ever overacts its part. Bothwell might have confirmed his triumph by a prudent course. 
but in his proud exultation he took no care to allay the already active envy of the nobles, and he even boasted that if he could get Mary's child into his possession, the young prince would never have an opportunity to revenge the death of his father. Soon after, he proclaimed his intention to go with the queen to quell some troubles on the border, and called on the chiefs to appear with their forces under arms for this purpose. It was at once suspected that he had designs on the young prince at Stirling Castle. Accordingly, the prince's lords, as they were thenceforth termed, gathered their retainers as if in compliance with the call, but assembled at Stirling in great numbers in open opposition to Bothwell. He just then learned that he could not rely on the keeper of the castle of Edinburgh, and fearing an attack from that quarter also, with the ready apprehension of an evil conscience, retired to Borthwick Castle seven miles south of the city. No sooner had he placed Mary there and collected all his force in defense than he found himself surrounded by the swarming army of his adversaries. At night he fled through their ranks in company with Mary, whose fortunes were now thoroughly involved with his, and who thus escaped in the disguise of male attire. Arrived at Dunbar, he summoned all the queen's lieges to her name to appear for her defense. An army of two thousand men, moved by feeling of loyalty, answered the call and were led forth by himself and Mary. The opposing forces met at Carberry Hill, but neither seemed disposed to engage the other in battle. The day was spent in negotiations, at one time for peace, at another for a decision by single combat, Bothwell having challenged any man of his own rank to meet him, and each party claiming that the other was in blame for the failure of this proposal. Finally, the queen offered to place herself in the hands of her lords, and to pardon their seeming revolt, provided they would ensure her free sovereignty. To frustrate her purpose, Bothwell, with characteristic desperation, attempted to shoot her messenger, and not succeeding, retired angrily to Dunbar Castle with his few followers. The moment Mary surrendered herself to the nobles for the sake, as she said, of saving the waste of Christian blood and her people's lives, was a turning point of his rash career. Not long after, he found it advisable to escape into the north of Scotland, where he held estates as a Duke of Orkney. Pursued thither by his enemies, and nearly captured as he was flying from them in a boat, it is related that he remained a while in the Orkney Isles, committing piracy on the seas, and was at last taken to Denmark, or else voluntarily went thither, to enlist the Danish king in his wretched cause. However that may be, it is believed he spent years in a Danish dungeon, and at last died insane, from the mad chafing of his proud, restless spirit, and the gnawings of conscience. His life was strange and wild as a dream. He was an embodiment of the fiery passions of the age. In our times, noblemen are giving scientific lectures to the people, or sitting as chairman of peace conventions and missionary societies. Mary's conduct to Carberry Hill can hardly be construed into any real love for Bothwell. Her army was so superior in numbers and position as to promise a sure victory. She would not have prevented a battle, or parted from him in such a manner, had she not desired to put herself out of his power. But her noble trust in her base nobleman was destined to be betrayed. As she entered the city, she was preceded by a banner, whereupon was painted the shocking picture of Darnley lying dead, and her child kneeling before it, with the words, Judge and revenge my cause, O Lord. The populace pressed around her, and insulted her with the most shameful exclamations while she rode on, her face bowed down in tears. To her surprise, the lords led her past Holyrood. She called out all her loyal subjects to interfere on her behalf, but she was taken to the provost's house. The next day, she so worked upon the variable sympathies of the crowd that her oppressors escorted her to the palace. This was but a feint of submission, or rather a step to a greater outrage. At midnight, Ruthven and Lindsay, the grim earls who were active in Rizzio's assassination, aroused her from sleep, disguised her in a coarse riding dress, and placing her on a horse, made all speed through the darkness until morning, when she found herself at Lochleven Castle, which was situated on a small island in the lake of that name north of Edinburgh. This was a place of great security, and the more so in this case, as it was, the seat of Lady Douglas, the mother of Earl Murray, and closely connected with Lindsay and Morton, all of them at heart, the foes of Mary. The full extent of the designs against her was hidden from the unfortunate queen. It was represented 
that extreme care for her safety in view of the power of Bothwell was the reason for such treatment. But she could not doubt that some evil was intended. Her keeper, the Lady of Lochleven, as she was more generally known, behaved harshly to her charge, and even taunted her with a pretension to the crown itself. She was kept, too, in close confinement. Her rooms occupying a bastion that overhung the waters of the lake are still shown to travelers, though dilapidated, like the rest of the castle. Thus far, the dominant party had not dared to publicly charge her with crime. Their declarations show that she was universally regarded as a helpless victim of the Lord of Dunbar Castle. Two great parties, however, soon began to define themselves, one for the Queen and one for the Prince. Morton, the leader of the latter, was at Edinburgh with his supporters. Hamilton Palace near Glasgow was a rendezvous of the Queen's friends, among whom were Huntley, Argyll, Ross, Livingston, and Seton, altogether representing a majority of the kingdom. The prince's friends, as they termed themselves, began to publish many systematic falsehoods criminating Mary, and these have been repeated and urged ever since. Their motives are plain. They hoped by dethroning her both to escape punishment for their misdeeds and to rise into greater power. And the queen's friends, knowing this, proposed that they should liberate her on condition she would forever pardon them. But they had gone too far to consent to this. Elizabeth, too, was busily instigating them against Mary, and Murray, who had long been at Paris, cautiously watched events in Scotland, lent them his encouragement. End of section 30 Recording by Stacy Cologne, Fort Worth, Texas. Section 31 of the Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stacy Cologne. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Mary of Scotland. Part 5. The 26th of July, 1567, was perhaps the saddest of all the sad days of this hapless queen. Sir Robert Melville and Lord Lindsay came to make her abdicate her throne. Melville first saw her, and used his persuasive talent to the utmost, but without effect. The savage Lindsay was next admitted. He at once broke forth in fierce threats, vowing to the unprotected queen, that if she did not immediately sign the papers of abdication brought with them, he would sign them with her blood and cast her into the lake beneath the window. Mary had known his sanguinary part in the Rizzio tragedy. She now saw him about to draw his dagger, as she supposed. Melville adroitly whispered to her that acts done under compulsion would not be binding if she ever should choose to disown them. In an agony of tears and terror, she put her name to the documents— wherein she was made to say that she freely resigned her crown, being wearied with the labors of government. Thus did this woman, whose honorable ambition was her ruling passion, suddenly find herself no more a sovereign. Four days afterward her son James, then one year old, was crowned at Stirling. All commands were published in his name. Buchanan, one of Mary's bitterest enemies, was made his tutor, and from that time contempt for his own mother was carefully instilled into the child's mind. Murray soon returned to Scotland. With characteristic circumspection, he did not at first commit himself to either party. The regency, during James's minority, was urged upon him. He went to Loch Leven, and, counterfeiting great sympathy for Mary, prevailed on her to approve his assuming that office for her sake. At Edinburgh he pretended much humility and a regret that the choice had fallen upon him, but took the oaths of regent. He set himself energetically and carefully at work to suppress discontent and to strengthen his power for a virtual reign in James's name that promised to endure many years. And to make assurance doubly sure, love letters were now forged and produced purporting to be from Mary to Bothwell and implicating her in Darnley's murder. The summit of his ambition appeared to be attained when Mary, a light-hearted girl of eighteen in sunny France, received the respectful visits of her Scottish earls. Little did she foresee how strangely the dark threads of the lives of the two of them were to be interwoven with the fair fibers of her own. For the first seven months of her imprisonment, the gloom of the poor queen was unalleviated by one ray of hope. 
in four short months, an unparalleled series of misfortunes, wrongs, and insults had fallen upon her. The Lady of Lochleven, a former dismissed courtesan of her father, was bitter and malicious. One of the chief servants of the castle was concerned in Rizzio's death, and declared he would gladly kill the queen. Her own servants were her only solace and protection. These were faithful and tender, yet even with their aid she had no chance of escape. But in March, 1568, a new light shone into her prison. A son of the lady keeper, George Douglas, aged 25, and a relative of the family, William Douglas, 17 years old, had entertained a very romantic interest in the beautiful and luckless Mary. They now arranged a plan for her escape. She clothed herself in the garments of her laundress, concealing her face, and bundle in hand passed out of the castle and took the boat in waiting. But the boatmen discovered her delicate hands, and, despite her commands as their queen, took her back to the castle. The resolute and chivalric George and William did not relinquish the idea of rescuing their lovely sovereign. Five weeks after, another scheme was formed and this time successfully carried out. On the 2nd of May, William abstracted the keys of the castle from the family supper table where they had been laid, locked the whole household in as he passed out, helped Mary out of the one window into a boat prepared for her, threw the keys into the lake, and with the assistance of Mary herself at the oars, soon placed her exultingly in the hands of several of her trusty lords who were waiting with the guard to receive her. Quickly mounting and riding rapidly with little rest, they arrived with her at Hamilton Palace early in the forenoon of the next day. The whole land was aroused by the news of her escape. Multitudes of every grade gathered to her assistance. Among them nine earls, nine bishops, eighteen lords, and many barons and gentlemen. Six thousand soldiers were at her command before the week closed. She renounced her forced abdication, Melville himself appearing and testifying to the circumstances. Murray's friends began to silently withdraw from him. He was at Glasgow near the headquarters of Mary. He saw the need of instant action to arrest her intention to fortify herself in Dumbarton Castle, which is situated on a lofty pyramid of rock, and was a place of impregnable strength. She was already on the way with her troops. Murray called together some 4,000 men and met the Queen's army at Langside, two miles south of Glasgow. Both armies endeavored to gain a commanding hill. Murray, by the advice of a veteran, mounted his infantry behind the troopers' saddles and reached the point first. A fierce battle ensued, for a long time doubtful, but at last decided by a reinforcement of Highlanders in favor of the regent. Mary watched the scene in unimaginable excitement, and overwhelmed at the result cried out that it were better for her not to have been born. There was no time for delay. With a few attendants, she put her excellent horsemanship to full proof, and never paused until she was sixty miles away to the south at the Abbey of Dundrennan. She was advised to sail for France, but was too proud to enter as a fugitive the land she had reigned over in splendor as the queen of a triple scepter. Nor would it do for her to apply for aid to a Catholic country. It would hazard her crown too much. She trusted that Elizabeth would at least give her refuge and applied for it. Unable to wait for a reply, she made her way by land and water to the vicinity of the castle of Carlisle in England. Men of rank came to meet her and conducted her with great respect to the castle. Elizabeth sent hypocritical messages of sympathy. She privately exulted in the climax of her wishes, the apparent ruin of Mary. She did not know how far it was prudent to take advantage of her power and waited to consult with Murray. With the excuse that Mary was in danger from her Scottish enemies, the castle was repaired. She, at all times, kept under guard, and her walks and rides finally prevented altogether. For the same ostensible reason, she was, not long after, removed farther south to Bolton Castle in the north of Yorkshire. Elizabeth's course was soon settled. She conferred with Murray, who had dispersed the renewed gatherings of forces in Mary's cause, and busily entrenched himself in his ill-gotten authority. The plan was to bring the Queen of Scots to what amounted to a criminal trial, and by foul means make her stand condemned before the world. 
She was called on to appoint commissioners to meet those of Murray, and others named by Elizabeth, to settle all disputes between her and the regent. Against this she protested as a sovereign, who could not be placed on a level with rebels to herself, but was ultimately persuaded to thus vindicate her honor. The English queen, from first to last, acted with a cunning as fiendish in its subtlety as in its malice. The commissioners met at York on the 4th of October, 1568. Notwithstanding Murray's utmost efforts, the case seemed to be going against him. Elizabeth, to give her influence a more deadly certainty, removed the conference to Westminster, and received Murray to her presence, whereas she had cruelly and unjustly refused to see Mary, the royal defendant, as if her pretended purity could not come in contact with one on whom rested suspicions which Elizabeth herself, after the mock trial even, declared to Mary she did not believe. With her quick intelligence and decision, Mary instructed her commissioners to withdraw from the council, and thus dissolve it, because it was so evidently unfair to adjourn it to a great distance from the accused, and to admit the accusers to opportunities denied to herself. Before this order reached her friends, Murray had, as a last resort, brought forward the forged love letters and sonnets ascribed to Mary, and involving her in the death of Darnley. The evidences for their suspiciousness need not be recounted the way they were used and at other times neglected to be used by the usurpers of the queen's power is enough to brand them as false the conference was broken up but murray and his spinster dictator arranged a little scene in which he was reprimanded and in defence brought forward an elaborate written statement of charges and proofs which england might employ in various ways and a reply to which was denied reception thus the whole infamous plot did not succeed but the great point was sufficiently gained, namely, to so overshadow the character of one of the earth's noblest and purest heroines that she could be held in lingering captivity. The retribution that followed the perfidious actors in this history is remarkable. Murray did not long enjoy his success. He was shot by Hamilton in revenge of maddening injuries done to the family of the latter by the troops of the former, and the tears Mary shed for him were witness to some good in his character, but more to the lofty magnanimity of her own. Lennox and Morton, who succeeded him, and other participants in the same events, after covering themselves with crime or cruelty or treachery one by one met a violent death. They that took the sword perished by the sword. Mary was but twenty-five when she entered England, in the first full bloom of body and mind. She was doomed to a thraldom of eighteen years that gradually destroyed her spirits and health, and ended in the bloody vengeance of the axe. This portion of her life was as much more heroic than the days of her active achievements, as the virtues of endurance and resignation are more noble than executive talent. She ceased to be the acknowledged Queen of Scotland, but she gained the kingdom of her own ambitious and afflicted heart, and she was purified like gold tried in the fire for the kingdom of heaven. She was taken from one castle to another and committed to the charge of one lord after another, in order that she might neither gain too much influence over her keepers, nor carry out a plan of escape. Her luxuries, comforts, attendants, and friends were continually diminished through the relentless hatred of her oppressor and her communications with friends at a distance was intercepted as far as possible. She employed herself in embroidery, reading, and writing. Some of her poetical efforts are preserved, and are beautiful memorials of her genius, her grief, and her Christian faith. And well did she need all resources to beguile her weary days and make her forget a while her discomfort. She had gradually ceased to be remembered, and her strong party at home was by degrees suppressed and thinned by death. Her hair turned prematurely gray with sorrow, her strength, from want of exercise, miserable fare, and bad accommodations failed her. A painful symptom of disease in her left side began to grow upon her. She thus describes her residence at Tutbury in 1680. This edifice, detached from the walls about twenty feet, is sunk so low that the rampart of earth behind the wall is level with the highest part of the building, so that here the sun can never penetrate. Neither does any pure air ever visit this habitation, on which descend drizzling damps and eternal fogs, to such excess that not an article of furniture can be placed beneath the roof, but in four days it becomes covered with green mold. 
I leave you to judge in what manner such humanity must act upon the human frame, and to say everything in one word, the apartments are in general more like dungeons for the vilest criminals than suited to persons of a station far inferior to mine. Inasmuch as I do not believe there is a lord or gentleman or even yeoman in the kingdom who would patiently endure the penance of living in so wretched a habitation. With regard to accommodation, I have for my own person but two miserable little chambers, so intensely cold during the night, that but for the ramparts and entrenchments of tapestry and curtains, it would be impossible to prolong my existence. And for those who have set up with me during my illness, not one has escaped malady. For taking air and exercise, I have but a quarter of an acre behind the stables. To aggravate her miseries, a poor priest of her faith was hung before her window. These accounts are translated from her letters in French. She who is the glory of the Louvre and the pride of Holyrood was at last the neglected prisoner of a decaying hunting lodge in the midst of an English forest. Many conspiracies were formed and attempts made to release her and restore her to her throne. The chief of these was by the Duke of Norfolk, an English noble and the most powerful subject in Europe. He proposed secretly for Mary's hand and was assured that, though on general ground she was averse to another marriage, yet she would favor his project and his suit. For this he was on discovery in prison nine months in the Tower of London. When released, he set about his scheme with all the more determination. Spain and Rome were to aid his cause, the Duke of Alva to land with an army, the English Catholics to rise, and the government to be overturned. But a second discovery of his purpose sent him to the block. He died like a hero. Mary disclaimed all knowledge of his treasonable designs toward Elizabeth, though she admitted his efforts to release herself, and she was not therefore made to suffer on his account. Simple devotion to a lovely and suffering queen, and private ambition were not the only causes of disquiet in England. From whatever motive trouble was made, it inevitably seized upon Mary's fame as its rallying word. Hence, an association of nobles was formed and sanctioned by Parliament for the purpose of prosecuting to death any person for whom, as well as by whom, any movement against the government was set on foot. Never was there a more absurdly unjust course of procedure adopted. It became a law and soon had occasion of execution against its real object, the Queen of Scots. In 1586, a new conspiracy was headed by Anthony Babington, a young man of wealth in Derbyshire who had heard much of Mary while he was at Paris. He was to be aided in the same manner as the Duke of Norfolk. Some letters passed between him and Mary, but there is no evidence of her initiation into the treasonable part of the plan. It was discovered. Fourteen of the leaders were executed, six of whom were pledged to assassinate the English Queen. Before the news had reached Mary, she was officially informed that she was to be held to trial as an accomplice. The nation was so greatly excited that Elizabeth saw that she might prudently go to any extremity against her admired prisoner. Mary denied the jurisdiction of another monarch over her, but as before, she was persuaded to submit to trial, lest a refusal be a tacit acknowledgment of guilt. The mockery of a court was held at Fotheringay Castle. In its great hall, with much pomp, the daughter of a hundred kings appeared, worn out with confinement and grief, but still resolute, calm, and discerning, before the greatest lawyers and politicians of the realm, and so ably answered their arguments that, on the testimony of her enemies who described the scene, she confounded her prosecutors. The old artifice was again used. The court was adjourned to a distance from her at Westminster, and there, of course, she was condemned. The shameless tyrant of England made a great show of reluctance to sign the death warrant, and waited to see what effect the verdict would have abroad. The King of France interposed feebly. The King of Scotland would have saved his mother, but was falsely counseled, and too timid, though now nineteen years of age. The warrant was signed, and the man to whom it was given was subsequently imprisoned for life on the hypocritical plea that he had received royal instructions not to have it executed. And the man who was the keeper of the doomed victim was enjoined by Elizabeth to secretly murder his prisoner before the sentence could be carried into effect, but he declined the wickedness. His name is Sir Amias Paulette, 
Mary requested that her servants might witness her constancy in death, and that her body might be buried according to the rites of her church, or carried to France. But no reply is known to have been made. On the afternoon of the 7th of February, 1587, the earls who were to carry out the sentence reached Mary's prison at Fotheringay. They respectfully disclosed their business. She heard them calmly as they read the death warrant. She expressed a cheerful willingness to die and made solemn oath on the Bible that she was innocent of the charge for which she was to suffer. She inquired about her son and the conditions of things abroad concerning which she had been kept in ignorance. When she found that the execution was to take place at eight o'clock the next morning, she manifested some emotion, but soon regained her serenity. From the first, however, her attendants, consisting of six waiting maids, a physician, surgeon, apothecary, and four male servants, were extremely agitated and, when the lords retired, made great lamentations. She knelt with them and prayed. At supper, the last repast with her household, she ate lightly, conversed but little, looked smilingly, and drank the health of all around her, calling them by name. Then she carefully disposed of all her money, furniture, and jewels, forgetting none of her friends near her or at a distance. After this, she wrote letters and her will, which occupied two large sheets, and is a fine memento of her strong and lucid intellect and of her noble heart. At two o'clock in the morning, she retired to her bed and rose at daybreak, gathered her little company of adherents, and continued in prayer until a knock at the door announced the fated hour. No priest was allowed her. Her attendants were forbidden to see her die, but on further entreaty, four males and two females of these were permitted to accompany her. To Melville, the chief of her train, she said, weeping, Tell my son that I thought of him in my last moments and that I have never yielded either in word or deed to aught that might lead to his prejudice. Desire him to preserve the memory of his unfortunate parent, and may he be a thousand times more happy and more prosperous than she has been. She perished in the room that had been the scene of her trial. A scaffold, carpeted with black, was at one end, and on it were two English earls and the executioners. Thither she was led, Melville bearing the train of her royal robe. She was dressed in state. She wore a gown of black silk bordered with crimson velvet, over which was a satin mantle. A long veil of white crepe stiffened with wire and edged with rich lace hung down almost to the ground. Round her neck was suspended an ivory crucifix. The ruins of her former stately and blooming self, she was still beautiful and dignified. The warrant of death was read aloud, she trembled not, nor changed her sublime tranquillity of countenance. The dean of Peterborough stepped forth from the two hundred spectators and soldiers and began to lecture her on points of doctrine. She turned from him, knelt, and prayed aloud for her enemies and for the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Rising, her veil and necklace were removed. The cross she was about to give to Jane Kennedy but the executioner snatched it away as part of his customary spoils. Her eyes were bound with a gold-embroidered handkerchief, her head laid on the block, and from her lips breathed the words, O Lord, in thee have I hoped, and into thy hands I commit my spirit. Three awkward blows of the axe severed her neck. Her head was held up to the gaze of the dumb crowd. The executioner cried, God save Elizabeth, Queen of England. The Earl of Kent responded, Thus perished all her enemies. Her remains were left rolled up in old green bays taken from a billiard table, afterwards buried with display in the Peterborough Cathedral, and finally a quarter of a century afterward placed in a splendid tomb at Westminster Abbey by her son James, who removed every vestige of the scene of her trial and death, Fotheringay Castle. Mary reached the age of forty-five years, her active life was between the ages of sixteen and twenty-five. No queen ever possessed higher talents or virtues. Her faults were the noble ones of a warm, trustful heart and of ardent youth. She confided in the treacherous too often. She had not learned that there are always many persons utterly dead to every claim of reason, honor, and generosity. Reigning in maturer years, she would have indicated her commanding intellect. 
As her enemies were often detestable in the face of their truer belief, so was she tolerant, deeply religious, and grandly upright in spite of her superstitious creed. Her character was frank and beautifully proportionate. Never would mere brilliancy of person and of mind have excited such glowing friendships, such bitter envies, such lasting admiration, and worldwide sympathy. End of section 31. Recording by Stacy Cologne, Fort Worth, Texas. Section 32 of The Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine H. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Section 32. Catherine of Russia. Part 1. Why, I can smile and murder while I smile, and cry content to that which grieves my heart, and wet my cheek with artificial tears, and frame my face for all occasions. Shakespeare The long and conspicuous reign of Catherine the Second was one of great tragical interest, and signalized by memorable events. Her mind was subtle and vigorous, but it is impossible to regard her character with any other feelings than those of disgust and pity. She presented herself to the world under a mask of benevolence, sincerity, wisdom, and piety, beneath which lurked detestable hypocrisy, licentiousness, vanity, and an ambition that aspired to great actions and reforms for the sake of renown rather than the good of mankind. Anxious to outfigure her great predecessors in the eyes of posterity, she selected her historian, and charged him not to record the assistance of anyone in the accomplishment of certain events, but to give the entire credit to her own wisdom and courage. She would have succeeding generations accept her as a model empress. She, who began her reign with the secret assassination of three rightful heirs to the throne— and ended it with the unjust and execrable division of Poland. In order to understand the steps by which she, a comparatively obscure princess, acquired the crown of the Russias, it is necessary to refer to the reign of her immediate predecessor. Elizabeth, the youngest daughter of Peter the Great, was proclaimed empress in 1741 by means of a revolt which deposed her cousin Anne and the infant Prince Ivan, for whom she acted as regent. The unfortunate Ivan was immured in the dungeon of Schlüsselburg, and his parents imprisoned in a fortress on the shores of the Arctic Ocean. Although Elizabeth was an amiable, gentle, beautiful woman, possessed of winning manners and a humanity that prompted her to take a vow, never to put a subject to death upon any provocation whatever, yet through the influence of favorites and the intoxication of unlimited power, her reign was marked by injustice and atrocious cruelties, and she became timid, weak, intemperate, and notoriously licentious. She selected for her successor, Peter, the son of her eldest sister. In order to have him under her immediate superintendence, she caused him to be brought from Holstein where his education was progressing under the enlightened Brumner. By some strange caprice, she supplied him with a narrow-minded, illiterate tutor, and to prevent any revolution in his favor, kept him almost a prisoner, surrounded by spies and ignorant persons, who engaged him in amusements and frivolous occupations that assisted to suppress whatever talent and vigor or energy of character he possessed. Some estimable persons and ladies of the court at Petersburg remonstrated with the Empress for her singular treatment of one who should be better fitted to occupy the throne. But she turned a deaf ear to their intercessions. One of her attendants ventured to suggest the evil that such an education was producing upon the character of the Grand Duke. If your majesty, said this courageous friend, 
do not permit the prince to know anything of what is necessary for governing the country, what do you think will become of him? And what do you think will become of the empire? Elizabeth, turning sternly to her attendant, said in a measured, threatening tone, Joanna, knowest thou the road to Siberia? These words were sufficient to silence future remonstrances. In 1747, Elizabeth determined to select a spouse for Peter. She was guided in her choice by the King of Prussia, who recommended a daughter of the Prince of Anhalt Zerbst. She was inclined to look favorably upon this alliance from the fact that she had once sincerely loved an uncle of the princess and after his death resolved never to marry. Princess Sophia Augusta Frederica was born at Stettin, May 2, 1729. Her father was commander-in-chief in the Prussian service and governor of the town and fortress of Stettin. Her mother was a woman of distinguished beauty, prudence, and good sense. She took upon herself the education of Sophia, who received the familiar nickname of Fike among her companions. These were selected without reference to their rank, for her mother endeavored to cultivate the simplest manners to suppress pride, a predominant characteristic of Sophia, and to insist upon her respectfully saluting ladies of distinction who visited the house. Among her playfellows she invariably took the principal part, often bringing into exercise an imperious, commanding temper. She was educated in the Lutheran religion, was early instructed from the best authors, and was disposed to study and reflection. Her seclusion was occasionally varied by excursions and visits to Hamburg and Berlin, in company with her mother. These visits fitted her for an after-appearance at court. At the suggestion of the King of Prussia, the Princess of Zerbst repaired to Petersburg with her daughter, hoping, by means of Sophia's attractions, and the reminiscences of Elizabeth's affection for her brother, to secure an alliance with Peter. They were cordially received by the Empress. The Grand Duke was quickly an admirer of the young princess who, now in her sixteenth year, added lively manners to an agreeable, if not handsome, face. She as readily regarded him favorably, for at this time his countenance was fresh, good-humored, and pleasing and his person of good stature and finely formed. With such mutual good will, therefore, but little time was required to make and accept proposals of marriage. As a necessary preliminary, Sophia adopted the Greek religion and received the name of Catherine Alexiana. Magnificent preparations were made for the approaching nuptials, but in the midst of this fair sailing, the Grand Duke was attacked with a violent fever, which soon divulged a malignant form of the smallpox. He recovered in a few weeks, but his face was for some time distorted and actually hideous with the marks of a disease which disfigured him for life. Catherine, who had been carefully kept in distant apartments, was prepared by her mother for the change in the appearance of her royal lover and warned not to betray the aversion she might feel on seeing him, lest the fine air-castles they had been building should be blown away at a breath. Catherine promised to conceal her emotions, and, attired as becomingly as possible, was conducted to the presence of the Grand Duke. She played her part well. With consummate art she approached Peter in her usual lively and graceful way, threw her arms about his neck, and kissed his cheek, apparently with devoted affection. She had no sooner gained her own apartments, however, than she fell senseless, and remained unconscious for three hours. This extreme repugnance, which she had so successfully dissembled, did not interfere for a moment with the ambitious designs that already outweighed every other consideration. The marriage was accordingly solemnized in 1747. Catherine retained an outward show of affection and respect as long as she thought necessary, but she soon felt her decided superiority. Talented, accomplished, speaking several languages with facility, dignified and winning in her deportment, she easily and becomingly filled her distinguished position, while Peter, 
who had good sense and a kind, confiding heart, had been spoiled by a base education, lacked polish and intelligence, and blushed at his inferiority in the presence of his wife. He regarded her with pride and admired the facility and fitness with which she acted the Grand Duchess. Determined to overrule and deprive him of the expected succession by placing the crown upon her own brow, she was easily induced to engage in the conspiracies formed against him by persons who preferred to see the ambitious Catherine upon the throne. Every possible means were taken to blacken the character of the Grand Duke in the eyes of Elizabeth. Slanderous reports were daily conveyed to her by one of her ladies of honor, who was engaged in the intrigues of the court. On one occasion, when she lamented the intemperate habits of the prince, the empress, shocked at this new charge, insisted she would not believe it till proved. The artful attendant took the first opportunity to dine with Peter, and by secretly putting an opiate in his wine, succeeded in prevailing upon him to unconsciously drink to excess. When he was sufficiently intoxicated, the deceitful woman hastened to call the empress. Bestuchev, the great chancellor, superintended these maneuvers by writing directions each day on scraps of paper, indicating the course of conduct each interested person was to pursue. These he enclosed in a snuff-box with a double bottom, and, under pretense of offering snuff, succeeded in conveying them to those for whom they were intended without observation. Soon after the marriage of Peter, the empress presented him with the palace of Oranienbaum, at some distance from Petersburg. There he preferred to remain, in freedom from his aunt's continual scrutiny and reproaches. For his amusement, he formed a guard of Holstein soldiers, and instructed them for several hours each day in the Prussian exercises. He also gathered about him those who had talent for music or the drama, besides a number of dissipated companions. Knowing his passion for imitating everything Prussian, they persuaded him to gamble, drink, and engage in other vices, assuring him that every officer in Prussia did the same. In the meantime, Catherine, wearied with the solitude of this country palace, and entertaining no affection for her husband, received the admiration of Soltikoff, the prince's chamberlain, a man of polished address and attractive appearance. Elizabeth soon heard the consequent scandal, and made her displeasure evident, though not fitted to reprove the misconduct for which she was notorious herself. By artful representations, Catherine was reinstated in her favor. But the Empress had frequent occasions to reprimand both of her belligerent wards, and seemed seriously to think of appointing Paul, the infant son of Catherine, her successor, with a regent to reign during his minority. Fearing this, Catherine assiduously applied herself to regaining the good will of the Empress, exalted herself in the eyes of the people by attending church daily with a devout air during the illness of the Empress, and assisted the intriguing party that favored her schemes by placing Peter in an odious light before the courtiers and the populace. At Elizabeth's death, which occurred early in 1762, in a fit of intoxication, she was made to repeat words of the attending priest that expressed affection for the Grand Duke and Duchess, and named them her successors. As soon as the royal message reached Peter, which commanded him to live long, the Russian form of announcing death, he passed in state through the streets of Petersburg, causing himself to be proclaimed emperor under the name of Peter the Third. Notwithstanding the contempt which the conspirators had sought to bring upon him, he was enthusiastically received by the people. He began his reign with popular measures. One of his first acts was to recall a multitude of state prisoners exiled to Siberia by the tyrannical and suspicious temper of Elizabeth. He took no revenge upon his enemies, permitted the nobility to travel abroad at their pleasure, and allowed them to join the military service or not as they chose. He also abolished the secret tribunal which had long been a terror to the Russians. 
everyone was in transports of delight with the new emperor, who had suddenly become a wise, dignified, temperate prince. His affection for Catherine returned, and he treated her with the utmost kindness and attention, forgetting her unfaithfulness and coldness. She, however, withheld the advice and guidance she was capable of giving, and which Peter looked for. Wearied with her repulsive coldness and imperious harshness, surrounded by a deceitful court, with not a single friend to whom he could turn with confidence, and bewildered with cares for which his education and life had not prepared him, he returned to his vicious habits, unable, with his blunt perceptions, to detect or even suspect the conspiracies formed against him. In fact, he was too much engaged in plots of his own to perceive that any others were in progress. Jealous and suspicious of his wife, he had thoughts of displacing her and her heir, and naming for his successor Prince Ivan, who, for more than twenty years, had been immured in a dungeon. Peter secretly visited the unhappy prince, and soon after had him brought privately to Petersburg and concealed in an obscure house. Catherine, whom Peter had dismissed to the palace of Peterhof, occupied her leisure and retirement in instigating and perfecting plots against the emperor, while she appeared to take no part of them. The Princess Dashkov, then only eighteen, quick, witty, courageous, learned, and with remarkable talent for intrigue, remained at court for the purpose of keeping Catherine informed of every circumstance that transpired. It was not only an attachment to the Empress that induced her to such a course, but jealousy towards a sister who was the openly acknowledged favorite of the Emperor and a base ambition to be the leader of a faction. The other principal personages were Count Panin, preceptor to the young prince, a man of obscure birth, and a character in which obstinacy and cunning were predominant. Gregory Orloff, Catherine's last lover, noted for courage and beauty, and his brother Alexei, both of them officers in the guards. Another, Cyril Razmanovsky, the hetman or commander of the Cossacks, having much influence at court and possessed of immense wealth, besides being a favorite among the troops, was an important assistant. By the secret machinations of all these haughty heads put together, the conspiracy was ripe for execution. Peter the Third, who was nearly ready to put himself at the head of a waiting army destined to war against Denmark, was to be seized on his arrival at Peterhof, where he expected to celebrate a festival previous to his departure for Denmark. He was now engaged in revels at his country palace of Oranienbaum. Catherine, meanwhile, lived in daily fear and unendurable anxiety, lest her schemes should be discovered. Even her dreams were haunted with guilty terrors. She frequently paced the floor of her apartments half the night, for sleep fled from her frightened eyelids. An unexpected occurrence hastened the execution of the conspirators' designs. Pasek, a lieutenant in the guards, had gained the soldiers of his company— One of them, supposing nothing was done without the concurrence of the captain, innocently asked him on what day they were to take up arms against the emperor. The captain concealed his surprise and cunningly drew from the unsuspecting soldier the whole secret. Pasek was immediately arrested and put under guard, but he managed to write hastily upon a slip of paper, Proceed to execution this instant, or we are undone, and gave it to a spy who hurried it to the Princess Dashkov. She quickly informed the conspirators, and though late at night, she assumed man's apparel and went out to meet them upon an unfrequented bridge where their plans were quickly formed. The Empress had vacated the palace at Peterhof to leave the apartments free for the festival. She occupied a summer house in the garden of the palace, at the extremity of which was a canal connected with the Neva, that gave private access to the gardens by means of a small boat fastened there. Catherine was sleeping here at midnight when she was suddenly aroused and beheld a soldier standing at her bedside. Your Majesty has not a moment to lose. 
get ready to follow me, said he. Terrified and astonished, the empress arose, called her attendant Ivanovna, and dressed in haste. The soldier returned for them. They followed him to a carriage that stood waiting and found Alexey Orlov, impatient for their appearance. The empress and her maid were placed in the vehicle. Alexey took the reins and set off at full speed for Petersburg, twenty miles distant. Suddenly the horses stopped and fell down, and no efforts of Alexey and his companion could urge them on. Their danger was every moment increasing. It was still night, and several miles were yet to be traversed. The empress was finally obliged to leave the carriage, and they resolved to pursue their way on foot. Impatient to reach the city, and filled with terror, they fled rather than walked along the road, not knowing what moment they might be pursued. They had not gone far before they met a light country cart. Alexey Orlov seized the poor peasant's horses, and the empress and her maid sprang into the rough vehicle. Leaving the owner standing aghast in the middle of the road, they sped away to the capital. Catherine, worn out with fatigue and excitement, arrived at seven in the morning, but without taking rest, proceeded to the quarter of the soldiers. Seeing but few who issued from the barracks with clamorous greeting, she hesitated a moment, trembling. An instant's thought suggested a deception by which to gain the whole detachment. In a speech, she assured them that the Tsar, her husband, had attempted to murder her and her son that very night. She had just escaped, and now threw herself on their protection. The incensed soldiers, believing what she said, swore to defend her. The cry of, Long live the Empress Catherine! went up with enthusiastic demonstrations. The Orloffs secured a like reception from their regiments, and no one dared to stop the singular proceedings except Villebois, general of the artillery, who attempted to remonstrate. Catherine turned round, and, in an imperious tone, demanded what he intended to do. Confused and confounded with her commanding manner, he could only stammer out, to obey your majesty, and immediately delivered the arsenals and magazines of the city into her hands. It had required but two hours to accomplish this feat, and, without bloodshed, Catherine saw herself surrounded by two thousand warriors, besides the inhabitants of Petersburg, who imitated the movements of the soldiers. In the afternoon she repaired to the church of Kafen, where the archbishop of Novgorod in sacerdotal robes, accompanied by numerous priests wearing long beards, was ready to receive her at the altar. He placed the crown upon her head, proclaimed her the sovereign of the Russias as Catherine II, and the Grand Duke Paul Petrovich her successor. The shouts of the multitude who crowded the church were hushed by the chant of the Te Deum that solemnly swelled above the vast assemblage. The ceremony concluded, the Empress repaired to the palace that had been occupied by Elizabeth, and for several hours received the crowds who thronged the apartments to take the oath of allegiance. The Chancellor Varensov, father of the Princess Dashkov, but a firm adherent to the Emperor's cause, ventured to warn Catherine of the danger to which she exposed herself. She replied with insulting impudence and hypocritical innocence. You see how it is. I cannot really do otherwise. I am only yielding to the ardent sensibility of the nation. The Chancellor was attended to his own house by a guard. At six in the evening, Catherine, crowned with oak leaves and with a sword in her hand, mounted her horse, and accompanied by Princess Dashkov and the Hetman Razmunovsky, placed herself at the head of the troops at Petersburg and went out to meet those who were encamped at a distance, in order to secure their adherence before Peter should command their attendance upon himself. During all these rapid and singular movements, Peter the Third, in unsuspecting ignorance, set out for the expected festivities of Peterhof, with the ladies and courtiers who had been reveling at his palace at Oranienbaum. While riding gaily along the road to Peterhof, 
they were met by one of Catherine's attendants, who said the empress had escaped and was nowhere to be found. Peter, confounded and unbelieving, hastened to the palace, searched the apartments, fled from one place to another in the greatest fright, questioned all whom he met, but was unable to solve the mystery. While all about him were filled with gloomy forebodings, a countryman rode rapidly up to the group, made a profound inclination of the body, and without uttering a word, drew from the bosom of his caftan a sealed note and presented it to the emperor. This revealed the occurrences at Petersburg and his wife's duplicity. The terror of the emperor increased every moment, but the tears of the women about him and the advice of his young courtiers availed him nothing. Munich, whom he had released from exile in Siberia, presented himself and suggested the only practicable course to pursue, telling him to put himself at the head of such troops as were left and march to Petersburg, where the sight of the emperor might effect a counter-revolution. But the news that Catherine, with her army, was already marching towards Peterhof, so frightened the cowardly emperor that he accepted the last advice of Munich, threw himself into a yacht, precipitately followed by the weeping women and unmanly courtiers, and went to Kronstadt, an important port in the Gulf of Finland, which Munich knew would afford him ample means of defense if the inhabitants and garrison still adhered to the emperor's cause. Catherine had been too quick for them. They no sooner arrived in port than the sentinels cried out, Who comes there? The emperor, was the reply. Long live the Empress Catherine, rang out from the soldiers, who threatened to sink the yacht if they did not put off in an instant. Munich entreated Peter to spring upon shore, and all might yet be his. But, like a terrified child, he ran into the cabin and hid himself among the terrified women. Nothing could be done but row the infatuated imbecile prince back to our Oranienbaum. End of section 32